Wow, Holden said to himself. I really don't want to do this. The sound echoed in his helmet, competing only with the faint hiss of his radio. I tried to talk you out of it, Naomi replied, her voice somehow managing to be intimate, even flattened and distorted by his suit's small speakers. Sorry, I didn't think you were listening. Ah, she said. Irony. Holden tore his eyes away from the slowly growing sphere that was his destination and spun around to look for the Rosinante behind him. She wasn't visible until Alex fired a maneuvering thruster and a gossamer cone of steam reflected some of the sphere's blue glow. His suit told him that the Rossi was over 30,000 kilometers away, more than twice as far as any two people on Earth could ever be from each other, and receding. And here he was, in a suit of vacuum armor, wearing a disposable EVA pack that had about five minutes of thrust in it. He'd burned one minute accelerating toward the sphere. He'd burn another slowing down when he got there. That left enough to fly back to the Rossi when he was done. Optimism, expressed as conservation of Delta V. Prologue, Maneo Maneo Jung Espinosa, Neo to his friends back on Ceres Station, huddled in the cockpit of the little ship he'd christened the E.K. After almost three months, there were maybe fifty hours left before he made history. The food had run out two days before. The only water that was left to drink was half a liter of recycled piss that had already gone through him more times than he could count. Everything he could turn off, he'd turned off. The reactor was shut down. He still had passive monitors, but no active sensors. The only light in the cockpit came from the backsplash of the display terminals. The blanket he'd wrapped himself in, corners tucked into his restraint so it wouldn't float away, wasn't even powered. His broadcast and tight beam transmitters were both shut off, and he'd slagged the transponder even before he'd painted the name on her hull. He hadn't flown this far just to have some kind of accidental blip alert the flotillas that he was coming. Fifty hours. Less than that. And the only thing he had to do was not be seen. And not run into anything. But that part was in Las Manos de Dios. His cousin Evita had been the one who introduced him to the underground society of slingshots. That was three years ago just before his fifteenth birthday. He'd been hanging at his family hole, his mother gone to work at the water treatment plant, his father at a meeting with the grid maintenance group that he oversaw, and Neo had stayed home, cutting school for the fourth time in a month. When the system announced someone waiting at the door, he'd figured it was school security busting him for being truant. Instead, Evita was there. She was two years older, and his mother's sister's kid, a real belter. They had the same long, thin bodies, but she was from there. He'd had a thing for Evita since the first time he saw her. He'd had dreams about what she'd look like with her clothes off, what it would feel like to kiss her. Now here she was, and the place to himself. His heart was going three times standard before he opened the door. Esa, una cabatia, she said smiling and shrugging with one hand. Hoy, he'd said, trying to act cool and calm. He'd grown up in the massive city and space that was Ceres Station, just the way she had, but his father had the low, squat frame that marked him as an earther. He had as much right to the cosmopolitan slang of the belt as she had, but it sounded natural on her. When he said it, it was like he was putting on someone else's jacket. Some coyos meeting down portside, Silvestre de Campos back, she said, her hip cocked, her mouth soft as a pillow and her lips shining. Meet? Que, no? he'd said. Got nothing better. He'd figured out afterward that she'd brought him because Milasana, a horse-faced Martian girl a little younger than him, had a thing, and they all thought it was funny to watch the ugly inner girl padding around after the half-breed. But by then he didn't care. He'd met Silvestre Campos, 
and he'd heard of slingshotting. It went like this. Some coyo put together a boat. Maybe it was salvage. Maybe it was fabbed. Probably at least some of it was stolen. Didn't need to be much more than a torch drive, a crash couch, and enough air and water to get the job done. Then it was all about plotting the trajectory. Without an Epstein, torch drive burned pallets too fast to get anyone anywhere. At least, not without help. The trick was to plot it so that the burn, and the best only ever used one burn, would put the ship through a gravity assist, suck up the velocity of a planet or moon, and head out as deep as the push would take them. Then, figure out how to get back without getting dead. Whole thing got tracked by a double-encrypted black net as hard to break as anything that the Loka Grega or Golden Bow had on offer. Maybe they ran it. It was illegal as hell, and somebody was taking the bets. Dangerous, which was the point. And then, when you got back, everyone knew who you were. You could lounge around in the warehouse party and drink whatever you wanted, and talk however you wanted, and drape your hand on Evita Jung's right tit, and she wouldn't even move it off. And just like that, Neo, who had never cared about anything very much, developed an ambition. The thing people have to remember is that the ring isn't magical, the Martian woman said. Neo had spent a lot of time in the past months watching the news feeds about the ring, and so far he liked her the best. Pretty face, nice accent. She wasn't as thick as an earther, but she didn't belong to the belt either, like him. We don't understand it yet, and we may not for decades. But the last two years have given us some of the most interesting and exciting breakthroughs in materials technology since the wheel. Within the next ten or fifteen years, we're going to start seeing the applications of what we've learned from watching the protomolecule, and it will... Fruit of a poisoned tree, the old leathery-looking Koyo beside her said. We cannot allow ourselves to forget that this was built for mass murder. The criminals and monsters at Protogen and now Quick released this weapon on a population of innocents. That slaughter began all of this, and profiting from it makes us all complicit. The feed cut to the moderator, who smiled and shook his head at the leathery one. Rabbi Kimball, the moderator said, we've had contact with an undisputed alien artifact that took over Eros Station spent a little over a year preparing itself in the vicious pressure cooker of Venus, then launched a massive complex of structures just outside the orbit of Uranus and built a thousand-kilometer-wide ring. You can't be suggesting that we are morally required to ignore those facts. Himmler's hypothermia experiments at Dachau, the leathery coyo began, wagging his finger in the air. But now it was the pretty Martian's turn to interrupt. Can we move past the 1940s, please? She said, smiling in a way that said, I'm being friendly, but shut the fuck up. We're not talking about space Nazis here. This is the single most important event in human history. Protogen's role in it was terrible, and they've been punished for it. But now we have to... Not space Nazis, the old Koyo yelled. The Nazis aren't from space. They're right here among us. They're the beasts of our worst nature. By profiting from these discoveries, we legitimize the path by which we came to them. The pretty one rolled her eyes and looked at the moderator like she wanted help. The moderator shrugged at her, which only made the old one angrier. The ring is a temptation to sin, the old Koyo shouted. There were little flecks of white at the corners of his mouth that the video editor had chosen to leave visible. We don't know what it is, the pretty one said. Given that it was intended to do its work on primordial Earth with single-celled organisms and wound up on Venus with an infinitely more complex substrate, it probably doesn't work at all. But I can say that temptation and sin have nothing to do with it. They are victims. Your complex substrate? It is the corrupted bodies of the innocent. Neo turned down the feed volume and just watched them gesture at each other for a while. It had taken him months to plan out the trajectory of the E.K., finding the time when Jupiter, Europa, and Saturn were all in the right positions. The window was so narrow 
It had been like throwing a dart from a half-click away and pinning a fruit fly's wing with it. Europa had been the trick. A close pass on the Jovian moon, then down so close to the gas giant that there was almost drag, then out again for the long trip past Saturn, sucking more juice out of its orbital velocity, and then farther out into the black, not accelerating again, but going faster than anyone would imagine a little converted rock hopper could manage. Through millions of clicks of vacuum, to hit a bullseye smaller than a mosquito's asshole. Nao imagined the expressions of all the science and military ships parked around the ring when a little ship, no transponder and flying ballistic, appeared out of nowhere and shot straight through the ring at 150,000 kilometers per hour. After that, he'd have to move fast. He didn't have enough fuel to kill all his velocity, but he'd slow down enough that they could get a rescue ship to him. He'd do some time and slam, that was sure. Maybe two years, if the magistrates were being pissy. It was worth it, though. Just the messages from the black net, where all his friends were tracking him with the constant and rising chorus of, Holy shit, it's going to work, made it worth it. He was going down in history. In a hundred years, people were still going to be talking about the biggest bald slingshot ever. He'd lost months building the E.K., more than that in transit, then jail time after. It was worth it. He was going to live forever. Twenty hours. The biggest danger was the flotilla surrounding the ring. Earth and Mars had kicked each other's navies into creaky old men months ago, but what was left was mostly around the ring, or else down in the inner planets. But Nao didn't care about them. There were maybe twenty or thirty big military ships watching each other while every science vessel in the system peeped and listened and floated gently a couple thousand clicks from the ring. All the Navy muscle there to make sure no one touched. Scared, all of them. Even with all that metal and ceramic crammed into the same little corner of space, even with the relatively tiny thousand clicks across that was the inner face of the ring, the chances that he'd run into anything were trivial. There was a lot more nothing than something. And if he did hit one of the flotilla ships, he wasn't going to be around to worry about it. So he just gave it up to the Virgin and started setting up the high-speed camera. When it finally happened, it would be so fast he wouldn't even know whether he'd made the mark until he analyzed the data. And he was making sure there was going to be a record. He turned his transmitters back on. Hoi! he said into the camera. Neo here. Neo Solo. Captain and crew of the Souverain Belt Racer E.K. Me alista me. Got six hours until biggest slipper since God made man. Es pa mi mamá, the sweet Sophia Brun, and Jesus our Lord and Savior. Watch close. Blink it and miss. Que sa? He watched the file. He looked like crap. He probably had time. He could shave the ratty little beard off and at least tie back his hair. He wished now he'd kept up with his daily exercises so he wouldn't look so chicken-shouldered. Too late now. Still, he could mess with the camera angle. He was ballistic. Wasn't like there was any thrust gravity to worry about. He tried again from two other angles until his vanity was satisfied, then switched to the external cameras. His introduction was a little over ten seconds long. He'd start the broadcast, twenty seconds out, then switch to the exterior cameras. More than a thousand frames per second, and it still might miss the ring between images. He had to hope for the best. Wasn't like he could get another camera now, even if a better one existed. He drank the rest of his water and wished that he'd packed just a little more food. A tube of protein slush would have gone down really well. It'd be done soon. He'd be in some Earther or Martian brig where there would be a decent toilet and water to drink and prisoners' rations. He was almost looking forward to it. His sleeping comaray woke up and squawked about a tight beam. He opened the connection. The encryption meant it was from the black net and sent long enough ago that it would reach him here. Someone besides him was showing off. Evita was still beautiful. 
but more like a woman now than she'd been when he'd started getting money and salvage to build the E.K. Another five years, she'd be plain. He'd still have a thing for her, though. Esa, una cobatia, she said. Eyes of the world. Toda agua. Mine, too. She smiled, and just for a second, he thought maybe she'd lift her shirt. For good luck. The tight beam dropped. Two hours. I repeat, this is Martian frigate Lucienne to the unidentified ship approaching the ring. Respond immediately or we will open fire. Three minutes. They'd seen him too soon. The ring was still three minutes away, and they weren't supposed to see him until he had less than one. Neo cleared his throat. No need, Kesa. No need. This is the E.K. Racer Alsa Siri Station. Your transponder isn't on, E.K. Busted, yeah? Need some help with that. Your radio's working just fine, but I'm not hearing a distress beacon. Not distressed, he said, pulling the syllables out for every extra second. He could keep them talking. Ballistic is all. Can fire up the reactor, but it's going to take a couple minutes. Maybe you can come give a hand, eh? You are in restricted space, E.K., the Martian said, and Neo felt the grin growing on his face. No harm, he said. No harm. Surrender. Just got to get slowed down a little. Firing it up in a few seconds. Hold your piss. You have ten seconds to change trajectory away from the ring or we will open fire. The fear felt like victory. He was doing it. He was on target for the ring and it was freaking them out. One minute. He started warming up the reactor. At this point, he wasn't even lying anymore. The full suite of sensors started their boot sequence. Don't fire, he said, as he made a private jacking-off motion. Please, sir, don't shoot me. I'm slowing down as fast as I can. You have five seconds, E.K. He had thirty seconds. The friend or foe screens popped up as soon as the full ship system was on. The Lucien was going to pass close by. Maybe seven hundred clicks. No wonder they'd seen him. At that distance, the E.K. would light up the threat boards like it was Christmas. Just bad luck, that. You can shoot if you want, but I'm stopping as fast as I can, he said. The status alarm sounded. Two new dots appeared on the display. Ijo de Puta had actually launched torpedoes. Fifteen seconds. He was going to make it. He started broadcast and the exterior camera. The ring was out there somewhere. Its thousand-kilometer span, still too small and dark to make out with a naked eye. There was only the vast spill of stars. Hold fire! he shouted at the Martian frigate. Hold fire! Three seconds. The torpedoes were gaining fast. One second. As one, the stars all blinked out. Neo tapped the monitor. Nothing. Friend or foe didn't show anything. No frigate. No torpedoes. Nothing. Now that, he said to no one and nothing, is weird. On the monitor, something glimmered blue, and he pulled himself closer, as if being a few inches closer to the screen would make it all make sense. The sensors that triggered the high G alert took five hundredths of a second to trip. The alert, hardwired, took another three hundredths of a second to react, pushing power to the red LED and the emergency klaxon. The little console telltale that pegged out with a 99G deceleration warning took a glacial half-second to excite its light-emitting diodes. But by that time, Neo was already a red smear inside the cockpit the ship's deceleration throwing him forward through the screen and into the far bulkhead in less time than it took a synapse to fire. For five long seconds, the ship creaked and strained, not just stopping, but being stopped. In the unbroken darkness, the exterior high-speed camera kept up its broadcast, sending out a thousand frames per second of nothing, and then of something else. Chapter 1 Holden
When he'd been a boy back on Earth, living under the open blue of sky, one of his mothers had spent three years suffering uncontrolled migraines. Seeing her pale and sweating with pain had been hard, but the halo symptoms that led into it had almost been worse. She'd be cleaning the house or working through contracts for her law practice, and then her left hand would start to clench, curling against itself until the veins and tendons seemed to creak with the strain. Next, her eyes lost their focus, pupils dilating until her blue eyes had gone black. It was like watching someone having a seizure, and he always thought, this time, she'd die from it. He'd been six at the time, and he'd never told any of his parents how much the migraines unnerved him, or how much he dreaded them, even when things seemed good. The fear had become familiar, almost expected. It should have taken the edge off the terror, and maybe it did. But what replaced it was a sense of being trapped. The assault could come at any time, and it could not be avoided. It poisoned everything, even if it was only a little bit. It felt like being haunted. The house always wins, Holden shouted. He and the crew, Alex, Amos, Naomi, sat at a private table in the VIP lounge of Ceres' most expensive hotel. Even there, the bells, whistles, and digitized voices of the slot machines were loud enough to drown out most casual conversation. The few frequencies they weren't dominating were neatly filled in by the high-pitched clatter of the pachinko machines and the low bass rumble of a band playing on one of the casino's three stages. All of it added up to a wall of sound that left Holden's guts vibrating and his ears ringing. What? Amos yelled back at him. In the end, the house always wins. Amos stared down at an enormous pile of chips in front of him. He and Alex were counting and dividing them in preparation for their next foray out to the gaming tables. At a glance, Holden guessed they'd won something like 15,000 series new yen in just the last hour. It made an impressive stack. If they could quit now, they'd be ahead. But, of course, they wouldn't quit now. Okay, Amos said. What? Holden smiled and shrugged. Nothing. If his crew wanted to lose a few thousand bucks blowing off steam at the blackjack tables, who was he to interfere? The truth was, it wouldn't even put a dent in the payout from their most recent contract. And that was only one of three contracts they'd completed in the last four months. It was going to be a very flush year. Holden had made a lot of mistakes over the last three years. Deciding to quit his job as the OPA's bagman and become an independent contractor wasn't one of them. In the months since he'd put up his shingle as a freelance courier and escort ship, the Rocinante had taken seven jobs, and all of them had been profitable. They'd spent money refitting the ship bow to stern. She'd had a tough couple of years, and she'd needed some love. When that was done, and they still had more money in their general account than they knew what to do with, Holden had asked for a crew wish list. Naomi had paid to have a bulkhead in their quarters cut out to join the two rooms. They now had a bed large enough for two people and plenty of room to walk around it. Alex had pointed out the difficulty in buying new military-grade torpedoes for the ship, and had requested a keel-mounted railgun for the Rossi. It would give them more punch than the point defense cannons, and its only ammunition requirements were two-pound tungsten slugs. Amos had spent thirty grand during a stopover on Callisto, buying them some aftermarket engine upgrades. When Holden pointed out that the Rossi was already capable of accelerating fast enough to kill her crew, and asked why they'd need to upgrade her, Amos had replied, Because this shit is awesome. Holden had just nodded and smiled and paid the bill. Even after the initial giddy rush of spending, they had enough to pay themselves salaries that were five times what they'd made on the Canterbury, and keep the ship in water, air, and fuel pellets for the next decade. Probably it was temporary. There would be dry times, too, when no work came their way and they'd have to economize and make do. That just wasn't today. 
Amos and Alex had finished counting their chips and were shouting to Naomi about the finer points of blackjack, trying to get her to join them at the tables. Holden waved at the waiter, who darted over to take his order. No ordering from a table screen here in the VIP lounge. What do you have in a scotch that came from actual grain? Holden asked. We have several Ganymede distillations, the waiter said. He'd learned the trick of being heard over the racket without straining. He smiled at Holden. But for the discriminating gentleman from Earth, we also have a few bottles of sixteen-year Lagavulin we keep aside. You mean, like actual scotch from Scotland? From the island of Ayla, to be precise, the waiter replied. It's twelve hundred a bottle. I want that. Yes, sir, and four glasses. The waiter tipped his head and headed off to the bar. We're going to play blackjack now, Naomi said, laughing. Amos was pulling a stack of chips out of his tray and pushing them across the table to her. Want to come? The band in the next room stopped playing, and the background noise dropped to an almost tolerable level for a few seconds before someone started piping Muzak across the casino PA. Guys, wait a few minutes, Holden said. I've bought a bottle of something nice, and I want to have one last toast before we go our separate ways for the night. Amos looked impatient right up until the bottle arrived, and then spent several seconds cooing over the label. Yeah, okay. This was worth waiting for. Holden poured out a shot for each of them, then held his glass up. To the best ship and crew anyone has ever had the privilege of serving with, and to getting paid. To getting paid, Amos echoed, and then the shots disappeared. God damn, Cap. Alex said, then picked up the bottle to look it over. Can we put some of this on the Rosie? You can take it out of my salary. Second it, Naomi said, then took the bottle and poured out four more shots. For a few minutes, the stacks of chips and the lure of the card tables were forgotten, which was all Holden had wanted, just to keep these people together for a few moments longer. On every other ship he'd ever served on, Hitting port was a chance to get away from the same faces for a few days. Not any more. Not with this crew. He stifled an urge to say a maudlin, I love you guys, by drinking another shot of scotch. One last hit for the road, Amos said, picking up the bottle. Gonna hit the head, Holden replied, and pushed away from the table. He weaved a bit more than he expected on his walk to the restroom. The scotch had gone to his brain fast. The restrooms in the VIP lounge were lush. No rows of urinals and sinks here. Instead, half a dozen doors that led to private facilities with their own toilet and sink. Holden pushed his way into one and latched it behind him. The noise level dropped almost to nothing as soon as the door closed. A little like stepping outside the world. It was probably designed that way. He was glad whoever built the casino had allowed for a place of relative calm. He wouldn't have been shocked to see a slot machine over the sink. He put one hand on the wall to steady himself while he did his business. He was midstream when the room brightened for a moment, and the chrome handle on the toilet reflected a faint blue light. The fear hit him in the gut. Again. I swear to God... Holden said, pausing to finish and then zip up. Miller, you better not be there when I turn around. He turned around. Miller was there. Hey, the dead man started. We need to talk. Holden finished for him, then walked to the sink to wash his hands. A tiny blue firefly followed him and landed on the counter. Holden smashed it with his palm, but when he lifted his hand, nothing was there. In the mirror, Miller's reflection shrugged. When he moved, it was with a sickening jerkiness, like a clockwork ticking through its motions, human and inhuman both. Everyone's here at once, the dead man said. I don't want to talk about what happened to Julie. Holden pulled a towel out of the basket next to the sink, then leaned against the counter facing Miller and slowly dried his hands. He was trembling, 
the same as he always did. The sense of threat and evil was crawling up his spine, just the same way it always did. Holden hated it. Detective Miller smiled, distracted by something Holden couldn't see. The man had worked security on Ceres, been fired and gone off hunting on his own, searching for a missing girl. He'd saved Holden's life once. Holden had watched when the asteroid station, Miller, and thousands of victims of the alien protomolecule had been trapped on crashed into Venus, including Julie Mao, the girl Miller had searched for and then found too late. For a year, the alien artifact had suffered and worked its incomprehensible design under the clouds of Venus. When it rose, hauling massive structures up from the depths and flying out past the orbit of Neptune, like some titanic sea creature translated to the void, Miller rose with it. And now, everything he said was madness. Holden, Miller said, not talking to him, describing him. Yeah, that makes sense. You're not one of them. Hey, you have to listen to me. Then you have to say something. This shit is out of hand. You've been doing your random appearing act for almost a year now, and you've never said even one thing that made sense. Not one. Miller waved the comment away. The old man was starting to breathe faster, panting like he'd run a race. Beads of sweat glistened on his pale, gray-tinged skin. So there was this unlicensed brothel down in Sector 18. We went in thinking we'd have fifteen, twenty in the box. More, maybe. Got there, and the place was stripped to the stone. I'm supposed to think about that. It means something. What do you want from me? Holden said. Just tell me what you want, all right? I'm not crazy, Miller said. When I'm crazy, they kill me. God, did they kill me? Miller's mouth formed a small O, and he began to suck air in. His lips were darkening, the blood under the skin turning black. He put a hand on Holden's shoulder, and it felt too heavy, too solid, like Miller had been remade with iron instead of bones. It's all gone pear-shaped. We got there, but it's empty. The whole sky's empty. I don't know what that means. Miller leaned close. His breath smelled like acetate fumes. His eyes locked on Holden, eyebrows raised, asking him if he understood. You've got to help me, Miller said. The blood vessels in his eyes were almost black. They know I find things. They know you help me. You're dead, Holden said the words coming out of him without consideration or planning. Everyone's dead, Miller said. He took his hand from Holden's shoulder and turned away. Confusion troubled his brow. Almost. Almost. Holden's terminal buzzed at him, and he took it out of his pocket. Naomi had sent, Did you fall in? Holden began typing out a reply, then stopped when he realized he'd have no idea what to say. When Miller spoke, his voice was small, almost childlike with wonder and amazement. Fuck. It happened, Miller said. What happened, Holden said. A door banged as someone else went into a neighboring stall, and Miller was gone. The smell of ozone and some rich organic volatiles like a spice shop gone rancid were all the evidence that he had been there, and that might only have been in Holden's imagination. Holden stood for a moment, waiting for the coppery taste to leave his mouth, waiting for his heartbeat to slow back down to normal, doing what he always did in the aftermath. When the worst had passed, he rinsed his face with cold water and dried it with a soft towel. The distant, muffled sound of gambling decks rose to a frenzy. A jackpot. He wouldn't tell them, Naomi 
Alex, Amos. They deserved to have their pleasure without the thing that had been Miller intruding on it. Holden recognized that the impulse to keep it from them was irrational, but it felt so powerfully like protecting them that he didn't question it much. Whatever Miller had become, Holden was going to stand between it and the Rossi. He studied his reflection until it was perfect. The carefree, slightly drunk captain of a successful independent ship on shore leave. Easy. Happy. He went back out to the pandemonium of the casino. For a moment, it was like stepping back in time. The casinos on Eros. The death box. The lights felt a little too bright. The noises sounded a little too loud. Holden made his way back to the table and poured himself another shot. He could nurse this one for a while. He'd enjoy the flavor and the night. Someone behind him shrieked their laughter. Only laughter. A few minutes later, Naomi appeared, stepping out of the bustle and chaos like serenity in a female form. The half-drunken, expansive love he'd felt earlier came back as he watched her make her way toward him. They'd shipped together on the Canterbury for years before he'd found himself falling in love with her. Looking back, every morning he'd woken up with someone else had been a lost opportunity to breathe Naomi's air. He couldn't imagine what he'd been thinking. He shifted to the side, making room for her. They cleaned you out? he asked. Alex, she said. They cleaned Alex out. I gave him my chips. You are a woman of tremendous generosity, he said with a grin. Naomi's dark eyes softened into a sympathetic expression. Miller showed up again, she asked, leaning close to be heard over the noise. It's a little unsettling how easily you see through me. You're pretty legible. And this wouldn't be Miller's first bathroom ambush. Did he make any more sense this time? No, Holden said. He's like talking to an electrical problem. Half the time, I'm not sure he even knows I'm there. It can't really be Miller, can it? If it's the protomolecule wearing a Miller suit, I think that's actually creepier. Fair point, Naomi said. Did he say anything new, at least? A little bit, maybe. He said something happened. What? I don't know. He just said, it happened, and blinked out. They sat together for a few minutes, a private silence within the riot, her fingers interlaced with his. She leaned over, kissing his right eyebrow, and then pulled him up off the chair. Come on, she said. Where are we going? I'm going to teach you how to play poker, she said. I know how to play poker. You think you do, she said. Are you calling me a fish? She smiled and tugged at him. Holden shook his head. If you want to, let's go back to the ship. We can get a few people together and have a private game. It doesn't make sense to do it here. The house always wins. We aren't here to win, Naomi said, and the seriousness in her voice made the words carry more than the obvious meaning. We're here to play. The news came two days later. Holden was in the galley, eating takeout from one of the dockside restaurants. Garlic sauce over rice, three kinds of legumes, and something so similar to chicken it might as well have been the real thing. Amos and Naomi were overseeing the loading of nutrients and filters for the air recycling systems. Alex in the pilot seat was asleep. On the other ships Holden had served aboard, having the full crew back on ship before departure required it was almost unheard of, and they'd all spent a couple of nights in dockside hotels before they'd come home. But they were home now. Holden ran through the local feeds on his hand terminal, sipping news and entertainment from throughout the system. A security flaw in the new Bandau Solace game meant that financial and personal information from six million people had been captured on a pirate server orbiting Titan. Martian military experts were calling for increased spending to address the losses suffered in the battle around Ganymede. On Earth, an African farming coalition was defying the ban on a nitrogen-fixing strain of bacteria. 
protesters on both sides of the issue were taking to the streets in Cairo. Holden was flipping back and forth, letting his mind float on the surface of the information, when a red band appeared on one of the news feeds, and then another, and then another. The image above the article chilled his blood. The ring, they called it. The gigantic alien structure that had left Venus and traveled to a point a little less than two AU outside Uranus's orbit, then stopped and assembled itself. Holden read the news carefully as dread pulled at his gut. When he looked up, Naomi and Amos were in the doorway. Amos had his own hand terminal out. Holden saw the same red bands on that display. You seen this, Captain? Amos asked. Yeah, Holden said. Some mad bastard tried to shoot the ring. Yeah. Even with the distance between Ceres and the ring, the vast, empty ocean of space, the news that some idiot's cheapjack ship had gone in one side of the alien structure and hadn't come out the other should have only taken about five hours. It had happened two days before. That's how long the various governments watching the ring had been able to cover it up. This is it, isn't it? Naomi said. This is what happened. Chapter 2 Bull Carlos C. de Baca, bull to his friends, didn't like Captain Ashford. Never had. The captain was one of those guys who'd sneer without moving his mouth. Before Ashford joined up with the OPA full-time, he'd gotten a degree in math from the lunar campus of Boston University, and he never let anyone forget it. It was like because he had a degree from an Earth university, he was better than the other belters. Not that he wouldn't be happy to badmouth guys like Bull or Fred, who really had grown up down the well. Ashford wasn't one thing or another. The way he latched on to whatever seemed like it made him the big man, education, association with Earth, growing up in the belt, made it hard not to tease him. And Ashford was going to be in command of the mission. There's a time element, too, Fred Johnson said. Fred looked like crap, too thin. Everyone looked too thin these days. But Fred's dark skin had taken on an ashy overtone that left Bull thinking about things like autoimmune disorders or untreated cancer. Probably it was just stress, years, and malnutrition. Same thing that got everyone, if nothing else did. Point of fact, Bull was looking a little gray around the temples, too, and he didn't like the crap LEDs that were supposed to mimic sunlight. That he was still darker than an eggshell had more to do with a nut-brown Mexican mother than anything ultraviolet. He'd been out in the dark since he was twenty-two. He was over forty now. And Fred, his superior officer under two different governments, was older than he was. The construction gantries sloped out ahead of them, the flexible walls shining like snake scales. There was a constant low-level whine. The vibrations of the construction equipment carried along the flesh of the station. The spin gravity here was a little less than the standard one-third G on Tycho Station proper, and Ashford was making a little show of speeding up and then slowing down for the Earthers. Bull slowed his own steps down just a little to make the man wait longer. Time element? What's that look like, Colonel? Ashford asked. Not as bad as it could be, Fred said. The ring hasn't made any apparent changes since the big one during the incident. No one else has gone through, and nothing's come out. People have backed down from filling their pants to just high alert. Mars is approaching this as a strictly military and scientific issue. They've got half a dozen science vessels on high burn already. How much escort? Bull asked. One destroyer, three frigates. Fred said. Earth is moving slower, but larger. They've got elections coming up next year, and the Secretary General's been catching hell about turning a blind eye to rogue corporate entities. Wonder why, Bull said dryly. Even Ashford smiled. Between Protogen and Malkukowski, the order and stability of the solar system had pretty much been dropped in a blender. Eros Station was gone. 
taken over by an alien technology and crashed into Venus. Ganymede was producing less than a quarter of its previous food output, leaving every population center in the outer planets relying on backup agricultural sources. The Earth-Mars alliance was the kind of quaint memory someone's grandpa might talk about after too much beer. The good old days, before it all went to hell. He's putting on a show, Fred went on. Media, religious leaders, poets, artists. They're hauling them all out to the ring so that every feed he can reach is pointed away from him. Typical, Ashford said, then didn't elaborate. Typical for a politician. Typical for an earther. What are we looking at out there? The gantry sang for a moment, an accident of harmonics setting it ringing and shaking until industrial dampers kicked in and killed the vibration before it reached the point of doing damage. All we've confirmed is that some idiot flew through the ring at high ballistic speeds and didn't come out the other side, Fred said, moving his hands in the physical shrug of a belter. Now there's some kind of physical anomaly in the ring. Could be that the idiot kid's ship got eaten by the ring and converted into something. The ring sprayed a lot of gamma and x-rays, but not enough to account for the mass of the ship. Could be that he broke it. Could be that it opened a gate, and there's a bunch of little green men and saucers about to roll through and make the solar system into a truck stop. What? Bo began, but Ashford talked over him. Any response from Venus? Nothing, Fred said. Venus was dead. For years after a corrupted era station fell through its clouds, all human eyes had turned to that planet, watching as the alien protomolecules struggled in the violence and heat. Crystal towers kilometers high rose and fell away. Networks of carbon fibers laced the planet and degraded to nothing. The weapon had been meant to hijack simple life on Earth billions of years before. Instead, it had the complex ecosystem of human bodies and the structures to sustain them in the toxic oven of Venus. Maybe it had taken longer to carry out its plan. Maybe having complex life to work with had made things easier. Everything pointed to it being finished with Venus. And all that really mattered was it had launched a self-assembling ring in the emptiness outside the orbit of Uranus that sat there dead as a stone. Until now. What are we supposed to do about it? Bull asked. No offense, but we don't got the best science vessels. And Earth and Mars blew the crap out of each other over Ganymede. Be there, Fred said. If Earth and Mars send their ships, we send ours. If they put out a statement, we put out one of our own. If they lay a claim on the ring, we counterclaim. What we've done to make the outer planets into a viable political force is reap real benefits, but if we start letting them lead, it could all evaporate. We planning to shoot anybody? Bull asked. Hopefully it won't come to that, Fred said. The gantry's gentle upward slope brought them to a platform arch. In the star-strewn blackness, a great plane of steel and ceramic curved away above them, lit by a thousand lights. Looking out at it was like seeing a landscape. This was too big to be something humans had made. It was like a canyon or a mountain, the meadow-filled caldera of some dead volcano. The scale alone made it impossible to see her as a ship, but she was. The construction mechs crawling along her side were bigger than the house Bold had lived in as a boy, but they looked like football players on a distant field. The long, thin line of the keel elevator stretched along the body of the drum to shuttle personnel from engineering at one end to ops at the other. The secondary car, stored on the exterior, could hold a dozen people. It looked like a grain of salt. The soft curve was studded with turreted rail guns and the rough, angry extrusions of torpedo tubes. Once, she'd been the Nauvoo, a generation ship headed to the stars carrying a load of devout Mormons with only an engineered ecosystem and an unshakable faith in God's grace to see them through. Now, she was the behemoth, the biggest, baddest weapons platform in the solar system. 
Four Doniger-class battleships would fit in her belly and not touch the walls. She could accelerate magnetic rounds to a measurable fraction of C. She could hold more nuclear torpedoes than the Outer Planets Alliance actually had. Her communications laser was powerful enough to burn through steel, if they gave it enough time. Apart from painting teeth on her and welding on an apartment building-sized shark fin, nothing could have been more clearly or effectively built to intimidate. Which was good, because she was a retrofitted piece of crap. And if they ever got in a real fight, they were boned. Bull slid a glance at Ashford. The captain's chin was tilted high and his eyes were bright with pride. Bull sucked his teeth. The last threads of weight let go as the platform and gantry matched to the stillness of the behemoth. One of the distant construction mechs burst into a sun-white flare as the welding started. How long before we take her out? Ashford asked. Three days, Fred said. Engineering report said the ship will be ready in about ten, Bull said. We planning to work on her while we're flying? That was the intention, Fred said. Because we could wait another few days here, do the work in dock, and burn a little harder going out, get the same arrival. The silence was uncomfortable. Bull had known it would be, but it had to be said. The crew's comfort and morale need as much support as the ship, Fred said. Diplomacy changing the shapes of the words. Bull had known him long enough to hear it. The Belters don't want a hard burn. Besides which, it's easier to get the in-transit work done in lower G. It's all been min-maxed, Bull. You ship out in three. Is that a problem? Ashford said. Bull pulled the goofy grin he used when he wanted to tell the truth and not get in trouble for it. We're heading out to throw gang signs at Earth and Mars while the ring does a bunch of scary alien mystery stuff. We've got a crew that's never worked together, a ship that's half salvage and not enough time to shake it all down. Sure, it's a problem. But it's not one we can fix, so we'll do it anyway. Worst can happen is we all die. Cheerful thought, Ashford said. The disapproval dripped off him. Bull's grin widened and he shrugged. Going to happen sooner or later. Bull's quarters on Tycho Station were luxurious. Four rooms, high ceilings, a private head with an actual water supply. Even as a kid back on Earth, he hadn't lived this well. He'd spent his childhood in a housing complex in the New Mexican Shared Interest Zone. Living with his parents, grandmother, two uncles, three aunts, and about a thousand cousins, seemed like. When he turned sixteen and declined to go on basic, he'd headed south to Alamogordo and worked his two-year service stripping down ancient solar electricity stations from the bad old days before fusion. He'd shared a dorm with ten other guys. He could still picture them, the way they'd been back then, all skinny and muscled with their shirts off or tied around their heads. He could still feel the New Mexican sun pressing against his chest like a hand as he basked in the radiation and heat of an uncontrolled fusion reaction, protected only by distance and the wide blue sky. When his two-year stint was up, he tried tech school, but he'd gotten distracted by hormones and alcohol. Once he'd dropped out, his choices were pretty much just the military or basic. He'd chosen the one that felt less like death. In the Marines, he'd never had a bunk larger than the front room of his Tycho station quarters. He hadn't even had a place that was really his own until he mustered out. Ceres Station hadn't been a good place for him. The hole he'd taken had been up near the center of spin, low G and high Coriolis. It hadn't been much more than a place to go sleep off last night's drunk, but it had been his. The bare, polished stone walls, the ship's surplus bed with restraining straps for low G. Some previous owner had chiseled the words, Beso Nadie, into the wall. It was Belter Cant for better or nothing. He hadn't known it was a political slogan at the time. The things he'd gotten since coming to Tycho Station, the frame cycling through a dozen good family pictures from Earth, 
the tin Santos candle holder that his ex-girlfriend hadn't taken when she left, the civilian clothes, would have filled his old place on Ceres and not left room for him to sleep. He had too much stuff. He needed to pare it down. But not for this assignment. The XO suite on the behemoth was bigger. The system chimed, letting him know someone was at the door. From long habit, Bull checked the video feed before he opened the door. Fred was shifting from one foot to the other. He was in civilian clothes, a white button-down and grandpa pants that tried to forgive the sag of his belly. It was a losing fight. Fred wasn't out of shape any more than Bull was. They were just getting old. Hey, Bull said. Grab a chair anywhere. I'm just getting it all together. Heading over now? Want to spend some time on the ship before we take her out, Bull said. Check for stray Mormons. Fred looked pained. I'm pretty sure we got them all out the first time, he said, playing along. But it's a big place. You can look around if you want. Bull opened his dresser, his fingers counting through T-shirts. He had ten. There was a sign of decadence. Who needed ten T-shirts? He pulled out five and dropped them on the chair by his footlocker. It's going to be all kinds of hell if they get rights to the Nauvoo back, he said. All the changes we're making to her? They won't, Fred said. Commandeering the ship was perfectly legal. It was an emergency. I could list you ten hours of precedent. Yeah, but then we salvaged it ourselves and called it ours, Bo said. That's like saying I've got to borrow your truck, but since I ran it into a ditch and hauled it back out, it's mine now. Law is a many splendid thing, Bull, Fred said. He sounded tired. Something else was bothering him. Bull opened another drawer, threw half his socks into the recycler, and put the others on his T-shirts. Just if the judge doesn't see it that way, could be awkward, Bull said. The judges on Earth don't have jurisdiction, Fred said. And the ones in our court system are loyal to the OPA. They know the big picture. They're not going to take our biggest ship off the board and hand it back over. Worst case, they'll order compensation. Can we afford that? Not right now, no, Fred said. Bull snorted out a little laugh. Ever wonder what we did wrong that got us here? You're driving one of the biggest desks in the OPA, and I'm XO to Ashford. That ain't a sign we've been living our lives right, man. About that. Fred said. We've had a little change of plan. Bull opened his closet, his lips pressing thin. Fred hadn't just come to chew the fat. There was a problem. Bull took two suits out of the closet, both still wrapped in sticky preservative film. He hadn't worn either one in years. They probably didn't fit. Ashford thought it would be better to have Michio Pa as the XO. We talked about it. I'm reassigning you as chief security officer. Third in command now, Bo said. What, Ashford think I was going to frag him and take his chair? Fred leaned forward, his fingers laced. The gravity of his expression said he knew it was a crap situation, but was making the best of it. It's all about how it looks, Fred said. This is the OPA's navy. The behemoth is the belt's answer to Mars and Earth's heaviest hitters. Having an Earther on the bridge doesn't send the right message. All right, Bo said. I'm in the same position. You know that. Even after all this time, I have to work twice as hard to command loyalty and respect because of where I'm from. Even the ones who like having me around because they think I make Earth look weak don't want to take orders from me. I've had to earn and re-earn every scrap of respect. Okay, Bo said. Security officer was going to mean less time in uniform. With a sigh, he put both suits on the chair. I'm not saying that you haven't, Fred said. No one knows better than I do that you're the best of the best. There are just some constraints we have to live with to get the job done. Bo leaned against the wall, his arms crossed. Fred looked up at him from under frost-colored brows. Sir, 
I've been flying with you for a long time, Bo said. If you need to ask me something, you can just do it. I need you to make this work, Fred said. What's going on out there is the most important thing in the system, and we don't know what it is. If we embarrass ourselves or give the inner planet some critical advantage, we stand to lose a lot of ground. Ashford and Pa are good people, but they're belters. They don't have the same experience working with Earth forces that you and I do. You think they're going to start something? No. Ashford will try his hardest to do the right thing, but he'll react like a belter and be surprised when other people don't. Ashford has only ever done a right thing because he's afraid of being embarrassed. He's a pretty uniform surrounding vacuum, and you can't rely on that. I'm not, Fred agreed. I'm sending you out there because I trust you to make it work. But you're not giving me command. But I'm not giving you command. How about a raise? Not that either, Fred said. Well, heck, Bo said. All the responsibility and none of the power. How can I turn down an offer like that? No joking. We're screwing you over, and the reasons are all optics and political bullshit. But I need you to take it. So, I'll take it, Bo said. For a moment, the only sound was the quiet ticking of the air recycler. Bull turned back to the task of putting his life in a footlocker again. Somewhere far above him, hidden by tons of steel and ceramic, raw stone and vacuum, Behemoth waited. Chapter 3 Melba When she walked into the gambling house, Melba felt eyes on her. The room was lit by the displays on the game decks, pink and blue and gold. Most of them were themed around sex or violence, or both. Press a button, spend your money, and watch the girls put foreign and offensive objects inside themselves while you waited to see whether you'd won. Slot machines, poker, real-time lotteries. The men who played them exuded an atmosphere of stupidity, desperation, and an almost tangible hatred of women. Darling, an immensely fat man said from behind the counter. Don't know where you think you come to, but you come in the wrong place. Maybe best you walk back out. I have an appointment, she said. Traven. The fat man's eyes widened under their thick lids. Someone in the gloom called out a vulgarity meant to unease her. It did, but she didn't let it show. Traven in the back, you want him, darling, the fat man said, nodding. At the far end of the room, through the gauntlet of leers and threat, a red metal door. All of her instincts came from before, when she was Clarissa, and so they were all wrong now. From the time she'd been old enough to walk, she'd been trained in self-defense, but it had all been anti-kidnapping. How to attract the attention of the authorities. How to de-escalate situations with her captors. There had been other work, of course. Physical training had been part of it. But the goal had always been to break away. To run. To find help. Now that there was no one to help her, nothing quite applied. But it was what she had. So it was what she used. Melba, not Clarissa, Melba nodded to the fat man and walked through the close-packed, dim room. The full gravity of Earth pulled on her like an illness. On one of the gambling decks, a cartoon woman was being sexually assaulted by three small, gray aliens while a flying saucer floated above them. Someone had won a minor jackpot. Melba looked away. Behind her, an unseen man laughed, and she felt the skin at the back of her neck tighten. Of all her siblings, she had most enjoyed the physical training. When it ended, she began studying Tai Chi with the self-defense instructor. Then, when she was fourteen, her father had made a joke about it at a family gathering. How learning to fight might make sense, he could respect that, but dancing while pretending to fight looked stupid and wasted time. She'd never trained again. That was ten years ago. 
She opened the red door and walked through it. The office seemed almost bright. A small desk with a built-in display tuned to a cheap accounting system. White frosted glass that let in the sunlight but hid the streets of Baltimore. A formed plastic couch upholstered with the corporate logo of a cheap brand of beer that even people on basic could afford. Two hulking men sat on the couch. One had implanted sunglasses that made him look like an insect. The other wore a T-shirt that strained at his steroidal shoulders. She'd seen them before. Traven was at the desk, leaning his thigh against it. His hair was cut close to the scalp, a dusting of white at the temples. His beard was hardly longer. He wore what passed for a good suit in his circles. Father wouldn't have worn it as a costume. Ah, look, the inimitable Melba. You knew I was here, she said. There were no chairs, no place to sit that wasn't already occupied. She stood. Of course I did, Travin said. As soon as you come off the street. Are we doing business? she asked. Her voice cut the air. Travin grinned. His teeth were uncorrected and gray at the gums. It was an affectation of wealth, a statement that he was so powerful mere cosmesis was beneath him. She felt a hot rush of scorn. He was like an old cargo cultist, imitating the empty displays of power and no idea what they really meant. She was reduced to dealing with him, but at least she had the grace to be embarrassed by it. It's all done, miss, Travin said. Melba Alsbeta Co. Born on Luna to Alsi, Becca, and Sergio Co. All deceased. No siblings. No taxation indenture. Licensed electrochemical technician. Your new self awaits, ah? Huh? And the contract? The Cerisier ships out. Civilian support for the grand mission to the ring. Our Miss Co. She's on it. Senior class, even. Little staff to oversee. Don't have to get your hands dirty. Traven pulled a white plastic envelope from his pocket. The shadow of a cheap hand terminal showed through the tissue. All here? All ready, he said. You take it and walk to the door a new woman, ah? Huh? Melba took her own hand terminal out of her pocket. It was smaller than the one in Traven's hand and better made. She'd miss it. She thumbed in her code authorized the transfer, and slid it back in her pocket. All right, she said. The money's yours. I'll take delivery. Ah, there is still one problem, Travin said. We have an agreement, Melba said. I did my part. And it speaks well of you, Travin said. But doing business with you? I enjoy it, I think. Exciting discoveries to be made. Creating this new you, we have to put the DNA in the tables. We have to scrub out doubled records. I think you haven't been entirely honest with me. She swallowed, trying to loosen the knot in her throat. The insect-eyed man on the couch shifted, his weight making the couch squeak. My money spends, she said. As it should, as it should, Travin said. Clarissa Melpameni Mao. Daughter to Jules Pierre Mao of Mao Kukowski Mercantile. Very interesting name. Mao Kukowski was nationalized when my father went to jail, Melba said. It doesn't exist anymore. Corporate death sentence, Travin said as he put the envelope on the desk display. Very sad. But not for you, huh? Rich men, no money. They find ways to put it where little eyes can't find. Get it to their wives, maybe. Their daughters. She crossed her arms, scowling. On the couch, the bodybuilder stifled a yawn. It might even have been genuine. She let the silence stretch, not because she wanted to pressure Travin to speak next, but because she didn't know what to say. He was right, of course. Daddy had taken care of all of them as best he could. He always had. Even the persecution of the United Nations couldn't reach everything. Clarissa had had enough money to live a quiet, retiring life on Luna or Mars and die of old age before the capital ran out. 
But she wasn't Clarissa anymore, and Melba's situation was different. I can give you another ten thousand, she said. That's all I've got. Travin smiled his grey smile. All that pretty money flown away, huh? And what takes you out into the darkness, eh? I wondered, so I looked. You are very, very good. Even knowing to squint, I didn't see more than shadows, didn't hear more than echoes, but... He put the envelope on the desk before him, keeping one finger on it the way her brother Peter did when he was almost sure of a chess move, but hadn't brought himself to commit. It was a gesture of ownership. I have something no one else does. I know to look at the ring. Ten thousand is all I have. Honestly, I've spent the rest. Would you need more, then? Travin asked. Investment capital, call it? Our little Melba can have ten thousand if you want it. Fifty thousand if you need it. But I will want more back. Much more. She felt her throat tighten. When she tilted her head, the movement felt too fast, too tight, bird-like, scared. What are you talking about? she asked, willing her voice to sound solid. Formless threat hung in the air like bad cologne, masculine and cheap. When he spoke again, false friendliness curved all of his vowels. Partners, you are doing something big. Something with a ring and the flotilla, huh? All these people heading out in the dark to face the monsters, and you are going with them. It seems to me that such a risk means you expect a very great return, the sort one expects from a Mao. You tell me what is your plan. I help you how I can help you. And what comes your way from this, we divide. No deal. The words were like a reflex. They came from her spine, the decision too obvious to require her brain. Traven pulled back the envelope, the plastic hissing against the table. The soft, tutting sound of tongue against teeth was as sympathetic as it was false. You have moved heaven and earth, he said. You have bribed, you have bought, you have arranged. And when you say that you have nothing in reserve, I believe you. So now you come to my table and tell me no deal? No deal is no deal. I paid you. I don't care. We are partners. Full partners. Whatever you are getting from this, I am getting too. Or else there are other people, I think, who would be very interested to hear about what the infamous Mao have been so quietly doing. The two men on the couch were paying attention to her now. Their gazes were on her. She turned to look over her shoulder. The door to the gambler's den was metal, and it was locked. The window was wide. The security wire in it was the sort that retracted if you wanted the glass to open and let the filthy breeze of the city in to soil the air. The insect-eyed one stood up. Her implants were triggered by rubbing her tongue against the roof of her mouth. Two circles, counterclockwise. It was a private movement, invisible, internal, oddly sensual. It was almost as easy as just thinking. The suite of manufactured glands tucked in her throat and head and abdomen squeezed their little bladders empty, pouring complex chemistry into her blood. She shuddered. It felt like orgasm without the pleasure. She could feel conscience and inhibition sliding away like bad dreams. She was fully awake and alive. All the sounds in the room, the roar of street traffic, the muffled cacophony of the gambling decks, Traven's nasty voice, went quieter, as if the cocktail flowing into her had stuffed foam in her ears. Her muscles grew tense and tight. The taste of copper filled her mouth. Time slowed. What to do? What to do? The thugs by the couch were the first threat. She moved over to them, gravity's oppressive grip forgotten. 
She kicked the bodybuilder in the kneecap as he rose, the little beer coaster of bone ripping free of its tendons and sliding up his thigh. His face was a cartoon of surprise and alarm. As he began to crumple, she lifted her other knee, driving it up into his descending larynx. She'd been aiming for his face. Throat just as good, she thought, as the cartilage collapsed against her knee. The insect-eyed one lunged for her. He moved quickly, his own body modified somehow, fused muscular neurons, probably, something to streamline the long, slow gap when the neurotransmitters floated across the synapses, something to give him an edge when he was fighting some other thug. His hand fastened on her shoulder, wide, hard fingers grabbing at her. She turned in toward him, dropping to pull him down. Palm strike to the inside of the elbow to break his power, then both her hands around his wrist, bending it. None of her attacks were conscious or intentional. The movements came flowing out of a hind brain that had been freed of restraint and given the time to plan its mayhem. It was no more a martial art than a crocodile taking down a water buffalo was. Just speed, strength, and a couple billion years of survival instinct unleashed. Her Tai Chi instructor would have looked away in embarrassment. The bodybuilder sloped down to the floor, blood pouring from his mouth. The insect-eyed man pulled away from her, which was the wrong thing to do. She hugged his locked joints close to her body and swung from her hips. He was bigger than she was, had lived in the gravity well all his life. He buffed up with steroids in his own cheap augmentations. She didn't need to be stronger than him, though, just stronger than the little bones in his wrist and elbow. He broke, dropping to his knee. Melba, not Clarissa, swung around him, sliding her right arm around his neck, then locking it with the left, protecting her own head from the thrashing that was about to come. She didn't need to be stronger than him, just stronger than the soft arteries that carried blood to his brain. Travin's gun fired, gouging a hole in the couch. The little puff of foam was like a sponge exploding. No time. She shrieked, pulling the power of the scream into her arms, her shoulders. She felt the insect-eyed man's neck snap. Travin fired again. If he hit her, she'd die. She felt no fear, though. It had been locked away where she couldn't experience it. That would come soon. Very soon. It had to be done quickly. He should have tried for a third bullet. It was the smart thing, the wise one. He was neither smart nor wise. He did what his body told him to and tried to get away. He was a monkey, and millions of years of evolution told him to flee from the predator. He didn't have time for another mistake. She felt another scream growing in her throat. Time skipped. Her fingers were wrapped around Travin's neck. She'd been driving his skull into the corner of his desk. There was blood and scalp adhering to it. She pushed again, but he was heavy. There was no force behind her blow. She dropped him, and he fell to the floor, moaning. Moaning. Alive, she thought. The fear was back now, and the first presentiment of nausea. He was still alive. He couldn't still be alive when the crash came. He'd had a gun. She had to find what had happened to it. With fingers quickly growing numb, she pulled the little pistol from under him. Partners, she said, and fired two rounds into his head. Even over the gambling decks, they had to have heard it. She forced herself to the metal door and checked the lock. It was bolted. Unless someone had a key or cut through it, she was all right. She could rest. They wouldn't call the police. She hoped they wouldn't call the police. She slid to the floor. Sweat poured down her face and she began shaking. It seemed unfair that she'd lose time during the glorious and redemptive violence and have to fight to stay conscious through the physiological crash that followed. But she couldn't afford to sleep. Not here. She hugged her knees to her chest, sobbing not because she felt sorrow or fear, but because it was what her flesh did when she was coming down. Someone was knocking at the door, but the sound was uncertain, 
tentative. Just a few minutes and she'd be not all right, not that, but good enough. Just a few minutes. This was why glandular modification had never taken root in the military culture. A squad of soldiers without hesitation or doubt, so full of adrenaline they could tear their own muscles and not care, might win battles. But the same fighters curled up and mewling for five minutes afterwards would lose them again. It was a failed technology, but not an unavailable one. Enough money, enough favors to call in, and enough men of science who had been cured of conscience. It was easy. The easiest part of her plan, really. Her sobs intensified, shifted. The vomiting started. She knew from experience that it wouldn't last long. Between retching, she watched the bodybuilder's chest heaving for air through his ruined throat. But he was already gone. The smell of blood and puke thickened the air. Melba caught her breath, wiping the back of her hand against her lips. Her sinuses ached, and she didn't know if it was from the retching or the false glands that lay in that tender flesh. It didn't matter. The knocking at the door was more desperate now. She could make out the voice of the fat man by the door. No more time. She took the plastic envelope and shoved it in her pocket. Melba Alzbeta Co. crawled out the window and dropped to the street. She stank. There was blood on her hands. She was trembling with every step. The dim sunlight hurt, and she used the shadows of her hands to hide from it. In this part of Baltimore, a thousand people could see her and not have seen anything. The blanket of anonymity that the drug dealers and pimps and slavers arranged and enforced also protected her. She'd be okay. She'd made it. The last tool was in place, and all she had to do was get to her hotel, drink something to put her electrolytes back in balance, and sleep a little. And then, in a few days, report for duty on the Cerisier, and begin her long journey out to the edge of the solar system. Holding her spine straight, walking down the street, avoiding people's eyes, the dozen blocks to her room seemed longer, but she would do it. She would do whatever had to be done. She had been Clarissa Melpomene Mao. Her family had controlled the fates of cities, colonies, and planets, and now father sat in an anonymous prison, barred from speaking with anyone besides his lawyer, living out his days in disgrace. Her mother lived in a private compound on Luna, slowly medicating herself to death. The siblings, the ones that were still alive, had scattered to whatever shelter they could find from the hatred of two worlds. Once, her family's name had been written in starlight and blood, and now they'd been made to seem like villains. They'd been destroyed. She could make it right, though. It hadn't been easy, and it wouldn't be now. Some nights the sacrifices felt almost unbearable. But she would do it. She could make them all see the injustice in what James Holden had done to her family. She would expose him, humiliate him, and then she would destroy him. Chapter 4 Anna Anushka Volovodov Pastor Anna to her congregation on Europa, or Reverend Dr. Volovodov to people she didn't like, was sitting in the high-backed leather chair in her office when the wife-beater arrived. Nicholas, she said, trying to put as much warmth into her voice as she could manage. Thank you for taking the time. Nick, he said, then sat on one of the metal chairs in front of her desk. The metal chairs were lower than her own, which gave the room a vaguely courtroom-like setting, with her in the position of judge. It was why she never sat behind the desk when meeting with one of her parishioners. There was a comfortable couch along the back wall that was much better for personal conversations and counseling. But every now and then, the air of authority the big chair and heavy desk gave her was useful. Like now. Nick, she said then pressed her fingertips together and rested her chin on them. Sophia came to see me this morning. Nick shrugged, 
looking away like a schoolboy caught cheating on an exam. He was a tall man with the narrow, raw-boned look outer planets types got from hard physical labor. Anna knew he worked in surface construction. Here on Europa, that meant long days in a heavy vacuum suit. The people who did that job were as tough as nails. Nick had the attitude of a man who knew how he looked to others and used his air of physical competence to intimidate. Anna smiled at him. It won't work on me, she thought. She wouldn't tell me what happened at first, she said. It took a while to get her to lift her shirt. I didn't need to see the bruises. I knew they'd be there. But I did need pictures. When she said pictures, he leaned forward, his eyes narrowing and shifting from side to side. He probably thought it made him look tough, threatening. Instead, it made him look like a rodent. She fell, he started. In the kitchen, Anna finished for him. I know, she told me. And then she cried for a very long time. And then she told me you'd started hitting her again. Do you remember what I said would happen if you hit her again? Nick shifted in his chair, his long legs bouncing in front of him with nervous energy, his large, bony hands squeezing each other until the knuckles turned white. He wouldn't look directly at her. I didn't mean to, he said. It just happened. I could try the counseling again, I guess. Anna cleared her throat. And when he looked at her, she stared back until his legs stopped bouncing. No, too late. We gave you the anger counseling. The church paid for you to go right up until you quit. We did that part. That part is done. His expression went hard. Gonna give me one of those Jesus speeches? I'm sick right up to here. Nick held his hand under his chin with that shit. Sophia won't shut up about it. Pastor Anna says, you know what? Fuck what Pastor fucking Anna says. No, Anna said. No Jesus speeches. We're done with that, too. Then what are we doing here? Do you, she said, drawing the words out, remember what I said would happen if you hit her again? He shrugged again, then pushed up out of the chair and walked away, putting his back to her. While pretending to stare at one of the diplomas hanging on the wall, he said, Why should I give a fuck what you say, Pastor Anna? Anna breathed a quiet sigh of relief. Preparing for this meeting, she'd been unsure if she'd actually be able to do what was needed. She had a strong, visceral dislike of dishonesty, and she was about to destroy someone by lying. Or, if not lying, at least deceit. She justified it to herself by believing that the real purpose was to save someone. But she knew that wouldn't be enough. She'd pay for what she was about to do for a long time in sleepless nights and second-guessing. At least his anger would make it easy in the short term. Anna offered a quick prayer. Please help me save Sophia from this man who's going to kill her if I don't stop him. I said, Anna continued at Nick's back, that I would make sure you went to jail for it. Nick turned around at that, a rodent's low cunning back on his face. Oh, yeah? Yes. He moved toward her in the low-gravity version of a saunter. It was intended to look threatening, but to Anna, who'd grown up down the well on Earth, it just looked silly. She suppressed a laugh. Sophia won't say shit, Nick said walking up to her desk to stare down at her. She knows better. She fell down in the kitchen and she'll say it to the magistrates. That's true, Anna said, then opened the drawer of her desk and took the taser out. She held it in her lap where Nick couldn't see it. She's terrified of you, but I'm not. I don't care about you at all anymore. Is that right? Nick said, leaning forward trying to frighten her by pushing into her personal space. Anna leaned toward him. But Sophia is a member of this congregation, and she is my friend. Her children play with my daughter. I love them. And if I don't do something, you're going to kill her. Like what? I'm going to call the police and tell them you threatened me. 
She reached for her desk terminal with her left hand. It was a gesture meant to provoke. She might as well have said, Stop me. He gave her a feral grin and grabbed her arm, squeezing the bones in her wrist together hard enough to ache, hard enough to bruise. She pointed the taser at him with her other hand. What's that? Thank you, she said, for making this easier. She shot him, and he drifted to the ground, spasming. She felt a faint echo of the shock through his hand on her arm. It made her hair stand up. She pulled up her desk terminal and called Sophia. Sophia, honey, this is Pastor Anna. Please listen to me. The police are going to be coming to your house soon to ask about Nick. You need to show them the bruises. You need to tell them what happened. Nick will already be in jail. You'll be safe. But Nick confronted me when I asked him about what happened to you, and if you want to keep both of us safe, you need to be honest with them. After a few minutes of coaxing, she finally got Sophia to say she would talk to the police when they came. Nick was starting to move his arms and legs feebly. Don't move, Anna said to him. We're almost done here. She called the new Dolinsk Police Department. The Earth Corporation that had once had the contract was gone, but there still seemed to be police in the tunnels, so someone had picked it up. Maybe a belter company, or the OPA itself. It didn't matter. Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. Anushka Volovodov. I'm the pastor at St. John's United. I'm calling to report an assault on my person. A man named Nicholas Trubachov tried to attack me when I confronted him about beating his wife. No, he didn't hurt me, just a few bruises on my wrist. I had a taser in my desk and used it before he could do anything worse. Yes, I'd be happy to give a statement when you arrive. Thank you. Bitch. Nick spat trying to get off the floor on shaky limbs. Anna shot him again. Tough day? Nono asked when Anna finally got home. Nono was dandling their daughter on her lap, and little Nami gave a squeal and reached for Anna as soon as she closed the door behind her. How's my girl? Anna said, and dropped onto the couch next to them with a long sigh. Nono handed the baby to her, and Nami immediately set about undoing Anna's bun and trying to pull her hair. Anna squeezed her daughter and took a long sniff off the top of her head. The subtle and powerful scent Nami had given off when they'd first brought her home had faded, but a faint trace of it was still there. Scientists might claim that humans lacked the ability to interact at the pheromonal level, but Anna knew that was baloney. Whatever chemicals Nami had been pumping out as a newborn were the most powerful drug Anna had ever experienced. It made her want to have another child just to smell it again. Namono, no hair pulling, Nono said, trying to untwist Anna's long red hair from the baby's fist. Don't want to talk about it? she said to Anna. Nono's full name was Namono too, but she'd been Nono ever since her older twin had been able to speak. When Anna and Nono named their daughter after her, the name had somehow morphed into Nami. Most people probably had no idea the baby was named after one of her mothers. Eventually, yes, Anna said, but I need baby time first. She kissed Nami on her pug nose, the same broad, flat nose as Nono, just below Anna's own bright green eyes. She had Nono's coffee-colored skin but Anna's sharp chin. Anna could sit and stare at Nami for hours at a time, drinking in the astonishing melding of herself and the woman she loved. The experience was so powerful it bordered on the sacred. Nami stuck a lock of Anna's hair in her mouth, and Anna gently pulled it back out again, then blew a raspberry at her. No eating the hair, she said, and Nami laughed as though this was the funniest thing ever spoken. Nono took Anna's hand and held it tightly. They didn't move for a long time. Nono was cooking mushrooms and rice. She'd put some reconstituted onion in with it, and the strong scent filled the kitchen. Anna cut up apples at the table for a salad. The apples were small and not very crisp, not good for munching, but they'd be fine in a Waldorf with enough other flavors and textures to hide their imperfections and they were lucky to have them at all. 
The fruit was part of the first harvest to come off of Ganymede since the troubles there. Anna didn't like to think how hungry everyone would be without that moon's remarkable recovery. Nami will be asleep for at least another hour, Nono said. Are you ready to talk about your day? I hurt someone, and I lied to the police today, Anna said. She pushed too hard on the knife, and it slipped through the soft apple and scored her thumb. It wasn't deep enough to bleed. Well, okay, you'll have to explain that, Nono said, stirring a small bowl of broth into a rice and mushroom mix. No, I really can't. Some of what I know was told in confidence. This lie you told, it was to help someone? I think so. I hope so, Anna said, putting the last bits of apple in the bowl, then adding nuts and raisins. She stirred in the dressing. Nono stopped and turned to stare at her. What will you do if you get caught in the lie? Apologize, Anna said. Nono nodded, then turned back to the pot of rice. I turned on your desk terminal today to check my mail. You were still logged in. There was a message from the United Nations about the Secretary General's Humanitarian Committee project. All those people who they're sending out to the ring. Anna felt the sharp twist of guilt, of having been caught out at something. Shit, she said. She didn't like profanity, but some occasions demanded it. I haven't responded yet. It felt like another lie. We were going to talk about it before you decided? Of course, I... Nami is almost two. Nono said. We've been here two years. At some point, deciding to stay is deciding who Nami is going to be for the rest of her life. She has family in Russia and Uganda who've never seen her. If she stays here much longer, they never will. Nami was being fed the same drug cocktail all newborns in the outer planets received. It encouraged bone growth and fought off the worst of the effects low-gravity environments had on childhood development. But Nono was right. If they stayed much longer, Nami would begin to develop the long, thin frame that came with life out there, to life in low gravity. Anna would be sentencing her to a life outside her home world forever. Europa was always supposed to be temporary, Anna said. It was a good posting. I speak Russian, the congregation here is small and fragile. Nono turned off the stove and came to sit by her holding her hand on the table. For the first time, the faux wood tabletop looked cheap to Anna, tacky. She saw with startling clarity a future in which Nami never lived anywhere with real wood. It felt like a punch to the stomach. I'm not mad at you for coming here, Nono said. This was our dream, coming to places like this. But when you asked for the transfer out here, you were three months pregnant. I was so unlikely to be chosen, Anna said, and she could hear the defensiveness in her own voice. No, no, nodded. But you were chosen. And this thing for the UN, flying out to the ring as part of the Secretary General's advisory group, and our baby not even two. I think two hundred people signed up for the same slot, Anna said. They chose you. They want you to go. It was so unlikely. Anna started. They always choose you. No, no, interrupted. Because you are very special. Everyone can see it. I can see it. I saw it the first time I met you, giving your speech at the faith conference in Uganda. So nervous you dropped your notes, but I could have heard a pin drop in that auditorium. You couldn't help but shine. I stole you from your country, Anna said. It was what she always said when No-No brought up how they met. The Ugandan church could have used a young minister like you. I stole you, Nono said, like she always said, only this time it had a disconcertingly pro forma feel, as though it were an annoying ritual to be rushed through. But you always say this. There were so many others. I was so unlikely to be picked. It's true. It's the excuse you use. You've always been one to ask for forgiveness rather than permission. I won't go, Anna said, 
pushing her hand against her eyes and the tears that threatened there. Her elbow banged into the salad bowl, nearly knocking it off the table. I haven't said yes to them. I'll tell them it was a mistake. Anushka, Nanu said, squeezing her hand. You will go. But I am taking Nami back to Moscow with me. She can meet her grandparents, grow up in real gravity. Anna felt a white-hot spike of fear shoot through her stomach. You're leaving me? Nona's smile was a mix of exasperation and love. No, you're leaving us. For a little while. And when you come back, we will be waiting for you in Moscow. Your family. I will find us a nice place to live there. And Nami and I will make it a home. A place where you can be happy. But we will not go with you. Why? was all Anna could think to say. Nono got up and took two plates out of the cupboard, then dished up dinner and put it on the table. As she spooned Waldorf salad onto her plate, she said, I'm very afraid of that thing, the thing from Venus. I'm afraid of what it will mean for everything we care about. Humanity, God, our place in his universe. I'm afraid of what it will do, of course, but much more afraid of what it means. I am too, Anna said. It was the truth. In fact, it was part of the reason she'd asked to join the expedition when she heard it was being assembled. That same fear Nono was talking about. Anna wanted to look it in the eye. Give God a chance to help her understand it. Only then could she help anyone else with it. So, go find the answers, Nono said. Your family will be waiting for you when you get back. Thank you, Anna said, a little awed by what Nono was offering her. I think, Nono said, around a mouthful of mushrooms and rice, that maybe they will need people like you out there. Like me? People who don't ask permission. Chapter 5 Bull It's not in the budget... Michio Pa, executive officer of the behemoth, said. If she'd been an earther, she would have been a small woman, but a lifetime in microgravity had changed her the way it did all of them. Her arms, legs, and spine were all slightly elongated. Not thin, exactly. Just put together differently. Her head was larger than it would have been, and walking in the mild one-third G-thrust gravity, she stood as tall as Bull, but still seemed perversely childlike. It made him feel shorter than he was. We might need to adjust that, he said. When they put in the railgun, they were treating it like we had standard bulkheads and supports. The thing is, the Mormons were really trying to cut back on mass. They used a lot of ceramics and silicates where the metals usually go. Directional stuff. We fire around right now, we could shear the skin off. Pa walked down the long, curving corridor. The ceiling arched above her, white and easily twice as high as required, an aesthetic gesture by designers who hadn't known they were building a warship. Her stride a little wider than his, moving a little more comfortably in the low G and making him trot slightly to keep up. It was one of a thousand small ways Belters reminded Earthborn men and women that they didn't belong here. The XO shook her head. We came out here with an operational plan she said. If we start rewriting it every time we find an adjustment we'd like to make, we might as well not have bothered. Privately, Bull thought the same thing, but with a different inflection. If he'd been EXO, the operational plan would have been called a suggested guideline and only opened when he wanted a good laugh. Pa probably knew that. They reached the transit ramp, a softly sloping curve that led from the command and control levels at the head of the behemoth down to the massive drum of her body, from Pa's domain to his. Look, Pa said, her mouth twitching into a conciliatory smile. I'll make note of it for the refit, but I'm not going to start reallocating until I have an idea of the big picture. I mean, if I start pulling resources out of environmental control to cover this, and next week we find something that needs doing there, I'll just be pushing it back, right? Bo looked down the ramp. Soft lights recessed in the walls 
filled the air with a shadowless glow like a cheesy vision of heaven. Pa put her hand on his shoulder. She probably meant it to be sympathetic, but it felt like condescension. Yeah, okay, he said. It'll be all right, chief, she said, giving his trapezius a little squeeze. He nodded and walked down the ramp to the transfer platform. Her footsteps vanished behind him, submerging in the hum of air recyclers. Bull fought the urge to spit. The behemoth, back when she'd been the Nauvoo, had been built with a different life in mind. Most ships built for travel between the planets were like massive buildings, one floor above another with the thrust of the Epstein Drive at the bottom, providing the feeling of weight for whole voyages, apart from a few hours in the middle when the ship flipped around to change from acceleration to slowing down. But, Epstein or not, no ship could afford the power requirements or the heat generated by accelerating forever. Plus, Einstein had a thing or two to say about trying to move mass at relativistic speeds. The Nauvoo had been a generation ship, its journey measured in light years rather than light minutes. The percentage of its lifespan it could afford to spend under thrust was tiny by comparison. The command and control at the top of the ship, and the main engines and the associated parts of engineering at the bottom, could almost have belonged to a standard craft connected by a pair of kilometers-long shafts, one for a keel elevator to move people and another that gave access to the skin of the drum. Everything else was built to spin. For the centuries out to Tau Ceti, the body of the Nauvoo was meant to turn. Ten levels of environmental engineering, crew quarters, temples, schools, wastewater treatment, machine shops and forges, and at the center the vast interior. It would have been a piece of earth curved back on itself, soil and farmland and the illusion of open air with a central core of fusion-driven light and heat as gentle and warm as a summer day. All the rooms and corridors in the body section, the vast majority of the ship, were built with that long, slow, endless season in mind. The brief periods of acceleration and deceleration at the journey's ends hardly mattered, except that they were all the ship had now. Those places that should have been floors were all walls, and would be forever. The vast reinforced decks meant to carry a tiny world's worth of soil were the sides of a nearly unusable well. Someone slipping from the connection where the command and control levels met the great chamber could fall for nearly two full kilometers. Water systems built to take advantage of spin gravity and Coriolis stood on their sides, useless. The Nauvoo had been a marvel of human optimism and engineering, a statement of faith in the twinned powers of God and rigorous engineering. The behemoth was a salvage job with mass accelerators strapped to her side that would do more damage to herself than to an enemy. And Bull wasn't even allowed to fix the problems he knew about. He passed through the transfer station and down toward his office. The rooms and corridors here were all built aslant, waiting for the spin gravity that would never come. Stretches of bare metal and exposed ducting spoke of the rush to finish it, and then to salvage and remake it. Just walking past them left Bull depressed. Samara Rosenberg, longtime repair honcho on Tycho Station and now chief engineer on the behemoth, was waiting in the anteroom, talking with Bull's new deputy. Serge, his name was, and Bull wasn't sure what he thought of the man. Serge had been part of the OPA before that was a safe thing to be. He had the traditional split-circle insignia tattooed on his neck and wore it proudly. But like the rest of the security force, he'd been recruited by Michio Pa, and Bull didn't know exactly how things stood. He didn't trust the man yet, and distrust kept him from thinking all that well of him. Sam, on the other hand, he liked. Hey, Bull, she said as he dropped onto the foam core couch. Did you get a chance to talk to the XO? We talked, Bull said. What's the plan? Sam said, folding her arms in a way that meant she already knew. Bull ran a hand through his hair. When he'd been younger, his hair had been soft. 
Now it was like he could feel each strand individually against his fingertips. He pulled out his hand terminal and scrolled through. There were five reports waiting. Three routine security reports and two occasionals. An injury report and a larceny complaint. Nothing that couldn't wait. Hey, Serge, Bull said. You hold the fort here for an hour? Anything you want, Chief, Serge said with a grin. It was probably just paranoia that left Bull hearing contempt in the words. All right, then. Come on, Sam, I'll buy you a drink. In a coalition ship, back when there'd been an Earth-Mars coalition, there would have been a commissary. In the OPA, there was a bar and a couple mom-and-pop restaurants, along with a bare-bones, keep-you-alive supply of pre-packed meals that anyone could get for the asking. The bar was in a wide space that might have been meant for a gymnasium or a ball court, big enough for a hundred people, but Bull hadn't seen it with more than a couple dozen. The lighting had been swapped out for blue and white LEDs set behind sand-textured plastic. The tables were flat black and magnetized to hold the bulbs of beer and liquor to them. Nothing was served in glasses. Che, che the bartender called as Bull and Sam stepped through the door. Morgan, alles messer you. Maya, Sam replied, as comfortable with a mishmash belter patois as Bull was with Spanish or English. It was her native tongue. What are you having? Bull asked as he slid into one of the booths. He liked the ones where he could see the door. It was an old habit. I'm on duty, she said, sitting across from him. Bull leaned forward, catching the barkeep's eye, and held up two fingers. Lemonades, he said. Sasa, the barkeep replied, lifting a fist in the equivalent of a nod. Bull sat back and looked at Sam. She was a pretty enough woman, cute with pixie-cut hair and a quick smile. There had been about a minute when they'd first met that Bull had seriously considered whether he found her attractive. But if he'd seen the same calculus in her, they'd gotten past it. Didn't go so good? Sam asked. No. Sam lifted her eyebrows and leaned her elbows against the tabletop. He sketched out Pa's objections and rationale, and Sam's expression shifted slowly into a fatalistic amusement. Waiting for the refit's all well and good, she said when he was done. But if we try and test fire that bad boy, it's going to make an awfully big owie. You sure about that? Not a hundred percent, she said. High eighties, though. Bull sighed out a tired obscenity as the barkeep brought the bulbs of lemonade. They were about the size of Bull's bald fists, citrus yellow, with Malisha Patiechi printed on the side in bright red script. Maybe I should talk to her, Sam said. If it came straight from me... It came straight from you, probably it would work, he said. And they get to tell me no on everything from now on. Bull asked for it? Well, if it was important, he'd have sent the belter, right? You really think it's about you not getting born up here? Yeah. Well, you're probably right, Sam said. Sorry about that. Comes with the territory, Bo said, pretending that it didn't bother him. Sam plucked her lemonade off the table and took a long, thoughtful drink. The bulb clicked when the magnet re-adhered to the tabletop. I've got nothing against inners. Worked with a lot of you guys and didn't run into a higher percentage of assholes than when I'm dealing with belters. But I have to get that railgun's mounts reinforced. If there's a way to do that without undercutting you, I'm all for it. But if it's that or mess up the ship, Bull said, nodding. Give me a little time. I'll think of something. Start when you want to shoot someone and count back 18 days, Sam said. That's my deadline. Even if everyone's sober and working balls out, my crew can't get it done faster than that. I'll think of something, Bull said. The larceny complaint turned out to be from a repair and maintenance crew who couldn't agree how to store their tools. The injury report was a kid who got caught between a stretch of deck plating and someone driving a salvage mech. The cartilage in the kid's knee had gotten ground into about a dozen different bits of custard. The medic said a good, clean bone break would have been better. 
The injured man would be fine, but he was off active duty for at least a month while all his pieces got glued back together. The security reports were boilerplate, which either meant that things were going well or that the problems were getting glossed over. But probably they were going well. The trip out to the ring was a shakedown cruise, and that always meant there'd be a little honeymoon period when the crew were all figuratively standing shoulder to shoulder and taking on the work. Everyone expected there'd be problems, so there was a grace period when morale didn't start heading down. Chief security officer on an OPA ship was a half-assed kind of position, one part cop, one part efficiency expert, and pretty much all den mother to a crew of a thousand people with their own agendas and petty power struggles and opinions on how he should be doing his job better. A good security chief kept bullshit off the captain's plate as a full-time job. The worst part, though, was that all Bull's formal duties were focused inward, on the ship. Right now, a flotilla of Earth ships was burning out into the deep night. A matching force of Martian war vessels, the remnants of the Navy that had survived two let's-not-call-them wars, was burning out on a converging path. The behemoth was lumbering along, too, with a head start that came from being farther from the sun and the hobble of low-G acceleration to keep her slow. And all of it was focused on the ring. Reports would be filling Captain Ashford's queue, and as his XO, Pa would be reading them too. Bull had whatever scraps they let him have, or else the same mix of pablum and panic that filled the news feeds. Ashford and Pa would be in conference for most of their shifts, working over strategies and options and playing through scenarios for how things might go down when they reached the ring. Bull was going to worry about all the trivial stuff, so they didn't have to. And somehow, he was going to make the mission work, because Fred had asked him to. Hey, Chief, Serge said. Bo looked up from the terminal feed in his desk. Serge stood in the office doorway. The shift's up and I'm out. All right, Bo said. I still got some stuff. I can lock up when I'm done. Bien, Alice, Serge said with a nod. His light. Shuffling footsteps hissed through the front room. In the corridor, Gutman's daughter stroked his white beard, and Casimir said something that made them both chuckle. Corin lifted her chin to Serge as he stepped out. The door closed behind him. When he was sure he was alone, Bull pulled up the operational plan and started hunting. He didn't have authority to change it, but that didn't mean he couldn't change anything. Two hours later, when he was done, he turned off the screen and stood. The office was dark and colder than he liked it. The hum of the ventilation system comforted him. If it were ever completely silent, that would be the time to worry. He stretched, the vertebrae between his shoulder blades crunching like gravel. They would still be in the bar, most likely. Serge and Corin and Casimir, Macondo and Garza. So similar they could have been brothers. Jojo. His people. To the degree that they were his. He should go. Be with them. Make friends. He should go to his bunk. Come on, old man, he said. Time to get some rest. He had closed and locked the office door before Sam's voice came to him in his memory. Even if everyone's sober and working balls out, my crew can't get it done faster than that. He hesitated, his wide fingers over the keypad. It was late. He needed food and sleep and an hour or so checking in with a family aggregator his cousin had set up three years before to help everyone keep track of who was living where. He had a container of flash-frozen green chili from Hatch back on Earth waiting for him. It was all going to be there in the morning, and more besides. He didn't need to make more work for himself. No one was going to thank him for it. He went back in, turned his desk back on, and reread the injury report. Sam had a good laugh, one that came from the gut. It filled the machining bay, echoing off ceiling and walls until it sounded like there was a crowd of her. Two of the techs on the far side turned to look toward her, 
smiling without knowing what they were smiling about. Technical support? she said. You've got to be kidding. Railgun's a pretty technical piece of equipment, Bo said. It needs support. So you redefined what I do as technical support? Yeah. That's never going to fly, she said. Then get the job done quick, Bo said. Ashford will pull you up for disciplinary action, she said, the amusement fading but not quite gone yet. He has the right. But there's this other thing I wanted to talk about. You said something yesterday about how long it would take to do the job if everyone on your crew was sober. It was like turning off a light. The smile left Sam's face as if it had never been there. She crossed her arms. Tiny half-moon shapes dented in at the corners of her mouth, making her look older than she was. Bull nodded to her like she'd said something. You've got texts coming to work high, he said. Sometimes, she said, and then reluctantly. Some of it's alcohol, but mostly it's pixie dust to make up for lack of sleep. I got a report about a kid got his knee blown out. His blood was clean. But it doesn't look like anyone tested the guy who was driving the mech. Driver isn't even named in the report. Weird, eh? If you say so, she said. Bull looked down at his feet. The gray and black service utility boots. The spotless floor. I need a name, Sam. You know I can't do that, she said. These assholes are my crew. If I lose their respect, we're done here. I won't bust your guys unless they're dealing. You can't ask me to pick sides. And sorry for saying this, but you already don't have a lot of friends around here. You should be careful how you alienate people. Across the bay, the two technicians lifted a broken Mac onto a steel repair hoist. The murmur of their conversation was just the sound of words without the words themselves. If he couldn't hear them, Bull figured they couldn't hear him. Yeah? So, Sam? Bull? I'm going to need you to pick sides. He watched her vacillate. It only took a few seconds. Then she looked across the bay. The technicians had the mech open, pulling an electric motor out of its spine. It was smaller than a six-pack of beer and built to put out enough torque to rip steel. Not the sort of thing to play with drunk. Sam followed his gaze and his train of thought. For a guy who bends so many rules, you can be pretty fucking uncompromising. Strong believer in doing what needs to get done. It took her another minute, but she gave him a name. Chapter 6 Holden Uranus is really far away, Naomi said as they walked along the corridor to the docking bay. It was the third objection to the contract that she'd listed so far, and something in her voice told Holden there were a lot more points on her list. Under other circumstances, he would have thought she was just angry that he'd accepted the job. She was angry, but not just. Yes, he said, it is. And Titania is a shitty little moon with only one little science base on it, Naomi continued. Yes, we could buy Titania for what it cost these people to hire us to fly out there, Naomi said. Holden shrugged. This part of Ceres was a maze of cheap warehouse tunnels and even cheaper office space. The walls were the grungy off-white of spray-on insulation foam. Someone with a pocket knife and a few minutes to kill could reach the bedrock of Ceres without much effort. From the ratty look of the corridor, there were a lot of people with knives and idle time. A small forklift came down the corridor toward them with an electric whine and a constant high-pitched beep. Holden backed up against the wall and pulled Naomi to him to get her out of its way. The driver gave Holden a tiny nod of thanks as she drove by. So why are they hiring us? she asked, demanded. Because we're awesome? Titania has, what, a couple hundred people living at the science base? Naomi said. You know how they usually send supplies out there? They load them into a single-use braking rocket and fling them at Uranus's orbit with a railgun. Usually, Holden agreed. And the company? Outer Fringe Exports? If I was making a cheap, disposable shell corporation, you know what I'd call it? 
Outer fringe exports? Outer fringe exports, she said. Naomi stopped at the entry hatch that opened to the rental docking bay and the Rosinante. The sign overhead listed the present user, Outer Fringe Exports. Holden started to reach for the controls to cycle the pressure doors open, but Naomi put a hand on his arm. These people are hiring a warship to transport something to Titania, she said, lowering her voice as though afraid someone might be listening. How can they possibly afford to do that? Our cargo hold is the size of a hat box. We gave them a good rate, Holden said, trying for funny and failing. What would someone be sending to Titania that requires a fast, stealthy, and heavily armed ship? Have you asked what's in those crates we signed up to carry? No, Holden said. No, I haven't. And I normally would, but I'm trying really hard not to find out. Naomi frowned at him her face shifting between angry and concerned. Why? Holden pulled out his hand terminal and called up an orbital map of the solar system. See this? All the way on this edge? This is the ring. He scrolled the display to the other edge of the solar system. And this is Uranus. They are literally the two spots furthest from each other in the universe that have humans near them. And? Naomi said. Holden took a deep breath. He could feel a surge of the anxiety he always tried to deny leaping up in him, and he pushed it back down. And I know I don't talk about it much, but something really unpleasant and really big with a really high body count knows my name, and it's connected to the ring. Miller, Naomi said. The ring opened, and he knew when it happened. It was the closest thing to making sense he's done since... since he rose from the dead. The words didn't fit in his throat, and Naomi didn't make him say them. Her nod was enough. She understood. In an act of legendary cowardice, he was running away to the other side of the solar system to avoid Miller and the Ring and everything that had to do with them. If they had to transport black market human organs or drugs or sex bots or whatever was in those crates, he'd do it, because he was scared. Her eyes were unreadable. After all this time, she could still keep her thoughts out of her expression when she wanted to. Okay, Naomi said, and pushed the entry door open for him. At the outer edge of Ceres, where the spin gravity was greatest, Holden almost felt like he could have been on Luna or Mars. Loading gantries fed into the skin of the station like thick veins, waiting for the mechs to load in the cargo. Poorly patched scars marked the walls where accidents had marred them. The air smelled of coolant and the kind of cheap air filters that reminded Holden of urinal cakes. Amos lounged on a small electric power lift, his eyes closed. We get the job? We did, Naomi said. Amos cracked an eye open as they came near. A single frown line drew itself on his broad forehead. We happy about that? he asked. We're fine with it, Naomi said. Let's get the lift warmed up. Cargo's due in ten minutes, and we probably want to get it off station as quickly as we can without raising suspicion. There was a beauty in the efficiency that came from a crew that had flown together as long as they had. A fluidity and intimacy and grace that grew from long experience. Eight minutes after Holden and Naomi had come in, the Rossi was ready to take on cargo. Ten minutes later, nothing happened. Then twenty. Then an hour. Holden paced the gantry nearest the entry hatch with an uncomfortable tingling crawling up the back of his neck. You sure we got this job? Amos asked. These guys seemed really sketchy to me, Naomi said over the comm from her station in ops. I'd think we've been scammed, except we haven't given anyone our account numbers. We're on the clock here, boss, Alex said from the cockpit. These loading docks charge by the minute. Holden bit back his irritation and said, I'll call again. He pulled out his terminal and connected to the export company's office. Their messaging system responded as it had the last three times he'd requested a connection. 
He waited for the beep that would let him leave another message. Before he could, his display lit up with an incoming connection request from the same office. He switched to it. Holden here. This is a courtesy call, Captain Holden, the voice on the other end said. The video feed was the Outer Fringe Exports logo on a gray background. We're withdrawing the contract, and you might want to consider leaving that dock very, very soon. You can't back out now, Holden said, trying to keep his voice calm and professional against the rising panic he felt. We've signed the deal. We've got your deposit. It's non-refundable. Keep it, his caller said. But we consider your failure to inform us of your current situation as a prior breach. Situation? Holden thought. They couldn't know about Miller. He didn't think they could. I don't. The party that's tracking you left our offices about five minutes ago, so you should probably get off series in a hurry. Goodbye, Mr. Holden. Wait, Holden said. Who was there? What's going on? The call ended. Amos was rubbing his pale, stubble-covered scalp with both hands. He sighed and said, We got a problem, right? Yep. Be right back. Amos replied and climbed off the forklift. Alex, how long till we can clear this dock? Holden asked. He loped across the bay to the entry hatch. There didn't seem to be any way to lock it from his side. Why would there be? The bays were temporary rental spaces for loading and unloading cargo. No need for security. She's warmed up, Alex replied, not asking the obvious question. Holden was grateful for that. Give me ten to run the decoupling sequence. That should do it. Start now, Holden said, hurrying back toward the airlock. Leave the lock open to the last minute. Amos and I will be out here making sure no one interferes. Roger that, Cap, Alex replied and dropped the connection. Interferes, Naomi said. What's going on? Okay, why is Amos going out there with a shotgun? Those sketchy, scary gangster types we just signed on with? Yes. They just dropped us, and whatever scared them into doing it is coming here right now. I don't think guns are an overreaction. Amos ran down the ramp, holding his auto shotgun in his right hand and an assault rifle in his left. He tossed the rifle to Holden, then took up a cover position behind the forklift and aimed at the bay's entry hatch. Like Alex, he didn't ask why. Want me to come out? Naomi asked. No, but prepare to defend the ship if they get past me and Amos, Holden replied, then moved over to the forklift's recharging station. It was the only other cover in the otherwise empty bay. In a conversational tone, Amos said, Any idea what we're expecting here? Nope, Holden said. He clicked the rifle to auto-fire and felt a faint nausea rising in his throat. All right, then, Amos said cheerfully. Eight minutes, Naomi said from his hand terminal. Not a long time, but if they were trying to hold the bay under hostile fire, it would seem like an eternity. The entry warning light at the cargo bay entrance flashed yellow three times, and the hatch slid open. Don't shoot unless I do, Holden said quietly. Amos grunted back at him. A tall, blonde woman walked into the bay. She had an Earther's build, a video star's face, and couldn't have been more than twenty. When she saw the two guns pointed at her, she raised her hands and wiggled her fingers. Not armed, she said. Her cheeks dimpled into a grin. Holden tried to imagine why a supermodel would be looking for him. Hi, Amos said. He was grinning back at her. Who are you? Holden said, keeping his gun trained on her. My name's Edri. Are you James Holden? I can be, Amos said, if you want. She smiled. Amos smiled back, but his weapon was still in a carefully neutral position. What have we got down there? Naomi asked, her voice tense in his ear. Do we have a threat? I don't know yet, Holden said. You are, though, right? You're James Holden, Adri said, walking toward him. The assault rifle in his hands didn't seem to bother her at all. Up close, she smelled like strawberries and vanilla. Captain James Holden of the Rosinante? Yes, he said. 
She held out a slim, throwaway hand terminal. He took it automatically. The terminal displayed a picture of him, along with his name and his U.N. citizen and U.N. naval ID numbers. You've been served, she said. Sorry. It was nice meeting you, though. She turned back to the door and walked away. What the fuck? Amos said to no one, dropping the muzzle of his gun to the floor and rubbing his scalp again. Jim? Naomi said. Give me a minute. He paged through the summons, jumping past seven pages of legalese to get to the point. The Martians wanted their ship back. Official proceedings had been started against him in both Earth and Martian courts, challenging the salvage claim to the Rosinante. Only they were calling it the Tachi. The ship was under an order of impound, pending adjudication, effective immediately. His short conversation with Outer Fringe Export suddenly made a lot more sense. Cap, Alex said through the connection. I'm getting a red light on the docking clamp release. I'm putting a query in. Once I get that cleared, we can pop the cork. What's going on out there? Naomi asked. Are we still leaving? Holden took a long, deep breath, sighed, and said something obscene. The longest layover the Rosinante had taken since Holden and the others had gone independent had been five and a half weeks. The twelve days that the Rosie spent in lockup seemed longer. Naomi and Alex were on the ship most of the time, putting inquiries through to lawyers and legal aid societies around the system. With every letter and conversation, the consensus grew. Mars had been smart to begin legal proceedings in Earth courts as well as their own. Even if Holden and the Rossi slipped the leash at Ceres, all major ports would be denied them. They'd have to skulk from one gray market belter port to the next. Even if there was enough work, they might not be able to find supplies to keep them flying. If they took the case before a magistrate, they might or might not lose the ship, but it would be expensive to find out. Accounts that Holden had thought of as comfortably full suddenly looked an order of magnitude too small. Staying on Ceres Station made him antsy. Being on the Rossi left him sad. There had been any number of times in his travels on the Rossi that he'd imagined, even expected, it all to come to a tragic end. But those scenarios had involved firefights or alien monstrosities or desperate dives into some planetary atmosphere. He'd imagined with a sick thrill of dread what it would be like if Alex died or Amos or Naomi. He'd wondered whether the three of them would go on without him. He hadn't considered that the end might find all of them perfectly fine, that the Rosinante might be the one to go. Hope, when it came, was a documentary streamcast team from UN Public Broadcasting. Monica Stewart, the team lead, was an auburn-haired, freckled woman with a professionally sculpted beauty that made her seem vaguely familiar when he saw her on the screen of the pilot's deck. She hadn't come in person. How many people are we talking about? Holden asked. Four, she said. Two camera jockeys, my sound guy, and me. Holden ran a hand across eight days' worth of patchy beard. The sense of inevitability sat in his gut like a stone. To the ring, he said. To the ring, she agreed. We need to make it a hard burn to get there before the Martians, the Earth Flotilla, and the Behemoth and we'd like some measure of safety once we're out there, which the Rosinante would be able to give us. Naomi cleared her throat, and the documentarian shifted her attention to her. You're sure you can get the hold taken off the Rosi? Naomi asked. I am protected by the Freedom of Journalism Act. I have the right to the reasonable use of hired materials and personnel in the pursuit of a story. Otherwise, anyone could stop any story they didn't like by malicious use of injunctions like the one on the Rossi. I have a backdated contract that says I hired you a month ago, before I arrived at Ceres. I have a team of lawyers ten benches deep who can drown anyone that objects in enough paperwork to last a lifetime. So, we've been working for you all along, Holden said. Only if you want to get that docking lock rescinded. But it's more than just a ride I'm looking for. That's what makes it reasonable that I can't just hire a different ship. I knew there was a but, Holden said. I want to interview the crew, too. 
While there are a half dozen ships I could get for the trip out, yours is the one that comes with the survivors of Eros. Naomi looked across at him. Her eyes were carefully neutral. Was it better to be here, trapped on Ceres while the Rossi was pulled away from him by centimeters, or flying straight into the abyss with his crew? And the ring. I have to think about it, he said. I'll be in touch. I respect that, Monica said. But please don't take long. If we're not going with you, we've still got to go with someone. He dropped the connection. In the silence, the deck seemed larger than it was. This isn't coincidence, Holden said. We just happened to get locked down by Mars, and the only thing that can get us out of the docking clamps just happens to be heading for the ring? No way. We're being manipulated. Someone's planning this. It's him. Jim, it's him. It's Miller. It's not Miller. He can barely string together a coherent sentence, Naomi said. How is he going to engineer something like this? Holden leaned forward and the seat under him shifted. His head felt like it was stuffed with wool. If we leave, they can still take her away from us, he said. Once this story is done, we won't be in any better position than we are right now. Except that we wouldn't be locked on Ceres, Naomi said. And it's a long way out there, a long way back. A lot could change. That wasn't as comforting as you meant it to be. Naomi's smile was thin, but not bitter. Fair point, she said. The Rocinante hummed around them the systems running through their automatic maintenance checks, the air cycling gently through the ducts, the ship breathing and dreaming, their home at rest. Holden reached out a hand, lacing his fingers with Naomi's. We still have some money. We can take out a loan, she said. We could buy a different ship, not a good one, but it wouldn't have to be the end of it all. It would be, though. Probably. No choice, then, Holden said. Let's go to Nineveh. Monica and her team arrived in the early hours of the morning, loading a few small crates of equipment that they carried themselves. In person, Monica was thinner than she seemed on screen. Her camera crew were a sturdy earth woman named Okju and a brown-skinned Martian man who went by Clip. The cameras they carried looked like shoulder-mounted weapons, alloy castings that could telescope out to almost two meters or retract to fit around the tightest corner in the ship. The sound man was blind. He had a dusting of short white hair and opaque black glasses. His teeth were yellowed like old ivory, and his smile was gentle and humane. According to the paperwork, his name was Elio Casti, but for some reason the documentary team all called him Cohen. They assembled in the galley, Holden's four people and Monica's. He could see each group quietly considering the other. They'd be living in one another's laps for months, strangers trapped in a metal and ceramic box in the vast ocean of the vacuum. Holden cleared his throat. Welcome aboard, he said. Chapter 7 Melba if the Earth-Mars alliance hadn't collapsed, if there hadn't been a war, or two wars, depending on how the line between battles was marked, civilian ships like the Cerisier would have had no place in the Great Convoy. The ships lost at Ganymede and in the Belt, the skirmishes to control those asteroids best placed to push down a gravity well. Hundreds of ships had been lost, from massive engines of war like the Donager, the Agatha King, and the Hyperion, to countless small three- and four-person support ships. Nor, Melba knew, were those the only scars. Phobos, with its listening station, had become a thin, nearly invisible ring around Mars. Eros was gone. Phoebe had been subjected to a sustained nuclear hell and pushed into Saturn. The farms at Ganymede had collapsed. Venus had been used and abandoned by the alien protomolecule. Protogen and the Mao Kukowski Empire, 
once one of the great shipping and transport companies in the system, had been gutted, stolen, and sold. The Cerisier began her life as an exploration vessel. Now she was a flying tool shed. The bays of scientific equipment were machine shops now. What had once been sealed labs were stacked from deck to deck with the mundane necessities of environmental control networks. Scrubbers, ducting, sealants, and alarm arrays. She lumbered through the uncaring vacuum on the fusion plume of her Epstein drive. The crew of a hundred and six souls was made of a small elite of ship command, no more than a dozen all told, and a vast body of technicians, machinists, and industrial chemists. Once, Melba thought, this ship had been on the bleeding edge of human exploration. Once it had burned through the skies of Jovian moons, seeing things humanity had never seen before. Now it was the hand-servant of the government, discovering nothing more exotic than what had been flushed into the water reclamation tanks. The degradation gave Melba a sense of kinship with the ship's narrow halls and gray plastic ladders. Once, Clarissa Melpomene Mao had been the light of her school, popular and beautiful, and suffused with the power and influence of her father's name. Now her father was a numbered prisoner in a nameless prison, allowed only a few minutes of external connection every day, and those to his lawyer, not his wife or children. And she was Melba Ko, sleeping on a gel couch that smelled of someone else's body in a cabin smaller than a closet. She commanded a team of four electrochemical technicians, Stani, Ren, Bob, and Soledad. Stani and Bob were decades older than her. Soledad, three years younger, had been on two sixteen-month tours. Ren, her official second, was a belter and, like all belters, passionate about environmental control systems the way normal people were with sex or religion. She didn't ask how he'd ended up on an earth ship, and he didn't volunteer the information. She had known the months going out to the ring would be hard, but she'd misunderstood what the worst parts would be. She's a fucking bitch, right? Stani said. It was a private channel between him and Ren. If she'd been who she pretended to be, she wouldn't have been able to hear it. She doesn't know Dick. Ren grunted, neither defending her nor joining the attack. If you hadn't caught that brownout buffer wrong way on the Macedon last week, it would have been another cascade failure, see, no? Would have had to throw off the whole schedule to go back and fix it. Might have, Ren said. She was a level above them. The destroyer, Sung Eun, muttered around her. The crew was on a maintenance run. Scheduled, routine, predictable. They'd left the Cerisier ten hours earlier in one of the dozen transports that clung to the maintenance ship's skin. They would be here for another fifteen hours, changing out the high-yield scrubbers and checking the air supply continuity. The greatest danger, she learned, was condensation degrading the seals. It was the kind of detail she should have known. She pulled herself through the access shaft. Her tool kit hung heavy on her front in the full-G thrust gravity. She imagined it was what being pregnant would feel like. Unless something strange had happened, Soledad and Bob were sleeping in the boat. Ran and Stani were level down and going lower with every hour. They were expecting her to make the final inspection of their work, and it seemed they were expecting her to do it poorly. It was true, of course. She didn't know why a real electrochemical technician seeing her inexperience should embarrass her as deeply as it did. She'd read a few manuals, run through a few tutorials. All that mattered was that they think she was an authentic, semi-competent overseer. It didn't matter whether they respected her. They weren't her friends. She should have switched to the private frequencies for Soledad and Bob to be certain neither had woken unexpectedly and might come looking for her. This part of the plan was important. She couldn't let any of them find her. But somehow... She couldn't bring herself to shift away from Ran and Stani. She don't do anything, is all. Keeps to her cabin. Don't help on the project. She just come out the end, look up, look down, sign off, and go back to her cabin. True. The junction was hard to miss. 
The bulkhead was reinforced and clearly marked with bright orange safety warnings in five languages. She paused before it, her hands on her hips, and waited to feel some sense of accomplishment. And she did, only it wasn't as pure as she'd hoped. She looked up and down the passageway, though the chances of being interrupted here were minimal. The explosive was strapped against her belly, the heat of her skin keeping it malleable and bright green. As it cooled to ambient, the putty would harden and fade to gray. It surprised her again with its density. Pressing it along the seams of the junction, she felt like she was forming lead with her bare hands. The effort left her knuckles aching before she was halfway done. She'd budgeted half an hour, but it took her almost twice that. The detonator was a black dot, four millimeters across, with ten black ceramic contacts that pressed into the already stiffening putty. It looked like a tick. When she was done, she wiped her hands down with cleaning towelettes twice, making sure none of the explosive was caught under her fingernails or on her clothes. She'd expected to skip her inspection of just the one level, but Ren and Stani had made good time, and she took the lift down two levels instead. They were still talking, but not about her now. Stani was considering getting a crush on Soledad. In laconic, belt-inflected half-phrases, Ren was advising against it. Smart man, her second. The lift paused, and three soldiers got on it. All men. Melba pressed herself back to make room for them, and the nearest nodded his polite gratitude. His uniform identified him as Marcos. She nodded back, then stared hard at her feet, willing them not to look at her. Her uniform felt like a costume. Even though she knew better, it felt like they would see through her disguise if they looked too close, like her past was written on her skin. My name is Melba Coe, she thought. I've never been anyone else. The lift stopped at her level, and the three soldiers made way for her. She wondered, when the time came, whether Marcos would die. She had never been to her father's prison, and even if he'd been allowed visitors, the visit would have been in a prescribed room, monitored, transcribed. Any real human emotion would have been pressed out of it by the weight of official attention. She would never have been permitted to see the hallways he walked down or the cell where he slept, but after his incarceration by the United Nations, she'd researched prison design. Her room was three centimeters narrower, a centimeter and a half longer. The crash couch she slept in was gimbaled to allow for changes in acceleration, while his would be welded to the floor. She could squeeze out whenever she wanted to go to the gang showers or the mess. Her door locked from the inside, and there were no cameras or microphones in her room. In every way that mattered, she had more freedom than her father. That she likely spent as much time in isolation was a matter of choice for her, and that made all the difference. Tomorrow would be a fresh rotation out. Another ship, another round of maintenance that she could pretend to oversee. Tonight she could lie on her couch, dressed in the simple cotton underclothes that she'd bought as the kind of thing Melba would wear. Her hand terminal had fifteen tutorials in local memory and dozens more in the ship's shared storage. They covered everything from microorganic nutrient reclamation to coolant system specifications to management policies. She should have been reading them through. Or, if not that, at least she shouldn't have been reviewing her own secret files. On the screen, Jim Holden looked like a zealot. The composite was built from dozens of hours of broadcast footage of the man taken over the previous years, with weight given to the most recent images and stills. The software she'd used to make a perfect visual simulacrum of the man cost more than her Melba persona had. The fake Holden had to be good enough to fool both people and computers, at least for a little while. On the screen, his brown eyes squinted with an idiot's earnestness. His jaw had the first presentiment of jowls, only half hidden by the microgravity. The smarmy half-smile told her everything she needed to know about the man who had destroyed her family. This is Captain James Holden, he said. What you've just seen 
is a demonstration of the danger you are in. My associates have placed similar devices on every ship presently in proximity to the ring. You will all stand down as I am assuming sole and absolute control over the ring in the name of the Outer Planets Alliance. Any ship that approaches the ring without my personal permission will be destroyed without... She paused it, freezing her small, artificial Holden in mid-gesture. Her fingertip traced the outline of his shoulder across his cheek and then stabbed at his eyes. She wished now that she'd picked a more inflammatory script. On Earth, making her preparations, it had seemed enough to have him take unilateral control of the ring. Now, each time she watched it, it seemed tamer. Killing Holden would have been easier. Assassinations were cheap by comparison. But she knew enough about image control and social dynamics to see where it would have led. Martyrdom. Canonization. Love. A host of conspiracy theories that implicated anyone from the OPA to her father. That was precisely not the point. Holden had to be humiliated in a way that passed backward in time. Someone coming to his legacy had to be able to look back at all the things Holden had done, all the pronouncements he'd given, all the high-handed, self-righteous decisions made on behalf of others while never leaving his control, and see that, of course, it had all led to this. His name put in with the great traitors, con men, and self-aggrandizing egomaniacs of history. When she was done, everything Holden had touched would be tainted by association including the destruction of her family, her father. Somewhere deep in the structure of the Cerisier, one of the navigators started a minor correction burn and gravity shifted a half a degree. The couch moved under her, and she tried not to notice it. She preferred the times when she could pretend that she was in a gravity well to the little reminders that she was the puppet of acceleration and inertia. Her hand terminal chimed once announcing the arrival of a message. To anyone who didn't look carefully, it would seem like just another advertisement. An investment opportunity she would be a fool to ignore, with a video presentation attached that would seem like corrupted data to anyone who didn't have the decryption key. She sat up, swinging her legs over the edge of the couch and leaned close to the hand terminal. The man who appeared on her screen wore black glasses dark enough to be opaque. His hair was cropped close to his skull, but she could see from the way it moved that he was under heavy burn. The sound man cleared his throat. The package is delivered and ready for testing. I'd appreciate the balance transfer as soon as you've confirmed. I've got some bills coming due, and I'm a little under the wire. Something in the background hissed, and a distant voice started laughing. A woman. The file ended. She replayed it four more times. Her heart was racing and her fingers felt like little electric currents were running through them. She'd need to confirm, of course, but this was the last, most dangerous step. The Rocinante had been cutting-edge military hardware when it had fallen into Holden's hands. There could also have been any number of changes made to the security systems in the years since. She set up a simple remote connection looped through a disposable commercial account on Ceres Station. It might take days for the Rosinante's acknowledgement to come back to her, saying that the back door was installed and functioning, that the ship was hers. But if it did... It was the last piece. Everything in place. A sense of almost religious well-being washed over her. The thin room with its scratched walls and two bright LEDs had never seemed so benign. She levered herself up out of the couch. She wanted to celebrate, though, of course, there was no one she could tell. Talk to might be enough. The halls of the Cerisier were so narrow that it was impossible to walk abreast or to pass someone coming the opposite way without turning sideways. The mess would fit twenty people sitting with their hips touching. The nearest thing to an open area was the fitness center off the medical bay. The treadmills and exercise machines required enough room that no one would be caught in the joints and belts. Safety regulations made it the widest, freest air in the ship, and so a good place to be around people. 
Of her team, only Rand was present. In the usual microgravity, he would probably have been neck deep in a tank of resistance gel. With a full G burn, he was on a regular treadmill. His pale skin was bright with sweat, his carrot orange hair pulled back in a frizzed ponytail. It was strange watching him. His large head was made larger by his hair, and the thinness of his body made him seem more like something from a children's program than an actual man. He nodded to her as she came in. Wren, she said, walking to the front of his machine. She felt the gazes of other crewmen on her, but on the Cerisier she didn't feel as exposed. Or maybe it was the good news that carried her. Do you have a minute? Chief, he said instead of yes, but he thumbed down the treadmill to a cool-down walk. Que ça? I heard some of the things Stani was saying about me, she said. Ren's expression closed down. I just wanted... She frowned, looked down, and then gave in to the impulse welling up in her. He's right, she said. I'm in over my head with this job. I got it because of some political favors. I'm not qualified to do what I'm doing. He blinked rapidly. He shot a glance at her, checking to see if anyone had overheard them. She didn't particularly care, but she thought it was sweet that he did. Not so bad, you, he said. I mean, little off here, little off there. But I've been under worse. I need help, she said. To do all the work the way it should be done. I need help. I need someone I can trust. Someone I can count on. Ran nodded, but his forehead roughened. He blew out his breath and stepped off the treadmill. I want to get the work done right, she said, not miss anything. And I want the team to respect me. Okay, sure. I know you should have had this job. Ren blew out another breath, his cheeks ballooning. It was more expressive than she'd ever seen him before. He leaned against the wall. When he met her gaze, it was like he was seeing her for the first time. Appreciate you saying it, Chief, but we're both of us outsiders here he said. Stick together, bien? Good, she said, leaning against the wall next to him. So, the brownout buffers? What did I get wrong? Ren sighed. The buffers are smart, but the design's stupid, he said. They talk to each other, so they're also a separate network, yeah? The thing is, you put one in the wrong way? Works okay, but next time it resets. The signal down the line looks wrong. Triggers a diagnostic run and the next one down and then the next one down. Whole network starts blinking like Christmas. Too many errors on the network and it fails closed. Takes down the whole grid. And then you got us going through checking each one by hand. The flashlights and the supervisor chewing our nuts. That's... That can't be right, she said. Seriously? It could have shut down the grid? I know, right? Wren said, smiling. And all it would take is change the design so it don't fit in if you got it wrong. But they never do. A lot of what we do is like that, boss. We try to catch the little ones before they get big. Some things, you get them wrong, it's nothing. Some things, and it's a big mess. The words felt like a church bell being struck. They resonated. She was that fault, that error. She didn't know what she was doing, not really, and she'd get away with it. She'd pass, until she didn't, and then everything would fall apart. Her throat felt tighter. She almost wished she hadn't said anything. She was a brownout buffer pointed the wrong way. A flaw that was easy to overlook, with the potential to wreck everything. For the others, don't take them harsh. Blowing off steam, mostly. Not you so much as it's anything. Fear-biting. Fear? Sure, he said. Everyone on this boat's scared dry. Try not to show it, do the work. But we're all getting nightmares. Natural, right? What are they afraid of? she asked. Behind her, the door cycled open and shut. A man said something in a language she didn't know. Wren tilted his head, and she had the sick, sinking feeling that she'd done something wrong.
she hadn't acted normal, and she didn't know what her misstep was. Ring, he said at last. It's what killed Eros. Could have killed Mars. All that weird stuff it did on Venus, no one knows what it was. Dead at that slingshot kid who went through? Half everyone thinks we should be pitching nukes at it. Other half thinks we'd only piss it off. We're going out as deep as anyone ever has just so we can look in the devil's eye. And Stani and Sole and Bob? They're all scared as shit of what we see in it. Me too. Ah, she said. All right, I understand that. Ren tried on a smile. You? It don't scare you? It's not something I think about. Chapter 8 Anna Nami and Nono left for Earth a week before Anna's shuttle. Those last days living alone in those rooms, knowing that she would never be back, that they would never be back, was like a gentle presentiment of death, profoundly melancholy and, shamefully, a little exhilarating. The shuttle from Europa was one of the last to join the flotilla, and it meant eighteen hours of hard burn. By the time she set foot on the deck of the UNN Thomas Prince, all she wanted was a bunk and twelve hours sleep. The young yeoman who'd been sent to greet and escort her had other plans, though, and the effort it would have taken to be rude about it was more than she could muster. The Prince is a Xerxes-class battleship, or what we sometimes refer to as a third-generation dreadnought, he said, gesturing to the white ceramic overgel of the hangar's interior walls. The shuttle she'd arrived on nestled in its bay, looking small under the cathedral huge arch. We call it a third-generation battleship because it is the third redesign since the build-up during the first Earth-Mars conflict. Not that it had been much of a conflict, Anna thought. The Martians had made noises about independence. The UN had built a lot of ships. Mars had built a few. And then Solomon Epstein had gone from being a Martian yachting hobbyist to the inventor of the first fusion drive that solved the heat buildup and rapid fuel consumption problems of constant thrust. Suddenly, Mars had a few ships that went really, really fast. They'd said, Hey, we're about to go colonize the rest of the solar system. Want to stay mad at us, or want to come with? The UN had made the sensible choice, and most people would agree. Giving up Mars in exchange for half of the solar system had probably been a pretty good deal. It didn't mean that both sides hadn't kept on designing new ways to kill each other, just in case. Just over half a kilometer long and two hundred meters wide at its broadest point, the yeoman was saying. Impressive, Anna replied trying to bring her wandering attention back. The yeoman pulled her luggage on a small rolling cart to a bank of elevator lifts. These elevators run the length of the ship, he said as he punched a button on the control panel. We call them the keel elevators. Because they run along the belly of the ship? Anna said. Yes, that's what the bottom of seagoing vessels was called. And space-based navies have kept the nomenclature. Anna nodded. His enthusiasm was exhausting and charming at the same time. He wanted to impress her, so she resolved to be impressed. It was a small enough thing to give someone. Of course, the belly of the ship is largely an arbitrary distinction, he continued as the elevator climbed. Because we use thrust gravity, the deck is always in the direction thrust is coming from, the aft of the ship. Up is always away from the engines. There's not really much to distinguish the other four directions from each other. Some smaller ships can land on planetary surfaces, and in those ships the belly of the ship contains landing gear and thrusters for liftoff. I imagine the Prince is too large for that, Anna said. By quite a lot, actually. But our shuttles and corvettes are capable of surface landings, though it doesn't happen very often. The elevator doors opened with another ding, and the yeoman pushed her luggage out into the hall. After we drop off your baggage at your stateroom, we can continue the tour. Yeoman? Anna said. Is that the right way to address you? Certainly. Or Mr. Ichigawa. Or even Jin, since you're a civilian. 
Jin, Anna continued, would it be all right if I just stayed in my room for a while? I'm very tired. He stopped pulling her baggage and blinked twice. But the captain said all of the VIP guests should get a complete tour, including the bridge, which is usually off-limits to non-duty personnel. Anna put a hand on the boy's arm. I understand that's quite a privilege, but I'd rather see it when I can keep my eyes open. You understand, don't you? She gave his arm a squeeze and smiled her best smile at him. Certainly, he said, smiling back. Come this way, ma'am. Looking around her, Anna wasn't sure if she actually wanted to see the rest of the ship. Every corridor looked the same. Slick, gray material with something spongy underneath covered most walls. Anna supposed it was some sort of protective surface to keep sailors from injury if they banged into it during maneuvers. And anything that wasn't gray fabric was gray metal. The things that would be impressive to most people about the ship would be its various mechanisms for killing other ships. Those were the parts of the ship she was least interested in. Is that okay? Ichigawa said after a moment. Anna had no idea what he was talking about. Calling you ma'am, I mean. Some of the VIPs have titles, pastor or reverend or minister. I don't want to offend. Well, if I didn't like you, I'd ask you to call me Reverend Doctor. But I do like you very much, so please don't, she said. Thank you, Jin said, and the back of his neck blushed. And if you were a member of my congregation, I'd have you call me Pastor Anna. Buddhist? Only when I'm at my grandmother's house, Jin said with a wink. The rest of the time, I'm a Navy man. Is that a religion now? Anna asked with a laugh. The Navy thinks so. Okay, she laughed again. So why don't you just call me Anna? Yes, ma'am, Jin said. He stopped at a gray door marked OQ-297-11 and handed her a small metal card. This is your room. Just having the card on you unlocks the door. It will stay locked when you're inside unless you press the yellow button on the wall panel. Sounds very safe, Anna said, taking the key from Jin and shaking his hand. This is the battleship Thomas Prince, ma'am. It's the safest place in the solar system. Her stateroom was three meters wide by four meters long. Luxurious by Navy standards, normal for a poor European, coffin-like to an Earther. Anna felt a brief moment of vertigo as the two different Annas she'd been reacted to the space in three different ways. She'd felt the same sense of disconnection when she'd first boarded the Prince and felt the full gravity pressing her down. The Earther she'd been most of her life felt euphoric, as for the first time in years her weight felt right. The Europan in her just felt tired, drained by the excessive pull on her bones. She wondered how long it would take Nono to get her Earth legs back, how long it would take before Nami could walk there. They were both spending the entire trip back pumped full of muscle and bone growth stimulators, but drugs can only take a person so far. There would still be the agonizing weeks or months as their bodies adapted to the new gravity. Anna could almost see little Nami struggling to get up onto her hands and knees like she did on Europa. Could almost hear her cries of frustration while she built up the strength to move on her own again. She was such a determined little thing. It would infuriate her to lose the hard-won physical skills she'd developed over the last two years. Thinking about it made Anna's chest ache, just behind her breastbone. She tapped the shiny black surface of the console in her room, and the room's terminal came on. She spent a moment learning the user interface. It was limited to browsing the ship's library and to sending and receiving text or audio-video messages. She tapped the button to record a message and said, Hi, Nono. -no. Hi, Nami. She waved at the camera. I'm on the ship, and we're on our way. I... She stopped and looked around the room at the sterile gray walls and Spartan bed. She grabbed a pillow off it and turned back to the camera. I miss you both already. She hugged the pillow to her chest tight. This is you. This is both of you. She turned the recording off before she got teary.
She was washing her face when the console buzzed a new message alert. Even though it didn't seem possible Nami could have gotten the message and replied already, her heart gave a little leap. She rushed over and opened the message. It was a simple text message reminding her of the VIP meet-and-greet in the officer's mess at 1900 hours. The clock said it was currently 1300. Anna tapped the button to RSVP to the event, and then climbed under the covers of her bed with her clothes on, and cried herself to sleep. Reverend Dr. Volovodov, a booming male voice said as soon as she walked into the officer's mess. The room was laid out for a party, with tables covered in food ringing the room and a hundred or more people talking in loose clumps in the center. In one corner, an ad hoc bar with four bartenders was doing brisk business. A tall, dark-skinned man with perfectly coiffed white hair and an immaculate gray suit walked out of the crowd like Venus rising from the waves. Anna wondered how he managed the effect. He reached out and took her hand with his. I'm so happy to have you with us. I've heard so much about the powerful work you're doing on Europa, and I don't see how the Methodist World Council could have chosen anyone else for this important trip. Anna shook his hand, then carefully extricated herself from his grasp. Dr. Hector Cortez, Father Hank on his live streamcasts that went out to over a hundred million people each week, and close personal friend and spiritual advisor to the Secretary General himself. She couldn't imagine how he knew anything about her. Her tiny congregation of less than a hundred people on Europa wouldn't even be a rounding error to his solar system-wide audience. She found herself caught between feeling flattered, uncomfortable, and vaguely suspicious. Dr. Cortez, Anna said, so nice to meet you. I've seen your show before, of course. Of course, he said, smiling vaguely, and already looking around the room for someone else to talk to. She had the sense that he'd come to greet her less out of the pleasure of her arrival than as a chance to extricate himself from whatever conversation he'd been having before, and she didn't know whether to be relieved or insulted. She settled on amused. Like a smaller object dragged into some larger gravity well, an elderly man in formal Roman Catholic garb pulled away from the central crowd and drifted in Dr. Cortez's direction. She started to introduce herself when Dr. Cortez cut in with that booming voice and said, Father Michel, say hello to my friend Reverend Dr. Anushka Volovodov, a worker for God's glory with the Europa Congregation of Methodists. Reverend Volovodov, the Catholic man said, I'm Father Michel, with the Archdiocese of Rome. Oh, very nice to meet, Anna started. Don't let him fool you with that humble old country priest act. Cortez boomed over the top of her. He's a bishop on the short list for cardinal. Congratulations, Anna said. Oh, it's nothing, all exaggeration and smoke, the old man beamed. Nothing will happen until it fits with God's plan. You wouldn't be here if that were true, Cortez said. The bishop chuckled. A woman in an expensive blue dress followed one of the uniformed waiters with his tray of champagne. She and Father Michel reached for a glass at the same moment. Anna smiled a no at the offered champagne, and the waiter vanished into the crowd at the center of the room. Please, the woman said to Anna, don't leave me to drink alone with a Catholic. My liver can't take it. Thank you, but what about you, Hank? I've heard you can put down a few drinks. She punctuated this with a swig from her glass. Cortez's smile could have meant anything. I'm Anna, Anna said, reaching out to shake the woman's hand. I love your dress. Thank you. I am Mrs. Robert Fagan, the woman replied with mock formality. Tilly, if you aren't asking for money. Nice to meet you, Tilly, Anna said. I'm sorry, but I don't drink. God save me from temperance, Tilly said. You haven't seen a party till you get a group of Anglicans and Catholics trying to beat each other to the bottom of a bottle. Now, that's not nice, Mrs. Fagan, Father Michel said. I've never met an Anglican that could keep up with me. Hank, why is Esteban letting you out of his sight? It took Anna a moment to realize that Tilly was talking about the Secretary General of the United Nations. 
Cortez shook his head and feigned a wounded look without losing his ever-present toothy grin. Mrs. Fagan, I'm humbled by the Secretary General's faith and trust in me as we speed off toward the single most important event in human history since the death of our Lord. Tilly snorted. You mean his faith and trust in the hundred million voters you can throw his way in June? Ma'am, Cortez said, turning to look at Tilly's face for the first time. His grin never changed, but something chilled the air between them. Maybe you've had a bit too much champagne. Oh, not nearly enough. Father Michel charged in to the rescue, taking Tilly's hand and saying, I think our dear Secretary General is probably even more grateful for your husband's many campaign contributions, though that does make this the most expensive cruise in history for you. Tilly snorted and looked away from Cortez. Robert can fucking afford it. The obscenity created an awkward silence for a few moments and Father Michel gave Anna an apologetic smile. She smiled back, so far out of her depth that she'd abandoned trying to keep up. What's he getting with them, I wonder, Tilly said, pointing attention at anyone other than herself. These artists and writers and actors, how many votes does a performance artist bring to the table? Do they even vote? It's symbolic, Father Michel said, his face taking on a well-practiced expression of thoughtfulness. We are all of humanity coming together to explore the great question of our time. The secular and the divine come to stand together before that overwhelming mystery. What is the ring? Nice, Tilly said. Rehearsal pays off. Thank you, the bishop said. What is the ring? Anna said with a frown. It's a wormhole gate. There's no question, right? We've been talking about these on a theoretical basis for centuries. They look just like this. Something goes through it, and the place on the other side isn't here. We get the transmission signals bleeding back out and attenuating. It's a wormhole. That's certainly a possibility, Father Michel said. Tilly smiled at the sourness in his voice. How do you see our mission here, Anna? It isn't what it is that's at issue, she said, glad to be back in a conversation she understood. It's what it means. This changes everything. And even if it's something wonderful, it'll be displacing. People will need to understand how to fit this in with their understanding of the universe, of what this means about God, what this new thing tells us about him. By being here, we can offer comfort that we couldn't otherwise. I agree, Cortez said. Our work is to help people come to grips with the great mysteries, and this one's a doozy. No, Anna started. Explaining isn't what I... Play your cards right, and it might get Esteban another four years, Tilly said over the top of her. Then we can call it a miracle. Cortez grinned a white grin at someone across the room. A man in a small group of men and women in loose orange robes raised his hand, waving at them. Can you believe those people? Tilly asked. I believe those are delegates from the Church of Humanity Ascendant, Anna said. Tilly shook her head. Humanity Ascendant? I mean, really? Let's just make up our own religion and pretend we're the gods. Careful, Cortez said. They're not the only ones. Seeing Anna's discomfort, Father Michel attempted to rescue her. Dr. Volovodov, I know the elder of that group. Wonderful woman. I'd love to introduce you. If you would all excuse us. Excuse me, Anna started, then stopped when the room suddenly went silent. Father Michel and Cortez were both looking towards something at the center of the gathering near the bar, and Anna moved around Tilly to get a better view. It was hard to see at first, because everyone in the room was moving away toward the walls, but eventually, a young man dressed in a hideous bright red suit was revealed. He'd poured something all over himself. His hair and the shoulders of his jacket were dripping a clear fluid onto the floor. A strong alcohol scent filled the room. This is for the People's Ashton Collective, the young man yelled out in a voice that trembled with fear and excitement. Free Etienne Barbara and free the Afghan people. Oh, dear God. Father Michel said, he's going to... Anna never saw what started the fire, 
but suddenly the young man was engulfed in flames. Tilly screamed. Anna's shocked brain only registered annoyance at the sound. Really, when had someone screaming ever solved a problem? She recognized her fixation on this irritation as her own way of avoiding the horror in front of her, but only in a distant and dreamy sort of way. She was about to tell Tilly to just shut up when the fire suppression system activated and five streams of foam shot out of hidden turrets in the walls and ceiling. The fiery man was covered in white bubbles and extinguished in seconds. The smell of burnt hair competed with the alcohol stench for dominance. Before anyone else could react, naval personnel were streaming into the room. Stern-faced young men and women with holstered sidearms calmly told everyone to remain still while emergency crews worked. Medical technicians came in and scraped foam off the would-be suicide. He seemed more surprised than hurt. They handcuffed him and loaded him onto a stretcher. He was out of the room in less than a minute. Once he was gone, the people with guns seemed to relax a little. They certainly put him out fast, Anna said to the armed young woman closest to her. That's good. The young woman, looking hardly older than a schoolgirl, laughed. This is a battleship, ma'am. Our fire suppression systems are robust. Cortez had darted across the room and was speaking to the ranking naval officer in a booming voice. He sounded upset. Father Michel seemed to be quietly praying, and Anna felt a strong urge to join him. Well, Tilly said, waving at the room with her empty champagne glass. Her face was pale apart from two bright red dots on her cheeks. Maybe this trip won't be boring after all. Chapter 9 Bull It would have gone faster if Bull had asked for more help, but until he knew who was doing what, he didn't want to trust too many people. Or anyone. A thousand people in the crew, more or less, made things a little muddier than they would have been in some ways. With a crew that big, the security chief could look for things like crew members from unlikely departments meeting up at odd times. Deviations from the pattern that every ship had. Since this was the shakedown voyage, the behemoth didn't have any patterns yet. It was still in a state of chaos, crew and ship getting to know one another, making decisions, forming habits and customs and culture. Nothing was normal yet, and so nothing was strange. On the other hand, it was only a thousand people. Every ship had a black economy. Someone on the behemoth would be trading sex for favors. Someone would run a card game or set up a pachinko parlor or start a little protection racket. People would be bribed to do things or not do things. It was what happened when you put people together. Bull's job wasn't to stamp it all out. His job was to keep it at a level that kept the ship moving and safe and to set boundaries. Alexei Myerson Freud was a nutritionist. He'd worked mid-level jobs on Tycho, mostly in the yeast vats, tuning the bioengineering to produce the right mix of chemicals, minerals, and salts for keeping humans alive. He'd been married twice, had a kid he hadn't seen in five years, was part of a network wargaming group that simulated ancient battles pitting themselves against the great generals of history. He was eight years younger than Bull. He had mouse-ass brown hair, an awkward smile, and a side business selling a combination stimulant and euphoric the belters called pixie dust. Bull had worked it all until he was certain. And even once he knew, he'd waited a few days, not long, just enough that he could follow Alexei around on the security system. He needed to make sure there wasn't a bigger fish above him, a partner who was keeping a lower profile or a connection to Bull's own team, or else, God forbid, Ashford's. There wasn't. The truth was, he didn't want to do it. He knew what had to happen, and it was always easier to put it off for another fifteen minutes or until after lunch or until tomorrow. Only every time he did, it meant someone else was going on shift stoned, maybe making a stupid mistake, breaking the ship, getting injured, or getting killed. The moment came in the middle of second shift. Bull turned down his console stood up, 
took a couple of guns from the armory and made a connection on his hand terminal. Serge? Boss? I'm gonna need you and one other. We're going to go bust a drug dealer. The silence on the line sounded like surprise. Bo waited. This would tell him something, too. You got it, Serge said. Be right there. Serge came into the office ten minutes later with another security grunt, a broad-shouldered, grim-faced woman named Corin. She was a good choice. Bo made a mental note in Serge's favor and handed them both guns. Corin checked the magazine, holstered it, and waited. Serge flipped his from hand to hand, judging the weight and feel, then shrugged. What's the plan? he asked. Come with me, Bo said. Someone tries to keep me from doing my job, warn them once, then shoot them. Straightforward? Serge said, and there was a sense of approval in the word. The food processing complex was deep inside the ship, close to the massive, empty inner surface. In the long voyage to the stars, it would have been next to the farmlands of the small internal world of the Nauvoo. In the behemoth, it wasn't anywhere in particular. What had been logical became dumb, and all it took was changing the context. Bull drove them, the little electric carts foam wheels buzzing against the ramps. In the halls and corridors, people stopped, watched, some stared. It said something that three armed security agents traveling together stood out. Bull wasn't sure it was something good. Near the vats, the air smelled different. There were more volatiles and unfiltered particulates. The processing complex itself was a network of tubs and vats and distilling columns. Half of the place was shut down, the extra capacity mothballed and waiting for a larger population to feed, or else waiting to be torn out. They found Alexei knee-deep in one of the water treatment baths, orange rubber waders clinging to his legs and his hands full of thick green kelp. Bull pointed to him and then to the catwalk on which he, Serge, and Corin stood. There might have been a flicker of unease in Alexei's expression. It was hard to say. I can't get out right now, the dealer said, holding up a broad, wet leaf. I'm in the middle of something. Bull nodded and turned to Serge. You two stay here. Don't let him go anywhere. I'll be right back. Sasa, boss, Serge said. The locker room was down a ladder and through a hall. The bank of pea-green private storage bins had been pulled out of the wall, turned ninety degrees, and put back in to match the direction of thrust. Blobs and filaments of caulk still showed at the edges where it failed to sit quite flush. Two other water-processing techs were sitting on the bench in different levels of undress, talking and flirting. They went silent when Bull walked in. He smiled at them, nodded, and walked past to a locker on the far end. When he reached it, he turned back. This belong to anyone? he asked. The two techs looked at each other. No, sir, the woman said, pulling her jumpsuit a little more closed. Most of these are just empty. Okay, then, Bull said. He thumbed in his override code and pulled the door open. The duffel bag inside was green and gray, the kind of thing he'd have put his clothes in when he went to work out. He ran a finger along the seal. About a hundred vials of yellow-white powder, a little more grainy than powdered milk. He closed the bag, put it on his shoulder. Is there a problem? The male tech asked. His voice was tentative, but not scared. Curious more, excited. Well, God loved rubberneckers, and so did Bull. Myers and Freud just stopped selling pixie dust on the side, Bull said. Should go tell all your friends, eh? The techs looked at each other, eyebrows raised as Bull headed out. Back at the kelp tank, he dropped the bag, then pointed to Alexei and to the catwalk beside him, the same motions he'd used before. This time, Alexei's face went grim. Bull waited while the tech slogged through the deep water and pulled himself up. What's the problem? Alexei said. What's in the back? Bull shook his head slowly and only once. 
The chagrin on Alexei's face was like a confession. Not that Bull had needed one. Hey, Essie, Bull said. Just want you to know I'm sorry about this. He punched Alexei in the nose. Cartilage and bone gave way under his knuckle, and a bright red fountain of blood spilled slowly past the tech's startled mouth. Put him on the back of the cart, Bo said, where folks can see him. Serge and Karn exchanged a look that was a lot like the pair in the locker room. We heading to the brig, boss? Serge asked, and his tone of voice meant he already knew the answer. We have a brig? Bowl asked as he scooped up the duffel bag. Pretty don't. Then we're not going there. Bullet planned the route to pass through all the most populated public areas between the innermost areas of the ship and its skin. Word was already going around, and there were spectators all along the way. Alexei was making a high, keening sound when he wasn't shouting or begging or demanding to see the captain. Bull had the sudden, visceral memory of seeing a pig carried to the slaughter when he'd been younger. He didn't know when it had happened. The memory was just there, floating unconnected from the rest of his life. It took almost half an hour to reach the airlock. A crowd had gathered, a small sea of faces, most of them on wide heads and thin bodies, the belters watching the earther kill one of their own. Bull ignored them. He keyed in his passcode, opened the inner door of the lock, walked back to the cart and hefted Alexei with one arm. In the low gravity, it should have been easy, but Bull felt himself getting winded before he got back to the lock. It didn't help that Alexei was thrashing. Bull pushed him in, closed the inner door, put in the override code, and opened the exterior door without evacuating the air first. The pop rang through the metal deck like a distant bell. The monitor showed that the lock was empty. Bull closed the exterior door. While the lock refilled, he walked back to the cart. He stood on the back of the cart where Alexei had been, the duffel bag over his head in both hands. Blood stained his sleeve and his left knee. This is pixie dust, right? He said to the crowd. He didn't use his terminal to amplify his voice. He didn't need to. I'm going to leave this in the airlock for sixteen hours. Then I'm spacing it. Any other dust comes in to join it before then? Well, it just happened. No big deal. Any of this goes away, and that's a problem. So everybody go tell everybody. And the next pendejo signs on shift high, comes and talks to me. He walked back to the airlock slowly, letting everyone see him. He opened the inner door slung the bag through and turned away, leaving the door open behind him. Climbing back behind the wheel of the cart, he could feel the tension in the crowd, and it didn't bother him at all. Other things did. What he'd just done was the easy part. What came next was harder, because he had less control over it. You want to set a guard on that, boss? Serge asked. Think we need to? Bull asked. He didn't expect an answer, and he didn't get one. The cart lurched forward, the spectators parting before it like a herd of antelope before a lion. Bull aimed them back toward the ramps that would take him to the security offices. Hardcore, Corin said. She made it sound like a good thing. Religious art decorated the captain's office. Angels in blue and gold held the parabolas of the archways that rose overhead to meet the image of a calm and bearded god. A beneficent Christ looked down from the wall behind Ashford's desk, Caucasian features calm and serene. He didn't look anything like the bloody, bent, crucified man Bull was familiar with. Arrayed at the Savior's side were images of plenty, wheat, corn, goats, cows, and stars. Captain Ashford paced back and forth by Jesus' knees, his face dark with blood and fury. Michio Pa was seated in the other guest chair, carefully not looking at Ashford or at Bull. Whatever the situation was with the Martian science ships and their military escort, with the massive Earth flotilla, it was forgotten for the moment. 
Bull didn't let the anxiety show in his face. This is unacceptable, Mr. Baca. Why do you think that, sir? Ashford stopped, put his wide hands on the desk and leaned forward. Bull looked into his bloodshot eyes and wondered whether the captain was getting enough sleep. You killed a member of my crew, Ashford said. You did it with clear premeditation. You did it in front of a hundred witnesses. Shit, you want witnesses, there's surveillance footage, Bull said. It wasn't the right thing to do. You're relieved of duty, Mr. Baca, and can find a quarters until we return to Tycho Station where you will stand trial for murder. He was selling drugs to the crew. Then he should have been arrested. Bull took a deep breath, exhaling slowly through his nose. You think we're more running a warship or a space station, sir? he asked. Ashford's brow furrowed and he shook his head. To Bull's right, Pa shifted in her seat. When neither of them spoke, Bull went on. Reason I ask is if I'm a cop, then, yeah, I should have taken him to the brig, if we had a brig. He should have gotten a lawyer. We could have done that whole thing. Me? I don't think this is a station. I think it's a battleship. I'm here to maintain military discipline in a potential combat zone. Not Earth Navy discipline, not Martian Navy discipline, OPA discipline. The Belter Way. Ashford stood up. We aren't anarchists, he said, his voice dripping with scorn. OPA tradition, maybe I'm wrong, is that someone does something that intentionally endangers the ship, they get to hitchhike back to wherever there's air, Bull said. You hold him out of a water vat. How is he endangering the ship? Was he going to throw kelp at it? Pa said, her voice brittle. People been coming on shift high. Bull said, lacing his fingers together on one knee. Don't trust me? Ask around. And come on, of course they are, right? We've got three times as much work needs to get done as we can do. Pixie dust, and they don't feel tired. Don't take breaks. Don't slow down. Get more done. Thing about bad judgment? You've got to have good judgment to notice you've got it. We already got people hurt. Matter of time before someone died. Or worse. You're saying this man was responsible for all those other people performing badly at their work, so you killed him? Ashford said, but the wind was out of his sails. He was going to fold like wet cardboard. Bull recognized that Ashford's weakness was going to work to his advantage this time, but he still hated it. I'm saying he was putting the ship at risk for his own financial gain, just like he was stealing air filters. And sure he did. There was a demand. He filled it. If I lock him up, that makes it so that the risk is higher. Prices are higher. Get caught, you maybe go to jail when we get back to Tycho. And you made it so that the risk is death. No, Bo said. I mean, yeah, but I don't shoot him. I do what you do to people who risk the ship. Belters know what getting spaced means, right? It frames the issue. This was a mistake. I've got a list of fifty people he sold to, Bull said. Some of them are skilled technicians. A couple are mid-level overseers. We could lock them all up, but then we've got less people to do the work. And anyway, they won't be doing it anymore. Supply's gone. But if you want, I could talk to them. Let them know I'm keeping an eye open. Pa's chuckle was mirthless. That would be difficult if you're in the brig on charges, she said. We don't have a brig, Bull said. Plan was the church elders were just going to talk everything out. He kept his tone carefully free of sarcasm. Ashford waffled. It was like watching a cat trying to decide whether to jump from one tree limb to another. His expression was calculating, internal, uncertain. Bull waited. This never happens again, Ashford said. You decide someone needs to go out the airlock, you come to me. I'll be the one that pushes the button. All right. All right what? Ashford bit the words. 
Bull lowered his head, looking at the deck. He'd gotten what he came for. He could let Ashford feel like he'd gotten a little win, too. I mean, yes, sir, Captain. Solid copy. I understand and will comply. You're damn right you will, Ashford said. Now get the hell back to work. Yes, sir. When the door closed behind him, Bull leaned against the wall and took a few deep breaths. He was intensely aware of the sound of the ship, low hum of the air recyclers, the distant murmur of voices, the chimes and beeps of a thousand different system alerts. The air smelled of plastic and ozone. He'd taken his calculated risk, and he'd pulled it off. Walking back down level by level, he felt the attention on him. In the lift, a man tried not to stare at him. In the hall outside the security office, a woman smiled at him and nodded, nervous as a mouse that smells cat. Bull smiled back. In the security office, Serge and another man from the team, a European named Casimir, lifted their fists, greeting him in the physical idiom of the belt. Bull returned the gesture and ambled over. What we got? Bull asked. A couple of dozen people came to pay respects, Serge said. I figure about half a kilo more dust just appeared out of nowhere. Okay, then. I've got a file of everyone who went in. You want me to flag them in the system? Nope, Bull said. I told them it was no big deal. It's no big deal. You can kill the file. You got it, boss. I'll be in my office, Bull said. Let me know if something comes up. And somebody start a pot of coffee. He sat down on the desk, his feet resting on the seat of his chair, and leaned forward. He was suddenly exhausted. It had been a long, bad day, and losing the dread he'd been carrying for the weeks leading up to it was like being released from prison. It took a minute or two to notice he had a message waiting from Michio Pa. The XO hadn't requested a connection. She didn't want to talk to him then. She just wanted to say something. In the recording, her face was lit from below with the backsplash of her hand terminal screen. Her smile was thin and tight, and sort of faded away somewhere around her cheekbones. I saw what you did there. That was very nice, very clever. Wrapping yourself in the OPA flag, making the old man wonder if the crew wouldn't take your side, more belter than thou. It was graceful. Bull scratched his chin. The stubble that had grown in since morning made his fingernails sound like a rasp. It was probably too much to ask that he not make any enemies with this, but he was sorry it was Pa. You can't sugarcoat it with me. We both know that killing someone doesn't make you admirable. I'm not about to forget this. I just hope you have enough soul left that what you've done still bothers you. The recording ended and Bull smiled at the blank screen wearily. Every time, he told the hand terminal. And next time, too. Chapter 10 Holden The Rocinante was not a small ship. Her normal crew complement was over a dozen Navy personnel and officers, and on many missions she'd also carried six Marines. Running the Rossi with four people meant each of them did several jobs, and that didn't leave a lot of downtime. It also meant that it was pretty easy at first to avoid the four strangers living on the ship. With a documentary crew restricted from entering ops, the airlock deck, the machine shop, or engineering, they were stuck on the two crew decks with access only to their quarters, the head, the galley, and sickbay. Monica was a lovely person. Calm friendly, charismatic. If even a part of her charm translated to the other side of the camera, it was easy to see how she'd succeeded. The others, Oakju, Clip, Cohen, made clear overtures of friendship, cracking jokes with the Rocinante's crew, making dinners, reaching out, but it wasn't clear to Holden whether it was the usual honeymoon period that came when any crew first came together for a long voyage, or something more calculated. Maybe a little of both. What he did see was his own crew drawing back. 
After two days of the documentary team being on board, Naomi simply retreated to the ops deck, where she couldn't be found. Amos had made a half-hearted pass at Monica and a slightly more serious attempt with Okju. When both failed, he began spending most of his time in the machine shop. Of them all, only Alex took time to socialize with their passengers, and him not all that often. He'd taken to sometimes sleeping in the pilot's couch. They'd agreed to being interviewed, and Holden knew they couldn't avoid it forever. They hadn't been out for a full week yet, and even on a fairly high burn would be months to their destination. Besides, it was in their contract. The discomfort of it was almost enough to distract him from the fact that every day brought them closer to the ring, and whatever it was that Miller wanted him out there for. Almost. It's Saturday, Naomi said. She was lounging in a crash couch near the comm station. She hadn't cut her hair for a while, and it was getting long enough to become an annoyance to her. For the last ten minutes, she'd been trying to braid it. The thick, black curls resisted her efforts, seeming to move with a will of their own. Based on past experience, Holden knew this was the precursor to cutting half of it off in exasperation. Naomi liked the idea of growing her hair very long, but not the reality. Holden sat at the combat ops panel, watching her struggle with it and letting his mind drift. Did you hear me? She said. It's Saturday. Are we inviting our guests to dinner? It had become custom on the ship that no matter what else was going on, the crew tried to have dinner as a group once a week. By unspoken agreement, it was usually Saturday. Which day of the week it happened to be didn't really matter much on a ship, but by holding their dinner on Saturday, Holden thought they were doing some small bit to celebrate the passing of a week, the beginning of another. A gentle reminder that there was still a solar system outside of the four of them. But he hadn't considered inviting the documentary crew to join them. It felt like an invasion. The Saturday dinner was for crew. We can't keep them out of it, he sighed, can we? Not unless we want to eat up here. You did give them the run of the galley. Damn it, he said. Should have confined them to quarters. For four months? We could have shoved ration bars and catheter bags under the door to them. She smiled and said, It's Amos's turn to cook. Right, I'll call and let him know it's dinner for eight. Amos made pasta and mushrooms, heavy on the garlic heavy on the Parmesan. It was his favorite, and he always splurged to buy real cloves of garlic and actual Parmesan cheese to grate, another small luxury they wouldn't be able to afford if they wound up in a courtroom battle with Mars. While Amos finished sautéing the mushrooms and garlic, Alex set the table and took drink orders. Holden sat next to Naomi on one side of the table while the documentary crew sat together on the other. The banter was polite and friendly, and if there was an uncomfortable undercurrent to it all, he still wasn't quite sure why. Holden had asked them not to bring cameras or recording equipment to the dinner table, and Monica had agreed. Clip, the Martian, was talking about sports history with Alex. Oakju and Cohen, sitting across from Naomi, were telling stories about the last assignment they'd been on, covering a new scientific station that was in stationary orbit around Mercury. It should have been almost pleasant, and it just wasn't. Holden said, We don't usually eat this well while flying, but we try to do something nice for our weekly dinner together. Okju smiled and said, Smells lovely. She was wearing half a dozen rings, a blouse with buttons on it, a silver pendant, and an ivory-colored comb holding back her frizzy brown hair. The sound man gazed serenely at nothing his black glasses hiding the top of his face, his expression calm and open. Monica watched him look over her crew, saying nothing, a faint smile on her lips. Ciao, Amos said, then began putting bowls of food on the table. While the meal was handed around in a slow circuit, Okju bowed her head and mumbled something. It took Holden a moment to realize she was praying. 
He hadn't seen anyone do it for years, not since he'd left home. One of his fathers, Caesar, had sometimes prayed before meals. Holden waited for her to finish before he started eating. This is very nice, Monica said. Thank you. You're welcome, said Holden. We're a week out of series, she said, and I think we're all settled in. Was wondering if we could start scheduling some preliminary interviews. It's mostly so we can test out the equipment. You can interview me, Amos said, not quite hiding his leer. Monica smiled at him and speared a mushroom with her fork, then stared at him while she popped it into her mouth and chewed slowly. Okay, she said. We can start with background work. Baltimore? The silence was suddenly brittle. Amos started to stand, but a gentle hand on his arm from Naomi stopped him. He opened his mouth, closed it, then looked down at his plate while the pale skin on his scalp and neck turned bright red. Monica looked down at her plate, her expression at the friction point between embarrassed and annoyed. That's not a good idea, Holden said. Captain, I'm sensitive to privacy issues for you and your crew. But we have an agreement. And with all respect, you've been treating me and mine like we're unwelcome. Around the table, the food was starting to cool off. It had hardly been touched. I get it. You held up your end of the deal, Holden said. You got me out of series and you put money in our pockets. We haven't been holding up our end. I get it. I'll set aside an hour tomorrow for starters. Does that work? Sure, she said. Let's eat. Baltimore, huh? Clip said to Amos. Football fan? Amos said nothing, and Clip didn't press it. After the uncomfortable dinner, Holden wanted nothing more than to climb into bed. But while he was in the head brushing his teeth, Alex pretended to casually wander in and said, Come on up to Ops, Cap. Got something to talk about. When Holden followed him up, he found Amos and Naomi already waiting. Naomi was leaning back with her hands behind her head, but Amos sat on the edge of a crash couch, both feet on the floor and his hands clenched into a doubled fist in front of him. His expression was still dark with anger. So, Jim, Alex said, walking over to another crash couch and dropping into it. This ain't a good start. She's looking stuff up about us. Amos said to no one in particular, his gaze still on the floor. Stuff she shouldn't know. Holden knew what Amos meant. Monica's reference to Baltimore was an allusion to Amos's childhood as the product of a particularly nasty brand of unlicensed prostitution. But Holden couldn't admit he knew it. He himself only knew because of an overheard conversation. He had no interest in humiliating Amos further. She's a journalist. They do background research, he said. She's more than that, Naomi said. She's a nice person. She's charming and she's friendly, and every one of us on the ship wants to like her. That's a problem, Holden said. That's a big fucking problem, Amos said. I was on the Canterbury for a reason, Jim, Alex said. His Mariner Valley drawl had stopped sounding silly and just seemed sad instead. I don't need someone digging up my skeletons to air them out. The Canterbury, the ice hauler they'd all worked on together before the Eros incident, was a bottom-of-the-barrel job for those who flew for a living. It attracted people who'd failed down to the level of their incompetence, or those who couldn't pass the background checks a better job might require. Or, in his own case, those who had a dishonorable military discharge staining their record. After having served with his small crew for years, Holden knew it wasn't incompetence that had put any of them on that ship. I know, he started. Same here, Captain, Amos said. I got a lot of past in my past. So do I, Naomi said. Holden started to reply, then stopped when the import of her words hit him. Naomi was hiding something that had driven her to take a glorified mechanic's job on the Canterbury. Well, of course she was. Holden hadn't wanted to think about it, 
but it was obvious. She was about the most talented engineer he'd ever met. He knew she had degrees from two universities and had completed her three-year flight officer training in two. She'd started her career on an obvious command track. Something had happened, but she'd never talked about what it had been. He frowned a question at her, but she stopped him with a tiny shake of her head. The fragility of their little family struck him full force. The paths that had pulled them all together had been so diverse, as improbable and unlikely as those kinds of things ever were, and the universe could just as easily take them apart. It left him feeling small and vulnerable and a little defensive. Everyone remembers why we did this, right? Holden asked. The lockdown? Mars coming after the Rosinante? We didn't have a choice, Naomi replied. We know. We all agreed to take this job. Amos nodded in agreement. Alex said, No one's saying we shouldn't have taken the job. What we're saying is that you're the front man for this band. Yes, Naomi said. You need to be so interesting that this documentary crew forgets all about the rest of us. That's your job for the rest of this flight. That's the only way this works. No, Amos said, still not looking up. There is another way. But I've never tossed a blind man out an airlock. Don't know how I'd feel about that. Might not be fun. Okay, Holden said, patting the air with his hands in a calming motion. I get it. I'll keep the cameras out of your faces as much as I can, but this is a long trip. Be patient. When we get to the ring, maybe they'll be tired of us and we can pawn them off on some other ship. They were silent for a moment, then Alex shook his head. Well, he said, I think we just found the only thing that'll make me look forward to getting there. Holden woke with a start rubbing furiously at an itch on his nose. He had a half-remembered feeling of something trying to climb inside it. No bugs on the ship, so it had to have been a dream. The itch was real, though. As he scratched, he said, Sorry, bad dream or something, and patted the bed next to him. It was empty. Naomi must have gone to the bathroom. He inhaled and exhaled loudly through his nose several times, trying to get rid of the itchy sensation inside. On the third exhale, a blue firefly popped out and flew away. Holden became aware of a faint scent of acetate in the air. We need to talk, said a familiar voice in the darkness. Holden's throat went tight. His heart began to pound. He pulled a pillow over his face and suppressed an urge to scream as much from frustration and rage as the old familiar fear that tightened his chest. So, there was this rookie, Miller started. Good kid. You'd have hated him. I can't take this shit, Holden said, yanking the pillow away from his face and throwing it in the direction of Miller's voice. He slapped the panel by the bed and the room's lights came on. Miller was standing by the door, the pillow behind him, wearing the same rumpled gray suit and pork pie hat, fidgeting like he had a rash. He never really learned to clear a room, you know, Miller continued. His lips were black. Corners and doorways, I tried to tell him. It's always corners and doorways. Holden reached for the comm panel to call Naomi, then stopped. He wanted her to be there, to make the ghost vanish the way it always had before. And he was also afraid that this time it wouldn't. Listen, you've got to clear the room, Miller said, his face twisted with confusion and intensity, like a drugged man trying to remember something important. If you don't clear the room, the room eats you. What do you want from me? Holden said. Why are you making me go out there? A thick exasperation twisted Miller's expression. What the hell are you hearing me say? You see a room full of bones? Only thing you know is something got killed. You're the predator, 
right up until your prey. He stopped, staring at Holden, waiting for an answer. When Holden didn't respond, Miller moved a step closer to the bed. Something on his face made Holden think of the times he'd watched the cop shoot people. He opened a cabinet by the bed and took out his sidearm. Don't get any closer, Holden said, not pointing the gun at Miller yet. But be honest, if I shot you, would you even die? Miller laughed. His expression became almost human. Depends. The door opened and Miller blinked out. Naomi came in, wearing a robe and carrying a bulb of water. You awake? Holden nodded, then opened the cabinet and put the gun away. His expression must have told Naomi everything. Are you all right? Yeah. He vanished when you opened the door. You look terrified, Naomi said, putting her water down and sliding under the covers next to him. He's scarier now. Before, I thought... I don't know what I thought. But ever since he knew about the gate, I keep trying to figure out what he really means. It was easier when I could think it was some kind of static. That it didn't... that it didn't mean anything. Naomi curled up against his side, putting her arms around him. He felt his muscles relaxing. We can't let Monica and her crew ever know about this, he said. Naomi's smile was half-sorrow. What? James Holden not telling everyone everything, she said. This is different. I know. What did he say? Naomi asked. Did it make sense? No. But it was all about death. Everything he says is about death. Over the course of the following weeks... The ship fell into a routine that, while not comfortable, was at least collegial. Holden spent time with the documentary crew being filmed, showing them the ship, answering questions. What was his childhood like? Loving and complex and bittersweet. Had he really saved Earth by talking the half-aware girl who'd been the protomolecule seed crystal into rerouting to Venus? No. Mostly that had just worked out well. Did he have any regrets? He smiled and took it, and pretended he wasn't holding anything back. That the only thing leading him out to the ring was his contract with them. That he hadn't been chosen by the protomolecule for something else that he hadn't yet begun to understand. Sometimes, Monica turned to the others, but Alex and Naomi kept their answers friendly, polite, and shallow. Amos laced his responses with cheerful and explicit profanity, until it was almost impossible to edit into something for a civilized audience. Cohen turned out to be more than a sound engineer. The dark glasses he wore were a sonar feedback system that allowed him to create a three-dimensional model of any space he occupied. When Amos asked why he didn't have prosthetics instead, Cohen had told them that the accident that claimed his eyes also burned the optic nerves away. The attempted nerve regrowth therapy had failed and almost killed him with an out-of-control brain tumor. But the interface that allowed his brain to translate sonar data into a working 3D landscape also made him an extraordinary visual effects modeler. While Monica spun a narrative of Holden's life following the destruction of his ship, the Canterbury, Cohen created beautiful visual renderings of the scenes. At one point, he showed the crew a short clip of Holden speaking, describing the escape from Eros after the initial protomolecule infection, all while he appeared to be moving down perfectly rendered Erosian corridors filled with bodies. Part of Holden had almost come to enjoy the interviews, but he could only watch the Eros graphics for a few seconds before he asked Cohen to turn it off. He'd been sure that seeing it would somehow invoke Miller, but it hadn't. Holden didn't like the memories that came with their story. The documentary crew made accommodations, not forcing him further than he was willing to go. Their being nice about it somehow only made him feel worse. A week out from the ring, they caught up to the behemoth. Monica was sitting on the ops deck with the crew when the massive OPA ship finally got close enough for the Rossi's telescopes to get a good view of her. 
Holden had allowed the restrictions on where the documentary crew were permitted to just sort of fade away. They were doing a slow pan of the behemoth's hull when Alex whistled and pointed at a protrusion on the side. Damn, boss. The Mormons are better armed than I remember. That's a railgun turret right there. Not bet a week's desserts those things are torpedo tubes. I liked her better when she was a generation ship, Holden replied. He called up combat ops and told the Rosinante to classify the new hull as the behemoth-class dreadnought and add all the hard points and weapons to her threat profile. That's the kind of stealing only governments can get away with, Amos said. I guess the OPA is a real thing now. Yeah, Alex replied with a laugh. Mars is making a similar claim against us, Holden said. And if we'd been the ones to blow up their battleship before we flew off in this boat, they'd have an argument to make, Amos said. Last I checked, that was the bad guys, though. Naomi didn't chime in. She was working at something on the comm panel. Holden could tell it was a complex problem because she was quietly humming to herself. You've been on the Nauvoo before, right? Monica asked. No, Holden said. The Rosinante began rapidly throwing data onto his screen. The ship's calculations of the behemoth's actual combat strength. They were still working on it the first time I was on Tycho Station. By the time I started working for Fred Johnson, they'd already shot the Nauvoo at Eros, and she was on her way out of the solar system. I did get to walk through the ship they sent to catch her once. The Rosinante was displaying puzzling projections at him. The ship seemed to think that the behemoth didn't have the structural strength to support the number and size of weapon hardpoints she currently sported. In fact, she seemed to think that if the OPA battleship ever actually fired two of its six capital ship class rail guns at the same time, there was a 34% chance the hull would rip apart. Just to have something to do, Holden told the Rossi to create a tactical package for fighting the behemoth and send it to Alex and Naomi. Probably they'd never need it. You didn't like working for the OPA? Monica asked. She had the little smile she got when she asked a question she already knew the answer to. Holden suspected the documentarian was also a terrible poker player, but so far he hadn't been able to get her into a game. It was a mixed bag, he said, forcing himself to smile. To be the James Holden that Monica wanted and expected to sacrifice himself to her attention, so she'd leave the others be. Jim? Naomi said, finally looking up from her panel. You know that memory leak in comms that I've been hunting for a month? It's getting worse. It's driving me nuts. How bad? Alex asked. Fluctuating between .0021 and .033%, she said. I'm having to flush and reboot every couple of days now. Amos laughed. Do we care about that? Because I'll raise you a power leak in the head that's almost a whole percent. Naomi turned to look at him with a frown. You didn't tell me? I'll bet you a month's pay it's a worn lead to the lights. I'll yank the fucker out when I get a chance. Do those things happen a lot? Monica asked. Hell no, Alex replied before Holden could. The Rosie's solid. Yeah, Amos chimed in. She's so well put together we got to obsess over bullshit like crusty memory bubbles and shitty light bulbs just to have something to do. The smile he aimed at Monica was indistinguishable from the real thing. So, you didn't really answer my question about the OPA, Monica said, swiveling her chair to face Holden. She pointed at the threat map the Rosie had created of the behemoth, the weapon hard points like angry red blisters dotting her skin. Everything okay between you? Yeah, everyone's still friends, Holden said. Nothing to worry about. A proximity light flashed as the behemoth bounced a ranging laser off the Rosie's hull. She returned the favor. Not targeting lasers. Just two ships making sure they weren't in any danger of getting too close. Nothing to worry about. Yeah, right. Chapter 11 Melba Stani stood just behind Melba's left shoulder, 
looking at the display. His palm rubbed against the slick fabric of his work trousers like he was trying to soothe a cramped quadriceps. Melba had learned to read it as a sign the man was nervous. The narrow architecture of the Cerisier put him so close to her she could feel the subtle warmth of his body against the back of her neck. In any other context, being this close to a man would have meant that they were sharing an intimate moment. Here it meant nothing. She didn't even find it annoying. Mira, Stani said, flapping his hand. La, right there. The monitor was old, a constant green pixel burning in the lower left corner where some steady glitch had been irreparable and not worth replacing. The definition was still better than a hand terminal. To the untrained eye, the power demand profile for the UNN Thomas Prince could have been the readout of an EEG, or a seismological reading, or the visual representation of a Bangra recording. But over the course of weeks, months now, Melba's eye wasn't untrained. I see it, she said, putting her finger on the spike. And we can't tell where it came from? Fucks me, Stani said, rubbing his thigh. I'm seeing it, but I don't know what I'm looking at. Melba ran her tongue against the back of her teeth, concentrating, trying to remember what the tutorials had shown about tracking power spikes. In an odd way, her inexperience had shifted into an asset for the team. Stani and Ren, Bob and Soledad, all had more hands-on experience than she did, but she'd only just learned the basics. Sometimes she would know some simple thing that all of them had known once and only she hadn't forgotten. Her analysis was slower, but it didn't skip steps, because she didn't know which steps could be skipped. Did it start at the deceleration flip? she asked. Stani grunted like a man struck by a sudden pain. They hit null G and one of the regulators reset, he said. At least it's nothing serious. Embarrassing to blow up all they preachers, he said. We'll need to get back over there and check them, though. Melba nodded and made a mental note to read through what that process required. All she'd known was the truism repeated in three of her tutorials that when a ship cut thrust halfway through a journey, flipped and began accelerating in the opposite direction, it was a time for a special care. I'll put it on the rotation, she said, and pulled up her team's schedule. There was a slot in ten days when there would be enough time to revisit the big ship. She blocked out the time, marked it, and posted it to the full group. All of it felt easy and natural, like the sort of thing she'd been doing her whole life, which, in a sense, she had. The flotilla was coming to the last leg of its journey. They had passed the orbit of Uranus weeks ago, and the sun was a bright star in an overwhelming abyss of night sky. All the plumes of fire were pointed toward the ring now, bleeding off their velocity with every passing minute. Even though it was the standard pattern for Epstein drive ships, Melba couldn't quite shake the feeling that they were all trying to flee from their destination and being pulled in against their will. Unless they were discussing work, the only conversation in the mess hall, on the exercise machines, on the shuttles to and from the ships they maintained, was about the ring. The Martian science ships and their escort were already there, peering through the void. There had been no official reports given, so instead rumors sprang up like weeds. Every beam of light that passed through the ring and hit something bounced back, just like in normal space. But a few troubling constants varied as you got close to it. The microwave background from inside the ring was older than the Big Bang. People said if you listened carefully to the static from the other side of the ring, you could hear the voices of the dead of Eros, or of the damned. Melba heard the dread in other people's voices, saw Soledad crossing herself when she thought no one was looking, felt the oppressive weight of the object. She understood their growing fear, not because she felt it herself, but because her own private crisis point was coming. The OPA's monstrous battleship was on course to arrive soon, almost at the same time as the Earth flotilla. It wasn't a matter of days yet, but it would be soon. The Rosinante had already passed the slower behemoth. 
She and Holden were rising up out of the sun's domain, and soon their paths would converge. Then there would be the attack, and the public humiliation of James Holden, and with it, his death. And after that... It was strange to think of an afterward. The more she imagined it, the more she could see herself relaxing back into Melba's life. There was no reason not to. Clarissa Mao had nothing, commanded nothing, was nothing. Melba Cole had work, at least, a history. It was a pretty thought, made prettier by being impossible. She would go home, become Clarissa again, and do whatever else she could to restore her family's name. Honor required it. If she'd stayed, it would have meant being like Julie. Growing up, Clarissa had admired and resented her older sister. Julie, the pretty one, the smart one, the champion yacht racer. Julie, who could make father laugh. Julie, who could do no wrong. Peter was younger than Clarissa, and so would always be less. The twins, Michael and Anthea, had always been a world unto themselves sharing jokes and comments that only they understood, and so seemed at times more like long-term guests of the family than part of it. Julie was the oldest, the one Clarissa longed to be, the one to beat. Clarissa hadn't been the only one to see Julie that way. Their mother felt it, too. It was the thing that made Clarissa and her mother most alike. And then something happened. Julie had walked away from them all, cut her hair, dropped out of school, and disappeared up into the darkness. She remembered her father hearing the news over dinner. They'd been having kaju mulkari in the informal dining room that overlooked the park. She'd just come back from a riding lesson and still smelled a little of horse. Peter had been talking about mathematics again, boring everyone— when her mother looked up from her plate with a smile and announced that Julie had written a letter to say she'd quit the family. Clarissa's mouth had dropped open. It was like saying that the son had decided to become a politician, or that four had decided to be eight. It wasn't quite incomprehensible, but it lived on the edge. Her father had laughed. He'd said it was a phase. Julie'd gone to live like the common people and sow a few wild oats, and once she'd had her fill, she'd come home. But she'd seen in his eyes that he didn't believe it. His perfect girl was gone. She'd rejected not only him, but the family, their name. Forever after, cashews and curry had tasted like victory. And so Melba would have to be folded up when she was done here put back in a box and buried or burned. Clarissa could go live with one of her siblings. Peter had his own ship now. She could work on it as an electrochemical engineer, she thought with a smile. Or, in the worst case, stay with Mother. If she told them what she'd done, how she'd saved the family name, then Clarissa could start to rebuild the company, remake their empire in her own name, possibly even free her father from imprisonment and exile. The thought left her feeling both hopeful and tired. A loud clang and the distant sound of laughter brought her back to herself. She reviewed the maintenance schedule for the next ten-day cycle, maintenance on the electrical systems of three of the minor warships and a physical inventory of the electrical cards, marked the ship's time, and shut down her terminal. The mess hall was half full when she got there. Members of half a dozen other teams eating together and talking and watching the news feeds about the ring, about themselves going to meet it. Soledad was sitting by herself, gaze fixed on her hand terminal while she ate a green-brown paste that looked like feces but smelled like the finest cooked beef in the world. Melba told herself to think of it as pâté, and then it wasn't so bad. Melba got herself a plate and a bulb of lemon water and slid in across from Soledad. The other woman's eyes flicked up with a small but genuine smile. Oi, boss, she said. How's it go? Everything's copacetic, Melba smiled. She smiled more than Clarissa did. That was an interesting thought. What did I miss? Report from Mars. Data this time. The ship that went through? Not on the drift. 
Really? Melba said. After they'd picked up the faint transmission from the little cobbled-together ship that had started all this, the assumption had been that it had been crippled by something that lived on the other side of the ring, that it was floating free. It's under power? Maybe, Soledad said. Data shows it's moving and a lot slower than it went in. And the probes they sent in? One of them got grabbed, too. Normal burn and then boom, stopped. The signal's all fucked up, but it looks like the same course that the ship's on. Like they're being taken to the same place or something. Weird, Melba said. But I guess weird is kind of what we expect, after Eros. My dad was on Eros, Soledad said, and Melba felt a strange tightening in her throat. He worked one of the casinos. Security to make sure no one hacked the games, right? Been there fifteen years. Said he was going to retire there, get a little hole up where he didn't weigh so much and just live off his retirement. I'm sorry. Soledad shrugged. Everyone dies, she said gruffly, then wiped the back of her hand against her eyes and turned back to the screen. My sister was there, Melba said. It was truth, and more than truth. My sister was one of the first ones it took. Shit. Soledad said, looking up at her now, terminal forgotten. Yeah. The two were quiet for a long moment. At another table, a belter man, no more than twenty, barked his knees against the edge of the table and started cursing squat little earth designers, to the amusement of his friends. You think they're still there? Soledad said softly, nodding at her terminal. There were those voices. The transmissions that came off Eros. You know, after. It was people, right? They're dead, Melba said. Everyone on Eros died. Changed, anyway, Soledad said. Some guys said it took the patterns off them, right? Their bodies, their brains. I think about maybe they never really died. Just got remade, you know? What if their brains never stopped working and just got... She shrugged, looking for a word, but Melba knew what she meant. Change, even profound change, wasn't the same as death. She was proof enough of that. Does it matter? What if their souls never got loose? Soledad said, with real pain in her voice. What if it caught them all, right? Your sister, my dad. What if they aren't dead, and Ring's got all their souls still? There are no souls, Melba thought with a touch of pity. We are bags of meat with a little electricity running through them. No ghosts, no spirits, no souls. The only thing that survives is the story people tell about you. The only thing that matters is your name. It was the kind of thing Clarissa would think. The kind of thing her father would have said. She didn't say it aloud. Maybe that's why Earth's bringing all those priests, Soledad said and took a scoop of her food, to put them all to rest. Someone should, Melba agreed, and then she turned to her meal. Her hand terminal chimed, ran requesting a private conversation. Melba frowned and accepted the connection. What's up, she said. His voice, when it came, was strained. I got something I was wondering if you could look at. An anomaly. On my way, Melba said. She dropped the connection and downed her remaining meat paste in two huge swallows, then dropped the plate into the recycler on her way out. Ren was at a workstation in one of the storage bays. It was one of the new spaces he could work in that had a ceiling high enough that he wouldn't have to hunch. Around him, blue plastic crates stood fixed to the floor or one another with powerful electromagnets. Her footsteps were the only sound. What have you got? she asked. He stood back and nodded at the monitor. Air filter data from the Sung Un, he said. Her blood went cold. Why? she said too sharply, too quickly. It's catching a lot of outliers. Raised a flag. I'm looking at the profile, and it's all high-energy ganga, 
nitroethene, she said. She hadn't thought of this. She'd known that the ships did passive gas monitoring, but it had never occurred to her that stray molecules of her explosive would get caught in the filters, or that anyone would check. Wren took her silence as confusion. Built a profile, he said. Ninety percent fit with a moldable explosive. So they've got explosives on board, Melba said. It's a warship. Explosives is what they do, right? Despair and embarrassment warred in her chest. She'd screwed up. She just wanted Wren to be quiet, to not say the things he was saying, that he was going to say. This is more like what they'd use for mining and excavation, he said. You inspected that deck. You remember seeing anything funny? Might have been hard to see. This stuff's putty until it hits air. You think it's a bomb? she said. Wren shrugged. Inner's hauling full load of geki. A guy tried to light himself on fire. Hunger strike lady. The one Koyo did that thing with the camera. That wasn't political, she said. He's a performance artist. All I mean, we put together a lot of different kinds of people, think a lot of different kinds of things. Doesn't bring out the best in people. I was a kid, I watched Miel turn end a marriage over whether the Mahdi was going to be a belter. And everybody know everybody back down the well is watching. That kind of attention changes people, and it don't make them better. Maybe someone's planning to make a statement, see, no? Did you alert the security? She asked. Check with you first. But something like this, Shikadag and I, we got to. I have to kill him, she thought like someone whispering in her ear. She saw how to do it. Get him to look at his screen, hunch over just a little, enough to bear the back of his neck. Then she would press her tongue against the roof of her mouth, the rough of the taste buds tickling her palate a little, and the strength would come. She'd break him here and then take him back to her quarters. She could clear out her locker, fit him in, and there was packing sealant that would keep the smell of the body from getting out. She'd file a report, say he was missing. She could act as confused as anyone. By the time she gave up the room and they found him, Melba would already be gone. Even if they worked out that she'd also planted the bomb, they'd just assume she was one of Holden's agents. Wren was looking at her, his brown eyes mild, his carrot-orange hair back in a wiry ponytail that left the skin of his neck exposed. She thought of him explaining about the brownout buffers, the gentleness in his expression, the kindness. I'm sorry, she thought. This isn't my fault. I have to. Let's check the data again, she said, angling her body toward the monitor. Show me where the anomalies are. He nodded, turning with her. Like everything on the Cerisier, the controls were built for someone a little shorter than Wren. He had to bend a little to reach them. A thickness rose up at the back of her neck, filled her throat. Dread felt like drowning. Wren's ponytail shifted, pulled to the side. There was a mole, brown and ovoid just where his spine met his skull, like a target. So I'm looking on this report here, he said, tapping the screen. Melba pressed her tongue against the roof of her mouth. What about Soledad? She'd been there when Wren called her. She knew Melba had gone to see him. She might have to kill her, too. Where would she put that body? There would have to be an accident, something plausible. She couldn't let them stop her. She was so close. It's not going up, though, he said. Steady levels. She circled her tongue counterclockwise once, then paused. She felt lightheaded, short of breath. One of the artificial glands leaking out, maybe, in preparation for the flood. Wren was speaking, but she couldn't hear him. The sounds of her own breath and the blood in her ears was too loud. I have to kill him. Her fingers were jittering. Her heart raced. He turned to her, blew a breath out his nostrils. He wasn't a person. He was just a sack of meat with a little electricity.
She could do this. For her father. For her family. It needed to be done. When Ren spoke, his voice seemed to come from a distance. Was denkst du? You want to make the call or want me to? Her mind moved too quickly and too slowly. He was asking if they should alert the Sung Un about the bomb. That was what he meant. Ren, she said. Her voice sounded small, querulous. It was the voice of someone much younger than she was. Someone who was very frightened or very sad. Concern bloomed in his expression, drew his brows together. Hey, you all right, boss? She touched the screen with the tip of her finger. Look again, she said softly. Look close. He turned, bending toward the data as if there were something there to discover. She looked at his bent neck like she might have looked at a statue in a museum, an object, nothing more. She circled her tongue against the roof of her mouth twice, and calm descended on her. His neck popped when it broke. The cartilaginous discs ripping free, the bundle of nerves and connective tissue that his life had run through coming apart. She kept striking the base of his skull until she felt the bone give way beneath her palm, and then it was time to move the body, quickly, before anyone walked in on them. Before the crash came. Fortunately, there was only a little blood. Chapter 12 Anna Two hours into an interfaith prayer meeting, and for the very first time in her life, Anna was tired of prayer. She'd always found a deep comfort in praying a profound sense of connection to something infinitely larger than herself. Her atheist friends called it awe in the face of an infinite cosmos. She called it God. That they might be talking about the same thing didn't bother her at all. It was possible she was hurling her prayers at a cold and unfeeling universe that didn't hear them, but that wasn't how it felt. Science had given mankind many gifts, and she valued it. But the one important thing it had taken away was the value of subjective, personal experience. That had been replaced with the idea that only measurable and testable concepts had value. But humans didn't work that way. And Anna suspected the universe didn't either. In God's image, after all, being a tenet of her faith. At first, the meeting had been pleasant. Father Michel had a lovely, deep voice that had mellowed with age like fine wine. His lengthy and heartfelt prayer for God's guidance to be upon those who would study the ring had sent shivers down her spine. He was followed by an elder of the Church of Humanity Ascendant, who led the group through several meditations and breathing exercises that left Anna feeling energized and refreshed. She made a note in her hand terminal to download a copy of their book on meditation and give it a read. Not all of the faiths and traditions represented on board took a turn, of course. The imam would not pray in front of non-Muslims, though he did give a short speech in Arabic that someone translated for her through her earbud. When he ended with Allahu Akbar, several people in the audience repeated it back. Anna was one of them. Why not? It seemed polite, and it was a sentiment she agreed with. But after two hours, even the most heartfelt and poetic of the prayers had begun to wear on her. She began counting the little plastic domes that hid fire suppression turrets. She'd gotten good at spotting them since the attempted suicide at the first party. She found her mind wandering off to think about the message she'd sent to Nono later. The chair she sat in had a very faint vibration that she could almost hear if she remained very still. It must have been the ship's massive drive, and as Anna listened for it, it began to develop a rhythmic pulse. The pulse turned into music, and she began humming under her breath. She stopped when an Episcopalian in the seat next to her pointedly cleared his throat. Hank Cortez was, of course, scheduled to go last. In the weeks and months Anna had been on the Prince, 
it had become apparent that while no one was officially in charge of the interfaith portion of the Ring expedition, Dr. Hank was treated as a sort of first among equals. Anna suspected this was because of his close ties to the Secretary General, who'd made the whole mission possible. He also seemed to be on a first-name basis with many of the important artists, politicians, and economic consultants in the civilian contingent of the group. It didn't really bother her. No matter how egalitarian a group might start out, someone always wound up taking a leadership role. Better Dr. Hank than herself. When the Neo-Wiccan priestess currently at the podium finally finished her rites, Dr. Hank was nowhere to be seen. Anna felt a little surge of hope that the prayer service would end early. But no. Dr. Hank made his entrance into the auditorium, trailed by a camera crew, and bowled his way up to the podium like an actor taking the stage. He flashed his gleaming smile across the audience, making sure to end with a section the camera people had set up in. Brothers and sisters, he said, let us bow our heads and offer thanks to the Almighty and seek his counsel and guidance as we draw ever closer to the end of this historic journey. He managed to rattle on that way for another twenty minutes. Anna started humming again. After, Anna met Tilly for lunch at the officer's mess that had been set aside for civilian use. Anna wasn't exactly sure how she'd wound up being Tilly's best and only friend on the trip, but the woman had latched onto her after their first meeting and burrowed in like a tick. No, that wasn't really fair. Even though the only thing she and Tilly had in common was their carbon base, it wasn't like Anna had a lot of friends on the ship either. And while Tilly could appear flighty and exasperating, Anna had gradually seen through the mask to the deeply lonely woman underneath. Her husband's obscene contributions to the Secretary General's re-election campaign had bought her way onto the flight as a civilian consultant. She had no purpose on the mission other than to be seen, an extended reminder of her husband's enormous wealth and power. That she had nothing else to offer the group only made the real point clearer. She knew it, and everyone else knew it, too. Most of the other civilians on the flight treated her with barely concealed contempt. While they waited for their food to arrive, Tilly popped a lozenge in her mouth and chewed it. The faint smell of nicotine and mint filled the air. No smoking on military ships, of course. How'd your thing go? Tilly asked, playing with her silver inlaid lozenge box and looking around the room. She was wearing a pants and blouse combination that probably cost more than Anna's house on Europa had. It was the kind of thing she wore when she wanted to appear casual. The prayer meeting? Anna said. Good. And then, not as good. Long. Very, very long. Tilly looked at her, the honesty getting her attention. God, don't I know it. No one can blather on like a holy man with a trapped audience. Well, maybe a politician. Their food arrived a Navy boy acting as waiter for the VIP civilians. Anna wondered what he thought of that. The UN military was all volunteer. He'd probably had a vision of what his military life would be like, and she doubted this was it. He carefully placed their food in front of them with the ease of long practice, gave them both a smile, and vanished back into the kitchen. Galley. They called it a galley on ships. Tilly picked half-heartedly at a farm-grown tomato and real mozzarella salad that Anna could have afforded on Europa by selling a kidney, and said, Have you heard from Namono? Anna nodded while she finished chewing a piece of fried tofu. I got another video last night. Nami gets bigger in every one. She's getting used to the gravity, but the drugs make her cranky. We're thinking about taking her off them early, even if it means more physical therapy. Aww. Uh, Tilly said. It had a pro forma feel to it. Anna waited for her to change the subject. Robert hasn't checked in for a week now, Tilly said. She seemed resigned rather than sad. You don't think he... Cheating? Tilly said with a laugh. I wish. That would at least be interesting. When he locks himself away in his office at 2 a.m., you know what I catch him looking at? Business reports. 
stock values, spreadsheets. Robert is the least sexual creature I've ever met. At least until they invent a way to fuck money. Tilly's casual obscenity had very quickly stopped bothering Anna. There was no anger in it. Like most of the things Tilly did, it struck her as another way to be noticed, to get people to pay attention to her. How's the campaign coming? Anna said. Esteban? Who knows? Robert's job is to be rich and have rich friends. I'm sure that part is coming along just fine. They ate in silence for a while, then, without planning to, Anna said, I don't think I should have come. Tilly nodded gravely, as though Anna had just quoted gospel at her. None of us should have. We pray, and we get photographed, and we have meetings about interfaith cooperation, Anna continued. You know what we never talk about? The ring? No. I mean, yes. I mean, we talk about the ring all the time. What is it? What's it for? Why did the protomolecule make it? Tilly pushed her salad away and chewed another lozenge. Then what? What I thought we came here to do. To talk about what it means. Nearly a hundred spiritual leaders and theologians on this ship, and none of us is talking about what the ring means. For God? Well, at least about God. Theological anthropology is a lot simpler when humans are the only ones with souls. Tilly waved at the waiter and ordered a cocktail Anna had never heard of. The waiter seemed to know, though, and darted off to get it. This seems like the kind of thing I'll need a drink for, she said. Go on. But how does the protomolecule fit into that? Is it alive? It murders us, but it also builds amazing structures that are astonishingly advanced. Is it a tool used by someone more like us, only smarter? And if so, are they creatures with a sense of the divine? Do they have faith? What does that look like? If they're even from the same god, Tilly said, using a short straw to mix her drink, then taking a sip. Well, for some of us, there's only one, Anna replied, then asked the waiter for tea. When he'd left again, she said, It calls into question the entire concept of grace. Well, not entirely, but it complicates it, at the very least. The things that made the protomolecule are intelligent. Does that mean they have souls? They invade our solar system, kill us indiscriminately, steal our resources. All things we would consider sins if we were doing them. Does that mean they're fallen? Did Christ die for them too? Or are they intelligent but soulless, and everything the protomolecule's done is just like a virus doing what it's programmed for? A group of workers in civilian jumpsuits came into the dining area and sat down. They ordered food from the waiter and talked noisily among themselves. Anna let them distract her while her mind chewed over the worry she hadn't let herself articulate before today. And really, it's all pretty theoretical, even to me she continued. Maybe none of that should matter to our faith at all, except that I have this feeling it will, that to most people it will matter. Tilly was sipping her drink, which Anna knew from experience meant she was taking the conversation seriously. Have you mentioned this to anyone? Tilly said, prompting her to continue. Cortez acts like he's in charge, Anna replied. Her tea arrived, and she blew on it for a while to cool it. I guess I should talk to him. Cortez is a politician, Tilly said with a condescending smirk. Don't let his folksy Father Hank bullshit snow you. He's here because as long as Esteban is in office, Cortez is a powerful man. This dog and pony show? This is all about votes. I hate that, Anna said. I believe you. You understand this all better than I do. But I hate that you're right. What a waste. What would you ask Cortez for? I'd like to organize some groups, have the conversation. Do you need his permission? Tilly asked. Anna thought of her last conversation with No-No and laughed. When she spoke, her voice sounded thoughtful even to her. No, she said. I guess I don't. That night, 
Anna was awakened from a dream about taking Nami to Earth and watching her bones break as the gravity crushed her to a blaring alarm. It lasted only a few seconds, then stopped. A voice from her comm panel said, All hands to action stations. Anna assumed this didn't mean her, as she had no idea what an action station was. There were no more alarms, and the voice from the comm panel didn't return with more dire pronouncements, but being startled out of her nightmare left her feeling wide awake and jumpy. She climbed out of her bunk, sent a short video message to Nono and Nami, and then put on some clothes. There was very little traffic in the corridor and lifts. The military people she did see looked tense, though to her relief not particularly frightened. Just aware. Vigilant. Having nowhere else to go, she wandered into the officer's mess and ordered a glass of milk. When it arrived, she was stunned to discover it was actual milk that had at some point come out of a cow. How much was the UN spending on this civilian dog and pony show? The only other people in the mess hall were a few military people with officers' uniforms and a small knot of civilian contractors drinking coffee and slumping in their seats like workers in the middle of an all-nighter. A dozen metal tables were bolted to the floor with magnetic chairs at their sides. Wall displays scrolled information for the ship's officers, all of it gibberish to her. A row of cutouts opened into the galley, letting through plates of food and the sounds of industrial dishwashers and the smell of floor cleaner. It was like sitting too near the kitchen in a very, very clean restaurant. Anna drank her milk slowly, savoring the rich texture and ridiculous luxury of it. A bell chimed on someone's hand terminal, and two of the civilian workers got up and left. One stayed, a beautiful, but sad-faced woman who looked down at a terminal on the table with a vacant, thousand-yard stare. "'Excuse me, ma'am,' said a voice behind her, almost making Anna jump out of her chair. A young man in a naval officer's uniform moved into her field of view and gestured awkwardly at the chair next to her. "'Mind if I sit?' Anna recovered enough to smile at him, and he took it as an assent, stiffly folding himself into the seat. He was very tall for an earther, with short, blonde hair and the thick shoulders and narrow waist all of the young officers seemed to have, regardless of gender. Anna reached across the table to shake his hand and said, Anna Volovodov. Chris Williams, the young officer replied, giving her hand a short but firm shake. And yes, ma'am, I know who you are. You do? Yes, ma'am. My people in Minnesota are Methodists, going back as far as we can trace them. When I saw you listed on the civilian roster, I made sure to remember the name. Anna nodded and sipped her milk. If the boy had singled her out because she was a minister of his faith, then he wanted to talk to her as a member of the congregation. She mentally shifted gears to become Pastor Anna and said, What can I do for you, Chris? Love your accent, ma'am. Chris replied. He needed time to build up to whatever it was that he'd approached her about, so Anna gave it to him. I grew up in Moscow, she replied. Though after two years on Europa, I can almost do Belter now, Sasa. Chris laughed, some of the tension draining out of his face. That's not bad, ma'am. But you get those guys going at full speed, I can't understand a word the skinnies say. Anna chose to ignore the slur. Please, no more ma'am. Makes me feel a hundred years old. Anna, please, or Pastor Anna, if you have to. All right, Chris said. Pastor Anna. They sat together in companionable silence for a few moments while Anna watched Chris work up to whatever he needed to say. You heard the alarm, right? He finally said. Bet it woke you up. It's why I'm here, Anna replied. Yeah, action stations. It's because of the dusters, I mean, Martians, you know. Martians? Anna found herself wanting another glass of the delicious milk, but thought it might distract Chris, so she didn't wave at the waiter. We're in weapons range of their fleet now, he said, so we go on alert. We can't share Sky with the dusters anymore without going on alert. Not since, you know, Ganymede. Anna nodded and waited for him to continue. And that ring, you know, it's already killed somebody. 
I mean, just a dumb as sand skinny slingshotter, but still, somebody. Anna took his hand. He flinched a bit, but relaxed when she smiled at him. That scares you? Sure. Of course. But that ain't it. Anna waited, keeping her face carefully neutral. The pretty civilian girl across the room got up suddenly, as though leaving. Her lips moved, talking to herself, then she sat back down, put her arms on the table and leaned her head on them. Someone else scared, waiting out the long watches of the night, all alone in a room full of people. I mean, Chris said, breaking into a reverie. That ain't all of it, anyway. What else? Anna said. The ring didn't put us on alert, he said. It's the Martians. Even with that thing out there, we're still thinking about shooting each other. That's pretty fucked up. Sorry, messed up. It seems like we should be able to see past our human differences when we're confronted with something like this, doesn't it? Chris nodded and squeezed her hand tighter, but said nothing. Chris, would you like to pray with me? He nodded and lowered his head, closing his eyes. When she'd finished, he said, I know I'm not the only Methodist on the ship. Do you, you know, hold services? I do now, she thought. Sunday at 10 a.m. in conference room 41, she said, making a mental note to ask someone if she could use conference room 41 on Sunday mornings. I'll see if I can get the time off, Chris said with a smile. Thank you, ma'am, Pastor Anna. It was nice talking to you, Chris. You just gave me a reason to be here, she thought. When Chris left, Anna found herself very tired, ready to return to her bed. But the pretty girl across the room hadn't moved. Her head was still buried in her arms. Anna walked over to her and gently touched her on the shoulder. The girl's head jerked up. Her eyes wild, almost panicked. Hi, Anna said. I'm Anna. What's your name? The girl stared up, as if the question were a difficult one. Anna sat down across from her. I saw you sitting here, Anna said. It looked like you could use some company. It's okay to be afraid. I understand. The girl jerked to her feet like a malfunctioning machine. Her eyes were flat, and her head tilted a degree. Anna felt suddenly afraid. It was like she'd gone to pet a dog and found herself with her hand on a lion. Something in the back of her head told her, This is a bad one. This one will hurt you. I'm sorry, Anna said, standing up with her hands half-raised. I didn't mean to disturb you. You don't know me, the girl replied. You don't know anything. Her hands were clenched into fists at her sides, the tendons in her neck quivering like plucked guitar strings. You're right, Anna said, still backing up and patting the air with her hands. I apologize. Other people in the room were staring at them now, and Anna felt a surge of relief that she wasn't alone with the girl. The girl stared at her, trembling for a few more seconds, then darted out of the room. What the fuck was that all about? Someone behind Anna said in a quiet voice. Maybe the girl had woken up from a nightmare too, Anna thought. Or maybe she hadn't. Chapter 13 Bull Arriving at the ring was a political fiction, but that didn't keep it from being real. There was no physical boundary to say that this was within the realm of the object. There was no port to dock at. The behemoth sensory arrays had been sucking in data from the ring since before they'd left Tycho. The Martian science ships and Earth military forces that had been there before the doomed Belter kid had become its first casualty were still there, where they had been, but resupplied now. The new Martian ships had joined them, matched orbit, and were hanging quietly in the sky. The Earth flotilla, like the behemoth, was in the last part of the burn, pulling up to whatever range they'd chosen to stop at. To say, 
We have come across the vast abyss to float at this distance, and now we are here. We've arrived. As far as anyone could tell, the ring didn't give a damn. The structure itself was eerie. The surface was a series of twisting ridges that spiraled around its body. At first they appeared uneven, almost messy. The mathematicians, architects, and physicists assured them all that there was a deep regularity there, the height of the ridges in a complex harmony with the width and the spacing between the peaks and valleys. The reports were breathless, finding one layer of complexity after another, the intimations of intention and design all laid bare without any hint of what it all might mean. The official Martian reports had been very conservative, the science officer said. His name was Chan Baozhe, and on Earth he'd have been Chinese. Here he was a belter from Palace Station. They've given a lot of summary and maybe a tenth of the data they've collected. Fortunately, we've been able to observe most of their experiments and make our own analysis. Which Earth will have been doing too, Ashford said. Without doubt, sir, John said. Like any ritual, the staff meeting carried more significance than information. The heads of all the major branches of the behemoth structural tree were present, Sam for engineering, Bull for security, John for the research teams, Benny Cortland Mapu for health services, Anna Marie Ruiz for infrastructure, and so on, filling the two dozen seats around the great conference table. Ashford sat in the place of honor, another beneficent Christ painted on the wall behind him. Pa sat at his right hand, and Bull, by tradition, at his left. What have we got? Ashford said, short form. It's fucking weird, sir, John said, and everyone chuckled. Our best analysis is that the ring is an artificially sustained Einstein-Rosen bridge. You go through the ring, you don't come out the other side here. So it's a gate, Ashford said. Yes, sir. It appears that the protomolecule, or Phoebe bug, or whatever you want to call it, was launched at the solar system several billion years ago, aiming for Earth with the intention of hijacking primitive life to build a gateway. We're positing that whoever created the protomolecule did it as a first step toward making travel to the solar system more convenient and practical later. Bull took a deep breath and let it out slowly. It was what everyone had been thinking but hearing it spoken in this official setting made it seem more real. The ring was a way for something to get here, not just a gateway, a beachhead. When the E.K. went through it, the mass and velocity of the ship triggered some mechanism in the ring, Chan said. The Martians have a good data set from the moment it happened, and there was a massive outpouring of energy within the ring structure and a whole cascade of micro-level confirmation changes. The entire object went up to about 5,000 degrees Kelvin, and it has been cooling regularly ever since. So it took a lot of effort to get that thing running, but it looks like not much to maintain. What do we know about what's on the other side? Pa asked. Her expression was neutral, her voice pleasant and unemotional. She could have been asking him to justify a line item in his budget. It's hard to know much, Chan said. We're picking through a keyhole, and the ring itself seems to be generating interference and radiation that makes getting consistent readings difficult. We know the E.K. wasn't destroyed. We're still getting the video feed that the kid was spewing when he went through. It's just not showing as much. Stars? Ashford said. Something we can start to navigate from? No, sir, John said. The far side of the ring doesn't have any stars, and the background microwave radiation is significantly different from what we'd expect. Meaning what? Ashford said. Meaning, ha, huh, that's weird, John said. Sir? Ashford's smile was cool as he motioned the science officer to continue. John coughed before he went on. We have a couple of other anomalies that we aren't quite sure what to make of. It looks like there's a maximum speed on the other side. Can you unpack that, please? Pa said. The E.K. went through the ring going very fast, John said. 
About seven-tenths of a second after it reached the other side, it started a massive deceleration. Bled off almost all its speed in about five seconds. It looks like the nearly instant deceleration was what killed the pilot. Since then, it seems as if the ship is being moved out away from the ring and deeper into whatever's on the other side. We know that when the protomolecule's active, it's been able to alter what we'd expect from inertia, Sam said. Is that how it stopped the ship? That's entirely possible, Chan said. Mars has been pitching probes through the ring, and it looks like we start seeing the effect right around 600 meters per second. Under that, mass behaves just the way we expect it to. Over that, it stops dead and then moves off in approximately the same direction that the EK is going. Sam whistled under her breath. That's really slow, she said. The main drives would be almost useless. It's slower than a rifle shot, John said. The good news is it only affects mass above the quantum level. The electromagnetic spectrum seems to behave normally, including visible light. Thank God for small favors, Sam said. What else are the probes telling us? There's something out there, John said. And for the first time, a sense of dread leaked into his voice. The probes are seeing objects, large ones. But there's not much light except what we're shining through the ring or mounting on the probes. And, as I said, the ring has always given inconsistent returns. If whatever's in there is made of the same stuff, who knows? Ships? Ashford said. Maybe. How many? Over a hundred, under a hundred thousand, probably. Bull leaned forward, his elbows on the table. Ashford and Pa were looking around the table at the graying faces. They'd known before, because they weren't going to wait for a staff meeting to get their information. Now they were judging the reactions. So he'd give them a reaction. Control the fall. Be weirder if there wasn't anything there. If it was an attack fleet, they'd have attacked by now. Yeah, Ruiz said, latching onto the words. Ashford opened the floor for questions. How many probes had Mars fired through? How long would it take something going at 600 meters per second to reach one of the structures? Had they tried sending small probes in? Had there been any contact from the protomolecule itself? The stolen voices of humans? The way there had been with Eros? John did his best to be reassuring without actually having anything more that he could say. Bull assumed there was a deeper report that Ashford and Pa were getting, and he wondered what was in it. Being kept out, chafed. All right, this is all interesting, but it's not our focus, Ashford said, bringing the Q&A session to a halt. We're not here to send probes through the ring. We're not here to start a fight. We're just making sure that whatever the inner planets do, we're at the table. If something comes out of the ring, we'll worry about it then. Yes, sir, Bull said, throwing his own weight behind Ashford's. It wasn't like there was another strategy. Better that the crew see them all unified. People were watching how this all came down, and not just the crew. Mr. Pa? Ashford said. The XO nodded and glanced at Bull. Instinct dropped a weight in his gut. There have been some irregularities in the ship's accounting structure, Pa said. Chief Engineer Rosenberg? Sam nodded, surprise in her face. XO, she said. I'm afraid I'm going to have to restrict you to quarters and revoke your access privileges until this is all clarified. Chief Watanabe will relieve you. Mr. Baca, you'll see to it. The room was just as silent, but the meaning behind it was different now. Sam's eyes were wide with disbelief and rising fury. Excuse me? she said. Pa met her gaze coolly, and Bull understood all of it in an instant. Records show you've been drawing resources from work and materials budgets that weren't appropriate, Pa said. And until the matter is resolved... If this is about the tech support thing, that's on me, Bull said. I authorized that. It's got nothing to do with Sam. I'm conducting a full audit, Mr. Barker. If I find you've been drawing resources inappropriately, I'll take the actions I deem appropriate. 
As your executive officer, I am informing you that Samara Rosenberg is to be confined to quarters and her access to ship systems blocked. Do you have any questions about that? She'd waited until they'd made the trip, until they'd gotten where they were going, and now it was time to establish that she was in control. To get back at him for the drug dealer he'd spaced and punish Sam for being his ally. Would have been stupid to do until their shakedown run was over. But now it was. Bull laced his fingers together. The refusal was on the back of his tongue, waiting. It would have been insubordination, and it would have been easy as breathing out. There were years, decades even, when he'd have done it and taken the consequences as a badge of honor. It had been his call, and standing by while Sam was punished for it was more than dishonorable. It was disloyal. Pa knew that. Anyone who'd read his service records would know it. If it had just been his mission, his career on the line, he'd have done it. But Fred Johnson had asked him to make this work. So there was only one play to make. No questions, he said, rising from his chair. Sam, you should come with me now. The others were silent as he led her out of the conference room. They all looked stunned and confused, except Ashford and Pa. Pa wore a poker face, and Ashford had a little shadow of smugness in the corners of his mouth. Sam's breath shook. Outrage and adrenaline left her skin pale. He helped her into the side seat of his security cart, then got behind the controls. They lurched into motion, four small engines whirring and whining. They were almost at the elevators when Sam laughed, a short, mirthless sound as much like a cry of pain as anything. Holy shit, Sam said. Bull couldn't think of anything to say that would pull the punch, so he only nodded and took the cart into the wide elevator car. Sam wept, but there was nothing that looked like sorrow in her expression. He guessed that she'd never suffered that kind of disciplinary humiliation before. Or if she had, it hadn't been often enough to build up a callus. The dishonor of letting her take the hit was like he'd swallowed something before he'd chewed it enough. And now it wouldn't go down. Back at the security office, Serge was at the main desk. The man's eyebrows rose as Bull came in the room. Oi, bossman, the duty officer said. A hardcore OPA bruiser named Jojo. ¿Qué pasa? Nothing good. What did I miss? Complaint from a carniceria down by engineering about a missing goat. Got a note from one of the Earth ships, lost one of their crew, wondering if we'd come up with an extra. A couple of coyos got shit-faced and we locked them in quarters. Told them we'd sick the bull on them. How'd they take that? We had the mop up after. Bull chuckled before he sighed. So, I've got Samara Rosenberg in the cart outside, he said. XO wants her confined to quarters for unauthorized use of resources. I want a pony in a wetsuit, Jojo grinned. XO gave an order, Bull said. I want you to take her to her quarters. I'll get her access pulled. We'll need to set a guard while we're at it. She's pissed. Jojo scratched at his neck. We're doing it? Yeah. Jojo's face closed. Bull nodded toward the door. Jojo left, and Bull took his place at the desk, identifying himself to the system and starting the process of locking Sam out of her own ship. While the security system ran its check against each of the behemoth subsystems, he leaned on his elbows and watched. The first time Fred Johnson saved Bull's life, he'd done it with a rifle and a mobile medical unit. The second time, he'd done it with a credit chip. Bull had mustered out at thirty and took his pension to Ceres. For three years, he'd just lived. Ate cheap, drank too much, slept in his own bed, not knowing if he was sick from the alcohol or the spin, not caring much. He got into a few fights, had a few disagreements with the local law. He didn't see that he had a problem until it was unmistakable, and by then it was a hell of a problem. Depression ran in his family. Self-medicating did, too. His grandfather had died of the pair. His mother had been in therapy a couple times. 
His brother had graduated to heroin and lived five years in a treatment center in Roswell. None of it had seemed to have anything to do with Bull. He was a Marine. He'd turned away from a life on basic to live in the stars, or if not the stars, at least the rocks that floated free in the night sky. He'd killed men. Bottle couldn't beat him. But it almost had. The day Fred Johnson had appeared at his door, it had been stranger than a dream. His former commanding officer looked different. Older. Stronger. Truth was, their birthdays weren't all that far apart, but Johnson had always been the old man. Bull had followed the news about the fallout from Anderson Station and Fred's changing sides. Some of the other Marines he knew on Ceres had been angry about it. He'd just figured the old man knew what he was doing. He wouldn't have done it without a reason. Bull, Fred had said. Just that at first. He could still remember Fred's dark eyes meeting his. The shame had made Bull try to stand straighter, to suck in his gut a little. In that moment he saw how far he'd fallen. Two seconds of seeing himself through Fred Johnson's eyes was all it took for that. Sir, Bull had replied, then stood back and let Johnson into the hole. The place stank of yeast and old tofu and flop sweat. Fred ignored it all. I need you back on duty, soldier. Okay, Bull had said. And the secret he carried with him, the one he'd take to his grave, was this. He hadn't meant it. In that moment, all he'd wanted was for Fred Johnson to go away and let Bull forget him again. Lying to his old commanding officer, to the man who'd kept him from bleeding out under fire, came as naturally as breathing. It didn't have anything to do with Earth, or the Belt, or Anderson Station. It wasn't some greater loyalty. He just wasn't done destroying himself. And even now, sitting alone at the security desk, betraying Sam, he thought that Fred had known, or guessed. Fred had pressed a credit chip into his palm. It was one of the cheap vaguely opalescent ones that the OPA had used to keep its funds untraceable back in the bad old days. Get yourself a new uniform. Bullet saluted, already thinking about the booze he could buy. The chit carried six months' wages at his old pay grade. If it had been less, Bull wouldn't have gone. Instead, he shaved for the first time in days, got a new suit, packed a valise, and threw out anything that didn't fit in it. He hadn't had a drink since, even on the nights he'd wanted one more than oxygen. The security system chimed that the lockout was finished. Bull noted it and leaned back in the chair, reading the be-on-alert notice from the Cerisier and letting his mind wander. When Gathoni arrived to take the next shift, he walked two corridors down to a little mom-and-pop bodega, bought a blister pack with four bulbs of beer, and headed over to Sam's quarters. The guard on duty nodded to him. Legally, Bull didn't have to knock. As head of security, he could have walked into Sam's rooms at any time, with or without being welcome. He knocked. Sam was wearing a simple sweater and black work pants with magnetic strips down the sides. Bull held up the beer. For a long moment, Sam glared at him. She stepped back and to the side. He followed her in. Her rooms were clean, neat, and cluttered. The air smelled like industrial lubricant and old laundry. She leaned against the arm of a foam couch. Peace offering? She said bitterly. Pretty much, Bull said. Pa's pissed off at me, and she's taking it out on you. She figured either I do it, and I lose my best ally, or I don't, and I'm the one confined to quarters, right? No way to lose for her. This is bullshit. It is, Bo said. And I'm sorry as hell about the whole damn thing. Sam's breath rattled with anger. Bull accepted it. He had it coming. She walked across to him, grabbing the four-pack out of his hand, twisting it to shatter the plastic and plucking one of the bulbs free. You want one? she asked. Just water for me, he said. What chafes me? 
Sam said, is the way Ashford just sits there like he's so happy about the whole thing. He knows the score. He's as much a part of it as Pa, or you. Don't think you can buy me off with a few cheap brews. You're just as much at fault as they are. I am. I got into engineering because I didn't want all the petty social bird shit. Now look at me. Yeah, Bo said. Sam dropped to the couch with a sigh and said something obscene and colorful. Bo sat down across from her. Okay, stop that, she said. What? That looking repentant thing. I feel like I'm supposed to genuflect or something. It's creepy. She took a long pull at the bulb, the soft plastic collapsing under the suction, then expanding out a little as the beer outgassed. Look, you and Pa are both doing what you think you ought to, and I'm getting screwed. I get it. Doesn't mean I have to be happy about it. Thing is, you're right. She wants you to lose allies. So, no matter how much I want to tell you to go put your dick in a vice, I'm not going to, just because it would mean Pa won. Thank you for that, Sam. Go put your dick in a vice, Bull. Bull's hand terminal chimed. Mr. Baca? Gathoni's voice said. You should come back to the office, maybe. Sam's expression sobered, and she put down the bulb. Bull's belly tightened. What's going on? he asked. When Gathoni answered, her voice was controlled and calm, as a medic calling for more pressure. Earth destroyer Sung Un? It just blew up. Chapter 14 Melba When she'd thought about it, planning the final, closing stages of her vengeance, she'd pictured herself as the conductor of a private symphony, moving her baton to the orchestrated chaos. It didn't happen that way at all. The morning she went to the Thomas Prince, she didn't know that the day had finally come. Active hands to stations, a man's voice announced over the general channel. Wish to fuck they'd stop doing that, Melba said. Always makes me feel like I should be doing something. Savvy, boss. When they start paying me Navy wages, I'll start jumping for their drills, Soledad said, her voice pressed thin by the hand terminal speaker. I've got nothing on this couple, unless Stanny's got it. We got to move down a level. Try again. Copy that, Melba said. Stani, what are you seeing? The channel went silent. Melba looked around the service corridor at a half kilometer of nothing. Conduit and pipes and the access grating that could shift to accommodate any direction of thrust. The only sounds were the creaking, hissing, and muttering of the Thomas Prince. The seconds stretched. Stani? Soledad said, dread in her voice, and the channel crackled. Perdon, Stani said, looking at some weird wiring, but it's not the goose we're hunting. Lost in my head, me. I'm fine. I'm here. Soledad said something obscene under her breath. Sorry, Stani said again. It's okay, Melba said. Did you check the brownout buffers? Did. Then let's just keep moving. Next level. The thing that surprised her, the one she hadn't seen coming, was how everyone on the Cerisier was ready to put Ren's disappearance at the foot of the ring. It was rare for people to go missing on a ship. The Cerisier, like any other long-haul vessel, was a closed system. There was nowhere to go. She'd assumed there would be the usual human suspicions. Ren had crossed someone, stolen something, slept with the wrong person, and he'd been disposed of. Thrown out an airlock, maybe. Fed into the recycling and reduced to his basic nutrients, then passed into the water or food supply. It wasn't that there were no ways to hide or dispose of a body. It was that there were so few ways for it to go unnoticed. Traveling between the planets had never eliminated murder. So many highly evolved primates in the same box for months on end, a certain death rate had to be expected. This time, though... It was different. It made sense to people that someone would go missing, vanish, as they approached the ring. It felt right. The voyage itself was ill-omened, and strange things were supposed to happen when people drew too near the uncanny, the dangerous, the haunted. 
The others were all on edge, and that gave her cover, too. If she started weeping, they'd think they understood why. They'd think it was fear. Melba packed her diagnostic array back in its sleeve, stood and headed down to the lift. The internal service lifts were tiny, with hardly enough room for one person in the gear. Traveling between decks here was like stepping into a coffin. As she shifted down to the next level, she imagined the power failing, being trapped there. Her mind flickered, and for a moment she saw her own storage locker, the one in her quarters, the one filled with sealant foam, and Wren. She shuddered and forced her mind elsewhere. The Thomas Prince was one of the larger ships in the Earth flotilla, the home of the civilian horde that the UN had put together. Artists, poets, philosophers, priests. Even without changing the physical structures of the ship, it gave it the feeling of being less a military vessel and more a poorly appointed, uncomfortable cruise liner. Clarissa had been on yachts and luxury ships most of the time she'd traveled outside Earth's gravity well, and she could imagine the thousand complaints the ship's captain would suffer about the halls not being wide enough and the screens on the walls too low a quality. It was the sort of thing she would have been concerned with in her previous life. Now it was less than nothing. It shouldn't have bothered her. One more death, more or less. It shouldn't have mattered. But it was Wren. In position, Stani said. Give me a second, Melba said, stepping out of the lift. The new corridor was nearly identical to the one above it. These decks were all quarters and storage with very little of the variation that she'd see when they reached the lowest levels. Engineering, machine shops, hangar bays. Tracking down the electrical anomaly, they'd started here because it was easy. The longer it took, the harder it would get. Like everything. She found the junction, took the diagnostic array out of its sleeve, and plugged it in. Sole? In place, Soledad said. Okay. Melba said. Start the trace. When it had happened, she'd gotten Rand to her quarters and laid him out on the floor. She'd already felt the crash coming on, so she'd lain down on her bunk and let it come. It might only have been her imagination that made that one seem worse than the ones before. For a long, horrified moment at the end, she thought that she'd voided herself, but her uniform was clean. She'd gone then, Wren still on her floor, gotten a bulb of coffee, put Wren's hand terminal in a stall of the group head, and found the security officer. He was a thin Martian named André Comigny, and he'd listened to her informal report with half an ear. Wren had called her and asked her to consult with him. When she'd gone to see him at his usual workstation, he wasn't there. She'd been through the ship, but she hadn't found him, and he wasn't answering connection requests. She was starting to get concerned. While they'd done a sweep of the ship, she'd gotten the tubes of sealant foam, gone back to her quarters, and entombed him. His hair had seemed brighter, the orange like something from a coral reef. His skin was pale as sunlight where the blood had drained away from it, purple as a bruise where it had pooled. Rigor hadn't set in, so she was able to fold him together, curled like a fetus, and fill the spaces around him with foam. It had taken minutes to harden. The foam was engineered to be airtight and pressure-resistant. If she'd done it right, the corpse smell would never leak out. Nadia, Soledad said, sounding resigned. You guys got anything? Hey, Stani said. Think I do. I've got a ten percent fluctuation on this box. Okay. Melba said. Let's reset it and see if that clears the issue. On it, Stani said. Grab some lunch while it run? I'll meet you in the galley, Melba said. Her voice seemed almost normal. She sounded like someone else. The galley was nearly empty. By the ship's clock, it was the middle of the night, and only a few officers lurked at their tables, watching the civilians as they passed. The terms of the service contract meant they got to use the officers' mess. She'd heard there was a certain level of distrust among the Navy crews for civilians like her and her team. 
She would have resented it more if she hadn't been the living example of why their suspicions were justified. Soledad and Stani were already at a table drinking coffee from the bulb and sharing a plate of sweet rolls. I'm going to miss these when we cut thrust, Stani said, holding one of the rolls up. Best cook flying can't bake right without thrust. How long do you think we're going to be on the float? As long as it takes, Melba said. They're planning for two months. Two months at Null G, Soledad said. But her voice and the grayness of her face were clear. Two months at the ring. Yeah, Stani said. Any word on Bob? The fifth of the team, fourth now, was still back on the Cerisier. It turned out he and Wren had both been having a relationship with a man on the medical team, and security were rounding up the usual suspects. Most times, someone went missing, it was domestic. Melba felt her throat going thick again. Nothing yet, she said. They'll clear him. He wouldn't have done anything. Yeah, Soledad said. Bob wouldn't hurt anyone. He's a good man. Everyone knew about everything, and he loved Ren. Could stop the Passato, Stani said. We don't know he's dead. Well, they say Koisa out there, dead's the best thing he could be, Soledad said. I've been having bad dreams since we flipped. I don't think we're making it back from this run, not any of us. Talking like that won't help, Stani said. A woman walked into the galley. Middle-aged, thick red hair pulled into a severe-looking bun that competed with her smile. Melba looked at her to try not to be at the table, then looked away. Whatever happened to Wren, she said, we've got our job to do, and we'll do it. Damn right, Stani said, and then again with a catch in his voice. Damn right. They sat together quietly for a moment while the older man wept. Sole put a hand on his arm, and Stani's shuddering breath slowed. He nodded, swallowed. He looked like an icon of grief and courage. He looked noble. It struck Melba for the first time that Stani was probably her father's age, and she had never seen her father weep for anyone. I'm sorry, she said. She hadn't planned to speak the words, but there they were, coughed up on the table. They seemed obscene. It's okay, Stani said. I'm all right. Here, boss, have a roll. Melba reached out, fighting herself not to weep again, not to speak. She didn't know what she'd say, and she was afraid of herself. The alert chimed on her hand terminal. The diagnostic was finished. It only took a second to see that the spike was still there. Stani said something profane, then shrugged. No rest for the wicked, no peace for the good, he said, standing. Go ahead, Melba said. I'll catch up. Pa problema, Soledad said. You hardly got to drink your coffee, Sasa. She watched them go, relieved that they wouldn't be there and wanted to call them back both at the same time. The thickness in her throat had traveled to her chest. The sweet rolls looked delicious and nauseating. She forced herself to take a few deep breaths. It was almost over. The fleets were there. The Rocinante was there. Everything was going according to her plan. Or, if not quite that, at least near enough to it. Wren shouldn't have mattered. She'd killed men before him. It was almost inevitable that people would die when the bomb went off. Vengeance called forth blood, because it always did. That was its nature and she had made herself its instrument. Wren wasn't her fault. He was Holden's. Holden had killed him by making her presence necessary. If he had respected the honor of her family, none of this would have happened. She stood up, squared herself, prepared to get back to the job of fixing the Thomas Prince, just the way the real Melba would have. I'm sorry, Wren, she said thinking it would be the last time, and the sorrow that shook her made her sit back down. Something was wrong. This wasn't how it was supposed to be. Her control was slipping. She wondered if, after all she'd done, 
she simply wasn't strong enough. Or if there was something else. Maybe the artificial glands had begun to leak their toxins into her bloodstream without being summoned. She was getting more emotionally labile. It could be a symptom. She rested her head on her arms and tried to catch her breath. He'd been kind to her. He'd been nothing but kind. He'd helped her, and she'd killed him for it. She could still feel his skull giving way under her hand, crisp and soft, like standing at the bank of a river and feeling the ground fall away. Her fingers smelled like sealant foam. Wren touched her shoulder and her head snapped up. Hi, someone said. I'm Anna. What's your name? It was the redhead who'd been talking to the naval officer a moment ago. I saw you sitting here, she said, sitting down. It looked like you could use some company. It's okay to be afraid. I understand. She knows. The thought ran through Melba's body like a sheet of lightning. Even without her tongue touching her palate, she felt the glands and bladders hidden in her flesh and gorging. Her face and hands felt cold. Before the woman's eyes could widen, Melba's sorrow and guilt turned to a cold rage. She knew, and she would expose everything. And then all of it would have been wasted. She didn't remember rising to her feet, but she was there now. The woman stood and took a step back. I have to kill her. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to disturb you. The woman's hands were half raised, as if that were enough to ward off a blow. It would be simple. She didn't look strong. She didn't know how to fight. Kick her in the gut until she bled out. Nothing simpler. A small voice in the back of Melba's mind said, She's one of those idiot priests looking for someone to save. She doesn't know anything. You're in public. If you attack her, they'll catch you. You don't know me, Melba said, struggling to keep her voice calm. You don't know anything. At one of the tables nearest the door, a young officer stood up and took two steps toward them, ready to interfere. If this woman got her thrown in the brig, they'd look into Melba's identity. They'd find Wren's body. They'd find out who she was. She had to keep it together. You're right. I apologize, the woman said. Hatred surged up in Melba's mind, pure and black where it wasn't red. A swamp of obscenities rose in her throat, ready to pour out on the idiot priest who was putting everything, everything in jeopardy. Melba swallowed it all and walked quickly away. The corridors of the Thomas Prince were a vague presence in the unquiet of her mind. She'd let the thing with Wren throw her. It stole her focus and led her into risks she didn't need to take. She hadn't been thinking straight, but now she was. She got into the elevator and selected the level where Stani and Soledad were checking the electrical system, chasing down the failing component. Then she deselected it and picked the hanger. Stani, Soli, she said into her hand terminal. Hold it together for me here. I've got a thing I need to do. She waited for the inevitable questioning, the prying and suspicion. Okay, Soledad said. And that was all. At the hangar, Melba authorized the flight of her shuttle, waited ten minutes for clearance, and launched out the side of the Thomas Prince and into the black. The shuttle monitors were cheap and small, the vastness of space compressed into fifty centimeters by fifty centimeters. She had the computer figure the fastest burn for the Cerisier. It was less than an hour. She leaned into the thrust like she was riding a roller coaster and let the torch engines burn. The Cerisier appeared in the dusting of stars as a small gray dot that hurtled toward her. The ship, like all the others in the flotilla, was in the last of the deceleration burn to put them at the ring. Somewhere out past all the glowing drive plumes, it waited. Melba pushed the thought from her mind. It made her think of Stani and Soledad and their quiet fears. She couldn't think of them now. Impatience to arrive made it hard to start the flip and the deceleration burn. 
She wanted to get there, to be there already. She wanted to speed into the Cerisier like a witch on a broom, screaming in at speeds that wouldn't have been possible in atmosphere. She waited too long, and did the last half of the jump at almost 2G. When she docked, she had a headache, and her jaw felt like someone had punched her. No one asked why she was back early and alone. She listed personal reasons in the log. Walking through the cramped corridors, squeezing past the other crewmen, felt oppressive, familiar, and comforting. It took coming back to recognize how much the wider spaces of the Thomas Prince had bothered her. It felt too much like freedom, and she was all about necessity. Her cell was a mess. All of her things, clothes, terminal jack, tampons, communications deck, toothbrush, were scattered on the floor. She'd have to find a way to secure them all before the burn stopped or they'd be floating out into the corridor. People would wonder why they weren't packed away. She let herself glance at the metal door under her crash couch. A tiny, golden curl of sealant foam stuck out from one corner. She'd get some kind of mesh bag and some magnets. That would do. It didn't matter. That was later. Nothing later mattered. She picked up the comm deck, turned it on. Ping times to the Rosinante were under thirty seconds. Melba loaded the sequence she'd been waiting to load for months. Years. It was a short script. It didn't take a second to prompt her to confirm. The fear was gone. The hatred was, too. For a moment, the tiny room was filled with a sense of having just woken from a dream, and her body felt relaxed, almost light. She'd come so far, and worked so hard, and despite all of the mistakes and screw-ups and last-minute improvisations, she'd done it. Everything in her life had been aiming toward this moment, and now that she was here, it was almost hard to let it all go. She felt like she was graduating from university or getting married. This moment, this action that fulfilled all the things she'd fought for, and then her world would never be the same. Carefully, savoring each keystroke, she put in the confirmation code, Jules-Pierre Mao, and thumbed the send button. The comm deck LED glowed amber. At the speed of light, a tiny packet of information was pulsing out, hardly more than a bit of background static. But the software in the Rosinante would recognize it. The communications array on Holden's ship would be slave to the virtual machine, already installed and impossible to stop without scraping the whole system clean. The Rosinante would send a clearly recognizable trigger code to the Sun Un, wait 53 seconds, and announce Holden's responsibility and his demands. And then the virtual machine would power up the weapons and targeting systems, and nothing, no power in the universe, could stop it from happening. The comm deck got the confirmation response, and the amber LED shifted to red. Chapter 15 Bull Bull's hand terminal sat on the cart's thin plastic dashboard, jiggling with every bump in the corridor floor. The siren blatted its standard two-tone, scattering people from his path and calling them out behind him. If they didn't know yet, they all would in minutes. The death of the Sun Un wasn't the sort of thing you could overlook. On the small jittering screen, the destroyer exploded again. At first, it was only a flicker of orange light amidships, something that could have been electrical discharge or a gauss gun finishing its maintenance regimen. Half a second later, sparkles of yellow radiated out from the sight. Two seconds after, the major detonation. Between one frame and the next, the destroyer's side bloomed open. Then nothing for ten full seconds before the fusion reactor core emerged slowly from the back, brighter than the sun. Bull watched the intense white gases begin to diffuse out and fade into a massive golden aurora, a drop of gold losing cohesion in the oceanic black. He looked up to make the turn onto the ramp that would take him back to the office. 
A young man ambled slowly out of his path, and Bo leaned on the cart's horn. There's a siren, Bo yelled as he passed the young man, and got an insolent nod in reply. Okay, Serge said from the terminal. We're getting the first security analysis. Best guess, something blew out in one of the power conduits. Fused the safety system so they couldn't shut it down. Would have taken about that long to turn the whole starboard main circuit to molten slag. What blew? Bull demanded. Probably a maneuvering thruster. About the right place for one. Get it hot enough, water skips steam and just goes straight to plasma. Cuts right through the bulkheads around it. Bull turned the cart around a tight corner and slowed to let a half dozen pedestrians get out of his way. Why'd they dump core? Don't know. But probably they thought they'd lose containment. They got six ships diverting now to keep from plowing into that mierda. If they'd lost containment, it'd be worse. They'd be diverting to avoid bodies and shrapnel. Are there survivors? Yeah. They're putting out the distress request, medical and evacuation. Sounds pretty fucked up, you know? What about trace data? Can we tell who shot him? No one shot him. Either it was a straight accident or... Or? Or it wasn't. Bo bit his lip. An accident would be bad enough. People on all sides of the system's power structure were on edge, and a reminder that Earth's fleet was aging and poorly maintained wouldn't make anything easier. Sabotage would be worse. The closest thing to good news was that everyone had seen it, and there wouldn't be any accusations of enemy action. If there'd been a Gauss round or a lucky missile that had slipped through the Sung Un's defenses undetected, the scientific mission could turn into a shooting war faster than Bull wanted to think about. Are we offering assistance? Bull asked. Give us a breath, boss, Serge said. Ashford ain't hearing any of this faster than us. Bull leaned forward, his hands wrapping the steering controls until his knuckles went white. Serge was right. What happened outside the ship was Ashford's problem, and Pa's. He was security chief, and he needed to think about what needed doing inside the behemoth. People would be scared, and it was his job to make sure that fear didn't turn into hysteria. Watching a ship blow out, even an enemy ship, reminded everyone how tenuous life was with only a thin skin of steel and ceramic to keep the vacuum at bay. It reminded him. The cart hit a larger bump than usual, and his hand terminal slipped onto its side. Okay, Bo said. Look, we're going to need to get relief supplies ready in case the captain decides to offer assistance. How many survivors can we take on? Serge's laughter rasped. All of them. With a pinch of behemoth. We got enough room for a city, us. Okay, Bo said, smiling a little despite himself. It was a stupid question. The only thing we got to worry about is... The line went dead. Serge? Not funny, Bo said, and then, talk to me, mister. We got something. Broadcast coming from a private corvette called the Rocinante. Why do I know that name? Bo asked. Yeah, Serge said. I'm putting it to you. The handset screen blacked out, jumped, and then a familiar face appeared. Bo let the cart slow as James Holden... The man whose announcement about the death of the ice hauler Canterbury started the first war between Earth and Mars once again made things worse. Ship that approaches the ring without my personal permission will be destroyed without warning. Do not test my resolve. Oh, no, Bo said. Oh, shit, no. It has always been a personal mission of mine to assure that information and resources remain free to all people. The efforts of individuals and corporate entities may have helped us to colonize the planets of our solar system and make life possible where it was inconceivable before, but the danger of someone unscrupulous taking control of the ring is too great. I have proven myself worthy of the trust of the people of the belt. It is a moral imperative that this shining artifact be protected, and I will spill as much blood as I have to in order to do so. Bo scooped up the hand terminal and tried to connect to Ashford. The red trefoil of command block blinked on the screen and shunted him to a menu that let him record a message for later. 
He tried pa and got the same thing. Holden's message was looping now. The replayed words just as idiotic and toxic the second time through. Bull said something obscene through clenched teeth. He pulled on the cart, turning the wheels as far as they would go, and stamped on the accelerator. The central lifts were only a minute or two away. He could get there. Just please God let Ashford not do anything stupid before he got to the bridge. That true, boss? Serge said. Did Holden just claim us all the ring? I want everyone on security mobilized right now, Bull said. Enemy action protocols. Corridors clear and bulkheads closed. Anyone on a weapons or damage control team, wake them up and get them dressed. You're in charge of that. You got it, boss, Serge said. Someone asks, where are you? Trying to keep from needing them. Bien. The familiar corridors seemed longer than usual. The awkwardness of floors built to be walls and walls intended as ceilings more surreal. If he'd been on a real battleship, there would have been a simple, direct path. If the behemoth's great belly had been spinning, it would have been better than this. He willed the cart faster, pushing the engine past what it could do. The alert klaxon sounded, Surge calling everyone to brace for battle. A crowd had formed at the lift men and women trying to get back to their stations. Bull pushed through them, the shortest person there. An earther, like Holden. At the lift, he activated the security override, called the first car, and stepped in. A tall, dark-skinned man tried to follow him. Bull put a hand on the man's chest, stopping him. Take the next one, Bull said. I'm not going where you want to be. As the lift rose toward the bridge like it was ascending to heaven, Bull used his hand terminal to grasp for any information. He didn't have access to the secure channels, only the captain and the XO had those, but there was more than enough public chatter. He ran through the open feeds, grasping for a sense of the situation, watching for a few seconds here, a few seconds there. The Martian science team and their escort were raging at Holden on every feed calling him a terrorist and a criminal. The Earth flotilla's reaction was quieter. Most of the public conversation was coordinating the rescue efforts on the Sung Un. The high-energy gas from the core dump was confusing some of the relief crew's comms, and someone fairly smart had started using the public feeds to coordinate them. It had the grim efficiency of a military operation, and it gave Bull hope for the Earth Navy crew still alive on the Sung Un, as much as it scared him about what was going to come after. Holden's message was repeating, spilling out over the public feeds. At first it just came from the Rosinante, but soon it was being relayed on other feeds along with commentary. Once the signal got back to the belt and the inner planets, it was going to be the only thing anyone talked about. Bull could already imagine the negotiations between Earth and Mars, could practically hear them reaching the conclusion that the OPA had gotten too confident and needed to be taken down a notch. Someone on the behemoth put out a copy of Holden's message with a split circle emblem over it and a commentary track saying that it was about time that the belt take its place and demand the respect it deserved. Bull told Serge to find the feed and shut it down. After what felt like hours and probably wasn't more than four minutes, the lift reached the bridge, the doors opening silently before him, and let Bull out. The bridge wasn't designed for battle. Instead of a real war machine system of multiple stations and controlled lines of command, the behemoth's bridge was built like the largest tugboat ever made, only with angels blowing golden trumpets adorning the walls. The stations, single stations with a rotating backup scheme, were manned by belters, looking at each other and chatting. The security station was through a separate door and stood unmanned. The bridge crew were acting like children or civilians. Their expressions were bright and excited. People who didn't recognize danger when they saw it, and assumed that whatever the crisis was, it would all work out in the end. Ashford and Pa were at the command station. Ashford was speaking into a camera, talking with someone on one of the other ships. Pa, scowling, strode toward Bull. Her eyes were narrow and her lips bloodless. 
What the hell are you doing here, Mr. Baca? I've got to talk to the captain, Bo said. Captain Ashford's busy right now, Pa said. You might have noticed we have a situation on our hands. I would have expected you to be at your duty station. Yes, Exo, but your station isn't on the bridge. You should leave now. Bo clenched his jaw. He wanted to shout at her, but this wasn't the time for it. He was here to make it work, and that wasn't going to help. We've got to shoot him, ma'am, Bo said. We've got to fire on the Rocinante, and we've got to do it now. All heads had turned toward them. Ashford ended his transmission and stepped toward them. Uncertainty made him look haughty. The captain's eyes flickered toward the crew members at their stations and back again. Bull could see how aware Ashford was that he was being watched. It deformed all his decisions, but there wasn't time for privacy. I have this under control, Mr. Baca, Ashford said. All respect, Captain, Bo said, but we've got to shoot down Holden and we have to do it before anyone else does. We're not going to do a damn thing until we know what's going on, mister, Ashford said, his voice taking a dangerous buzz. I've sent back a request for clarification to Ceres to see whether the higher-ups authorized Holden's action, and I am monitoring the activity of the Earther fleet. The slip was telling. Not U.N., Earther. Bo felt the blood in his neck. Ashford's casual racism and incompetence was about to get them all killed. He gritted his teeth, lowered his head, and raised his voice. Sir, there's a calculation happening right now with Earth and Mars both. This is a potentially volatile situation, Mr. Barker, where they have to decide whether to take direct response or let Holden win. And I am not going to be the one to throw gas on the fire, escalating to violence at this point, and once they start shooting at him, they're going to start shooting at us. Pa's voice cut through the air like a single flute in a bass symphony. He's right, sir. Bull and Ashford turned toward her. Ashford's surprise was a mirror of his own. The man at the sensor station muttered something to the woman next to him, the hiss of his voice carrying in the sudden silence. Mr. Buck is right, Pa said. Holden's identified himself as a representative of the OPA. He's taken violent action against the Earth forces. The opposing commanders will have to look on us as his backup. Holden isn't a representative of the OPA, Ashford said. The bluster made him sound unsure. You called Ceres, Bo said. If you're not sure, they're not either. Ashford's face flushed red. Holden hasn't had any official status with the OPA since Fred Johnson fired him over his handling of Ganymede. If there's a question, I can clarify with the other commanders that Holden doesn't speak for us, but no one's taking any action. The best thing is to wait and let things cool down. Pa looked down, then up again. It didn't matter that she'd humiliated Bull and Sam in front of the command staff. All that counted was doing this next part right. Bull wanted to reach out, touch her arm, lend her the courage to stand up to Ashford. It turned out she didn't need it. Sir, if we don't take the initiative, someone else will. And then it's going to be too late for clarifications. Denials are fine if they're believed. But Holden and his crew were known to be working with us previously, and they're claiming to represent us now. We're four hours lagged to Ceres. We can't wait for answers. We have to make the division between us and Holden unequivocal. Mr. Bach is right. We need to engage the Rocinante. Ashford's face was gray. I'm not going to start a shooting war, he said. You listening to the same feeds as me, Captain? Bull asked. Everyone already thinks we did. The Rocinante's one ship. We can take her out, Pa said. If we fight Earth or Mars, we'll lose. The truth lay on the floor between them. Ashford put a hand to his chin. His eyes were flickering back and forth like he was reading something that wasn't there. Every second he didn't respond, his cowardice showed through. And Bull could see that the man knew it, resented it. Ashford was responsible and didn't want the responsibility. He was more afraid of looking bad than of losing. Mr. Chen, Ashford said, get a tight beam to the Rosinante. 
Tell Captain Holden that it's an urgent matter. Yes, sir, the communications officer said, and then a moment later, The Rosinante isn't accepting the connection, sir. Captain? The man at the sensor array said. The Rosinante's changing course. Where's she going? Ashford demanded, his gaze still locked on Bull. Um, towards us, sir? Ashford closed his eyes. Mr. Corley, he growled. Power up the port missile array, Mr. Chen. I want tight beam connections to the Earth and Mars command ships, and I want them now. Bull let himself sag back. The sense of urgency giving way to relief and a kind of melancholy. One more time, Colonel Johnson. We dodge the bullet one more time. Weapons board is green, sir, the weapons officer said, her voice crisp and excited as a kid at an arcade. Lock target, Ashford said. Do I have those tight beams yet? We're acknowledged and pending, sir, Chen said. They know we want to talk. That'll do, Ashford said, and began pacing the bridge like an old-time captain on a wooden quarterdeck. His hands were clasped behind his back. We have lock, the weapons officer said. Then, the Rosinante's weapon systems are powering up. Ashford sank into his couch. His expression was sour. He'd been hoping, Bull realized, that it might be true, that the OPA might be making a play to control the ring. The man was an idiot. Should we fire, sir? The weapons officer asked, the strain in her voice like a dog on a leash. She wanted to, badly. Bull didn't think better of her for it. He glanced at Pa, but she was making a point of not looking at him. Yes. Ashford said. Go ahead. Fire. One away, sir, the weapons officer said. I'm getting an error code, the operations officer said. We're getting feedback from the launcher. Bull's mouth tasted like a penny. If Holden had put a bomb on the behemoth, too, their problems might only be starting. Is the missile out? Pa snapped. Tell me we don't have an armed torpedo stuck in the tube. Yes, sir. The weapons officer said. The missile is away. We have confirmation. The Rosinante is taking evasive maneuvers. Is she returning fire? Ashford said. No, sir. Not yet, sir. I'm getting errors in the electrical grid, sir. I think something shorted out. We might... The bridge went dark. Lose power, sir. The monitors were black. The lights were off. The only sound was the hum of the air recyclers running, Bull imagined, off the battery backups. Ashford's voice came out of the darkness. Mr. Pa, did we ever test fire the missile systems? I believe it's on the schedule for next week, sir, the XO said. Bull tuned his hand terminal screen to its brightest, lifting it like a torch. He glanced up at the emergency lighting set into the walls all around the room, sitting there as dark as everything else. Another system that hadn't been tested yet. A few seconds later, half of the bridge crew pulled flashlights out of recessed emergency lockers. The light level came up as beams played across the room. No one spoke. No one needed to. If the Rosinante fired back, they were a dead target. But the chances were that they wouldn't lose the whole ship. If they'd waited until they were in pitched battle against Earth or Mars, or both... The behemoth would have died. Instead, they'd just shown the whole system how unprepared they were. It was the first time Bo was really glad to be just the security officer. Exo? Bo said. Yes? Permission to release the chief engineer from house arrest? Pa's face was monochrome gray in the dim light, and solemn as the grave. Still, he thought he saw a glint of bleak amusement in her eyes. Permission granted, she said. Chapter 16 Holden Well, Amos said, that's just fucking peculiar. The message began to repeat. This is Captain James Holden. What you've just seen is a demonstration of the danger you are in. The ops deck was in a stunned silence. 
Then Naomi began working the ship's ops panel with a quiet fury. In Holden's peripheral vision, Monica motioned to her crew and Oakju lifted a camera. The tacit decision to let the no-civilians on the ops deck rule slide suddenly seemed like it might have been a mistake. It's a fake, Holden said. I never recorded that. That's not me. Sort of sounds like you, though, Amos said. Jim, Naomi said, panic beginning to distort her voice. That broadcast is coming from us. It's coming from the Rosie right now. Holden shook his head, denying the assertion outright. The only thing more ridiculous than the message itself was the idea that it was coming from his ship. That broadcast is coming from us, Naomi said, slamming her hand against her screen. And I can't stop it. Everything seemed to recede from Holden. The noises in the room coming from far away. He recognized it as a panic reaction, but he gave into it, accepted the short moment of peace it brought. Monica was shouting questions at him he could barely hear. Naomi was furiously pounding on her workstation, flipping through menu screens faster than he could follow. Over the ship's calm, Alex was shouting demands for orders. From across the room, Amos was staring at him with a look of almost comical puzzlement. The two camera operators, equipment still clutched in one hand, were trying to belt themselves into crash couches with the other. Cohen floated in the middle of the room, lips pursed in a faint frown. This was the setup, Holden said. This is what it was for. Everything. The Martian lawsuit. The loss of his Titania job. The camera crew going to the ring, all leading to this. The only thing he couldn't imagine was why. What do you mean? Monica asked, pushing close to get into the shot with him. What setup? Amos put a hand on her shoulder and shook his head once. Naomi, Holden said. Is the only system you've lost control of comms? I don't know. I think so. Then kill it. If you can't help Amos isolate the entire comm system from the power grid, cut it out of the damn ship if you have to. She nodded again and then turned to Amos. Alex, Holden said. Monica started to say something to him, but he held up one finger to silence her, and she closed her mouth with a snap. Get us burning toward the behemoth. We're not really claiming the ring for the OPA, but as long as everyone thinks we are, they're the team least likely to shoot us. What can you tell me about what's going on? Monica said. Are we in danger here? Is this dangerous? Her usual smirk was gone. Open fear had replaced it. Strap in, Holden said. All of you, do it now. Oakju and Clip were already belted into crash couches, and Monica and Cohen quickly followed suit. The entire documentary crew had the good sense to stay quiet. Cap, Alex said. His voice had taken on the almost sleepy tone he got when in a high-stress situation. The behemoth just lit us up with their targeting laser. Holden belted himself into the combat op station and warmed it up. The Rossi began counting ships within their threat radius. It turned out to be all of them. The ship asked him if any should be marked as hostiles. Your guess is as good as mine, honey. Huh? Naomi asked. Um, Alex said. Are you guys warming up the weapons? No, Holden said. Oh, I'm really sorry to hear that, Alex said. Weapon systems are coming online. Are we shooting at anyone? Not yet. Holden told the Rosie to mark anything that hit them with a targeting system as hostile and was relieved when the system actually responded. The behemoth shifted to red on the display. Then, after a moment's thought... He told the ship to lump all the Martians and Earth ships into two groups. If they wound up fighting with one ship in a group, they'd be fighting them all. There were too many. The Rossi was caught between Fred Johnson's two-kilometer-long OPA overcompensation and most of the remaining Martian Navy. And beyond the Martians, the ring. Okay, he said, desperately trying to think of what to do now. They were as far from a hiding spot as it was possible to be in the solar system. It was a two-month trip just to the nearest rock bigger than their ship. 
He doubted he could outrun three fleets and all their torpedoes for two months. Or two minutes, really, if it came to that. How's that radio coming? Down, Amos said. Easy enough to just pull the plug. Do we have any way to tell everyone that the broadcast wasn't us? I will happily signal full and complete surrender at this point, Holden said. Not without turning it back on, Amos replied. Everyone out there is probably trying to contact us, Holden said. The longer we don't answer, the worse this will look. What about the weapons? Warmed up, not shooting, Amos said, and not responding to us. Can we pull power on those two? We can, Amos said, looking pained. But damn, I sure don't want to. Fast mover, Naomi yelled. Holy shit, Alex said. The OPA just fired a torpedo at us. On Holden's panel, a yellow dot separated from the behemoth and shifted to orange as it took off at high G. Go evasive, Holden said. Naomi, can you blind it? No, no laser, she replied, her voice surprisingly calm now. And no radio. Countermeasures aren't responding. Fuck me, Amos said. Why did someone drag us all the way out here just to kill us? Could have done that at Ceres, saved us the trip. Alex, here's your course. Holden sent the pilot a vector that would take them right through the heart of the Martian fleet. As far as he knew, the Martians only wanted to arrest him. That sounded okay. Has the behemoth fired again? No, Naomi replied. They've gone dark. No active sensors, no drives. Kind of big and kind of close to be trying for sneaky, Alex said without any real humor. Here comes the juice. While the couches pumped them full of drugs to keep the high G from killing them, apropos of nothing, Cohen said, Fucking bitch. Before Holden could ask what he meant, Alex opened up the Rosie's throttle, and the ship took off like a racehorse feeling the spurs. The sudden acceleration slammed Holden into his couch hard enough to daze him for a second. The ship buzzed him back to his senses when a missile proximity alarm warned him the behemoth's torpedo was getting closer. Helpless to do anything about it, Holden watched the orange dot that meant all their deaths, creeping ever closer to the fleeing Rosinante. He looked up at Naomi, and she was looking back as helpless as he was, all her best tricks taken away when the comma ray was powered down. The gravity dropped suddenly. Got an idea. Alex said over the comm. Then the ship jerked through several sharp maneuvers, and the gravity went away again. The Rosinante had added a new alarm to her song. A collision warning was sounding. Holden realized he'd never actually heard a collision alarm outside of drills. When do spaceships run into each other? He turned on the exterior cameras to a field of uniform black. For a second, he thought they were broken. But then Alex took control of them, panning out along the vast expanse of a Martian cruiser's skin. The target lock buzzer cut out, the missile losing them. Put this Martian heavy between us and the missile, Alex said, almost whispering it as though the missile might hear if he spoke too loud. How close are we to them? Holden asked, his voice matching Alex's. About ten meters, Alex said, pride in his voice. More or less. This is really going to piss them off if the missile keeps coming, Amos said. Then, almost meditatively, I don't even know what a point defense cannon does at a range like this. As if an answer, the cruiser hit them with a targeting laser. Then, all of the other Martian ships did as well, adding a few dozen more alarms to the cacophony. Shit, Alex said, and the gravity came back like a boulder rolled onto Holden's chest. None of the Martian ships fired, but the original missile shot back into view on the scope. The Martians were guiding it in, now that the behemoth seemed to be out of action. Holden marveled that he'd lived just long enough to finally see real Martian OPA cooperation. It wasn't as gratifying as he'd hoped. Martian ships whipped past on both sides as the Rosinante accelerated through the main cluster of their fleet, Holden could imagine the targeting arrays and point defense cannons swiveling to track them as they went by. Once past them, there was nothing but the ring, 
and infinite star-speckled black all around it. The plan came to mind with the sick, sinking feeling of something horrible he'd always known and tried to forget. The missile was coming, and even if they avoided it, there would be others. He couldn't dodge forever. He couldn't surrender. For all he knew, his weapons might start firing at any second. For a moment, the ops deck seemed to go still, time slowing the way it did when something catastrophic was happening. He was intensely aware of Naomi, pressed back in her couch, Monica and Okju, their eyes wide with fear and thrust. Clip, his hand pressed awkwardly into the gel by his side, Cohen's slack jaw and pale face. Huh. Holden gurgled to himself, the G-forces crushing his throat when he vocalized. He signaled Alex to cut thrust and the gravity dropped away again. The ring, Holden said. Aim for the ring. Go. The gravity came back with a slap, and Holden rotated his chair to his workstation and brought up the navigational console. Watching the rapidly approaching orange dot out of the corner of his eye, he built a navigational package for Alex that would take them at high speed to the ring, then spin them for a massive and almost suicidally dangerous deceleration burn just before they went in. He could slide them in under the velocity cap that had stopped the EK and all the fast-moving probes since. With any luck, the missile would be caught by whatever was on the other side, and the Rossi going slower wouldn't. The ship warned him that such high G-forces had a three percent chance to kill one of the crew members even during a short burn. The missile would kill them all. Holden sent the nav package to Alex, half expecting him to refuse, hoping. Instead, the Rossi accelerated for an endless twenty-seven minutes, followed by a nauseating zero-G spin that lasted less than four seconds, and a deceleration burn that lasted four and a half minutes and knocked every single person on the ship unconscious. Wake up, Miller said in the darkness. The ship was in freefall. Holden began coughing furiously as his lungs attempted to find their normal shape again after the punishing deceleration burn. Miller floated beside him. No one else seemed to be awake yet. Naomi wasn't moving at all. Holden watched her until he could see the gentle rise and fall of her ribcage. She was alive. Doors and corners, Miller said. His voice was soft and rough. I tell you, check your doors and corners and you blow into the middle of the room with your dick hanging out. Lucky son of a bitch. Give you this, though, you're consistent. Something about the way he spoke seemed saner than usual, more controlled. As if guessing his thoughts, the detective turned to look at him, smiled. Are you here? Holden asked. His mind was still fuzzy, his brain abused by thrust and oxygen loss. Are you real? You're not thinking straight. Take your time. Catch up. There's no hurry. Holden pulled up the exterior cameras and blew out one long exhale that almost ended in a sob. The OPA missile was floating outside the ship, just over a hundred meters from the nose of the Rossi. The torpedo's drive was still firing, its tail a furious white torch stretching nearly a kilometer behind it. But the missile hung in space, motionless. Holden didn't know if the missile had been that close when they went through. He suspected not. More likely, they'd just wound up that close once they'd both stopped moving. Even so, the sight of the massive weapon, engine burning as it still fought to reach him, made a shiver go down his spine and his balls creep up into his belly. Ten meters closer and they'd have been in proximity. It would have detonated. As he watched, the missile was slowly pulled away. Dragged off to who knew where by whatever power set the speed limit on this side of the ring. We made it, he said. We're through. Yeah, Miller said. This is what you wanted, isn't it? This is why you did it. 
You're giving me too much credit. Amos and Naomi both groaned as they started to wake. The documentary crew was motionless. They might even be dead. Holden couldn't tell without unstrapping, and his body wouldn't allow that yet. Miller leaned close to the screen, squinting at it like he was searching for something. Holden pulled up the sensor data. A host of information flooded in, numerous objects clustered within a million kilometers, close as seeds in a pod. And past them? Nothing. Not even starlight. What are they? Holden asked. What's out there? Miller glanced down at the display. His face was expressionless. Nothing, the dead man said. And then, it scares the shit out of me. Chapter 17 Bull The hell are we? Serge said, floating gently by the security desk. Security or fucking babysitters? Or whatever gets the job done, Bull said. But he couldn't put much force behind the words. It was thirty hours since the behemoth had gone dark, and he had slept for six of them. Serge, Casimir, Jojo, and Corin had been trading off duty at the desk, coordinating the recovery. The rest of the security staff had been in ad hoc teams, putting down two little panic riots, coordinating the physical resources to free a dozen people trapped in storage bays where the air recycler hadn't booted back up, arresting a couple of mech jockeys who'd taken the chaos as opportunity to settle a personal score. The lights were on all across the ship now. The damage control systems, woken from their coma, were working double time to catch up. The crews were exhausted and frightened and on edge. And James fucking Holden had escaped through the ring into whatever was on the other side. The security office smelled like old sweat and the bean curd masala that Casimir had brought in yesterday. For the first day, there had been an unconscious effort to keep a consistent physical orientation. Feet toward the floor, head toward the ceiling. Now they all floated in whatever direction they happened to fall into. It seemed almost natural to the belters. Bull still suffered the occasional bout of vertigo. Amen, Alice, amen, Serge said with a laugh. Lube for the machine, us. Least fun I've ever had with lube, Corin said. Bull noted that when Corin got tired, she got raunchy. In his experience, everyone dealt with pushing too hard differently. Some got angry and irritable. Some got sad. At a guess, it was all loss of inhibition. Wear down the facade with too much work or fear or both, and whoever was waiting underneath came out. All right, Bull said. You two go take a rest. I'll watch the shop until the others get back. You two have done more than— The security desk chimed. The connection request was from Sam. Bull lifted a finger to Serge and Corn and pulled himself over to the desk. Sam, he said. Bull? She replied, and the single syllable, short and sharp, carried a weight of annoyance and anger that verged on rage. I need you to come down here. You can call whoever you want, a man's voice said in the background. I don't care, you hear? I don't care anymore. You do whatever you want. Bull checked the connection location. She was down near the machine shops. It wasn't too far. I need to bring a sidearm? Bull asked. I won't stop you, sweetie, Sam said. On my way, he said, and dropped the connection. Guess do, Corin said to Serge. You've been up longer. I'll keep the place from burning. You going to be all right? Serge asked, and it took Bull a second to realize the man was talking to him. Unstoppable, Bull said, trying to mean it. Being exhausted in zero gravity wasn't the same as it was under thrust or down a gravity well. Growing up, Bull had been dead tired pretty often, and the sense of weight, of his muscles falling off the bone like overcooked chicken, was what desperate fatigue meant. He'd been off of Earth for more years now than he'd been on it, and it still confused him on an almost cellular level to be worn to the point of collapse and not feel it in his joints. Intellectually, he knew it left him feeling that he could do more than he actually could. 
There were other signs. The grit against his eyes. The headache that bloomed slowly out from the center of his skull. The mild nausea. None of them had the same power, and none of them convinced. The corridors weren't empty, but they weren't crowded. Even at full alert, with every team working double shifts and busting ass, the behemoth was mostly empty. He moved through the ship, launching himself handhold to handhold, sailing down each long straightaway like he was in a dream. He was tempted to speed up, slapping at the handholds and ladders as they passed and adding just a touch of kinetic energy to his float, the way he and his men had back in his days as a marine. More than one concussion had come out of the game, and he didn't have time for it now. He wasn't young anymore, either. He found Sam and her crew in a massive service bay. Four men in welding rigs floated near the wall, fixing lengths of conduit to the bulkhead with showers of sparks and lights brighter than staring at the sun. Sam floated nearby, her body at a forty-five degree angle from the work. A young belter floated near her, his body at an angle that pointed his feet toward her. Bull understood it was an insult. Bull, Sam said. The young man's face was a pale mask of rage. This is Gareth. He's decided laying conduits icky. I'm an engineer, Gareth said, spitting out the word so violently it gave him a degree of spin. Did eight years on Tycho Station, I'm not going to get used like a fucking technician. The other welders didn't turn from their work, but Bull could see them all listening. He looked at Sam and her face was closed. Bull couldn't tell if calling him in for help had been hard for her, or if it was part of how she expected him to make things right to her after the thing with Pa. That it had been the shortest attention on record didn't pull the sting of being caught up in his political struggles. Either way, she'd escalated the problem to him, and so it was his now. Bull took a deep breath. So, what are we working on here? he asked less because he cared than it would give him a few extra seconds to think, and his brain wasn't at its best. I've got a major line faulting out, Sam said. I can take three days and diagnose the whole thing, or I can take twenty hours and put up a workaround. And the conduits for the workaround? Is. Bull lifted his fist in the belter's equivalent of a nod, and then turned his attention to the boy. Gareth was young, and he was tired and he was an OPA belter, which meant he'd never been through any kind of real military indoctrination. Bull had to figure Sam had yelled at him enough before she'd called for backup. All right, then, Bull said. It's the hey bullshit is, the man said, his educated grammar fracturing. I understand, Bull said. You can go. Just help me get your rig on first. Gareth blinked. Bull thought he saw the ghost of a smile in the corners of Sam's bloodshot eyes, but that could have meant anything. Pleasure at the weariness in Bull's voice, or at Gareth's confusion, or maybe she'd understood what Bull was doing, and she thought he was really clever. I talked to the guys on the other ship some, Bull said. Earth or Mars. Someone will be sending a ship back. I'll see if I can't get you a ride as far as Ceres anyway. Gareth's mouth opened and closed like a goldfish. Sam pushed off, hooking the welder's rig with one hand, pulling it close to speed up the turn and then extending her arm to slow it. Bull took it from her and started pulling on the straps. You know how to do this? Sam asked. Good enough to hang conduit, Bull said. Security can lose you? Shift's done, Bull said. I was just heading for my bunk, but this needs doing. I can do it. All right, then, Sam said. Take the length at the end, and I'll have someone join it up with Marcus. I'll come check your work in a minute. Sounds good, Bull said. He was spinning just a few degrees each second, and he let the momentum carry him around to face the boy. The rage was still there, but it was sinking under a layer of embarrassment. All his arguments and bluster about not doing something because it was beneath him, and now the head of security was using his off-shift to do the same work. 
Bo could feel the attention of the other welders on them. Bo lit his torch, just testing it out, and the air between them went white for a second. Okay, then. I got this. You can go if you want. The boy shifted, getting ready to launch himself back across the bay and out into the ship. Bo tried to remember the last time he'd actually welded something with no gravity. He was pretty sure he could do it, but he'd have to start slow. Then Gareth's shoulders cupped forward, and he knew he wouldn't have to. Bo started taking off the straps, and Gareth moved forward to help him. You're tired, Bo said, his voice low enough not to carry to the others. You've been working too hard, and it got to you a little. Happens to everyone. Bien. He put the torch in the boy's hand and squeezed it there. This is a privilege, Bo said. Being out here, doing this bullshit, working our asses off for no one to give a shit. It's a privilege. Next time you undermine Chief Engineer Rosenberg's authority, I will ship your ass home with a note that says you couldn't handle it. The boy muttered something Bo couldn't make out. The flare from the other torches made the boy's face dance white and brown and white again. Bull put a hand on his arm. Yes, sir, Gareth said. Bull let go, and the boy pushed off to the wall, situating himself over the length of pipe that was waiting there for him. Sam appeared at Bull's elbow, sliding down from the blind spot above and behind him. That worked, she said. Yeah. Didn't hurt that you're an Earther. Didn't. How's it all coming? Apart, Sam said. But we'll stick it back together with bubble gum if we have to. At least no one was shooting at us. Sam's laugh had some warmth in it. They wouldn't have had to do it twice. The alert tone came from all their hand terminals at once, simultaneous with the ship address system. Bull felt his lips press thin. Well, that timing's a little ominous, Sam said before Captain Ashford's voice rang out through the ship. The openness of the spaces and the different speakers made the words echo like the voice of God. This is your captain speaking. I have just received confirmation from the OPA Central Authority that the actions undertaken by the criminal James Holden were unauthorized by any part of the Outer Planets Alliance. His actions put not only this ship but the reputation and good standing of the Alliance in threat. I have informed the Central Authority that we took swift and decisive action against Holden, and that he escaped from us only by retreating through the ring. Thanks for that, by the way, Sam said. De nada. I have requested and received, Ashford continued, the authority to continue action to address this insult as I deem fit. The evidence of our own sensors and of the Martian and Earth feeds to which we have access all show that the Rosinante has passed through the ring in good condition and appears to have sustained no damage despite the physical anomalies on the other side. In light of that, I have made the decision to follow Holden through the ring and take him and his crew into custody. I will be sending out specific instructions to all department heads outlining what preparations we will need to complete before we begin our burn but I expect to be in pursuit within the next six hours. It is imperative for the pride, dignity, and honor of the OPA that this insult not go unanswered, and that the hands that bring hold to justice be ours. I want you all to know that I am honored to serve with such a valiant crew, and that together we will make history. Take these next hours, all of you, to rest and prepare. God bless each and every one of you and the Outer Planets Alliance. With a resounding click from a hundred speakers, Ashford dropped the connection. The flashing white light of the welding torches was gone, and the bay was darker. Laughter warred against despair in Bull's gut. Is he drunk, do you think? Sam said. Worse, embarrassed. He's trying to save face, Bull said. The behemoth filled its ditties in front of God and everyone, so now we're going to be the biggest badass in the system to make up for it? Pretty much. Gonna talk him out of it? Gonna try. Sam scratched her cheek. Could be hard to back down after that little once-more-into-the-breach thing. He won't, Bull said. 
But I've got to try. The inner planets came out to the black with an understanding that they were soldiers sent to a foreign land. Bull remembered the feeling from when he'd first shipped out, the sense that his home was behind him. For the inners, the expansion out into the solar system had always had the military at its core. The Belters didn't have that. They were the natives here. The forces that had brought their ancestors out to the belt had roots in trade, commerce, and the overwhelming promise of freedom. The OPA had begun its life more like a labor union than a nation. The difference was subtle but powerful, and it showed in strange ways. If they had been in any of the Earth or Mars ships that floated now in the darkness near the ring, Bull would have come from his thorough and profound dressing down by the captain to seek out Exo Pa in a galley or mess hall. But this was the behemoth, so we found her in a bar. It was a small place with bulbs of alcohol, chocolate, coffee, and tea, all set with temperature controls in the nipple, so the uniformly tepid drinks could come out anywhere from almost boiling to just this side of ice. The decor was cheap nightclub with colored lights and cheap graphic films to hide the walls. Half a dozen people floated on handholds or tethers, and Pa was one of them. His first thought as he pulled himself toward her was that she needed a haircut. With the false gravity of acceleration gone, her hair floated around her, too short to tie back, but still long enough to interfere with her vision and creep into her mouth. His second thought was that she looked as tired as he was. Mr. Baca, Pa said. Exo, you mind if I join you? I was expecting you. You've been to see the captain? Bull wished he could sit down, not for any actual reason so much as the small physical punctuation it would have given their conversation. I have. He wasn't happy to see me. Showed me the proposal you'd built up on how to remove me from my position. It was a contingency plan. She said. Yeah. So, this idea where we take the behemoth through the ring? We can't do that. We start any kind of serious burn, we're going to have two navies on our butts. And we don't know what's on the other side, except that it's way more powerful than we are. Do you want an alien civilization taking its ideas of humanity from Jim Holden? Ashford had said the same thing, word for word. It had been his most cogent argument. And now Bull knew where he'd borrowed it from. He'd had the long trip down in the lift to let his sleep-deprived brain come up with its counter-argument. That's not even going to come into play if they shoot our nuts off before we get there, he said. You really think Earth and Mars are going to go for the whole we're just playing sheriff line? There's going to be a bunch of them who still think whatever Holden was up to, we were in on it. But even if they don't, the part where they stand to the side and let us take the lead isn't going to happen. You can bet your ass the head of the Mars Force is asking his exo if they want an alien civilization taking its ideas of humanity from Ashford. That was nice, Pa said. The reversal thing? That was good. The inner planets may not be making threats yet, Bo said, but they are. Mars has threatened to open fire on us if we get within a hundred thousand kilometers of the ring. Bo put his hand to his mouth. He could feel his mind struggling to make sense of the words. The Martian Navy had already laid down an ultimatum. Ashford hadn't even mentioned it. So what the hell are we doing? We're preparing for burn in four and three-quarter hours, Mr. Baca, Pa said, because that's what we've been ordered to do. The bitterness wasn't only in her voice. It was in her eyes and the angle of her mouth. Sympathy and outrage battled in Bull's mind, and underneath them, a rising panic. He was too tired to be having this conversation, too tired to be doing what had to get done. It had stripped away all the protections that would have made him hesitate to speak. If he could have gotten just one good cycle's rest, maybe he could have found another way. But this was the hand he'd been dealt, so it was the hand he'd play. You don't agree with him. Bo said. If it was your call, you wouldn't do it. Pa took a long pull at her bulb, the flexible foil buckling under the suction. 
Bull was pretty sure she wasn't drinking for the taste, and the urge to get some whiskey for himself came on him like an unexpected blow. It doesn't matter what I would or wouldn't do, Pa said. It's not my command, so it's not my decision. Unless something happens to the captain, Bull said. Then it would be. Pa went still. The sound of the music, the shifting patterns of lights, all of it seemed to recede. They were in their own small universe together. Pa thumbed on the bulb's magnet and stuck it to the wall beside her. There are still hours before the burn starts, and then travel time. The situation may change, but I won't take part in mutiny, she said. Maybe you wouldn't have to. Doesn't have to have anything to do with you. But unless you're going to specifically order me not to. I am specifically ordering you, Mr. Baca. I am ordering you not to take any action against the captain. I am ordering you to respect the chain of command, and if that means I have to commit to follow through on Ashford's orders, then I'll make that commitment. Do you understand me? Yeah, Bull said slowly. Either we're all going to die, or we're going through the ring. This audiobook has been broken into multiple parts to make the download faster. You have reached the end of a part, but not the end of the complete audiobook. So please check your library for the next part of this audiobook. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. This is Audible. Sci-Fi Audio and One Click Digital present Abaddon's Gate. Book Three of The Expanse by James S. A. Corey Narrated by Jefferson Mays Chapter 18 Anna Eleven people showed up for Anna's first worship service. The contrast with her congregation on Europa was unsettling at first. On Europa, she'd have had twenty or so families straggling in over the half hour before the service began, and a few drifting in late. They'd have been all ages, from grandparents rolling in on personal mobility devices to screaming children and infants. Some would come in their Sunday best formal wear, others in ratty, casual clothes. The buzz of conversation prior to the service would be in mixed Russian, English, and Outer Planets polyglot. By the end of the worship meeting, a few might be snoring in their pews. Her UNN congregation showed up in a single group at exactly 9.55 a.m. Instead of walking in and taking seats, they floated in as a loose clump and then just hovered in a disconcerting cloud in front of her podium. They wore spotless dress uniforms so crisply pressed they looked sharp enough to cut skin. They didn't speak. They just stared at her expectantly. And they were all so young. The oldest couldn't have been more than twenty-five. The unusual circumstances rendered her standard worship service inappropriate. No need for a children's message or church announcements. So Anna launched directly into a prayer, followed by a scripture reading and a short sermon. She'd considered doing a sermon on duty and sacrifice. It seemed appropriate in the martial setting. But she had instead decided to speak mostly on God's love. Given the fear Chris had expressed a few days prior, it felt like the better choice. When she'd finished, she closed with another prayer, then served communion. The gentle ritual seemed to ease the tension she felt in the room. Each of her eleven young soldiers came up to her makeshift table, took a bulb of grape juice and a wafer, and returned to their prior position floating nearby. She read the familiar words in Matthew and Luke, then spoke the blessing. They ate the bread and drank from the bulb. And, as had always happened since the very first church service she could remember, Anna felt something vast and quiet settle on her. She also felt the shiver that tried to crawl up her spine, competing with a threatening belly laugh. She'd had a sudden vision of Jesus, who'd asked his disciples to keep doing this in remembrance of him, watching her little congregation as they floated in microgravity and drank reconstituted grape beverage out of suction bulbs. It seemed to stretch the boundaries of what he'd meant by this. A final prayer, and the service was over. 
not one of her congregation pushed toward the door to leave. Eleven young faces stared at her, waiting. The oppressive aura of fear she'd managed to push away during the communion crept back into the room. Anna pulled herself around the podium and joined their loose cloud. Should I expect anyone next week? You guys are making me nervous. Chris spoke first. No, it was real nice. He seemed to want to say more, but stopped and looked down at his hands instead. Back on Europa, people would have brought snacks and coffee for after the service, Anna said. We could do that next time, if you want. A few half-hearted nods. A muscular young woman in a marine uniform pulled her hand terminal halfway out of her pocket to check the time. Anna felt herself losing them. They needed something else from her, but they weren't going to ask for it, and it definitely wasn't coffee and snacks. I had the whole sermon on David, she said, keeping her tone casual, conversational, on the burden we place on our soldiers, the sacrifices we ask you to make for the rest of us. Chris looked up from his hands. The young Marine put her hand terminal away. With her podium behind her, the meeting room was just a featureless gray box. The little knot of soldiers floated in front of her, and suddenly the perspective shifted and she was above them, falling toward them. She blinked rapidly to break up the scene and swallowed to get the lemony taste of nausea out of her throat. David? A young man with brown hair and dark skin said. He had an accent that she thought might be Australian. King of Israel, another young man said. That's just the nice version, the Marine countered. He's the guy who killed one of his own men so he could sleep with his wife. He fought for his country and his faith, Anna cut in, using the teacher's voice she used in Bible classes for teenagers, the one that made sure everyone knew she was the voice of authority. That's the part I care about right now. Before he was a king, he was a soldier often unappreciated by those he served. He put his body over and over again between danger and those he'd sworn to protect, even when his leaders were unworthy of him. A few more nods. No one looking at hand terminals. She felt herself getting them all back. And we've been asking that of our soldiers since the beginning of time, she continued. Everyone here gave up something to be here. Often we're unworthy of you, and you do it anyway. So why didn't you? Chris asked. You know, do the David sermon. Because I'm scared, Anna said, taking Chris's hand with her left and the hand of the Australian boy with her right. Without anyone saying anything, the loose cloud became a circle of held hands. I'm so afraid, and I don't want to talk about soldiers and sacrifice. I want to talk about God watching me, caring about what happens to me. And I thought maybe other people would, too. More nods. Chris said, When the skinnies blew that ship, I thought we were all dead. No shit, the Marine said. She gave Anna an embarrassed look. Sorry, ma'am. It's okay. They say they didn't, another woman said. They shot at Holden. Yeah, and then their whole ship mysteriously turned off. If the dusters hadn't pinged Holden, he'd have flown off scot-free. They're going to follow him, the young Marine said. Dusters say they'll smoke them if they go in. Fuck the dusters, the Australian said. We'll grease every one of them if they start anything. Okay, Anna cut in, keeping her voice gentle. Dusters are Martians. They prefer Martians and calling people from the outer planet skinnies is also rude. Epithets like that are an attempt to dehumanize a group so that you won't feel as bad about killing them. The Marine snorted and looked away. And, Anna continued, fighting out here is the last thing we should be doing. Am I right? Yeah, Chris said. If we fight out here, we'll all die. No support, no reinforcements. Nothing to hide behind. Three armed fleets and nothing bigger than a stray hydrogen atom for cover. This is what we call the kill box. 
The silence stretched for a moment. Then the Australian sighed and said, Yeah. And something may come out of the ring. Saying the thing out loud and then acknowledging it drained the tension out of the air. With everyone floating in microgravity, no one could slump. But shoulders and foreheads relaxed. There were a few sad smiles. Even her angry young Marine ran a hand through her blonde crew cut and nodded without looking at anyone. Let's do this again next week, Anna said while she still had them. We can celebrate communion, then maybe just chat for a while. And in the meantime, my door is always open. Please call me if you need to talk. The group began to break up, heading for the door. Anna kept hold of Chris's hand. Could you wait a moment? I need to ask you about something. Chris, the Marine said with a mocking sing-song voice, gonna get a little preacher action. That's not funny, Anna said, using the full weight of her teacher voice. The Marine had the grace to blush. Sorry, ma'am. You may leave, Anna said. And her Marine did. Chris, do you remember the young woman who was in the officer's mess that first time we met? He shrugged. There were lots of people coming and going. This one had long, dark hair. She looked very sad. She was wearing civilian clothes. Oh, Chris said with a grin. The cute one. Yeah, I remember her. Do you know her? No. Just a city contractor fixing the plumbing, I'd guess. We have a couple of ships full of them in the fleet. Why? That was a good question. She honestly wasn't sure why the angry young woman weighed on her mind so much over the last few days. But something about her stuck in Anna's memory like a burr in her clothing. She'd feel irritated and antsy, and suddenly the girl's face would pop into her mind. The anger, the sense of threat she'd radiated. The proximity of that encounter to the sudden hostilities and damaged ships and people shooting at each other. There was nothing that tied them all together, but Anna couldn't shake the feeling that they were connected. I'm worried about her? Anna finally said. At least it wasn't a lie. Chris was tinkering with his hand terminal. After a few seconds, he said, Melba Coe, electrochemical engineer. She'll probably be on and off the ship here and all the way home. Maybe you'll run into her. Great, Anna said, wondering if she actually wanted that to happen. You know what sucks? Tilly asked. Before Anna could say anything, Tilly said, This sucks. She didn't have to elaborate. They were floating together near a table in the civilian commissary. A small plastic box was attached to the table with magnetic feet. Inside it was a variety of tubes filled with protein and carbohydrate pastes in an array of colors and flavors. Next to the box sat two bulbs. Anna's held tea, Tilly's coffee. The officer's mess, with its polite waiters, custom-cooked meals, and open bar, was a distant memory. Tilly hadn't had an alcoholic drink in several days. Neither of them had eaten anything that required chewing in his long. The oat and raisin isn't bad. I think it might actually have real honey in it, Anna said, holding up one of the white plastic squeeze packs. Tilly was no stranger to space travel. Her husband owned estates on every major rock in the solar system, but Anna suspected she'd never eaten food out of a plastic tube in her entire life before this. Any pilot who had the poor planning to put Tilly's ship at Null G during one of her meals was probably fired at the next port. Tilly picked up a packet of the oat mush, wrinkled her lip at it, and flicked it away with her fingers. It sat spinning next to her head like a miniature helicopter. Annie, Tilly said, if I wanted to suck vile fluids out of a flaccid and indifferent tube, I'd have stayed on Earth with my husband. At some point... Anna had become Annie to Tilly, and her objection to this nickname hadn't phased Tilly at all. You have to eat eventually. Who knows how long we'll be out here? Not much longer if I have anything to say about it, said a booming voice from behind Anna. If she'd been touching the floor, she would have jumped, 
but floating in the air, all she managed was an undignified jerk and squeak. Sorry to startle you, Cortez continued, sliding into her field of view, but I had hoped we might speak. He was scuffing across the floor, wearing the magnetic booties the Navy had handed out. Anna had tried them, but drifting free while your feet remained pinned to the floor had given her an uncomfortable underwater sensation that made her even sicker than just floating around did. She never used them. Cortez nodded to Tilly, his too white smile beaming at her in his nut-brown face. Without asking if he could join them, he used the menu screen on the table to order himself a soda water. Tilly smiled back. It was the fake, I don't really see you smile she used on people who carried her luggage or waited on her table. Their mutual contempt established, Tilly sipped her coffee and ignored his presence. Cortez placed one large hand on Anna's shoulder and said, Dr. Volovodov, I am putting together a coalition of the important civilian counselors on this ship to make a request of the captain, and I'd like your support. Anna admired the absolute sincerity Cortez managed to pack into a sentence that was almost entirely composed of flattery. Cortez was here because he was the spiritual advisor to the UN Secretary General. Anna was here because the United Methodist Council could spare her, and her home happened to be on the way. If she was on any list of important counselors, then the bar was set pretty low. I'm happy to talk about it, Dr. Cortez, Anna said, then reached for her tea bulb. It gave her an excuse to extricate her arm from his grip. How can I help? First, I have to commend you on your initiative in arranging worship services for the women and men on the ship. I'm ashamed I didn't think of it first, but I'm happy to follow your lead. We're already arranging for similar meetings with leaders of the various faiths on board. Anna felt a blush come up, even though she suspected that everything Cortez said was manipulative. He was so good he could get the response he wanted even when you knew exactly what he was up to. Anna couldn't help but admire it a little. I'm sure the sailors appreciate it. But there is other work we can be doing, Cortez said. Greater work. And that's what I came to ask you about. Tilly turned back to the table and gave Cortez a sharp look. What are you up to, Hank? Cortez ignored her. Anna, may I call you Anna? Here it comes, Annie, Tilly said. Annie? No, Anna cut in. Anna is fine. Please call me Anna. Cortez nodded his big white and brown head at her, blinding her with his smile. Thank you, Anna. What I want to ask you to do is sign a petition I'm circulating and add your voice to ours. Ours? You know that the behemoth has begun to burn toward the ring. I'd heard. We're asking the captain to accompany it. Anna blinked twice, then opened her mouth to speak and found nothing to say. She closed it with a snap when she realized both Cortez and Tilly were staring at her. Go into the ring. Holden had made it inside, and it looked like he was still alive. But actually entering the ring had never been part of the mission plan, at least not for the civilian contingent. No one had any idea what the structures were that waited beyond the ring, or what changes passing through the wormhole might make on humans. Or even if the ring would stay open. It might have a preset mass limit, or a limited power supply, or anything. It might just slam shut after enough ships had gone through. It might slam shut with half a ship going through. Anna pictured the prince cut in half, the two pieces drifting in space a billion light-years apart, humans spilling into vacuum from both sides. We're also asking the Martians to come with us. Cortez continued. Now hear me out. If we join together in this... Yes, Anna said before she knew she was going to say it. She didn't know why Cortez was pushing for it, and she didn't care. Maybe it was to get votes in the Earth elections. Maybe it was a way for Cortez to exert control over the military commanders. Maybe he felt it was his calling. They hadn't come here as explorers, not really. They'd come here to be seen by the people back at home who were watching. It was why they'd had so many protests and dramas on the way out. 
Once, this had been about the spectacle. But now, things had changed, and this was the answer to the fear she'd seen at church. The immediate danger wasn't the ring, at least not right now. It was humans taking their anxiety out on the nearest enemy they could actually see, each other. If the OPA went ahead with its plan to follow Holden into the ring, and the UN and Martian forces joined together to follow, no one would have any reason to shoot anyone else. They'd be what they'd started out as again. They'd be a joint task force, exploring the most important discovery in human history. If they stayed, they were three angry fleets trying to keep one another from getting an advantage. The whole thing spilled into Anna's mind, feeling very much like relief. Yes, she said again. I'll sign it. The things we need to know, the things we need to learn and take back with us to all those frightened people back home, that's where we'll learn them, not here, on the other side. Thank you for asking me, Dr. Cortez. Hank, Anna. Please call me Hank. Oh, Tilly said, her coffee bulb floating forgotten in the air in front of her. We are so fucked. Hi, no, no, Anna said to the video camera in her room's communication panel. Hi, Nami. Mom loves you. She loves you so much. She hugged her pillow to her chest, squeezing it tight. This is you. This is both of you. She put the pillow down, taking a moment to compose herself. No, no. I'm calling to apologize again. Chapter 19 Melba The injustice of it shrieked in the back of her skull. It wouldn't let her sleep. It had come so close to working. So much of it had worked. But then Holden dove into the ring, and something had saved him, and Melba felt a huge invisible fist drive itself into her gut. And it was still there. She'd watched the whole thing unfold in her quarters sitting cross-legged on her crash couch, her hand terminal seeking information from any feed. The network had been so swamped with other people doing the same thing, her own signal wouldn't stand out. No one would wonder why she was watching when everyone else was doing the same. When the OPA had opened fire, she'd heard the Earth forces bracing for a wave of sabotage explosions that never came. The anger at Holden... The condemnations and recriminations had been pouring like cool water on a burn. Her team had been called up on an emergency run to the Sung Un, repairing the damage she'd done, but she'd checked in whenever there was a free moment. When Mars had turned its targeting lasers on the Rosinante, guiding the missile to him, she'd laughed out loud. Holden had stopped her outgoing message, but at the expense of killing his whole communications array. There was no way he could send out a retraction in time. When he'd passed through the ring, she'd been in three conversations simultaneously and watching an electrical meter for dangerous fluctuations. She didn't find out until they were being rotated back to the Cerisier that Holden hadn't died, that he wasn't going to. The missile had been stopped, and the enemy had been spared. Back on her ship, she'd gone straight to her bunk, curled up on the crash couch and tried not to panic. Her brain felt like it had come untied. Her thoughts ran in random directions. If the Martians had just launched a few missiles of their own instead of waiting for the OPAs to do the job, Holden would be dead. If the Rosinante had been a few thousand kilometers closer to the behemoth when it fired, Holden would be dead. The gimbling under her couch hushed back and forth in the last of the deceleration burn, and she realized she was shaking her body, banging her back against the gel. If the thing that made the protomolecule, the nameless, evil thing that was hunched in the abyssal black on the other side of the ring, hadn't changed the laws of physics, Holden would be dead. Holden was alive. She'd always known that the destruction of James Holden was a fragile thing. Discrepancies would be there if anyone looked closely. 
She couldn't match her announcement to the exact burn that the Rosinante would be on when she sprang her trap. There would be artifacts in the video that a sufficiently close analysis would detect. By the time that happened, though, it would have been too late. The story of James Holden would have been set. New evidence could be dismissed as crackpots and conspiracy theorists, but it required that Holden and his crew be dead. It was something she'd always heard her father say. If the other man's dead, the judge only has one story to follow. When he put his communication array back together, the investigation would begin. She'd be caught. They'd find out it was her. And the thought had the copper taste of fear. They'd find Wren. They'd know she killed him. Her father would know. Word would reach him in his cell that she had beaten Wren to death, and that would be worse than anything. Not that she'd done it, Melba thought, that she'd been caught doing it. The sound came from her door, three hard thumps, and she screamed despite herself. Her heart was racing, the blood tapping at the inside of her throat, banging at her ribs. Miss Cole? Soledad's voice came. You in there? Can I... I need to talk if you've... Hearing fear in someone else's voice felt like vertigo. Melba got to her feet. Either the pilot was repositioning the ship, or she was just unsteady. She couldn't tell which. She looked in her mirror, and the woman looking out could almost have been a normal person woken from a deep sleep. Just a minute, she said, running her fingers through her hair, pressing the dark locks against her scalp. Her face felt clammy. Nothing to be done. She opened the door. Soledad stood in the thin, cramped corridor. The muscles in her jaw worked like she was chewing something. Her wide eyes skittered over Melba, away and back, away and back. I'm sorry, Miss Coe, but I can't... I can't do it. I can't go there. They can fire me, but I can't go. Melba reached out and put her hand on the woman's arm. The touch seemed to startle them both. All right, she said. It'll be all right. Where can't you go? The ship shifted. That one wasn't her imagination, because Sole moved too. The prince, she said. I don't want... I don't want to volunteer. Volunteer for what? Melba asked. She felt like she was coaxing the girl back from some sort of mental break. There was enough self-awareness left in her to appreciate the irony. Didn't you get the message? It's from the contract supervisor. Melba looked back over her shoulder. Her hand terminal was on the crash couch, a green and red band on the screen showing that there was a priority message waiting. She raised a finger, keeping Soledad out of the room and away from the locker, and grabbed the terminal. The message had come through ten hours before, marked urgent and must reply. Melba wondered how long she'd been lying on her couch, lost in her panic fugue. She thumbed the message except. A stream of tight legal script poured onto the screen, brash as a shout. Danis General Contracting, owners and operators of half the civilian support craft in the fleet, including the Cerisier, was invoking the exceptional actions clause of the standard contract. Each functional team would choose a designated volunteer for temporary duty on the UNN Thomas Prince. The remuneration would remain at the standard level until completion of the contract, when any hazard bonuses or exemptions would be assessed. Melba had to read the words three times to understand them. I can't go in there, Soledad was saying, somewhere away to her left. The voice had taken on an irritating whine. My father... I told you about him. You understand. Your sister was there, too. You have to tell Bob or Stanley to do it. I can't. They were going after Holden. They were going through the ring after Holden. Her panic didn't fall away so much as click into focus. None of you are going, Melba said. This one's mine. The official transfer was the easiest thing she'd done since she came aboard. 
She sent a message to the contracts officer with her ID number and a short message saying that she'd accept transfer to the prince. Two minutes later, she had her orders. Three hours to finish her affairs on the Cerisier, then into the transport, and gone. It was intended, she knew, as a time to meet with her team, make the transition easy. She had other fish to fry. Filling a locker with industrial sealant was one thing. The foam was made to apply quickly and remain malleable for a few seconds before the yellow mush dimmed to gold and set. The excess could be cut away with a sharp knife for the next hour. After that, nothing would move it except the right kind of solvent, and even that was an ugly, arduous process. But leaving the body where it could be found wasn't an option. Someone would be assigned to her bunk and they'd want to use the locker. Besides which, leaving Wren behind seemed somehow wrong. And so, with two and a half hours before she left the ship, Melba took a pair of shoulder-length latex gloves, three cans of solvent, a roll of absorbent towels, and a vacuum-rated large personal tool case into her room, and locked the door behind her. The locker door didn't want to open at first, fixed in place by a drop of sealant she hadn't noticed, but a few sprays of solvent degraded it until she could pull it open with her fingers. The sealant was a single, rough-textured face of gold, like a cliff made small. She opened the tool case, took a deep breath, and faced the grave. I'm sorry about this, she said. I'm really, really sorry. At first, the solvent spray didn't seem to do anything beyond a sharp smell, but then the sealant began ticking, like a thousand insects walking over stone. Gouges and crevices formed in the sealant wall, then a small runnel of slime. She rolled up a few of the towels, setting them on the floor to catch the flow. Wren's knee was the first part to appear, the round cap of the bone and death-blackened skin emerging from the melting foam like a fossil. The fabric of his uniform was soaked with fluid rot. The smell hit her, but it wasn't as bad as she'd expected. She'd imagined herself retching and weeping, but it was gentler than that. When she took his legs to draw him out, they fell away from his pelvis. So she cut the trousers, wrapped the legs in towels, and put them in the toolbox. Her mind was quiet and still, like an archaeologist pulling the dead of centuries before out into the light. Here was his spine. This was the vile slush where the hydrochloric acid in his gut, no longer held in check by the mechanisms of life, had digested his stomach, his liver, his intestines. She drew out his head last, the bright red hair darkened and flecked with matter like an overused kitchen mop. She lifted the bones into the toolbox, packed them with the gore and corruption-soaked towels, then closed his new coffin, triggered the seal, and set the lock combination. She had forty minutes left. She spent another ten minutes cleaning out the locker where Wren had spent his death, then stripped off the gloves and threw them in the recycler. She bathed, trying to scrub off the stink, and noticed distantly that she was sobbing. She ignored the fact, and by the time she changed into her new uniform, the crying seemed to have stopped. She picked up the last of her things, threw them in a pack, put her still wet hair in a ponytail, and hauled Wren to the loading bay where the other supplies would be taken across to the prince. It didn't allow her time to say her goodbyes to Soledad or Stani or Bob. She was sorry for that, but it was a burden she could bear. There were about thirty of them, all told. Men and women she'd seen around the ship, heard their names once or twice, nodded to in the galley or on the exercise machines. Once they reached the prince, they were all brought into a small, white conference room with benches that bolted to the floor like pews. They were already under thrust, already moving for the ring and whatever was on the other side. While the overly enthusiastic yeoman prattled on about the Thomas Prince, she glanced at the faces around her. An old man with a scruffy white beard and ice-blue eyes, 
a stocky blonde woman who was probably younger than she was, with poorly applied eyeliner and a grim look about the jowls. They'd all come here of their own free will. Or free will is bounded by the terms of their work contracts. They were all going through the ring, into the mouth of whatever was on the other side. She wondered what would motivate them to do it, what kinds of secrets they'd hidden in their tool chests. You will need to keep your identification cards with you at all times, the yeoman was saying, holding up a white plastic card on a lanyard. Not only are these the keys to get into your quarters, they'll also get you food in the civilian commissary, and they'll let you know if you're where you're supposed to be. The blonde woman turned toward Melba and glared. Melba looked away, blushing. She hadn't intended to stare. Never be rude unintentionally, her father had always said. The yeoman's white card turned a deep, bloody red. If you see this, he said, it means you're in a restricted area and need to leave immediately. Don't worry too much. She's a big ship and we all get a little turned around sometimes. I got buzzed four times the first week I was here. No one's going to get bent out of shape over an honest mistake, but security will be following up on them, so be prepared. Melba looked at her own white card. It had her name, a picture of her unsmiling face. The omen was talking about how much they were appreciated, and how their service was an honor to the ship and to themselves. All in this together, one big team. The first stirring of hatred for the man shifted in her gut, and she tried to distract herself. She didn't know what she'd do once they were all on the other side, but she had to find Holden. She had to destroy him. The sound man, too. Anything that led back to her had to be destroyed or discredited. She wondered if there was a way to get a fake card, or one that belonged to someone with a lot more clearance than Mel Bacot would have. Maybe one that could check out a shuttle. She'd need to look into it. She was improvising now, and getting the best tool she could manage would be critical. Around her, people began standing up. From the bored looks and the quiet, she figured they were beginning the walking tour. She'd been through the Thomas Prince before. She was already familiar with the high ceilings and wide corridors where three people could walk abreast. She might not know where everything was, but she could fake it. She fell in line with the others. In case of emergency, all you have to do is get back to your quarters and strap in, the yeoman said, walking backwards so that he could keep lecturing them while they all moved, bumping against each other like cattle. Someone behind her made a soft, mooing sound, and someone else chuckled. The joke had gone out to the darkness of space, even where cows hadn't. Now, through here is the civilian commissary, the yeoman said as they passed through a pair of sliding steel doors. Those of you who were working here before might be used to getting your food and coffee from the officer's mess, but now that we're on a military operation, this is going to be the place to go. The civilian commissary was a low, gray box of a room with tables and chairs bolted to the floor, and a dozen people of all ages and dress sat scattered around. A thin man with improbably pale hair leaned against a crash-padded wall, drinking something from a bulb. Two older men in black robes and clerical collars sat huddled together like the unpopular kids at a cafeteria. Melba was already beginning to turn inward again, ignoring them all, when something caught her. A familiar voice. Twenty feet away... Tilly Fagan leaned in toward an older man who looked like he was struggling between annoyance and flirtation. Her hair was up, and her laughter caustic in a way that recalled long, uncomfortable dinner parties with both of their families. Melba felt a sudden atavistic shame at being so underdressed. For a sickening moment, her false self slipped away, and she was Clarissa again. Forcing herself to move slowly, calmly, she drifted to the back of the crowd, making herself as small and difficult to notice as she could. Tilly glanced over at the nattering yeoman and his herd of technicians with undisguised annoyance, but didn't notice Melba. Not this time. The yeoman led them all back out of the commissary, down the long hallway to their new quarters. 
Melba took her ponytail down and brushed her hair in close around her face. She'd known, of course, that the prince had the delegation from Earth, but she'd discounted them. Now she wondered how many other people here knew Clarissa Mao. She had the horrible image of turning a corner and seeing Mika Krauss or Stephen Comer. She could see their eyes going wide with surprise, and she wondered whether she could bring herself to kill them, too. If she couldn't, the brig and the news feeds and a prison cell like her father's would follow. The yeoman was talking about their quarters, assigning them out one by one to all the volunteer technicians. They were tiny, but the need for each person to have a crash couch in case of emergency meant they wouldn't be hot bunking. She could stay in there bribe one of the others to bring her food. Except, hold up like a rat, tracking and killing Holden became exponentially more difficult. There had to be a way. The omen called her name, and she realized it wasn't the first time. Here, she said, sorry. She scuttled into her room, the door recognizing her white card and unlocking for her, then closing when she was inside. She stood for a long moment, scratching her arm. The room was bright and clean, and as unlike the Cerisier as Nepal was from Colombia. You came to improvise, she said, and her voice sounded like it came from someone else. Well, here you are. Start improvising. Chapter 20 Holden Instead of putting him at ease, the weeks and months of interviews had given Holden a new persona. A version of himself that stood in front of a camera and answered questions. That explained things and told stories in ways entertaining enough to keep the focus on himself. It wasn't the sort of thing that he'd have expected to have any practical application. One more surprise among many. This, Holden said, gesturing to the large video monitor behind him on the operations deck, is what we are calling the Slow Zone. That's a terrible name, Naomi said. She was at the ship operations panel, just out of view of the documentary crew's cameras. Slow Zone? Really? You have a better name? Monica asked. She whispered something to Clip, and he shifted a few degrees to his left, camera moving with him in a slow pan. The burst blood vessel in his eye was starting to fade. The high-G burn through the ring had been hard on all of them. I still like Alex's name, Naomi replied. Dandelion Sky, Monica said with a snort. First of all, only people from Earth and Mars have even the slightest idea what a dandelion is. And second of all, no, it sounds stupid. Holden knew he was still on camera, so he just smiled and let the two of them hash it out. The truth was he'd been partial to Alex's name. Where they sat, looking out, it did sort of look like being at the center of a dandelion, the sky filled with fragile-looking structures and an enormous sphere around them. Can we finish this? Monica asked, shooting the comment at Naomi without looking at her. Sorry I interrupted, Naomi replied, not looking sorry at all. She winked at Holden and he grinned back. And three, two, Monica pointed at him. The slow zone, based on the sensor data we're able to get, is approximately one million kilometers across. Holden pointed at the 3D representation on the screen behind him. There are no visible stars, so the location of the zone is impossible to determine. The boundary is made up of 1,373 individual rings evenly spaced into a sphere. So far, the only one we've been able to find that's open is the one we came through. The fleets we traveled out with are still visible on the other side, though the ring seems to distort visual and sensor data, making readings through it unreliable. Holden tapped on the monitor, and the center of the image enlarged rapidly. We're calling this Ring Station, for lack of a better term. It appears to be a solid sphere of a metallic substance, measuring about five kilometers in diameter. Around it is a slow-moving ring of other objects, 
including all of the probes we've fired into the slow zone and the belter ship E.K. The torpedo that chased us through the ring is headed toward the station in a trajectory that seems to indicate it will become part of the garbage ring, too. Another tap, and the central sphere took up the entire screen. We're calling it a station, pretty much only because it sits at the center of the slow zone, and we're making the entirely unfounded assumption that some sort of control station for the gates would be located there. The station has no visible breaks in its surface. Nothing that looks like an airlock or an antenna or a sensor array or anything. Just that big, silvery, blue, glowing ball. Holden turned off the monitor, and both of the camera operators swiveled to put him at the center of their shots. But the most intriguing factor of the slow zone, and the one that gives it its name, is the absolute speed limit of 600 meters per second. Any object above the quantum level traveling faster than that is locked down by what seems to be an inertial dampening field, and then dragged off to join the garbage circling the central station. At a guess, this is some sort of defensive system that protects the ring station and the gates themselves. Light and radar still work normally, but radiation made up of larger particles like alpha and beta radiation does not exist inside the slow zone. At least, outside the ship, that is. Whatever controls the speeds here only seems concerned by the exterior of the objects, not the interior. We've done radiation and object speed tests inside the ship, and so far everything works as normal. But the last probe we fired was immediately grabbed by the field and is now making its way down to the garbage ring. The lack of alpha and beta radiation leads me to believe that there's a thin cloud of loose electrons and helium nuclei orbiting that station as part of the garbage ring. Can you tell us what your plan is now? Monica said from off-camera. Cohen pointed his mic at her, then back at Holden. Our plan now is to remain motionless, avoid attracting the ring station's attention, and keep studying the slow zone using what instruments we have. We can't leave until we repair the comm array and let everyone outside know that we aren't psychotic murderers bent on claiming the ring for ourselves. Great, Monica said, giving him the thumbs up. Clip and Okju moved around the room getting shots to cut in later. They shot the instrument panels, the monitor behind Holden, even Naomi lounging in her op station crash couch. She smiled sweetly and flipped them off. How's everyone doing after the burn? Holden asked, Clip's blood-pinked eye still drawing his attention. Cohen touched his side and grimaced. Got a rib that I think just slid back into place this morning. I've never been on a ship doing maneuvers that violent before. It gave me a little more respect for the Navy. Holden pushed off the bulkhead and drifted over to Naomi. In a low voice, he said, Speaking of the Navy... How's that comaray coming along? I'd really love to start protesting my innocence before someone figures out a way to lob a slow-moving torpedo in here after us. She blew out an exasperated breath at him and started tugging on her hair like she did when she was lost in a complex problem. That little Trojan horse that keeps grabbing control? Every time I wipe and reboot, it finds its way back in. I've got comms totally isolated from the other systems, and it's still getting in. And the weapons? They keep on powering up, but they never fire. So there has to be some connection. Yes, Naomi said, and waited. Holden felt a self-conscious discomfort. That doesn't tell you anything you didn't know. No. Holden pulled himself down into the crash couch next to hers and buckled in. He was trying to play it cool, but the truth was, the longer they went without presenting a defense, or at least a denial to the fleets outside, the more risk there was that someone would find a way to destroy the Rosi, slow zone or not. The fact that Naomi couldn't figure it out only added to the worry. If whoever was doing this was clever enough to outsmart Naomi with an engineering problem, they were in a lot of trouble. What's the next plan? he asked trying to keep the impatience out of his voice. Naomi heard it anyway. We're taking a break from it, she said. 
I've got Alex doing ladar sweeps of all the other rings that make up the boundary of the slow zone, just to see if one is different in some way. And I've got Amos fixing that light bulb in the head. There's nothing else to do, and I wanted him out of my hair while I come up with another way to attack this calm problem. What can I do to help? Holden asked. He'd already gone through every other system on the ship three times, looking for malicious and hidden programs. He hadn't found any, and he couldn't think of anything else that might be useful. You're doing it, Naomi said, subtly moving her head toward Monica without actually looking at her. I feel like I've got the ship job here. Oh, please, Naomi said with a grin. You love the attention. The deck hatch slid open with a bang, and Amos came up the crew ladder. Motherfucker, he yelled as the hatch closed behind him. What? Holden started, but Amos kept yelling. When I peeled that twitchy power circuit open in the head, I found this little bastard hiding in the LED housing, sucking off our juice. Amos threw something, and Holden barely managed to catch it before it hit him in the face. It looked like a small transmitter with power leads coming off one end. He held it up to Naomi, and her face darkened. That's it, she said, reaching out to take it from Holden. You're fucking right, that's it, Amos bellowed. Someone hid that in the head, and it's been loading the software hijacker onto our system every time we boot up. Someone with access to the ship's head, Naomi said, looking at Holden. But he'd already gone past that and was unbuckling his restraints. Are you armed? Holden asked Amos. The big mechanic pulled a large caliber pistol out of his pocket and held it against his thigh. In the microgravity, it would shove Amos around if he fired it, but surrounded by bulkheads, that wouldn't be too much of a problem. Hey, Monica said, her face shifting from confusion to fear. One of you hijacked my comma ray, Holden said. One of you is working for whoever is doing this to us. Whoever it is should really just tell me now. You forgot to threaten us, Cohen said. He sounded almost ill. No, I didn't. Naomi had unbuckled her harness as well and was floating next to him now. She tapped a wall panel and said, Alex, get down here. Look, Monica said, patting the air with her hands. You're making a mistake blaming us for this. Clip and Oakju moved behind her, pulling Cohen to them. The documentary crew formed a small circle facing outward unconsciously creating a defensive perimeter. More Pleistocene age behavior that humans still carried with them. Alex drifted down from the cockpit. His usually jolly face had a hard expression on it. He was carrying a heavy wrench. Tell me who did it, Holden repeated. I swear by everything holy that I will space the whole damn lot of you to protect this ship if I have to. It wasn't us, Monica said the fear in her face draining the bland video star prettiness away, making her look older, gaunt. Fuck this, Amos said, pointing the gun at them. Let me drag one of them down to the airlock and space them right now. Even if only one of them did it, I got me a 25% chance to get the right one. Got a 33% chance with the second one I toss. 50-50 by the third, and those are odds I'll take any day. Holden didn't acknowledge the threat but he didn't argue with it either. Let them sweat. Shit, Cohen said. I don't suppose it will matter that I got set up just as bad as you guys, will it? Monica's eyes went wide. Oakju and Clip turned to stare at the blind man. You? Holden said. It didn't make any sense not to. Not really. But he honestly hadn't suspected the blind guy. It made him feel betrayed, and guilty of his prejudices at the same time. I got paid to stick that rig on the ship, Cohen said, moving out of the defensive circle and floating a half meter closer to Holden, pulling himself out of the group so that if anything happened, they wouldn't get hurt. Holden respected him for that. I had no idea what it would do. I figured someone was spying on your comms is all. When that broadcast went out and the missiles started flying, I was just as surprised as you guys. 
and my ass was just as much on the line. Motherfucker, Amos said again, this time without the heat. Holden knew him well enough to know that angry Amos was not nearly as dangerous as cold Amos. I was thinking I'd have a tough time spacing a blind guy, but turns out I'm going to be just fine with it. Not yet, Holden said, waving Amos off. Who paid you to do this? Lie to me and I let Amos have his way. Cohen held up both hands in surrender. Hey, you got me, boss. I know my ass is hanging by a thread right now. I got no reason not to come clean. Then do. I only met her once, Cohen continued. Young woman. Nice voice. Had lots of money. Asked me to plant this thing. I said, sure, get me on that ship and I plant whatever you want. Next thing I know, Monica's got a gig doing this dock about you in the ring. Damned if I know how she swung that. Son of a bitch, Monica said, clearly as surprised by this revelation as anyone else. That actually made Holden feel a little better. Who was this young woman with all the money? Holden asked. Amos hadn't moved, but he wasn't pointing the gun at anyone anymore. Cohen's tone didn't have a hint of deception in it. He sounded like a man who knew that his life hung on every word. Never got a name, but I can sculpt her pretty easy. Do that, Holden said. Then watched as Cohen plugged his modeling software into the big monitor. Over the next several minutes... The image of a woman slowly formed. It was all one color, of course, and the hair was a sculpted lump, not individual strands. But when Cohen had finished, Holden had no doubt about who it was. She was changed, but not so much that he couldn't recognize the dead girl. Julie Mao. The ship was quiet. Monica and her two camera operators had been confined to the crew decks again, and last time Holden had checked, they were together in the galley, not talking. Cohen's betrayal had taken them by surprise as well, and they were still working through it. Cohen himself was in the airlock. It was the closest thing they had to a brig. Holden had to assume the man was quietly panicking. Alex was back in the cockpit. After Amos had thrown Cohen into the airlock, he'd disappeared back down to his machine shop to brood. Holden had let him go. Of them all, Amos took betrayal the hardest. Holden knew that Cohen's life was hanging on whether Amos could get past it or not. If he decided to take action, Holden wouldn't be able to stop him, and didn't even know if he'd want to try. So he and Naomi sat alone together on the ops deck as she made the last few adjustments to get the comm array back up and running. With Cohen's device disabled, they'd been able to reboot it without being hijacked. Naomi was waiting for him to speak. He could feel the tension in her shoulders from across the room, but he had no idea what to say. For a year, Miller had been a confused phantasm that appeared randomly and spouted nonsense. Now everything Miller had said over the last year took on the weight of dark portents, prophetic riddles whose meaning must be teased out or risk catastrophe. And Miller wasn't the only ghost haunting Holden. Julie Mao had joined the game. Somehow, while Miller had followed Holden around the solar system, the protomolecule had been using Julie, working on its own secret plans. Julie had arranged for the Martian lawsuit that stripped him of safe ports and employment. She'd arranged to have a documentary crew placed on his ship to send him to the ring. And now, it appeared, she'd engineered an elaborate betrayal that forced him to actually go through the ring to stay alive. The ghost Julie didn't resemble his Miller at all. It was working with very specific purpose. It had access to money and powerful connections. The only thing it had in common with Miller was that it seemed to be focused on him. And if this was all true, then everything it had done had been with a single purpose in mind. To bring him here. To force him to go through the ring. A shiver crawled its way up his spine, sending all the hairs on his arms and neck standing straight up. 
He turned on the closest workstation and brought up the external telescopes. Nothing at all in this starless void except a lot of inactive rings and the massive blue ball at its center. As he watched, the missile that had chased them through the gate drifted into view and joined the slowly circling ring of flotsam that orbited the station. Everything comes to me, eventually, the station seemed to be saying. I have to go there, he said out loud, even as the thought popped into his head. Where? Naomi asked, turning away from her work on the comm. The relief he could see on her face now that he'd finally said something wouldn't last long. He felt a pang of guilt for that. The station, or whatever it is. I have to go there. No, you don't, she said. Everything that's happened over the last year has been to bring me here, now. Holden rubbed his face with both hands, itching his eyes and hiding from Naomi's scrutiny at the same time. And that thing is the only place in here. There's nothing else. No other open gates, no planets, no ships. Nothing. Jim, Naomi said, a warning in her voice. This thing where you always have to be the guy who goes? I'll never know why the protomolecule is talking to me until I get there face to face. Eros, Ganymede, the Agatha King, Naomi continued. You always think you have to go. Holden stopped rubbing his face and looked at her. She stared back, beautiful and angry and sad. He felt his throat threaten to close up, so he said, Am I wrong? Tell me I'm wrong and we'll think of something else. Tell me how all of what's happened means something else and I'm just not seeing it. No, she said again, meaning something else this time. Okay, he sighed. Okay, then. It's getting old being the one who stays behind. You're not staying behind, Holden said. You're keeping the crew alive while I do something really stupid. It's why we're an awesome team. You're the captain now. That's a shit job, and you know it. Chapter 21 Bull In the last hours before they shot the ring, a kind of calm descended on the behemoth. In the halls and galleries, people talked, but their voices were controlled, quiet, brittle. The independent feeds, always a problem, were pretty subdued. The complaints coming to the security desk fell to nothing. Bull kept an eye on the places people could get liquored up and stupid, but there were no flare-ups. The traffic going through the comm laser back toward Tycho Station and all points sunward spiked to six times its usual bandwidth. A lot of people on the ship wanted to say something to someone, a kid, a sister, a dad, a lover, before they passed through the signal warping circumference and into whatever was on the other side. Bull had thought about doing it, too. He'd logged into the family group feed for the first time in months, and let the minutiae of the extended Baca family wash over him. One cousin was engaged, another one was divorcing, and they were trading notes and world views. His aunt on Earth was having trouble with her hip, but since she was on basic, she was on a waiting list to get a doctor to look at it. His brother had dropped a note to say that he'd gotten a job on Luna, but he didn't say what it was or anything about it. Bull listened to the voices of the family he never saw except on the screen, the lives that didn't intersect his own. The love he felt for them surprised him and kept him from putting his own report in among them. It would only scare them, and they wouldn't understand it. He could already hear his cousins telling him to jump ship, get on something that wasn't going through. By the time the message got there... He'd already have gone, anyway. Instead, he recorded a private video for Fred Johnson, and all he said in it was, After this, you owe me one. With an hour to go before they passed through, Bull put the whole ship on battle-ready status. Everyone in their couches, one per. No sharing. All tools and personal items secured, 
all carts in their stations and locked down. The bulkheads closed between major sections so that if something happened, they'd only lose air one deck at a time. He got a few complaints, but they were mostly just grousing. They made the transit slowly. The thrust gravity hardly more than a tendency for things to drift toward the floor. Bull couldn't say whether that was a technical decision on Sam's part, meant to keep them from moving too quickly in the uncanny reduced speed beyond the ring, or Ashford giving the Earth and Mars ships the time to catch up so that they'd all be passing through at more or less the same time. Only if it was that, it wouldn't have been Ashford. That kind of diplomatic thinking was pa. Probably it was just that the main drive couldn't go slow enough, and this was as fast as the maneuvering thrusters could move them. Bull wasn't that worried about the Earth forces. They'd been the ones to broker the deal, and they had civilians on board. Mars, on the other hand, might call itself a science mission, but its escort was explicitly military. And until Earth stepped in, they'd be willing to poke holes in the behemoth until the air ran out. Too many people with too many agendas. And everyone was worried that the other guy would shoot them in the back. Of all the ways to go and meet the godlike alien whatever they were that built the protomolecule, this was the stupidest, the most dangerous, and, for Bull's money, the most human. The transit actually took a measurable amount of time the great bulk of the behemoth sulking through the ring in a few seconds. An eerie, fluting groan passed through the ship, and Bull, in his crash couch at the security office waiting for the next disaster, felt the goose flesh on his arms and neck. He flipped through the security monitors like a dad walking through the house to see if the windows were all locked, all the kids safely in their beds. Memories of the Eros feed tugged at the back of his mind. Black whirls of filament covering the corridors, the bodies of the innocent and the guilty alike, warping, falling apart, and becoming something else without actually dying in between. The blue firefly glow that no one had yet explained. With every new monitor, he expected to see the behemoth in that same light. And every time he didn't, his dread moved on to the one still to come. He moved to the external sensor feed the luminous blue object in the center of a sphere of anomalies that the computers interpreted as being approximately the same size as the ring. Gates to God knew where. I don't know what the hell we're doing here, he said under his breath. Ah, shut them men, brother, Serge said, pale-faced from his desk. A connect request popped on Bull's hand terminal, the alert red of senior staff. With dread growing at the back of his throat, Bull accepted it. Sam appeared on the screen. Hey, she said. This whole act like we're in a battle thing, where we aren't supposed to get out of our crash couches? I'd really appreciate it if you could ease up enough to let us make sure the ship isn't falling apart. You getting alerts? No, Sam admitted. But we just sailed the behemoth into a region of space with different, you know, laws of physics and stuff. Makes me want to take a peek. We got eight ships coming in right behind us, Bull said. Hold tight until we see how that shakes down. Sam smiled in a way that expressed her annoyance with him perfectly. You can get the teensiest bit paternalistic sometimes, Bull. You know that? A new alert popped up by Sam's face. A high-priority message was coming into the comm array. From the Rosinante. Sam. I got something here. I'll get back to you. I'll be sitting here on my couch doing nothing, she said. He flipped over to the incoming message. It was a broadcast. A belter woman, with black hair pulled back from her face in a style that gave Bull the impression she'd been welding something before she'd begun the broadcast and would be again as soon as she was finished, looked into the camera. Nagata, executive officer of the Rosinante. I want to make it very clear that the previous broadcast claiming our ownership of the ring was a fake. Our communications array was hijacked, and we were locked out of it. The saboteur on board has confessed, and I am including a data file at the end of this transmission with all the evidence we have about the real perpetrator of these crimes. 
I am also including a short documentary presentation on what we've discovered in the time we've been here that Monica Stewart and her team produced. I want to reiterate here, Captain Holden had no mandate from anyone to claim the ring. He had no intention of doing so, and none of us had any participation in or knowledge of the bomb on the Sung Un, or on any other ship. We were here solely as transport and support for a documentary team, and pose no intentional threat whatsoever to any other vessel. Serge grunted, unconvinced. You think they fragged him? Keep Jim Holden from grabbing the camera? Fragged him or tied him up, Bull said. It was a joke, but there was something in it. Why wasn't the Resonantes captain the one making the announcement? We will not surrender our ship, the belter said. But we will invite inspectors aboard to verify what we've reported, with the following conditions. First, the inspectors will have to comply with basic safety. Five more communication alerts popped up, all from different ships, all broadcast. If they were flying into the teeth of a vast and malefic alien intelligence, by God, they were going to go down squabbling. Unacceptable. We demand the immediate surrender of the Tachi and all accompanying... What confirmation you can provide that James Holden at once for interrogation. If your claims are verified, we will... Message repeats. Please confirm and clarify EVA activity, Rosinanti. Who have you got out there and where are they going? Bull pulled up the sensor array and began a careful sweep of the area around Holden's ship. It took him half a minute to find it. A single EVA suit burning away from the ship and heading for the blue glowing structure in the center of the sphere. He said something obscene. Five minutes later, the XO of the Rosinante spoke again to confirm Bull's worst suspicions. This is Naomi Nagata, she said, executive officer and acting captain of the Rosinante. Captain Holden is not presently available to take questions, meet with any representatives, or surrender himself into anybody's custody. He is... She looked down. Bull couldn't tell if it was fear or embarrassment or a little of both. The belter took a deep breath and continued. He is conducting an EVA approach of the base at the middle of the slow zone. We have reason to believe he was... called there. Bull's laughter pulled Serge's attention. Serge lifted his hand, the physical belter idiom for asking a question. Bull shook his head. Just trying to think of a way we could be doing this worse, he said. Ashford insisted that they meet in person, so even though Bull had ordered that all crew members not performing essential functions remain in their couches, he himself floated to the lift and headed to the bridge. The crew was a muted cacophony. Every station was juggling telemetry and signal switching and sensor data, even though basically nothing was going on. It was just that the excitement demanded that everything be busy and serious and fraught. The excitement, or else the fear. The monitors were set to a tactical display. Earth in blue, Mars in red, the behemoth in orange, and the artifact at the center of the sphere in a deep forest green. The debris ring was marked in white, and two dots of gold, one for the Rosinante, well ahead of the other ships, and another for her captain. The scale was so small, Bull could see the shapes of the larger ships, boxy and awkward in the way that structures built for vacuum could be. The universe shrunk down to a knot smaller than the sun, and still unthinkably vast. And in that bubble of darkness, mystery, and dread, two matched dots, one blue, the other red, moving steadily toward the little gold holden. Marine skiffs, hardly more than a wide couch strapped on the end of a fusion drive. Bull had ridden on boats like them so long ago it seemed like a different lifetime. But if he closed his eyes, he could still feel the rattle of the thrusters transferred through the shell of his armor. Some things he would never forget. How long, Ashford said, until you can put together a matching force? Bull rubbed his palm against his chin. Shrugged. How long did it take to get back to Tycho? Ashford's face went red. I'm not interested in your sense of humor, Mr. Baca, 
Earth and Mars have both launched interception teams against the outlaw James Holden. If we don't have a force of our own out there, we look weak. We're here to make sure the OPA remains the equal of the inner planets, and we're going to do that, whatever it takes. Am I clear? You're clear, sir. So how long would it take? Bull looked at Pa. Her face was carefully blank. She knew the answer as well as he did, but she wasn't going to say it. Leaving the shit job for the Earther. Well, all right. It can't be done, Bull said. Each one of those skiffs is carrying half a dozen marines in full battle dress. Powered armor. Maybe Goliath class for the Martians, Reaver class for the Earthers. Either way, I don't have anything in that league. And the soldiers inside those suits have trained for exactly this kind of combat every day for years. I've got a bunch of plumbers with rifles I could put on a shuttle. The bridge went quiet. Ashford crossed his arms. Plumbers. With rifles. Is that how you see us, Mr. Baca? I don't question the bravery or commitment of anyone on this crew, Bull said. I believe that any team we sent over there would be willing to lay down their lives for the cause. Of course, that would only take about fifteen seconds, and I won't send our people into that. The implication floated in the air as gently as they did. You're the captain. You can make the order, but you'll own the consequences. And they'll know the Earther told you what would happen. Pa's eyes were narrow and looked away. Thank you, Mr. Baca, Ashford said. You're dismissed. Bull saluted, turned, and launched himself for the lift. Behind him, the bridge crew started talking again, but not as loud. Probably they'd all get reamed once Bull was gone, just because they'd been in the room when Ashford got embarrassed. The chances were slim that they'd be sending anyone to the thing. Nucleus, base, whatever it was. Bull couldn't think of a way to do any better than that, so that would count for a win. On the way back to his station, he looked over the data file the Rosinante had sent out. The saboteur seemed legitimate enough. Bull had seen enough faked confessions to recognize the signs, and this didn't have them. After that, though, the whole damn thing turned into a fairy tale. A mysterious woman who manipulated governments and civilians, who was willing to kill dozens of people and risk thousands in order to... do what? Put James Holden through the ring, where he was going now? The image the prisoner had built looked like it had been carved from ice. No one had added color. Bull put on an even olive flesh tone and brown hair, and the face didn't look familiar. Juliet Mao, they said. She hadn't been the first person infected with the protomolecule, but everyone before her had gotten thrown in an autoclave one way or the other. She'd been the seed crystal that Eros had used to make itself, to make the ring. So, who was to say she couldn't be wandering around hiring traitors and placing bombs? The problem with living with miracles was that they made everything seem plausible. An alien weapon had been lurking in orbit around Saturn for billions of years. It had eaten thousands of people, hijacking the mechanisms of their bodies for its own ends. It had built a wormhole gate into a kind of haunted sphere. So, why not the rest? If all that was possible, everything was. Bull didn't buy it. Back at the security desk, he checked the status. The skiff of Earth Marines had gone too fast, trying to race ahead of the Martian force. The slow zone had caught them, and the skiff was drifting off toward the Ring of Debris. Chances were that all the men in it were dead. The Martian skiff was still on track, but Holden would reach the structure before they got to him. It was too bad, in a way. The Martians had been the trigger-happy ones all along. Chances of someone getting to question Holden were looking pretty long. Bull sucked his teeth, half-formed ideas shifting in the back of his mind. Holden wasn't getting interrogated, but that didn't mean no one would. He checked his security codes. Ashford hadn't blocked him from using the comm laser. Protocol would have been to discuss this with Ashford, or at least Pa, but they had their hands full right now anyway. And if it worked, it would be hard for them to object. They'd have a bargaining chip. 
The Rosinante's XO appeared on the screen. What can I do for you, Behemoth? Carlos Baca here. I'm security chief. Wanted to talk about maybe taking a problem off your hands. She hoisted her eyebrows, her head shaking like she was trying to stay awake. She had a smart face. I've got a lot of problems right now, she said. Which one were you thinking about? You've got a bunch of civvies on your ship. One of them under arrest. Mars is still saying you're flying their ship. Earth is wondering whether you blew the shit out of one of theirs. I can take custody of your prisoner and give the rest of them a safer place than you can. Last I checked, the OPA was the only one that's actually shot at us so far, she said. She had a good smile. Too young for him, but ten years ago, he'd have been asking her if he could make her dinner around now. Doesn't put you at the top of my list. That was me, Bo said. I won't do it this time. It got him a chuckle, but it was a bleak kind. The one that came from someone wading through hell. Look, you got a lot going on, you've got a bunch of people on there who aren't your crew. You've got to keep them safe, and it's a distraction. You send them over here, and everyone will see you aren't trying to control access to them. Makes this whole thing about how it wasn't you that blew the shit out of the Sung Un that much easier for people to believe. I think we're past goodwill gestures, she said. I think goodwill gestures are the only chance you have to avoid a field promotion, Bo said. They're sending killers after your captain. Good ones. No one's thinking straight here. You and me, we can start cooling things down. Acting like grown-ups. And if we do, maybe they do too. No one else needs to get killed. Thin hope, she said. It's all the hope I got. You got nothing to hide, then show them that. Show everyone. It took her twenty seconds. All right, she said. You can have them. Chapter 22 Holden Wow, Holden said to himself. I really don't want to do this. The sound echoed in his helmet, competing only with the faint hiss of his radio. I tried to talk you out of it, Naomi replied, her voice somehow managing to be intimate, even flattened and distorted by his suit's small speakers. Sorry, I didn't think you were listening. Ah, she said, irony. Holden tore his eyes away from the slowly growing sphere that was his destination and spun around to look for the Rosinante behind him. She wasn't visible until Alex fired a maneuvering thruster and a gossamer cone of steam reflected some of the sphere's blue glow. His suit told him that the Rosi was over 30,000 kilometers away, more than twice as far as any two people on Earth could ever be from each other, and receding. And here he was, in a suit of vacuum armor, wearing a disposable EVA pack that had about five minutes of thrust in it. He'd burned one minute accelerating toward the sphere. He'd burn another slowing down when he got there. That left enough to fly back to the Rossi when he was done. Optimism expressed his conservation of Delta V. Ships from the three fleets had begun coming through the gate even before he'd started his trip. The Rossi was now protected from them only by the absolute speed limit of the slow zone. She was drifting off at just under that limit to put as much space between her and the fleets as possible. They had a sphere a million kilometers in diameter to play with, even without going beyond the area marked by the gates. The gates had close to 50,000 kilometers of empty space between them. But the idea of flying out of the slow zone and into that starless void beyond made Holden's skin crawl. He and Naomi had agreed it would be a maneuver of last resort. As long as no one could fire a ballistic weapon, the Rossi should be plenty safe with 500 quadrillion square kilometers to move around in. Holden spun back around, using two quarter-second blasts from his EVA pack, and took a range reading to the sphere. It was still hours away. The minute-long burst he'd fired from the pack to start his journey had accelerated him to a slow crawl, astronomically speaking, and the Rossi had come to a relative stop before releasing him. 
He'd never have had enough juice in the EVA pack to stop himself if the ship had flung him out at the slow zone's maximum speed. Ahead, in the middle of all that starless black, the blue sphere waited. It had waited for two billion years for someone to come through his particular gate, if the researchers were right about how long ago Phoebe had been captured by Saturn. But lately, the strangeness surrounding the protomolecule and the ring left Holden with the disquieting feeling that maybe all of the assumptions they'd made about its origins and purpose were wrong. Protogen had named the protomolecule and decided it was a tool that could redefine what it meant to be human. Jules-Pierre Mao had treated it like a weapon. It killed humans, therefore it was a weapon. But radiation killed humans, and a medical X-ray machine wasn't intended as a weapon. Holden was starting to feel like they were all monkeys playing with a microwave. Push a button, a light comes on inside, so it's a light. Push a different button and stick your hand inside, it burns you, so it's a weapon. Learn to open and close the door, it's a place to hide things. Never grasping what it actually did, and maybe not even having the framework necessary to figure it out. No monkey ever reheated a frozen burrito. So here the monkeys were, poking the shiny box and making guesses about what it did. Holden could tell himself that in his case the box was asking to be poked, but even that was making a lot of assumptions. Miller looked human, had been human once, so it was easy to think of him as having human motivations. Miller wanted to communicate. He wanted Holden to know or do something. But it was just as likely, more likely maybe, that Holden was anthropomorphizing something far stranger. He imagined himself landing on the station and Miller saying, James Holden, you and only you in the universe have the correct chemical composition to make a perfect wormhole fuel, then stuffing him into a machine to be processed. Everything okay? Naomi asked in response to his chuckle. Still just thinking about how incredibly stupid this is. Why didn't I let you talk me out of it? It looks like you did, but it took a couple of hours for it to process. Want us to come get you? No. If I bail out now, I'll never have the balls to try it again, Holden said. How's it look out there? The fleets came through with about two dozen ships, mostly heavies. Alex has figured out the math on doing short torpedo burns to get one up to the speed limit, but not over, which means everyone on those other ships are doing the same thing. So far, no one has fired at us. Maybe your protestations of my innocence worked? Maybe she said. There were a couple of small ships detaching from the fleet on an intercept course with you. The Rossi is calling them landing skiffs. Shit, they're sending the Marines after me? They've burned up to the speed limit, but the Rossi says you make station fall before they catch you. But just before. Damn, Holden said. I really hope there's a door. They lost the UN ship. The other is Martian. So maybe they brought Bobby. She can make sure the others are nice to you. No, Holden said with a sigh. No, these will be the ones that are still mad at me. Knowing the Marines were following made the back of his neck itch. Being in a spacesuit just added that to his already lengthy list of insoluble problems. On the good news level, Monica's team is getting evacuated to the behemoth. You never did like her. Not much, no. Why not? Her job is digging up old things, Naomi said, the lightness of her tone almost covering her anxieties. And digging up old things leads to messes like this one. When Holden was nine, Rufus, the family Labrador, died. He had already been an adult dog when Holden was born, so Holden had only ever known Rufus as a big, black, slobbering bundle of love. He'd taken some of his first steps, clutching the dog's fur in one stubby fist. He'd run around the Montana farm, not much bigger than a toddler, with Rufus as his only babysitter. Holden had loved the dog with the simple intensity only children and dogs share. But when he was nine, Rufus was fifteen, 
and old for such a big dog. He slowed down. He stopped running with Holden, barely managing a trot to catch up, then gradually only a slow walk. He stopped eating. And one night, he flopped onto his side next to a heater vent and started panting. Mother Elise had told him that Rufus probably wouldn't last the night, and even if he did, they'd have to call the vet in the morning. Holden had tearfully sworn to stay by the dog's side. For the first couple of hours, he held Rufus's head on his lap and cried, as Rufus struggled to breathe and occasionally gave one half-hearted thump of his tail. By the third, against his will and every good thought he'd had about himself, Holden was bored. It was a lesson he'd never forgotten. That humans only have so much emotional energy. No matter how intense the situation or how powerful the feelings, it was impossible to maintain a heightened emotional state forever. Eventually, you'd just get tired and want it to end. For the first hours drifting toward the glowing blue station, Holden had felt awe at the immensity of empty starless space around him. He'd felt fear of what the protomolecule might want from him, fear of the marines following him, fear that he'd made the wrong choice and that he'd arrive at the station to find nothing at all. Most of all, fear that he'd never see Naomi or his crew again. But after four hours of being alone in his spacesuit, even the fear burned out. He just wanted it all to be over with. With the infinite and unbroken black all around him, and the only visible spot of light coming from the blue sphere directly ahead, it was easy to feel like he was in some vast tunnel, slowly moving toward the exit. The human mind didn't do well with infinite spaces. It wanted walls, horizons, limits. It would create them if it had to. His suit beeped at him to let him know it was time to replenish his O2 supply. He pulled a spare bottle out of the webbing clipped to his EVA pack and attached it to the suit's nipple. The gauge on his HUD climbed back up to four hours and stopped. The next time he had to refill, he'd be on the station or in Marine custody. One way or the other, he wouldn't be alone anymore. And that was a relief. He wondered what his mothers would have thought about all this, whether they would have approved of the choices he'd made, how he could arrange to have a dog for their children since Naomi wouldn't be able to live at the bottom of the gravity well. His attention wandered, and then his mind. He awoke to a harsh buzzing sound and for a few seconds slapped his hand at empty space trying to turn his alarm off. When he finally opened sleep-gummed eyes, he saw his HUD flashing a proximity warning. He'd somehow managed to fall asleep until the station was only a few kilometers away. At that distance, it loomed like a gently curving wall of metallic blue, glowing with its own inner light. No radiation alarms were flashing, so whatever made it glow wasn't anything his suit thought was dangerous to him. The flight program Alex had written for him was spooling out on the HUD, counting down to the moment when he'd need to do his minute-long deceleration burn. Waving his hand around when he first woke up had put him into a gentle rotation, and the flight program was prompting him to allow it to make course corrections. Since he trusted Alex completely on matters of navigation, Holden authorized the suit to handle the descent automatically. A few quick bursts of compressed gas later, he was facing out into the black, the sphere at his back. Then came a minute-long burn from the pack to slow him to a gentle half meter per second for landing. He kicked on his boot magnets, not knowing if they'd actually help or not. The sphere looked like metal, but that didn't mean much, and turned around. The wall of glowing blue was less than five meters away. Holden bent his knees, bracing for the impact of hitting the surface and hoping to absorb enough energy that he didn't just bounce off. The half meters ticked away, each second taking too long and passing too quickly. With only a meter before impact, he realized he'd been holding his breath and let out a long exhale. Here we go he said to no one. Hey, boss, 
Alex said in a burst of radio static. Before Holden could reply, the surface of the sphere irised open and swallowed him up. After Holden passed through the portal into the interior of the sphere, he landed on the gently curving floor of a room shaped like an inverted dome. The walls were the metallic blue of the sphere's exterior. The surfaces were textured almost like moss, and tiny lights seemed to flicker in and out of existence like fireflies. His suit reported a thin atmosphere made mostly of benzene compounds and neon. The ceiling iris closed again, its flat, unbroken surface showing no sign that there had ever been an opening. Miller stood a few meters from where Holden landed. His rumpled gray suit and pork pie hat made both mundane and exotic by the alien setting. The lack of breathable air didn't seem to bother him at all. Holden straightened his knees and was surprised to feel something like gravity's resistance. He'd felt the weight of spin and of thrust and the natural deep pull of a gravity well. The EVA pack was heavy on his back, but the quality of it was different. He almost felt like something was pushing down on him from above instead of the ground coming up to meet him. Hey, boss, Alex repeated, a note of worry in his voice. Miller held up a hand in a don't-mind-me gesture, wordless permission for Holden to answer. Receiving, Alex, go ahead. The sphere just swallowed you, Alex said. You okay in there? Yep, five by five. But you called before I went in. What's up? Just wanted to warn you that company's coming pretty close on. You can expect them in about five minutes at best guess. Thanks for the report. I'm hoping Miller won't let them in. Miller? Alex and Naomi said at the same time. She must have been monitoring the exchange. I'll call when I know more, Holden said with a grunt as he finished getting the EVA pack off. It fell to the floor with a thud. That was odd. Holden turned on the suit's external speakers and said, Miller? He heard the sound of his own voice echoing off of the walls and around the room. The atmosphere shouldn't have been thick enough for that. Hey, Miller replied, his voice unmuffled by the spacesuit as if they were standing together on the deck of the Rossi. He nodded slowly, his sad, basset-hound face twisting into something resembling a smile. There are others coming. They yours? Not mine, no, Holden replied. That would be the skiff full of Martian recon marines that are coming to arrest me. Or maybe just shoot me. It's complicated. You've been making friends without me, Miller said, his tone sardonic and amused. How are you doing? Holden asked. You seem more coherent than usual. Miller gave a short belter shrug. How do you mean? Usually when we talk, it's like only half the signal's getting through. The old detective's eyebrows rose in surprise. You've seen me before? On and off for the last year or so? Well, that's pretty disturbing, Miller said. If they're planning to shoot you, we'd better get going. Miller seemed to flicker out of existence, reappearing at the edge of the moss-like walls. Holden followed, his body fighting with the nauseating sense of being weightless and heavy at the same time. When he drew close, he could see the spirals within the moss on the walls. He'd seen something like this before where the protomolecule had been, but this was lush by comparison, complex and rich and deep. A vast ripple seemed to pass over the wall like a stone thrown in a pond, and, despite having his own isolated air supply, Holden smelled something like orange peels and rain. Hey. Miller said. Sorry, Holden said. What? We better get going, the dead man said. He gestured toward what looked like a fold of the strange moss, but when Holden came close, he saw a fissure behind it. The hole looked soft as flesh at the edges, and it glistened with something. It wept. Where are we going? Deeper, 
Miller said. Since we're here, there's something we should probably do. I have to tell you, though, you got a lot of balls. For what? Holden said, and his hand slid against the wall. A layer of slime stuck to the fingers of his suit. Coming here? You told me to, Holden said. You brought me. Julie brought me. I don't want to talk about what happened to Julie, the dead man said. Holden followed him into the narrow tunnel. Its walls were slick and organic. It was like crawling through a deep cave or down the throat of a vast animal. You're definitely making more sense than usual. There are tools here, Miller said. They're not... they're not right, but they're here at least. Does this mean you might still say something enigmatic and vanish in a puff of blue fireflies? Probably. Miller didn't expand on this, so Holden followed him for several dozen meters through the tunnel until it turned again, and Miller led him into a much larger room. Oh, uh, wow, he managed to say. Because the floor of the first room and the tunnel that led out of it had both had a consistent down, Holden had thought he was moving laterally just under the skin of the station. That couldn't have been right because the room the tunnel opened into had a much higher ceiling than was possible if that were true. The space stretched out from the tunnel into a cathedral vast opening hundreds of meters across. The walls slanted inward into a domed ceiling that was twenty meters off the floor in the center. Scattered across the room in seemingly random places were two-meter-thick columns of something that looked like blue glass with black, branching veins shooting through it. The columns pulsed with light, and each pulse was accompanied by a subsonic throb that Holden could feel in his bones and teeth. It felt like enormous power, carefully restrained, a giant whispering. Holy shit, he finally said when his breath came back. We're in a lot of trouble, aren't we? Yeah, Miller said. You shouldn't have come. Miller walked off across the room, and Holden hurried to catch up. Wait, what? he said. I thought you wanted me here. Miller walked around something that from a distance had looked like a blue statue of an insect, but up close was a massive confusion of metallic limbs and protrusions, like a construction mech folded up on itself. Holden tried to guess at its purpose and failed. Why would you think that? Miller said as he walked. You don't know what's in here. Doors and corners. Never walk into a crime scene until you know there's not someone there waiting to put you down. You've got to clear the room first. But maybe we got lucky. For now. Wouldn't recommend doing it again, though. I don't understand. They came to a place in the floor that was covered in what looked like cilia, or plant stalks, gently rippling in a non-existent wind. Miller walked around it. Holden was careful to do the same. As they passed, a swarm of blue fireflies burst out of the ground cover and flew up to a vent in the ceiling where they vanished. So... There was this unlicensed brothel down in Sector 18. We went thinking we'd be hauling fifteen, twenty people in. More, maybe. Got there, and the place was stripped to the stone, Miller said. It wasn't that they'd gotten wind of us, though. The Loca Grega had heard about the place, sent their guys to clean it up. Took about a week to find the bodies. According to forensics, they'd all been shot twice in the head pretty much while we were getting one last cup of coffee. If we'd been a little faster, we'd have walked in on it. Nothing says fucked like opening the door on a bunch of kids who thought they'd make a quick buck off the sex trade and having an organized kill squad there for the meet and greet instead. What has that got to do with anything? This place is the same, Miller said. There was supposed to be something. A lot of something. There was supposed to be... Shit, I don't have the right words. An empire. A civilization. A home. 
more than a home, a master. Instead, there's a bunch of locked doors and the lights on a timer. I don't want you charging into the middle of that. You'll get your ass killed. What the hell do you mean? Holden said. You or the protomolecule or Julie Mao or whatever you set this whole thing up. The job, the attack, all of it. That stopped Miller. He turned around with a frown on his face. Julie's dead, kid. Miller's dead. I'm just the machine for finding lost things. I don't understand, Holden said. If you didn't do this, then who did? See, now, that's a good question. On several levels. Depending on what you mean by this. Miller's head lifted like a dog catching an unfamiliar scent on the wind. Your friends are here. We should go. He moved off at a faster walk toward the far wall of the room. The Marines, Holden said. Could you stop them? No, Miller said. I don't protect anything. I can tell the station they're a threat. There'd be consequences, though. Holden felt a punch of dread in his gut. That sounds bad. It wouldn't be good. Come on. If we're going to do this, we need to stay ahead of them. The halls and passages widened and narrowed, meeting and falling away from each other like blood vessels of some massive organism. Holden's suit light seemed almost lost in the vast darkness, and the blue firefly flickers came in waves and vanished again. Along the way, they passed more of the metallic blue insect-like constructs. What are these? Holden asked, pointing to an especially large and dangerous-looking model as they passed it. Whatever they need to be, Miller replied without turning around. Oh, great, so we're back to inscrutable, are we? Miller spun around, a worried look on his face, and blinked out of existence. Holden turned. Far across the huge room, a form was coming out of the tunnel. Holden had seen similar armor before. A Martian Marine's powered armor was made of equal parts efficiency and threat. There was no escaping it. Anyone in those suits could run him down without trying. Holden switched his suit to an open frequency. Hey, I'm right here. Let's talk about this, he said, then started to walk toward the group. As one, all eight Marines raised their right arms and opened fire. Holden braced himself for death, even while part of his mind knew that he shouldn't have time to brace for death. At the distance they were, the rounds from their high-velocity guns would be hitting in a fraction of a second. He'd be dead long before the sound of the shots reached him. He heard the rapid and deafening buzzsaw sound of the guns firing. But nothing hit him. A diffuse cloud of gray formed in front of the Marines— when the firing finally stopped, the cloud drifted away toward the walls of the room. Bullets. They'd stopped centimeters from the gun barrels, and were now being drawn away just like the objects outside the station. The Marines broke into a fast run across the room, and Holden tried to scramble away. They were beautiful in their way, the lethal power of the suits harnessed by years of training to make their movements seem like a dance. Even without their weapons, they could tear him limb from limb. One punch from that armor would break all the bones he had and change his viscera to a thin slurry. His only chance was to outrun them, and he couldn't outrun them. He almost didn't see the movement when it came. His focus was locked on the Martians, on the danger he knew. He didn't consciously notice that one of the insect-like things had started moving until the Marines turned to it. The alien thing's movements were fast and jagged, like a clockwork mechanism that only had full speed and full stop. It clicked toward the Marines, jerking with each step, and it loomed larger than the tallest of them by almost half a meter. They panicked in the way that people trained to expect violence panic. Two started firing with the same results as before. Another Marine's suit shifted something in its arm and a larger barrel appeared. Holden scooted away from the confrontation. 
He was sure there was shouting going on in those armored suits, but it wasn't a frequency he had access to. The large barrel went white with muzzle flash, and a slow arcing slug of metal the size of Holden's fist took to the strange air. A grenade. The ticking monster ignored it, stepping closer to the marines, and the grenade detonated at its insectile feet where it landed. The alien thing jerked back, its appendages flailing and dust falling from its severed limbs like a smoke of fungal spores. The complex carpet of moss glowed with orange embers where the blast had burned it. And all around the marines, a dozen other alien statues came to life. They moved faster this time. Before the marines could begin to react, the one who'd launched the grenade was lifted gently up and ripped apart. Blood sprayed up into the air, hanging, Holden thought numbly, too long before it drifted back to the ground. The surviving marines began to fall back, their guns pointing to the alien creatures that were swarming the dead man. While Holden watched, the marines retreated into the far tunnel, falling back, regrouping. The alien things fell on their own injured fellow, ripping and clawing, slaughtering it as if it were the enemy as much as the marines had been. And then, when it was gone, five of the monsters gathered together in the burned spot where the explosion had been. They shuddered, went still, shuddered again, and then from all five of them a thin stream of opaque yellow goo spattered out onto the scar. Holden felt fascination and revulsion as the moss grabbed onto the stuff, regrowing like it had never been damaged, like the attack hadn't even existed. Consequences, Miller said at his side. He sounded tired. Did they... Did they just turn that poor bastard into spackle? They did, Miller said. He had it coming, though. That guy got happy with his grenade launcher? Just killed a lot of people. What? How? He taught the station that something moving as fast as a good baseball pitch might still be a threat. Is it going to take revenge? No, Miller said. It's just going to protect itself. Reevaluate what counts as dangerous. Take control of all the ships that might be a problem. What does that even mean? It means a really bad day for a whole lot of people. When it slows you down, it ain't gentle. Holden felt a cold hand close on his heart. The Rosie. A look of sorrow, even sympathy, passed over the detective's face. Maybe. I don't know. Miller said with a rueful shrug. One way or the other, a whole lot of people just died. Chapter 23 Melba Julie saved her. There was no other way to look at it. True to style, Holden's proxy had given everything away. Cohen discovered, told everything he knew, and put the image he'd stolen along with it. Melba had it on her hand terminal, a portrait of the young woman as ice sculpture. She hadn't known the sound man had taken the data when she'd met with him, but she should have guessed he would. The mistake was obvious in retrospect. It ought to have ended the chase. The people in power should have seen it, shrugged, and thrown her out an airlock. Except that it came with its own misinterpretation. Here, Holden said, is Julie Mao. And that's what everyone saw. The differences that were obvious to her became invisible to others. They expected to see the protomolecule infiltrating and threatening and raising the dead, and so they saw it. She did what she could to keep anyone from noticing the similarities. She'd met Cohen on Earth with a full G pulling down. With the Thomas Prince already close to the ring's velocity limit, there was no acceleration thrust. Her cheeks looked fuller, her face round. She'd had her hair down then, so now she pulled it back in a braid. The image had no color, so she wore a little makeup to alter the shape of her eyes and lips. Doing something radical would only call attention, so she went small. She might not even have needed to do that. Her schedule in the Thomas Prince was full. 
They were going to work her, work all of them like dogs. She didn't care. The service gantries and access ways would be safe. No one who knew Clarissa Mao would be there. She would stay away from the public parts of the ship as much as she could, and more often than not, she could get one of the other techs to grab a tube of something from the commissary and bring it to her. In the off-shifts, she would build her arsenal. Holden was beyond her reach for the time being. It was almost funny. She'd gone to so much effort to make him seem like an unrepentant megalomaniac, and then, left to his own devices, he named himself de facto ambassador of the whole human race. Julie had fooled him, too. With any luck at all, he'd die in a firefight or get killed by the protomolecule. Her work had narrowed to destroying the evidence of Holden's innocence. It wouldn't be hard. The Rosinante had begun its life as an escort corvette on the battleship Donager. It was well-designed and well-constructed, but also now years past its last upgrade. The weaknesses in its defense were simple. The cargo doors nearest the reactor had been damaged and repaired and would almost certainly be weaker than the original. The forward airlock had been built with a software glitch vulnerable to hacking. Real Martian naval ships would have been updated as a matter of course, but Holden might have been sloppy. Her first hope was the airlock. A short-range access transmitter built for troubleshooting malfunctioning airlocks had found its way in among her things. If that failed, getting through the cargo door was harder. She hoped for something explosive, but the Thomas Prince took its munitions very seriously. The equipment manifests did include a half-suit exoskeleton mech. It would fit over her chest and arms, it wasn't designed for legs, and with a cutting torch to make the initial breach, it could probably bend the plating enough to let her through. It was also small and lightweight enough to carry, and her access card was a high enough grade for the system to let her take one away. Once she was on, it would be simple. Kill everyone, overload the reactor, and blow the ship to atoms. With any luck at all, it would reignite suspicions about the bomb on the Sung Un. If she got out, fine. If she didn't, she didn't. The only tricks now were getting there, and waiting like everyone else to hear what happened on the station. She was dreaming when catastrophe came. In it, she was walking through a field outside a schoolhouse. She knew that it was on fire, that she had to find a way in. She heard fire engine sirens, but their dark shapes never appeared in the sky. There were people trapped inside, and she was supposed to get to them, to free them, or to keep them from escaping, or both. She was on the roof, going down through a hole. Smoke billowed out around her, but she could still breathe because she'd been immunized against flames. She stretched down, fingertips brushing against low-G handholds. She realized someone was holding her wrist, supporting her as she strained in toward the darkness and fire. Wren. She couldn't look at him. Sorrow and guilt welled up in her like a flood, and she collapsed into a blue-lit bar with crash couches where all the tables should have been. Couples ate dinner and talked and screwed in the dim around her. The man across from her was both Holden and her father. She tried to speak, to say that she didn't want to do this. The man took her by the shoulders, pressing her into the soft gel. She was afraid for a moment that he'd crawl on top of her, but he brought his fists down on her chest with a killing impact, and she woke up to the sound of klaxons and droplets of blood floating in the air. The pain in her body was so profound and inexplicable that it didn't feel like pain. It was only the sense that something was wrong. She coughed, launching a spray of blood across the room. She thought that somehow she'd triggered her false glands in her sleep, that what was wrong was only her. But the ship alarms argued that it was something worse. She reached for her hand terminal, but it wasn't in its holder. She found it floating half a meter from the door, rotating in the air. A star-shaped fracture in the resin case showed where it had hit something hard enough to break. 
The network access displayed a bright red bar. No status. System down. Melba pulled herself to the door and cycled it open. The dead woman floating in the corridor had her arms out before her. Her hair splayed around her like someone drowned. The left side of her face was oddly shaped, softer and rounder, and bluer than it should have been. Her eyes were half open, the whites the bright red of burst vessels. Melba pushed past the corpse. Farther down the corridor, a sphere of blood the size of a soccer ball floated slowly toward the air intake, with no sign where it had come from. In the wider corridors toward the middle of the ship, things were worse. Bodies floated at every door, in every passageway. Everything not bolted down floated now by the walls thrown toward the bow. The soft gray walls were covered with dents where hand terminals and tools and heads had struck them. The air smelled like blood, and something else, deeper and more intimate. Outside the commissary, three soldiers were using sealant foam to stick the dead to the walls, keeping them out of the way. In gravity, they would have been stacking bodies like cordwood. You all right? One of them said. It took Melba a second to realize that the woman was speaking to her. I'm okay, Melba said. What happened? Who the fuck knows? You're one of the maintenance techs, yes? The woman said sharply. I am, Melba said. Melba Co., electrochemical. Well, you can get your ass to Environmental Co., the woman said. I'm guessing they need you there. Melba nodded, the motion sending her spinning a little until the woman put out a hand to steady her. She'd never been in a battle or at the scene of a natural disaster. The nearest had been a hurricane that hit Sao Paulo when she was eight, and her father had hidden the family in the corporate shelters until the flooding was gone. She'd seen more of that damage on the news feeds than in person. The Thomas Prince was a scene from hell. She passed knots of people working frantically, but the dead and dying were everywhere. Droplets of blood and chips of shattered plastic formed clouds where the eddies of the recyclers pushed them together. In zero-G, blood pooled in the wounds and wouldn't clear. Inflammation was worse, lungs filled with fluid more easily. However many had died already... More would. Soon. If she hadn't been in her crash couch, she'd have been thrown into a wall at six hundred meters per second, just like all the others. No, they couldn't be right. No one would have survived that. She hadn't spent much of her time on environmental decks. Most of her work before, with Stani and Soledad, had been with power routing. The air and water systems had technicians of their own. Specialists at a higher pay grade than hers. The architecture of the rooms kept everything close without being as cramped as the Cerisier. She floated in with a sense of relief, as if reaching her goal accomplished something in itself, as if it gave her some measure of control. The air smelled of ozone and burned hair. A young man, face covered with blue-black bruises, was stuck to the bulkhead with a rope and two electromagnets. He waved something similar to a broom, with a massive mesh of fabric on the end like a gigantic flyswatter, clearing blood from the air. His damaged face was impassive, shocked. A thickening layer of tears encased his eyes, blinding him. You! Who the hell are you? Melba turned. The new man wore a navy uniform. His right leg was in an inflatable pressure cast. The foot sticking out the end was a bluish purple, and his breath was labored in a way that made her think of pneumonia, of internal bleeding. Melba Co., civilian electrochemical tech off the Cerisier. Who do you answer to? Mickelson's my group supervisor, she said, struggling to remember the man's name. She had only met him once, and he hadn't left much of an impression on her. My name's Nikos, the broken-legged man said. You work for me now, come on. He pushed off more gracefully than should have been possible. She followed him a little too fast and had to grab a handhold to keep from running into his back. He led her through a long passageway into engineering. A huge array of thin metal and ceramic sheets stood at one wall, warnings in eight languages printed along its side. 
Scorch marks drew circles on the outermost plate, and the air stank of burnt plastic and something else. A hole two feet across had been punched through the center. A human body was still in it, held in place by shards of metal. You know what that is, Co? Air processing, she said. That's the primary atmosphere processing unit, he said as if she hadn't spoken. And it's a big damn problem. Secondary processors still on fire just at the moment, and the tertiary backups will get us through for about seven hours. Everyone on my team is busted or dead, so you're about to rebuild this one, understand? I can't do that, she thought. I'm not really an electrochemical technician. I don't know how to do this. I'll get my tools. Don't let me stop you, he said. If I find someone can help out, I'll send them your way. That would be good, she said. What about you? Are you all right? Can you help? At a guess? Crush pelvis, maybe something worse going on in my gut. Keep passing out a little, he said with a grin. But I'm high as a kite on the emergency speed, and there's work, so hop too. She pushed off. Her throat was tight, and she could feel her mind starting to shut down. Overstimulation. Shock. She made her way through the carnage and wreckage to the storage bay where the toolboxes from the Cerisier were. Her card unlocked them. One had shattered, the remains of a testing deck floating in the air, green ceramic shards and bits of gold wire. Wren was there, his coffin toolbox shifted in place despite the electromagnetic clamps. For a moment, the dream of the fire washed over her. She wondered if she might still be sleeping, the wave of death just part of the same blackness in her own brain. She put her hand on Wren's box, half expecting to feel him knocking back. A sudden vertigo washed through her, and the sense that she and the ship were falling, that it would land on her, crush her, all the blood and all the terror every dead person held in place to keep the corpses from floating, they all began here. Every sin she'd committed backward and forward in time had its center in the bones beneath her hand. Stop, she said, just stop. She took her tool chest, the real one, and sped back to engineering and the shattered air processing controller. Nikos had found two other people, a man in civilian dress and an older woman in naval uniform. Your co? the woman said. Good, grab his legs. Melba set her toolbox against the deck and activated the magnets, then pushed over to the hole in the atmosphere processor. The machine had been loosened from its housing, giving the body a little more room to move. Melba put her hands on the dead man's thighs, wadding the cloth of his trousers in her fists. She braced herself against the metal siding of the unit. Ready? the man asked. Ready. The woman counted down from three, and Melba pulled. For a long moment, she thought the corpse wouldn't come out. But then something tore, the vibrations of it transferring through to her hands. The body slid free. Score one for the good guys, Nico said from across the bay. His face was developing an ashy gray tone, like he was dying. She wished he would go to the medical bays, but they were probably swamped. He could die here, doing his work or there, waiting for an open bay. Clear him away. Got him out. We don't need him drifting back. Melba nodded, took a firm grip, and pushed off on a trajectory that would land them on the far bulkhead. The back of the corpse's head had been crushed almost flat, but death had come so swiftly there was very little blood. At the wall, she secured him with a spray of foam and held him for a moment while it set. The dead man's face was close to hers. She could see the whiskers he'd missed when he'd shaved, the brown of his empty eyes. She felt a sudden urge to kiss him, and then pushed the impulse away, disgusted. From his uniform, he'd been an officer, lieutenant maybe. The white identity card on the lanyard around his neck had a picture of him looking solemn. She took it in her fingers. Not lieutenant, lieutenant commander. Lieutenant Commander Stepan Arsenault, who would never have come through the ring if it weren't for her, who wouldn't have died here. 
She tried to feel guilt, but there wasn't room for him inside of her. She had too much blood already. She was reaching out to tuck his card back in place when the small voice in the back of her mind said, I bet he could get an EVA pack with this. Melba blinked. Her mind seemed to click back into focus, and she looked around her, the last wisps of dream or delirium leaving her mind. She had access to the equipment she needed. The ship was in chaos. This was it. This was the opportunity she'd been waiting for. She plucked the card off its lanyard and slipped it in her pocket, then looked around nervously. No one had noticed. She licked her lips. I'm going to need something to crack this, the young man was saying. The bolt head sheared round. I can't get it out. The older woman swore and turned to her. Got anything that'll do the trick? Not here, Melba said. I have an idea where I could get something to drill it out, though. Move fast. We don't want this place getting stuffy. Okay, you guys do what you can. I'll be right back. Melba lied. Chapter 24 Anna Eschatology had always been Anna's least favorite study of theology. When asked about Armageddon, she'd tell her parishioners that God himself had been pretty circumspect on the topic, so it didn't do much good to worry about it. Have faith that God will do what's best, and avoiding his vengeance against the wicked should be the least compelling reason for worship. But the truth was that she'd always had a deeply held disagreement with most futurist and millennialist interpretations. Not the theology itself, necessarily, since their guess at what the end times prophecies really meant was as good as anyone else's. Her disagreement was primarily with the level of glee over the destruction of the wicked that sometimes crept into the teachings. This was especially true in some millennialist sects that filled their literature with paintings of Armageddon, pictures of terrified people running away from some formless, fiery doom that burned their world down behind them, while smug worshippers of the correct religion, of course, watched from safety as God got with the smiting. Anna couldn't understand how anyone could see such a depiction as anything but tragic. She wished she could show them the Thomas Prince. She'd been reading when it happened. Her hand terminal had been propped on her chest with a pillow behind it, her hands behind her head. A three-tone alarm had sounded a high-G alert, but it was late to the party. She was already being mashed into her crash couch so hard that she could feel the plastic of the base right through twenty centimeters of impact gel. It seemed to last forever, but it was probably just a few seconds. Her hand terminal had skidded down her chest, suddenly heavier than Nami the last time she'd picked her daughter up. It left a black and blue trail of bruises up her breastbone and slammed into her chin hard enough to split the skin. The pillow mashed into her abdomen like a ten-kilo sandbag, filling her mouth with the taste of stomach acid. But worst of all was the pain in her shoulders. Both arms had snapped back flat against the bed, temporarily dislocating them. When the endless seconds of deceleration were over, both joints popped back into place with a pain even worse than when they'd come out. The gel of the couch, stressed beyond its design specifications, hadn't gripped her the way it was meant to. Instead, it rebounded back into its prior shape and launched her in slow motion toward the ceiling of her cabin. Trying to put her hands in front of her sent bolts of agony through her shoulders, so she drifted up and hit the ceiling with her face. Her chin left a smear of blood on the fabric-covered foam. Anna was a gentle person. She'd never in her life been in a fight. She'd never been in a major accident. The worst pain she'd ever felt before was childbirth, and the endorphins that had followed had mostly erased it from her memory. To suddenly be so hurt in so many different places at once left her dazed and with a sort of directionless anger. It wasn't fair that a person could be hurt so much. She wanted to yell at the crash couch that had betrayed her by letting this happen and she wanted to punch the ceiling for hitting her in the face, even though she'd never thrown a punch in her life and could barely move her arms. When she could finally move without feeling lightheaded, she went looking for help, 
and found that the corridor outside her room was worse. Just a few meters from her door, a young man had been crushed. He looked as though a malevolent giant had stomped on him and then ground him under its heel. The boy was not only smashed, but torn and twisted in ways that barely left him recognizable as a human. His blood splashed the floor and walls and drifted around his corpse in red balls like grisly Christmas ornaments. Anna yelled for help. Someone yelled back in a voice filled with liquid and pain. Someone from farther down the corridor. Anna carefully pushed off the door jam of her room and drifted toward the voice. Two rooms down, another man was half in and half out of his crash couch. He must have been in the process of getting out of bed when the deceleration happened, and everything from his pelvis down was twisted and broken. His upper torso still lay on the bed, arms waving feebly at her, his face a mask of pain. Help me, he said and then coughed up a glob of blood and mucus that drifted away in a red and green ball. Anna drifted up high enough to push the comm panel on the wall without using her shoulder. It was dead. All the lights were the ones she'd been told came on in emergency power failures. Nothing else seemed to be working. Help me, the man said again. His voice was weaker and filled with even more of a liquid rasp. Anna recognized him as Alonzo Guzman, a famous poet from the UN's South American region, a favorite of the Secretary General, someone had told her. I will, Anna said, not even trying to stop the tears that suddenly blinded her. She wiped her eyes on her shoulder and said, Let me find someone. I've hurt my arms, but I'll find someone. The man began weeping softly. Anna pushed back into the corridor with her toes, drifting past the carnage to find someone who wasn't hurt. This was the part the millennialists never put in their paintings. They loved scenes of righteous, godly vengeance on sinful mankind. They loved to show God's chosen people safe from harm, watching with happy faces as they were proved right to the world. But they never showed the aftermath. They never showed... Weeping humans, crushed and dying in pools of their own fluids. Young men smashed into piles of red flesh. A young woman cut in half because she was passing through a hatchway when catastrophe hit. This was Armageddon. This is what it looked like. Blood and torn flesh and cries for help. Honor reached an intersection of corridors and ran out of strength. Her body hurt too badly to continue. And in all four directions, the corridor floors and walls were covered with the aftermath of violent death. It was too much. Anna drifted in the empty space for a few minutes, and then she gently floated to the wall and stuck to it. Movement. The ship was moving now. Very slow, but enough to push her to the wall. She pushed away from it and floated again. Not still accelerating then. She recognized that her interest in the relative movements of the ship was just her mind trying to find a distraction from the scene around her, and started crying again. The idea that she might never come home from this trip crashed in on her. For the first time since coming to the ring, she saw a future in which she never held Nami again, never smelled her hair, never kissed Nono, or climbed into a warm bed beside her and held her close. The pain of those things being ripped away from her was worse than anything physical she'd suffered. She didn't wipe away the tears that came, and they blinded her. That was fine. There was nothing here she wanted to see. When something grabbed her from behind and spun her around, she tensed, waiting for some new horror to reveal itself. It was Tilly. Oh, thank God. The woman said, hugging Anna tight enough to send new waves of pain through her shoulders. I went to your room and there was blood on the walls and you weren't there and someone was dead right outside your door. Unable to hug back, Anna just put her cheek against Tilly's for a moment. Tilly pushed her out to arm's length, but didn't let go. Are you okay? She was looking at the gash on Anna's chin. My face is fine, just a little cut, but my arms are hurt. 
I can barely move them. We need to get help. Alonso Guzman's in his room and he's hurt, really hurt. Do you know what happened? I haven't met anyone yet who knows, Tilly said, rotating Anna first one way, then the other, looking her over critically. Move your hands. Okay, bend your elbows. She felt Anna's shoulders. They're not dislocated. I think they were for a second, Anna said after the gasp of pain Tilly's touch brought. And everything else hurts, but we have to hurry. Tilly nodded and pulled a red and white backpack off one shoulder. When she opened it, it was filled with dozens of plastic packages with tiny black text on them. Tilly pulled a few out, read them, put them back. After several tries, she stripped the packaging off of three small injection ampules. What is that? Anna said. But Tilly just jabbed her with all three in answer. Anna felt a rush of euphoria wash over her. Her shoulders stopped hurting. Everything stopped hurting. Even her fear about never seeing her family again seemed a distant and minor problem. I was sleeping when it happened, Tilly said, tossing the empty ampules into the first aid pack. But I woke up feeling like a forklift had run over me. I think my ribs were popped out of place. I could barely breathe. So I dug up this pack from the emergency closet in my room. I didn't think to look there, Anna said, surprised she hadn't. She had a vague memory of being disoriented by pain, but now she felt great, better than ever before, and sharp, hyper-aware. Stupid not to think of the emergency supplies, this being, after all, an emergency. She wanted to slap herself on the forehead for being so stupid. Tilly was holding her arms again. Why was she doing that? They had work to do. They had to find the medics and send them after the poet. Hey, kiddo, Tilly said. Takes a second for that first rush to ease down a bit. I spent a full minute trying to resuscitate a pile of red paste before I realized how wired I was. What is this? Anna asked, moving her head from side to side, which made the edges of Tilly's face blurry. Tilly shrugged. Military-grade amphetamines and painkillers, I'm guessing. I gave you an anti-inflammatory, too, because what the hell? Are you a doctor? Anna asked, marveling at how smart Tilly was. No, but I can read the directions on the package. Okay, Anna nodded, her face serious. Okay. Let's go find someone who knows what's going on, Tilly said, pulling Anna down the corridor with her. And after, I need to find my people, Anna said, letting herself be pulled. I may have given you too much. No, no, and Nami are at home, in Moscow. No, my people, my congregation. Chris and that other guy in the Marine. She's angry, but I think I can talk to her. I need to find them. Yeah, Tilly said. May have overdosed you a bit, but we'll find them. Let's find help first. Anna thought of the poet and felt her tears threatening to return. If she was sad, maybe the initial rush of the drugs was wearing off a little. She found herself regretting that for a moment. Tilly stopped at a printed deck map on the wall. It was right next to a black and unresponsive network panel. Of course, military ships would have both, Anna thought. They were built with the expectation that things would stop working when the ship got shot. That thought made Anna sad, too. Some distant part of her consciousness recognized the drug-fueled emotional roller coaster she was on, but was powerless to do anything about. She started weeping again. Security station. Tilly tapped on a spot on the map, then yanked Anna down the corridor after her. They made two turns and wound up at a small room filled with people, guns, and computers that seemed to still be working. A middle-aged man with salt-and-pepper hair and a grim expression on his face pointedly ignored them. The other four people in the room were younger but equally uninterested in their arrival. Get 35C open first, the older man said to the two young men floating to his left. He pointed at something on the map. There were a dozen civvies in there. EMT? one of the young men asked. Don't have them to spare, and that galley doesn't have crash couches. Everyone in there is pasta sauce, but the LT says look anyway. Roger that, 
the young man replied, and he and his partner pushed out of the room past Anna and Tilly, barely glancing at them as they went. You two do a corridor sweep, the older man said to the other two young sailors in the room. Tags if you can find them, pictures and swabs if you can't. Everything sent to Opcom on Red 2-1, got me? Aye, aye, one of them said, and they floated out of the room. The man in 295 needs help, Anna said to the security officer. He's hurt badly. He's a poet. He tapped something onto his desk terminal and said, Okay, he's in the queue. The EMTs will get there as soon as they can. We're setting up a temporary emergency area in the officer's mess. I suggest you two ladies get there double time. What happened? Tilly asked, and gripped a handhold on the wall like she meant to stay a while. Anna grabbed on to the nearest thing she could find, which turned out to be a rack of weapons. The security officer looked Tilly up and down once and seemed to come to the conclusion that giving her what she wanted was the easiest solution. Hell if I know. We decelerated to a dead stop in just a shade under five seconds. The damage and injuries are all high-G trauma. Whatever grabbed us only grabbed the skin of the ship and didn't give a shit about the stuff inside. So... The slow zone changed? Tilly was asking. Anna looked over the guns in the rack, her emotions more under control, but her mind was still racing. The rack was full of pistols of various kinds, big blocky ones with large barrels and fat magazines, smaller ones that looked like the kind you saw in cop shows, and in a special rack all their own, tasers like the one she'd had on Europa. Well, not really like it. These were military models, gray and sleek and efficient-looking, with a much bigger power pack than hers. In spite of their non-lethal purpose, they managed to appear dangerous. Her old taser at home had looked like a small hairdryer. Don't touch those, the security officer said. Anna hadn't even realized she was reaching for one until he said it. That could mean a damn lot of casualties, Tilly said. Anna had the feeling she was re-entering the conversation after having missed a lot of it. Hundreds on the prince, the security officer said. And we weren't going anywhere near the old speed limit. Some of the ships were. We get no broadcasts from those now. Anna looked at the various terminals working in the office around her. Damage reports and security feeds and orders. Anna couldn't understand much of them. They used a lot of acronyms and numbers for things, military jargon. One small monitor was displaying pictures of people. Anna recognized James Holden in one, then another version of him with a patchy beard. Wanted posters? But she didn't recognize any of the other people until the sculpture of the girl that Naomi, Holden's second-in-command, had blamed for the attack. Maybe it was the space girl. Anna said before she'd realized she was going to. She still felt stoned and suppressed an urge to giggle. The security officer and Tilly were both staring at her. Anna pointed at the screen. Julie Mao, the girl from Eros, the one the Rosinante blamed. Maybe she did this. Both the security officer and Tilly turned to look at the screen. A few seconds later, the image of Julie, the space girl, disappeared and was replaced by someone Anna didn't recognize. Someone's going to get James Holden in an interrogation room for a few hours, and then we'll have a much better idea of where to put the blame. Tilly just laughed. Is that who they blamed? She said when she'd finished. That isn't Julie Mao, and there's no way Claire's out here. Claire? Anna and the officer said at the same time. That's Claire, Clarissa Mao, Julie's little sister. She's living on Luna with her mother, last I heard, but that's definitely not Julie. Are you sure? Anna said. Because the executive officer from the Rosinante said, I dandled both those girls on my knee back in the day. The Maos used to be regular guests at our house in Baja, brought the kids out during the summers to swim and eat fish tacos. And that one is Claire, not Julie. Oh said Anna, as her drug-enhanced mind ran out the entire plot. The angry girl she'd seen in the galley, the explosion of the UN ship, the ridiculous message from Holden's ship, followed by the protestations of innocence. 
It was her. She blew up the ship. Which ship? The officer asked. The UN ship that blew up. The one that made the Belter ship shoot at Holden. And then we all went through the ring, and she's here. She's on this ship right now. I saw her in the galley, and I knew there was something wrong with her. She scared me, but I should have said something, but I didn't, because why would I? Tilly and the security man were both staring at her. She could feel her mind running away with her, and her mouth seemed to be working all on its own. They were looking at her like she'd gone insane. She's here, Anna said, clamping her mouth shut with an effort. Claire? Tilly asked with a frown. I saw her in the galley. She threatened me. She was on this ship. The security man scowled and tapped something on his terminal, swore, then tapped something else. I'll be a son of a bitch. Shipwide face recognition says we've got a match in Hangar B right now. You have to go arrest her, Anna shouted. Hangar B is a designated emergency area, the officer said. She's probably there with the other survivors and broken in five different places, if it's even her. Shitty reproduction like that makes for a lot of false positives. You have software that could have found her at any time? Tilly asked in disbelief. You didn't check? Ma'am, we don't ask how high when James fucking Holden says jump, the officer growled back. There's an airlock in there, Anna said, stabbing her hand at the display. She could leave. She could go anywhere. Like where? The officer replied. As if on cue, a green airlock cycling alarm appeared on the display. We have to go get her, Anna said, pulling on Tilly's arm. You have to go to the officer's mess, the security man said. I'll send people to pick her up for questioning as soon as we stop bleeding. Don't worry about it. We've got plenty enough to sort out now. That one will wait. But... A young man floated into the room. The left half of his face was covered in blood. Need the MTs to six alpha, sir. We've got ten civvies. I'll see who I can pry free, the officer said. Do we know anything about the condition of the injured? Bones sticking out, but they're not dead. Anna pulled Tilly into the corridor. We can't wait. She's dangerous. She's already killed people when she blew up the other ship. You're stoned, Tilly said, pulling her arm free and drifting across the corridor to bump into the wall. You're not acting rationally. What are you going to do even if Claire Mao is on this ship and has become some sort of terrorist? She blew up a ship. Gonna hit her with your Bible? Anna pulled the taser halfway out of her pocket. Tilly sucked in a whistling breath through her teeth. You stole that? Are you insane? She asked in a loud whisper. I'm going to find her, Anna replied, the drug singing in her blood having focused down to a fine point. She felt like if she could stop this Claire person, she could save herself from losing her family forever. She recognized this idea as utterly irrational and gave in to its power anyway. I have to talk to her. You're going to get killed, Tilly said. She looked like she might start crying. You told security. You did your part. Let it go. You're a minister, not a cop. I'll need an EVA pack. Do you know where they keep those? Are they near the airlocks? You're insane, Tilly said. I can't be part of this. It's okay, Anna said. I'll be back. Chapter 25 Holden Naomi, Holden said again. Come in. Please, please respond. The silent radio felt like a threat. Miller had paused, his face bleak and apologetic. Holden wondered how many other people had looked at that exact expression on Miller's face. It seemed designed to go with words like, There's been an accident, and The DNA matches your son's. Holden could feel his hands trembling. It didn't matter. Rosinante, Naomi, come in. Doesn't mean anything, Miller said. She could be just fine, but the camera went down. Or maybe she's busy fixing something. Or maybe she's dying by centimeters, Holden said. I've got to go. I have to get back to her. 
Miller shook his head. It's a longer trip back out than it was getting here. You can't go as fast anymore. By the time you get back, she'll have figured out whatever needed figuring. Or she'll be dead, Miller didn't say. Holden wondered what it meant that the protomolecule could put Miller on its hand like a puppet, and the detective could still be thoughtful enough to leave out the possibility that everyone on the Rosie was gone. I have to try. Miller sighed. For a moment, his pupils flickered blue, like there were tiny, bathypelagic fish swimming in the deep trenches of his eyeballs. You want to help her? You want to help all of them? Come with me. Now. You run back home, we won't get to find out what happened. And you may not get the chance to come back here. Plus, you can bet your friends are regrouping back there, and they can still gently rip your arms off if they catch you. Holden felt like there were two versions of himself pulling at his mind. Naomi might be hurt, might be dead. Alex and Amos, too. He had to be there for them. But there was also a small, quiet part of himself that knew Miller was right. It was too late. You can tell the station that there are people on those ships, he said. You can ask it to help them. I can tell a rock that it ought to be Secretary General. Doesn't mean it's going to listen. All this? Miller waved his hands at the dark walls. It's dumb. Utilitarian. No creativity or complex analysis. Really? Holden said, his curiosity peeking through the panic and anger and fear. Why not? Some things, it's better if they're predictable. No one wants the station coming up with its own bad ideas. We should hurry. Where are we going? Holden said, pausing for a few deep breaths. He'd been at low G for too long without taking the time for exercise. His cardio had suffered. The dangers of growing rich and lazy. I'm going to need you to do something for me, Miller replied. I need access to the... Shit, I don't know. Call them records. Holden finished his panting, then straightened and nodded for Miller to resume their walk. As they moved down the gently sloping corridor, he said, Aren't you already plugged in? I'm aware. The station is in lockdown, and they didn't exactly give me the root password. I need you to open it up for me. Not sure what I can do that you can't, Holden said, other than be a charming dinner guest. Miller stopped at another seeming dead end, touched the wall, and a portal irised open. He gestured Holden through, then followed and closed the door behind them. They were in another large chamber, vaguely octagonal and easily fifty meters long on each face. More of the insectile mechs littered the space, but the glass pillars were not in evidence. Instead, at the center of the chamber stood a massive construct of glowing blue metal. It was octagonal, a smaller version of the dimensions of the room, but only a few meters wide on each face. It didn't glow any brighter than the rest of the room, but Holden could feel something coming off of it, an almost physical pressure that made walking toward it difficult. His suit said that the atmosphere had changed, that it was rich with complex organic chemicals and nitrogen. Sometimes having a body at all means you've got a certain level of status. If you aren't pretty damn trusted, you don't get to walk around in the fallen world. The fallen world? Miller shuddered and leaned his hand out against the wall. It was a profoundly human gesture of distress. The glowing moss of the wall didn't respond at all. Miller's lips were beginning to turn black. Fallen world. The substrate. Matter. Are you all right? Holden asked. Miller nodded, but he looked like he was about to vomit. There's times I start knowing things that are too big for my head. It's better in here, but there are going to be some questions that don't fit in me. Just thinking with all this crap connected to the back of my head is a full-contact sport. And if I get too much, I'm pretty sure they'll, uh, call it reboot me. I mean... Sure, consciousness is an illusion and blah, 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 but I'd rather not go there if we can help it. 
I don't know how much the next one would remember. Holden stopped walking, then turned and gave Miller a hard shove. Both of them staggered backward. You seem pretty real to me. Miller held up his finger. Seem. Good verb. You ever wondered why I leave as soon as anyone else shows up? I'm special? Yeah, I wouldn't go that far. Fine, Holden said. I'll bite. Why doesn't anyone else see you? I'm not sure we've got time for this, but... Miller took off his hat and scratched his head. So your brain has a hundred billion brain cells and about five hundred trillion synapses. Will this be on the test? Don't be an asshole, Miller said conversationally and put his hat back on. And that shit is custom grown. No two brains are exactly alike. Guess how much processing power it takes to really model even one human brain. More than every human computer ever built put together, and that's before we even start getting to the crap that goes on inside the cells. Okay? Now, picture those synapses as buttons on a keyboard. Five hundred trillion buttons. And say that a brain looking at something and thinking, that's a flower, punches a couple billion of those keys in just the right pattern. Except it ain't near that easy. It isn't just a flower. It's a pile of associations. Smells, the way the stem feels in your fingers, the flower you gave your mom once, the flower you gave your girl, a flower you stepped on by accident and it made you sad. And being sad brings on a whole pile of other associations. I get it, Holden said, holding up his hands in surrender. It's complicated. Now, Picture you need to push exactly the right buttons to make someone think of a person. Hear them speaking. Remember the clothes they wore and the way they smelled and how they would sometimes take off their hat to scratch their head. Wait, Holden said. Are there bits of protomolecule in my brain? Not exactly. You may have noticed I'm non-local. What the hell does that even mean? Well, Miller said... Now you're asking me to explain microwaves to a monkey. That's a metaphor I've never actually spoken aloud. If you're aiming for not creeping me the hell out, you need more practice. So yeah, the most complex simulation in the history of our solar system is running right now so that we can pretend I'm here in the same room with you. The correct response is being flattered. Also doing what the fuck I need you to do. That would be touching that big thing in the middle of the room. Holden looked at the construct again, felt the almost subliminal pressure coming off of it. Why? Because, said Miller, lecturing to a stupid child, the place is in lockdown. It's not accepting remote connections without a level of authorization I don't have. And I do? You're not making a remote connection. You're actually here, in the substrate. In some quarters, that's kind of a big deal. But I just walked in here. You had some help. I calmed some of the security down to get you this far. So you let the Marines in, too? Unlocked is unlocked. Come on. The closer Holden got to the octagon, the harder it was to approach. It wasn't just fear, though the dread swam at the back of his throat and all down his spine. It was physically difficult, like pushing against a magnetic field. The shape was chipped at the edges, marked with hair-thin lines and patterns that might have been ideograms or patterns of fungal growth, or both. He reached out his hand and his teeth itched. What will happen? he asked. How much do you know about quantum mechanics? How much do you? Holden replied. A lot, turns out, Miller said with a lopsided grin. Do now, anyway. I'm not going to burst into flames or something, right? Miller gave a small belter shrug with his hands. Don't think so. I'm not up on all the defense systems, but I don't think so. So, Holden said, 
Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Holden sighed and started to reach for the surface. He paused. You didn't really answer the question, you know. You're stalling, Miller said. And then, which question was that? I get why no one else sees you. But the real question is, why me at all? I mean, okay, you're screwing with my brain, and that's hard work, and if there's other people for me to interact with, it's too hard and all like that. But why me? Why not Naomi or the UN Secretary General or something? Miller nodded, understanding the question. He frowned and sighed. Miller kind of liked you. Thought you were a decent guy. That's it? You need more? Holden placed his palm flat against the closest surface. He didn't burst into flames. Through the gloves of his EVA suit, he felt a short electric tingle, and then nothing, because he was floating in space. He tried to scream, and failed. Sorry, a voice said in his head. It sounded like Miller. Didn't mean to drag you in here. Just try and relax, all right? Holden tried to nod, but failed at that, too. He didn't have a head. His sense of his own body had changed, shifted, expanded past anything he'd imagined before. The simple extent of it was numbing. He felt the stars within him, the vast expanses of space contained by him. With a thought... He could pull his attention to a sun surrounded by unfamiliar planets, like he was attending to his finger or the back of his neck. The lights all tasted different, smelled different. He wanted to close his eyes against the flood of sensation, but he couldn't. He didn't have anything so simple as eyes. He had become immeasurably large and rich and strange, Thousands of voices, millions, billions, lifted in chorus, and he was their song. And at his center, a place where all the threads of his being came together. He recognized the station not by how it looked, but by the deep throb of its heartbeat. The power of a million suns contained, channeled. Here was the nexus that sat between the worlds the miracle of knowledge and power that gave him heaven, his Babel. And a star went out. It wasn't especially unique. It wasn't beautiful. A few voices out of quadrillions went silent, and if the great chorus of his being was lessened by them, it wasn't perceptible. Still, a ripple passed through him. The colors of his consciousness swirled and darkened, concern, Curiosity, alarm, even delight. Something new had happened for the first time in millennia. Another star flickered and failed. Another few voices went silent. Now, slowly and instantly both, everything changed. He felt the great debate raging in him as a fever, an illness. He had been beyond anything like a threat for so long that all the reflexes of survival had weakened. Atrophied. Holden felt a fear that he knew belonged to him, the man trapped within the machine, because his larger self couldn't remember to feel it. The vast parliament swirled, thoughts and opinions, analysis and poetry blending together and breaking apart. It was beautiful as sunlight on oil, and terrifying. Three suns failed, and now Holden felt himself growing smaller. It was still very little, almost nothing. A white spot on the back of his hand, a sore that wouldn't heal. The plague was still only a symptom, but it was one his vast self couldn't ignore. From the station at his core, he reached out into the places he had been, the darkened systems that were lost to him, and he reached out through the gates with fire. The fallen stars, mere matter now, empty and dead, bloated filled their systems in a rage of radiation and heat, sheared the electrons from every atom, and detonated. Their final deaths echoed, and Holden felt a sense of mourning and of peace. The cancer had struck, 
and been burned away. The loss of the minds that had been would never be redeemed. Mortality had returned from exile, but it had been cleansed with fire. A hundred stars failed. What had been a song became a shriek. Holden felt his body shifting against itself, furious as a swarm of bees trapped and dying. In despair, the hundred suns were burned away, the station hurling destruction through the gates as fast as the darkness appeared, but the growing shadow could not be stopped. All through his flesh, stars were going out, voices were falling into silence, death rolled the vacuum faster than light and implacable. He felt the decision like a seed crystal giving form to the chaos around it, solid, hard, resolute. Desperation, mourning, and a million farewells, one to the other. The word quarantine came to him, and, with the logic of dreams, it carried an unsupportable weight of horror. But within it, like the last voice in Pandora's box, the promise of reunion. One day, when the solution was found, everything that had been lost would be regained. The gates reopened. The vast mind restored. The moment of dissolution came, sudden and expected, and Holden blew apart. He was in darkness, empty and tiny and lost, waiting for the promise to be fulfilled, waiting for the silent chorus to whisper again that Armageddon had been stopped, that all was not lost. And the silence reigned. Huh. Miller thought at him. That was weird. Like being pulled backward through an infinitely long tunnel of light, Holden was returned to his body. For one vertiginous moment he felt too small, like the tiny wrapping of skin and meat would explode trying to contain him. Then he just felt tired and sat down on the floor with a thump. Okay, Miller said rubbing his cheek with an open palm. I guess that's the start. Sort of explains everything. Sort of nothing. Pain in the ass. Holden flopped onto his back. He felt like someone had run him through a shredder and then badly welded him back together. Trying to remember what it felt like to be the size of a galaxy gave him a splitting headache, so he stopped. Tell me everything it explains he said when he could remember how to speak. Being forced to move moist flaps of meat in order to form the words felt sensual and obscene. They quarantined the systems, shut down the network to stop whatever was capping the locals. So, behind each of those gates is the solar system full of whatever made the protomolecule? Miller laughed. Something in the sound of it sent a shiver down Holden's spine. That seems pretty fucking unlikely. Why? This station has been waiting for the all-clear signal to open the network back up for about two billion years. If they'd found a solve, they wouldn't still be waiting. Whatever it was, I think it got them all. All of them but you, Holden said. Nah, kid. I'm one of them like the Rosinante is one of you. The Rosie's smart for a machine. It knows a lot about you. It could probably gin up a rough simulation of you if someone told it to. Those things, the ones you felt like, compared to them, I'm a fancy kind of hand terminal. And the nothing, it explains, Holden said. You mean what killed them? Well, if we're going to be fair, it's not really nothing, Miller said, crossing his arms. We know it ate a galaxy-spanning hive consciousness like it was popcorn, so that's something. And we know it survived a sterilization that was a couple hundred solar systems wide. Holden had a powerfully vivid memory of watching the station hurl fire through the ring gates, of the stars on the other side blowing up like balloons, of the gates themselves abandoned to the fire and disappearing. Even just the echo of it nearly blinded him with remembered pain. Seriously, did they blow up those stars to stop it? Holden's image of Miller patted the column at the center of the room, though he knew now that Miller wasn't really touching it. 
Something was pressing the right buttons on his synaptic keyboard to make him think Miller was. Yep. Autoclaved the whole joint. Fed a bunch of extra energy in and popped them like balloons. They can't still do that, though, right? I mean, if the things that ran this are all gone, no one to pull that trigger. It won't do that to us. Miller's grim smile chilled Holden's blood. I keep telling you. This station is in war mode, kid. It's playing for keeps. Is there a way we can make it feel better about things? Sure. Now I'm in here, I can take off the lockdown, Miller said. But you're going to have to... Miller vanished. To what? Holden shouted. I'm going to have to what? From behind came an electronically amplified voice. James Holden, by authority of the Martian Congressional Republic, you are placed under arrest. Get down on your knees and place your hands on your head. Any attempt to resist will be met with lethal response. Holden did as he was told, but turned his head to look behind. The seven Marines and recon armor had come into the room. They weren't bothering to point their guns at him, but Holden knew they could catch him and tear him to pieces just using the strength of their suits. Guys, seriously, you couldn't have given me five more minutes? Chapter 26 Bull Voices Light A sense of wrongness deep in places he couldn't identify. Bull tried to grit his teeth and found his jaw already clenched hard enough to ache. Someone cried out, but he didn't know where from. The light caught his attention. Simple white LED with a sanded backsplash to diffuse it. An emergency light. The kind that came on when power was down. It hurt to look at, but he did, using it to focus. If he could make that make sense, everything else would come. A chiming alarm kept tugging at his attention, coming from outside, in the corridor. Bull's mind tried to slide that way, going into the corridor, out into the wide, formless chaos, and he pulled it back to the light. It was like trying to wake up, except he was already awake. Slowly, he recognized the alarm as something he'd hear in the medical bay. He was in the medical bay, strapped onto a bed. The tugging sensation at his arm was a forced IV. With a moment of nauseating vertigo, his perception of the world shifted. He wasn't standing. He was lying down. Meaningless distinctions without gravity. But human brains couldn't seem to help trying to assert direction on the directionless. His neck ached. His head ached. Something else felt wrong. There were other people in the bay. Men and women on every bed, most with their eyes closed. A new alarm sounded. The woman in the bay across from him losing blood pressure, crashing, dying. He shouted and a man in a nurse's uniform came floating past. He adjusted something on her bed's control board, then pushed off and away. Bull tried to grab him as he went by, but he couldn't. He'd been in his office. Serge had already gone for the night. A few minor incidents were piled up from the day, the constant friction of a large, poorly disciplined crew. Like everyone else, he'd been waiting to see whether Holden and the Martians came back out of the station, or if something else would. The fear had made sleep unlikely. He started watching the presentation that the Rosinante had sent, James Holden looking surprisingly young and charming, saying, this is what we're calling the slow zone. He remembered noticing that everyone had accepted Holden's name for the place, and wondered whether it was just that the man had gotten there first, or if there was something about charisma that translated across the void. And then he'd been here. Someone had attacked then. A torpedo had gotten past their defenses, or else sabotage. Maybe the whole damn ship was just coming apart. There was a calm interface on the bed. He pulled it over, logged in, and used his security override to open its range to the full ship 
and not just the nurse's station. He requested a connection to Sam, and a few heartbeats later, she appeared on the screen. Her hair was floating around her head. Null G always made him think of drowned people. The sclera of her left eye was the bright red of fresh blood. Bull, she said with a grin that looked like relief. Jesus Christ with a side of chips, but I never thought I'd be glad to hear from you. Need a status report. Yeah, she said. I better come by for this one. You in your office? Medical bay, Bull said. Be there in a jiff, she said. Sam, what happened? You remember that asshole who shot the ring and got turned into a thin paste when his ship hit the slow zone? Same thing. We went too fast, Bull said. We didn't. Something changed the rules on us. I've got a couple techs doing some quick and dirty tests to figure out what the new top speed is, but we're captured and floating into that big ring of ships, along with everybody else. The whole flotilla? Everybody and their sisters, Sam said. A sense of grim despair undercut the lightness of her words. No one's under their own power now except the shuttles that were inside the bays when it happened, and no one's willing to send them going too fast either. The behemoth was probably going the slowest when it happened. Other ships, it's worse. How bad floated in his mind. But something about the words refused to be asked. His mind skated over them, flickering. The deep sense of wrongness welled up in him. First convenience, he said. On my way, Sam said, and the connection dropped. He wanted to sag back into a pillow, wanted to feel the comforting hand of gravity pressing him down. He wanted the New Mexican sun streaming in through a glass window and the open air and blue sky. None of it was there. None of it would ever be. Rest when you're dead, he thought, and thumbed the calm terminal on again. Ashford and Pa weren't accepting connections, but they both took messages. He was in the process of connecting to the security office when a doctor came by and started talking with him. Min Sterling, her name was. Benny Cortland Mapu's second. He listened to her with half his attention. A third of the crew had been in their rest cycle, safely in their crash couches. The other two-thirds, him included, had slammed into walls or decks. The hand terminals they'd been looking at accelerating into projectiles. Something about network regrowth and zero gravity and spinal fluid. Bull wondered where Pa was. If she was dead and Ashford alive, it would be a problem. Disaster recovery could only go two ways. Either everyone pulled together and people lived, or they kept on with their tribal differences and fear and more people died. He had to find a way to coordinate with Earth and Mars. Everyone was going to be stressed for medical supplies. If he was going to make this work, he had to bring people together. He needed to see if Monica Stewart and her team, or anyway the part of her team that wasn't going to be charged with sabotage and executed, were still alive. If he could start putting out his own broadcasts, something along the lines of what she'd done with Holden. The doctor was getting agitated about something. He didn't notice when Sam came into the room. She was just floating there. Her left leg was in an improvised splint of nylon tape and packing foam. Bull put his palm out to the doctor, motioning for silence, and turned his attention to Sam. You've got the report? he asked. I do. Sam said, and you can have it as soon as you start listening to what she's saying. What? Sam pointed to Dr. Sterling. You have to listen to her, Bull. You have to hear what she's saying. It's important. I don't have time or patience. Bull! Sam snapped. Can you feel anything? I mean, anything lower than your tits? The sense of wrongness flooded over him, and with it, a visceral, profound fear. Vertigo passed through him again, and he closed his eyes. All the words the doctor had been saying, crushed spinal cord, diffuse blood pooling, paraplegic, finally reached his brain. To his shame, tears welled up in his eyes, blurring the women's faces. If the fibers grow back wrong, the doctor said, 
the damage will be permanent. Our bodies weren't designed to heal in zero-G. We're built to let things drain. You have a bolus of blood and spinal fluid putting pressure on the wound. We have to drain that, and we have to get the bone shards out of the way. We could start the regrowth now, but there are about a dozen people who need the nootropics just to stay alive. I understand, Bull said around the lump in his throat, hoping she'd stop talking, but her inertia kept her going on. If we can stabilize the damage and get the pressure off and get you under at least one-third G, we have a good chance of getting you back to some level of function. All right, Bo said. The background of medical alerts and voices and the hum of the emergency air recyclers stood in for real silence. What's your recommendation? Medical coma, the doctor said without hesitating. We can slow down your system, stabilize you until we can evacuate. Bull closed his eyes, squeezing the tears between the lids. All he had to say was yes, and it was all someone else's problem. It would all go away, and he'd wake up somewhere under thrust with his body coming back together. Or he wouldn't wake up at all. The moment lasted. He remembered walking among the defunct solar collectors, climbing them bracing a ceramic beam with his knees while one of the other men on his team cut it, running. He remembered a woman he'd been seeing on Tycho Station, and the way his body had felt against her. He could get it back, or some part of it. It wasn't gone. Thank you for your recommendation, he said. Sam, I'll have that damage report now. Bull, no, Sam said. You know what happens when one of my networks grows back wrong. I burn it out and start over. This is biology. We can't just yank out your wiring and reboot you. And you can't macho your way through it. Is that what I'm doing? Bull said. And he almost sounded like himself. I'm serious, Sam said. I don't care what you promised Fred Johnson or how tough you think you are. You're going to be a big boy and take your nasty medicine and get better, you got it? She was on the edge of crying now. Blood was darkening her face. Some of her team were surely dead. People she'd known for years, maybe her whole life. People she'd worked with every day. With a clarity that felt almost spiritual, he saw the depth of her grief and felt it resonate within him. Everyone was going to be there now. Everyone who'd lived on every ship would have seen people they cared about broken or dead. And when people were grieving, they did things they wouldn't do sober. Look where we are, Sam, Bull said gently. Look what we're doing here. Some things don't go back to normal. Sam wiped her eyes with a sleeve cuff, and Bull turned to the doctor. I understand and respect your medical advice, but I can't take it right now. Once the ship and crew are out of danger, we'll revisit this. But until then, staying on duty is more important. Can you keep me cognitively functioning? For a while, I can, the doctor said. But you'll pay for it later. Thank you, Bull said, his voice soft and warm as flannel. Now, Chief Engineer Rosenberg, give me the damage report. It wasn't good. The best thing Bull could say after reading Sam's report and consulting with the doctors and his own remaining security forces was that the behemoth had weathered the storm better than some of the other ships. Being designed and constructed as a generation ship meant that the joints and environmental systems had been built with an eye for long-term wear. She'd been cruising at under ten percent the slow zone's previous maximum speed when the change came. The massive deceleration had happened to all the ships at the same time, slowing them from their previous velocity to the barely perceptible drifting toward the station's captive ring in just under five seconds. If it had been instantaneous, no one would have lived through it. Even with the braking spread out, it had approached the edge of the survivable for many of them. People asleep or at workstations with crash couches had stood a chance, Anyone in an open corridor, or getting up for a bulb of coffee at the wrong moment, was simply dead. The count stood at two hundred dead, 
and twice that many wounded. Three of the Martian ships that had been significantly faster than the behemoth weren't responding, and the rest reported heavy casualties. The big Earth ships were marginally better. To make matters worse, the radio and laser signals going back out of the ring to what was left of the flotilla were bent enough that communication was just about impossible. Not that it would have mattered. The slow zone, shit, now he was thinking of it that way too, was doing everything it could to remind them how vast the distances were within it. At the velocities they had available to them now, getting to the ring would take as long as it had to reach it from the belt. Months at least, and that in shuttles. All the ships were captured. However many of them were left, they were on their own. The station's grip was pulling them into rough orbit around the glowing blue structure, and no amount of burn was able to affect their paths one way or the other. They couldn't speed up, and they couldn't stop. No one was under thrust, and it was making the medical crisis worse as zero-G complicated the injuries. The behemoth's power grid, already weakened and patched after the torpedo launch debacle, had suffered a cascading ship-wide failure. Sam's team was trekking through the ship, resetting the tripped safeties, adding new patches to the mess. One of the Earth ships had come close to losing core containment and gone through an automatic shutdown that left it running off batteries. Another was battling an environmental systems breakdown with the air recyclers. The Martian Navy ships might be fine, or they might be in ruins, but the Martian commander wasn't sharing. If it had been a battle, it would have been a humbling defeat. It hadn't even been an attack. Then what would you call it? Pa asked from the screen of his hand terminal. She and Ashford had both survived. Ashford was riding roughshod over the recovery efforts, trying, Bull thought, to micromanage the crisis out of existence. That left Pa at the helm to coordinate with all the other ships. She was better suited for it anyway. There was a chance, at least, that she would listen. If I were doing it, I'd call it progressive restraint, Bull said. That asshole who shot the ring came through doing something fierce and he got locked down. There's rules about how fast you can go. Then Holden and those Marines go to the station. Something happens. Whatever's running the station gets its jock in a twist and things lock down harder. I don't know the mechanism of how they do it, but the logic's basic training stuff. It's allowing us as much freedom as it can, but the more we screw it up, the tighter the choke. Okay, Pa said, running a hand through her hair. She looked tired. I can see that. So, as long as it doesn't feel threatened, maybe things don't get worse. But, if someone gets pissed, Bull said, I don't know. Some Martian pendejo just lost all his friends or something? He decides to arm a nuke, walk it to the station and set it off, maybe things get a lot worse. All right. We've got to get everyone acting together, Bull said. Earth, Mars, us, everyone. Because if this was me... I'd escalate from a restraint to a coercive restraint to shooting someone. We don't want to get this thing to follow the same... I said, all right, Mr. Baca, Pa shouted. That means I understood your point. You can stop making it, because the one thing I don't need right now is another self-righteous male telling me how high the stakes are and that I better not fuck things up. I got it. Thank you. Bull blinked, opened his mouth, and closed it again. On his screen... Pa pinched the bridge of her nose. He heard echoes of Ashford in her frustration. Sorry, Exo, he said. You're right. I was out of line. Don't worry about it, Mr. Baca, she said, each syllable pulling a weight behind it. If you have any concrete, specific recommendations, my door is always open. I appreciate that, Bull said. So, the captain? Captain Ashford's doing his best to keep the ship in condition and responsive. He feels that letting the crew see him will improve morale. And how's that going? Bull didn't ask. Didn't have to. Pa could see him restraining himself. Believe it or not, we are all on the same team, she said. I'll keep it in mind. 
Her expression clouded, and she leaned in toward a screen. A gesture of intimacy totally artificial in the floating world of zero-G and video connections, and still impossible to entirely escape. I heard about your condition. I'm sorry. It's all right, he said. If I ordered you to accept a medical coma? He laughed. Even that felt wrong. Truncated. I'll go when I'm ready, he said, only realizing after the fact that the phrase could mean two different things. We get out of the woods, the docks can take over. All right, then, she said, and her terminal chimed. She cursed quietly. I have to go. I'll touch base with you later. You got it, Bull said, and let the connection drop. The wise thing would have been to sleep. He'd been awake for fourteen hours, checking in with the security staff who were still alive, remaking a duty roster, doing all the things he could do from the medical bay that would make the ship work. Fourteen hours wasn't all that long a shift in the middle of a crisis, except that he'd been crippled. Crippled. With a sick feeling, he walked his fingertips down his throat, to his chest, and to the invisible line where the skin stopped feeling like his own and turned into something else. Meat. His mind skittered off the thought. He'd been hurt before and gotten back from it. He'd damn near died four or five different times. Something always happened that got him back on his feet. He always got lucky. This time would be the same. Somehow, somehow he'd get back. Have another story to tell and no one to tell it to. He knew he was lying to himself. But what else could he do? Apart from stand aside, and maybe he should, let Pa take care of it, give Ashford his shot. No one would give him any shit if he took the medical coma. Not even Fred. Hell, Fred would probably have told him to do it. Ordered him. Bull closed his eyes. He'd sleep or he wouldn't. Or he'd drift into some half-lucid place that wasn't either. One of the doctors was weeping in the corridor, a slow, autonomic sound, more like being sick than expressing sorrow. Someone coughed wetly. Pneumonia was the worst danger now. Null G messed with the sensors that triggered the kinds of coughing that actually cleared lungs until it was too late. After that... Strokes and embolisms as the blood that gravity should have helped to drain pooled and clotted instead. On all the other ships, it was the same. Survivable injuries made deadly just by floating. If they could just get under thrust, get some gravity. We're all on the same team, Pa said in his half-drowse, and Bull was suddenly completely awake. He scooped up his hand terminal, but Ashford and Pa were both refusing connections. It was the middle of their night. He considered putting through an emergency override, but didn't. Not yet. First he tried Sam. Bo? she said. Her skin looked grayish, and there were lines at the corners of her mouth that hadn't been there before. Her one blood-red eye seemed like an omen. Hey, Sam. Look. We need to get all the other crews from all the other ships onto the behemoth. Bring everyone together so no one does anything stupid. You want a pony, too? Sure, Bo said. Thing is, we got to give them a reason to come here. Something they need and they can't get anyplace else. Sounds great, Sam said, shaking her head. Maybe I'm not at my cognitive best here, sweetie, but are you asking me for something? They've all got casualties. They all need gravity. I'm asking you how long it would take you to spin up the drum. Chapter 27 Melba The darkness was beautiful and surreal. The ships of the flotilla, drawn together by the uncanny power of the station, hugged closer to each other than they ever would have under human control. The only lights came from the occasional exterior maintenance array and the eerie glow of the station. It was like walking through a graveyard in the moonlight. The ring of ships and debris glittered in a rising arc before her and behind, 
as if any direction she chose would lead up from where she was now. The EVA suit had limited propellant, and she wanted to conserve it for her retreat. She scuttled through the vacuum, magnetic boots clicking against the hull of the prince, until she reached its edge and launched herself into the gap between vessels, aiming toward a Martian supply ship. The half-mech and emergency airlock folded on her back, massed almost fifty kilos, but with their courses matched, they were as weightless as she was. It was an illusion, she knew, but in the timeless reach between the Thomas Prince and the hated Rosinante, all her burdens seemed light. The EVA suit had a simple heads-up display that outlined the Rosinante with a thin green line. It wasn't the nearest ship. The trip out to it would take hours, but she didn't mind. It was as trapped as all the others. It couldn't go any place. She hummed to herself as she imagined her arrival, rehearsed it. She let herself daydream that he would be there. Jim Holden returned from the station. She imagined him raging at her as she destroyed his ship. She imagined him weeping and begging her forgiveness, and seeing the despair in his eyes when she refused. They were beautiful dreams, and folded safely inside them she could forget the blood and horror behind her. Not just the catastrophe on the prince, but all of it. Wren, her father, Julie, everything. The dim blue light of the not moon felt like home, and the impending violence like a promise about to be kept. If there was another part of her, a sliver of Clarissa that hadn't quite been crushed yet that felt differently, it was small enough to ignore. Of course, it was just as likely they'd all be dead when she got there. The catastrophe would have hit them as hard as the Thomas Prince or any of the other ships. Holden's crew might be nothing but cooling meat already, only waiting for her to come and light their funeral pyre. There was, she thought, a beauty in that, too. She ran across the skins of the ships, leaped from one to the next like a nerve impulse crossing a synapse, like a bad idea being thought by a massive, moonlit brain. The air in the suit smelled like old plastic and her own sweat. The impact of the magnetic boots pulling her to the ships and then releasing her again translated up her leg, tug and release, tug and release, and before her, as slowly as the hour hand of an analog clock, the ghost-green Rosinante grew larger and nearer. She knew the ship's specs by heart. She'd studied them for weeks. Martian Corvette, originally assigned to the doomed Doniger. The entry points were the crew airlock just aft of the ops deck, the aft cargo bay doors, and a maintenance port that ran along beneath the reactor. If the reactor was live, the maintenance access wouldn't work. The fore airlock had almost certainly had its security profile changed once the ship fell into Holden's control. Only a stupid man wouldn't change it, and Melba refused to believe a stupid man could bring down her father. The service records she'd gleaned suggested that the cargo bay had been breached once already. Repairs were always weaker than the original structure. The choice was easy. The attitude of the ship put the cargo bay on the far side of the ship, the body of the Rosinante hiding its flaw from the light. Melba stepped into shadow, shivering as if it could actually be colder in the darkness. She fastened the mech to the ship's skin and assembled it for use under the glare of the EVA suit's work lamps. The mech was the yellow of fresh lemons and police tape. The cautions printed in three alphabets were like little Rosetta stones. She felt an inexplicable fondness for the machine as she strapped it across her back, fitting her hands into the Waldos. The mech hadn't been designed for violence, but it was suited for it. That made her and it the same. She lit the cutting torch, and the EVA's suit's mask went dark. Melba clung to the ship and began her slow invasion. Sparks and tiny asteroids of melted steel flew off into the darkness around her. The repair work where the bay doors had been bent out and refitted was almost invisible. 
If she hadn't known to look, she wouldn't have seen the weaknesses. She wondered if they knew she was coming. She imagined them hunched over their security displays, eyes wide with fear at what was digging its way under the Rosinante's skin. She found herself singing softly, snatches of popular songs and old holiday tunes, whatever came to mind. Bits of lyrics and melody matched to the hum of the torch's vibration. She breached the Rosinante, a patch of glowing steel no wider than her finger popping out. No air vented through the gap into the vacuum. They didn't keep the cargo bay pressurized. That meant the atmosphere wasn't dropping inside, and the ship alarms weren't blaring. One problem solved even without her help. It felt like fate. She killed the torch and unfolded the emergency airlock, sealing it against the hatch. She unzipped the outer layer, closed it, unzipped the inner one, and stepped into the small additional room she'd created. She didn't know how much damage she'd have to do to get into the inner areas of the ship. She didn't want an accidental loss of atmosphere to rob her of her vengeance. Holden needed to know who'd done this to him, not gasp out his last breaths thinking his ship had merely broken. Gently, she slipped the mech's hand into the hole, braced and peeled back the cargo door, long strips of steel blooming like an iris blossom. When it was wide enough, she took the sides of the hole in her mechanical hands and pulled herself into the cargo bay. Supply crates lined the walls and floors held in place by electromagnets. One had shattered, a victim of the catastrophe. A cloud of textured protein packets floated in the air. The LED on the panel beside the interior airlock door was green. The bay hadn't been locked down. Why would it? She punched the button to enter the airlock and begin the cycle. Once the green pressure light came on, she slipped her hands out of the mech and lifted off the helmet. No klaxons were ringing. No voices shouted or threatened. She'd made it on without alarming anyone. Her grin ached. Back in the mech, she opened the airlock into the interior of the ship and paused. Still no alarms. Melba pulled herself gently, silently, into enemy territory. The Rosinante was built floor by floor from the reactor up to the engineering deck, to the machine shop, then the galley and crew cabins and medical bays, storage deck containing the crew airlock, then on up to the command deck and pilot station farthest forward. Under thrust, it would be like a narrow building. Without thrust, the ship was directionless. She had choices to make now. The cargo bay was close enough to give her access to engineering and the reactor. She could sneak in there and start the reactor on its overload. Or she could go up, try taking the crew by surprise, and set the ship to self-destruct from the command deck. She took a deep breath. The Rosinante had four regular crew, including Holden, and she didn't know whether the documentary crew were still on board. At least two of the regular crew had military training and experience. She might be able to take them in a fight if she got the drop on them or came across them one at a time. The risk was too high. The reactor was nearest. It was easiest, and she could get out through the cargo bay. She pulled herself along the corridors she knew only from simulations toward the reactor and the death of the ship. When she opened the hatch to engineering, a woman floated above an open control panel, a soldering iron in one hand and a spool of wire in the other. She had the elongated frame and slightly oversized head of someone who'd grown up under low G. Brown skin and dark hair pulled back in a utilitarian knot. Naomi Nagata, Holden's lover. Melba felt a sudden urge to tear off the mech suit, swirl her tongue across the roof of her mouth, feel the chemical rush, to grab the narrow belter's neck in her bare hands and feel the bones snap. It would be a year-long dream of revenge made tactile and perfect. But two other crew members were on the ship, and she didn't know where they were. 
the terror she'd felt in that sleazy Baltimore casino came rushing back. Crawling helplessly on the floor in the post-drug collapse while people banged at the door to get in. She couldn't risk a crash until she knew where everyone was. Naomi looked up at the sound of the door. Pleasure in the woman's dark eyes as if the interruption were a happy surprise. And then shock. And then a cold fury. For a moment, neither one moved. With a yell, the woman launched herself at Melba, spinning the spool of wire in front of her. Melba tried to dodge, but the bulk of the mech and its slow response made it impossible. The wire hit her left cheek with a sound like a brick falling to earth, and for a moment her head rang. She brought up the mech's arm in a rough block, taking the belter solidly in the ribs and sending them both spinning. Melba grabbed at a handhold, missed it, and then tried for another. The mech's hand latched on, crushing the metal flat and almost pulling it from the wall, but the belter was ahead of her, skimming through the air at Melba, teeth bared like a shark. Melba tried to get the mech's free arm up to bat her away, but the belter was already too close. She grabbed the front of Melba's jumpsuit, balling it in a fist, and used the leverage to swing a hard knee into her ribs, punctuating each blow with a word. You don't get to hurt my ship. Melba felt a rib give way. She reached her tongue for the roof of her mouth, but again she didn't make the small, private circles that would flush her blood with fire. She had to be awake and functional when the fight was over. She gritted her teeth and curled the mech's free arm in, bending it against itself, and then snapped her hand closed. The belter screamed. The mech's claw had her by the shoulder. Melba squeezed again and heard the muffled, wet sound of bone breaking. She threw the belter across the room as hard as the motor's letter. Where the woman bounced off the far wall, a smear of blood marked it. Melba waited, watching the belter rotate in the air, directionless and loose as a rag doll sinking to the bottom of a swimming pool. A growing sphere of blood adhered to the woman's shoulder and neck. I do what I want, Melba said, and the voice sounded like someone else's. Carefully, she pulled herself to the control panel. The panel was off, fixed to the deck with a length of adhesive tape. The guts within were a mass of wires and plates. The Rosinante had taken some damage in the catastrophe, but not so much that Melba couldn't do what was needed. She shrugged out of the mech, cracked her knuckles, traced the major control nodes, and plugged them back into the panel. The local memory check took only a few seconds, and she overrode the full system check. It was nothing she could have done before she left Earth, but Melba Coe had spent months learning about the guts of military ships. This was just the sort of thing Soledad, Stani, and Bob would have checked on if they'd been working maintenance. It was something Ran would have taught her. Her fingers curled, stumbling over the keyboard for a moment, but she got it back. The control specs of the reactor came up. Releasing the magnetic bottle that kept the core from melting through the ship was deliberately designed to be difficult. Changing the limits on the reaction itself until it would eventually outstrip the bottle's ability to contain it was also hard, but less so. And it would give her a little time to tell Holden what she'd done, then get out of the ship and back toward the Thomas Prince. In the chaos of the day, no one might even know that someone had survived the death of the Rosinante. A flicker in her peripheral vision was the only warning she had, but it was enough. Melba twisted out of the way, the belter's massive wrench hissing through the air where her temple had been. Melba pushed back with her legs, struggling frantically to worm back into the mech. She tensed against the coming attack, but no blows came. She shrugged into the metal and jammed her hands into the waldos, grabbing the wall and spinning back to the fight just as the belter looked up from the control panel. Blood was crawling up the woman's neck, held to her by surface tension, and her smile was triumphant. The control panel flashed red, and a screen of code crawled over it too fast to read. The lights in the room went off, 
and the emergency LEDs flickered on. Melba felt her throat go tight. The belter had dumped core. The reaction Melba had come to overload was dissipating in a cloud of gas behind the ship. The belter's smile was feral and triumphant. Doesn't change anything, Melba said. It hurt to talk. You have torpedoes. I'll overload one of those. Not in my lifetime, the belter said and attacked again. Her swing was lopsided, though. Clumsy. The wrench clanged against the mech's joint, but it didn't do any damage. The belter launched herself out of reach just as Melba swung an arm at her. The belter wasn't using her injured arm at all, and she left spinning droplets of blood whenever she changed direction. Melba wondered why the woman didn't call for help. On little ships like this, opening a communications channel was often as simple as saying it out loud. Either the computer was down, the rest of the crew dead or incapacitated, or it simply hadn't occurred to her. It didn't matter. It didn't change what Melba had to do. She shifted to her right, sliding through the air, moving handhold to handhold, never giving the other woman the chance to catch her unmoored and spin her into the open air at the center of the room. The belter perched on the wall, her dark eyes darting one way, then another, searching for advantage. There was no fear in them, no sentimentality. Melba had no doubt that if the opportunity came, Naomi would kill her. She reached the hatch, setting the mech's claw to grip a handhold, and then slipping one arm free to reach for the door's controls. It was a provocation, and it worked. The belter jumped, not straight at Melba, but to the deck above her, then turned, kicked off, and drove down, her heels aiming for Melba's head. Melba drove her arm back into the mech and snapped the free arm up, catching the belter in mid-flight. Her handhold broke free of the wall, and the pair of them floated together into the open air of the room. The belter's injured arm was caught in the mech's clamp, and she kicked savagely with her heels. One blow connected, and Melba's vision narrowed for a moment. She pulled the belter through the air, worrying at her like a terrier with a rat, and then managed to swing the free arm up and catch the woman by the neck. The belter's hand flew up to the clamp, panic in her expression. Her eyes went wide and bright. It would take a twitch of Melba's fingers to crush the woman's throat, and they both knew it. A sense of triumph and overwhelming joy washed through her. Holden might not be here, but she had his lover. She would take someone he loved from him just the way he'd taken her own father from her. This wasn't even fighting anymore. This was justice. The belter's face was flushing red, her breath constricted and rough. Melba grinned, enjoying the moment. This is his fault, she said. All of this is what he had coming. The belter scratched the mech's claw. The blood that came away might have been from the old wound, or the mech's grip might already have broken the skin. Melba closed her fingers a fraction. The pressure feather light. The mech's servos buzzed as it closed a millimeter more. The belter tried to say something, pushing the word out past her failing windpipe, and Melba knew she couldn't let her speak. She couldn't let her beg or weep and cry mercy. If she did, Melba suddenly wasn't sure she could go through with it. And it had to be done. Sympathy is for the weak her father's voice whispered in her ear. You're Naomi Nagata, Melba said. My name is Clarissa Melpamini Mao. You and your people attacked my family. Everything that's happened here, everything that's going to happen, it's your fault. The light was fading from the belter's eyes. Her breath came in ragged gasps. All it would take was a squeeze. All she had to do was make a fist and snap the woman's neck. With the last of her strength, the belter woman lifted her free hand in a gesture of obscenity and defiance. Melba's body buzzed, like she'd stepped into the blast from a fire hose. 
Her head bent back, her spine arching against itself. Her hands flexed open, her toes curled back until it seemed like they had to break. She heard herself scream. The mech spread its arms to the side and froze, leaving her crucified in the metal form. The buzzing stopped, but she couldn't move. No matter how much she willed it, her muscles would not respond. Naomi came to rest against the opposite wall, a knot of panting and blood. Who are you? the belter croaked. I am vengeance, Melba thought. I am your death made flesh. But the voice that answered came from behind her. Anna. My name's Anna. Are you all right? Chapter 28 Anna The woman, Naomi Nagata, replied by coughing up a red glob of blood. I'm an idiot. Of course you're not all right, Anna said then floated over to her, pausing to push the still-twitching Melba to the other side of the compartment. Girl and mech drifted across the room, bounced off a bulkhead and came to a stop several meters away. Emergency locker, Naomi croaked, and pointed at a red panel on one wall. Anna opened it to find flashlights, tools, and a red and white bag not too different from the one Tilly had been carrying on the prince. She grabbed it. While Anna extracted a package of gauze and a can of coagulant spray for the nasty wound on Naomi's shoulder, the belter pulled out several hypoampules and began injecting herself with them one at a time, her movements efficient and businesslike. Anna felt like something was tearing in her shoulders every time she wrapped the gauze around Naomi's upper torso, and she almost asked for another shot for herself. Years before, Anna had taken a seminar on ministering to people with drug addictions. The instructor, a mental health nurse named Andrew Smoot, had made the point over and over that the drugs didn't only give pleasure and pain. They changed cognition, stripped away the inhibitions, and, more often than not, someone's worst habits or tendencies, what he called their pathological move, got exaggerated. An introvert would often withdraw. An aggressive person would grow violent. Someone impulsive would become even more so. Anna had understood the idea intellectually. Almost three hours into her spacewalk, the amphetamines Tilly had given her began to fade, and a clarity she hadn't known she lacked began to return to her. She felt she had a deeper, more personal insight into what her own pathological move might be. Anna had spent only a few years living among belters and outer planets' inhabitants, but that was long enough to know that their philosophy boiled down to what you don't know kills you. No one growing up on Earth ever really understood that, no matter how much time they later spent in space. No belter would have thrown on a spacesuit and EVA pack and rushed out the airlock without first knowing exactly what the environment on the other side was like. It wouldn't even occur to them to do so. Worse, she'd run out that airlock without stopping to send a message to Nono. You don't ask for permission. You ask for forgiveness, echoed in her head. If she died doing this, Nono would have it carved as her epitaph. She'd never get that last chance to say she was sorry. The brightly colored display, which always seemed to float at the edge of her vision no matter which way her face was pointed, had said that she had 83% of her air supply remaining. Not knowing how long a full tank would last robbed that information of some much-needed context. As she'd tried to slow her breathing back down and keep from panicking, the gauge ticked to 82%. How long had it been at 83% before it did? She couldn't remember. A vague feeling of nausea made her think about how bad throwing up in her spacesuit would be which only made the feeling worse. The girl, Melba, or Claire now, was far ahead and gaining, moving with the easy grace of long practice. Someone for whom walking in a spacesuit with magnetic boots was normal. 
Anna tried to hurry and only managed to kick her boot with her other foot and turn the magnet up high enough to lock it to the hull of the ship. The momentum of her step tugged against the powerful magnetic clamp. After several lost seconds figuring out how to fix that problem, she'd found the controls and slid the grip back down to a normal human range. After that, she gave up on haste and aimed for a safe, consistent pace. Slow and steady, but she wasn't winning the race. She lost sight of the girl, but she told herself it didn't matter. She guessed well enough where Clarissa Mao was going, or Melba Coe whoever this woman was. She had seen images of the Rosinante on news feeds before. It was probably as famous as a ship could be. James Holden's central role in the Eros and Ganymede incidents, along with a peppering of dogfights and anti-piracy actions, had kept his little corvette mentioned in the media on and off for years. As long as there weren't two Martian corvettes parked next to each other, Anna felt confident she'd be able to spot it. Fifteen long minutes later, she did. The Rosinante was shaped like a stubby black wedge of metal, a fat chisel laid on its side. The flat surface of the hull was occasionally broken up by a domed projection. Anna didn't know enough about ships to know what they were. It was a warship, so sensors or guns maybe, but definitely not doors. The tail of the ship had been facing her, and the only obvious opening in it was at the center of the massive drive cone. She walked to the edge of the ship she was on, and then from side to side, trying to get a better look at the rest of the Rosinante before jumping over to it. The irony of looking before she leapt at this late stage of the game made her laugh, and she felt some of the tension and nausea fading. Just to the right of the drive cone, was a bubble of plastic attached to the ship, pale as a blister. A moment later, she was through the wound in the ship's cargo doors and inside. It had occurred to her, as she looked at the maze of crates locked against the hull with magnets much like the ones on her own feet, that she hadn't thought her plan through past this. Did this room connect to the rest of the ship? The doors behind her didn't have an airlock which probably meant that this space was usually kept in vacuum. She had no idea where anyone would be in relation to that room, and, more worrisome, she had no idea if the girl she was chasing was still in there, hiding behind one of the boxes. Anna carefully pulled herself from crate to crate to the other end of the long, narrow compartment. Bits of plastic and freeze-dried food drifted around her like a cloud of oddly shaped insects. The broken crates might have been relics of a fight, or debris created by the speed change. She had no way to know. She reached into the small bag tethered to her EVA pack and pulled out the taser. She'd never fired one in microgravity or in vacuum. She hoped neither thing affected it. Another gamble no belter would ever take. To her great relief, she found an airlock at the other end of the room and it opened at a touch of the panel. Cycling it took several minutes while Anna pulled the heavy EVA pack off her back and played with the taser to make sure she knew how to turn the safety off. The military design was intuitive, but less clearly labeled than the civilian models she was accustomed to. The panel flashed green, and the inner doors opened. No one was in sight just a deck that looked like a machine shop with tool lockers and workbenches and a ladder set into one wall. Bookending the ladder were two hatches, one going toward the front of the ship, the other toward the back. Anna was thinking that she was most likely to run into crew members by going toward the front of the ship when there was a loud bang from the back and the lights went out. Yellow LEDs set into the walls came on a moment later, and a genderless voice said, Core dump, emergency power only, and repeated it several times. Her helmet muffled the sound, but there was clearly still air in the ship. She pulled the helmet off and hung it from her harness. Anna was fairly certain you only ejected the core in emergencies related to the engine room, so she moved to that hatch instead. 
With the constant rumble of the ship gone and her helmet removed, she could hear faint noises coming through the hatch. It took her several long moments to figure out how to access it, and when she finally did, the hatch snapped open so suddenly it made her almost yelp with surprise. Inside, Melba was murdering someone. A belter woman with long, dark hair and a greasy coverall was having her throat crushed by the mechanical arms Melba wore. The woman, Anna could see now that it was James Holden's second-in-command, Naomi Nagata, looked like Melba had beaten her badly. Her arm and shoulder were covered in blood, and her face was a mass of scrapes and contusions. Anna drifted down into the vaulted chamber. The reactor room's walls curving inward like a church, the cathedrals of the fusion age. She felt an almost overwhelming need to hurry, but she knew she'd only get one shot with the taser, and she didn't trust herself to fire on the move. Naomi's face was turning a dark, bruised purple, her breath the occasional wet rasp. Somehow, the belter managed to raise one hand and flip Melba off. Anna's feet hit the decking, and her boots stuck. She was less than three meters behind Melba when her finger pressed the firing stud, aiming for the area of her back not covered by the skeletal frame of the mech, hoping the taser would work through a vacuum suit. She missed, but the results were impressive anyway. Instead of hitting the fabric of Melba's suit, the taser's two microdarts hit the mech dead center. The trailing wires immediately turned bright red and began to fall apart like burning string. The taser got so hot, Anna could feel it through her glove. So she let go just before it melted into a glob of gooey gray plastic. The mech arced and popped, and the arms snapped straight out. The room smelled like burning electrical cables. All of Melba's hair was standing straight up, and even after the taser had died, her fingers and legs continued to twitch and jerk. A small screen on the mech's arm had a flashing red error code. Who are you? Naomi Nagata asked, drifting in a way that told Anna she'd be slumping to the floor at the first hint of gravity. Anna. My name's Anna, she had said. Are you all right? After the third injection, Naomi took a long, shuddering breath and said, Who's Anna? Anna is me, she said, then chuckled at herself. You mean, who am I? I'm a passenger on the Thomas Prince. UN? You don't look like Navy. No, a passenger. I'm a member of the advisory group the Secretary General sent. The Dog and Pony Show, Naomi said then hissed with pain as Anna tightened the bandage and activated the charge that would keep it from unwinding. Everyone keeps calling it that, Anna said as she felt the bandage. She wished she'd paid more attention in the church first aid class. Clear the airway, stop the bleeding, immobilize the injury was about the limit of what she knew. That's because it is, Naomi said, then reached up with her good hand to grab a rung of the nearby ladder. It's all political bullshit. She was cut off by a mechanical-sounding voice saying, Reboot complete. Anna turned around. Melba was staring at them both. Her hair still standing straight out from her head, but her hands no longer twitching uncontrollably. She moved her arms experimentally, and the half-mech whined, hesitated, and then moved with her. Fuck me, Naomi said. She sounded annoyed, but unsurprised. Anna reached for her taser before she remembered it had melted. Melba bared her teeth. This way, Naomi said as the hatch slid open above them. Anna darted through it with Naomi close behind, using her one good arm to pull herself along. Melba surged after them, reaching out with one foot to push off the reactor housing. Naomi pulled her leg through just in time to avoid being grabbed by the mech's claw, then tapped the locking mechanism with her toe, and the hatch slammed shut on the mech's wrist. The hatch whined as it tried to close, crushing the claw in a spray of sparks and broken parts. Anna waited for the scream of pain that didn't come, 
then realized that the gloves Melba used to control the machine were in the mech's forearms, several centimeters behind the point of damage. They hadn't hurt her, and she'd sacrificed the use of one of the mech's claws in order to keep the hatch open. The other claw appeared in the gap, gripping at the metal, bending it. Go, Naomi said, her voice tight with pain, her good hand pointing at the next hatch up the ladder. After they were both through, Anna took a moment to look around at the new deck they were on. It looked like crew areas. Small compartments with flimsy-looking doors. Not a good place to hold up. Naomi flew through the empty air and the dim shadows cast by the emergency lights, and Anna followed as best she could, the feeling of nightmare crawling up her throat. After they'd passed through the hatch into the next level, Naomi stopped to tap on the small control screen for several seconds. The emergency lights shifted to red, and the panel in the hatch read, Security Lockdown. She's not trapped down there, Anna said. She can get out through the cargo bay. There's a hole in the doors. That's twice now someone has done that, Naomi replied, pulling herself up the ladder. Anyway, she's wearing a salvage mech rig, and she's in the machine shop. Half the stuff in there is made to cut through ships. She's not trapped. We are. This took Anna by surprise. They'd gotten away. They'd locked a door behind them. That was supposed to end it. The monster isn't allowed to open doors. It was fuzzy, juvenile thinking, and Anna became less sure that all the drugs had actually passed through her system. So what do we do? Medical bay, Naomi said, pointing down a short corridor. That way. That made sense. The frail-looking belter woman was getting a gray tone to her dark skin that made Anna think of massive blood loss, and the bandage on her shoulder had already soaked through and was throwing off tiny crimson spheres. She took Naomi by the hand and pulled her down the corridor to the medical bay door. It was closed, and the panel next to it flashed the security lockdown message like the deck hatches had. Naomi started pressing it, and Anna waited for the door to slide open. Instead, another, heavier-looking door slid into place over the first, and the panel Naomi was working on went dark. Pressure doors, Naomi said, harder to get through. But we're on this side of them. Yeah. Is there another way in? Anna asked. No, let's go. Wait, Anna said. We need to get you in there. You're very badly hurt. Naomi turned to look at her frowned as if she'd only seen Anna for the first time. It was a speculative frown. Anna felt she was being sized up. I have two injured men in there, my crew. They're helpless, Naomi finally said. Now they're as safe as I can make them. So you and I are going to go up to the next deck, get a gun, and make sure she follows us. When she shows up, we're going to kill her. I don't, Anna started. Kill her. Can you do that? Kill? No, I can't, Anna said. It was the truth. Naomi stared at her for a second longer, then just shrugged with her good hand. Okay, then, come with me. They moved through the next hatch to the deck above. Most of the space was taken up by an airlock and storage lockers. Some of the lockers were large enough to hold vacuum suits and EVA packs. Others were smaller. Naomi opened one of the smaller lockers and pulled out a thick black handgun. I've never shot anyone either, she said, pulling the slide back and loading around. To Anna's eye, the bullet looked like a tiny rocket. But those two in the med bay are my family and this is my home. I understand, Anna said. Good, because I can't have you... Naomi started, then her eyes rolled up in her head and her body went limp. The gun drifted away from her relaxed hand. No, 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 Anna repeated in a sudden wash of panic. She floated over to Naomi and held her wrist. There was still a pulse, but it was faint. She dug through the first aid pack, looking for something to help. One ampule said it was for keeping people from going into shock, so Anna jabbed Naomi with it. She didn't wake up. The air in the room began to smell different, hot, and with the melted plastic odor her damaged taser had given off when it died. 
A spot of red appeared on the deck hatch, then shifted to yellow, then to white. The girl in the mech, coming for them. The hatch above them, the one that led forward on the ship, was closed and flashing the lockdown message. Naomi hadn't told her what the override code was. The airlock was on their level, but it was locked down, too. The deck hatch began to open in lurching increments. Anna could hear Melba panting and cursing as she forced it, and Naomi's lockdown code hadn't kept the insane woman out. It had only locked them in. Anna pulled Naomi's limp body over to one of the large vacuum suit storage lockers and put her inside, climbing in after her. There was no lock on the door. Between the unconscious woman and the suit, there was hardly enough room for her to close it. She set both of her feet at the corner where the door of the locker met the deck and set the magnets up to full. She felt the suit lock onto the metal, clamping her legs into place and pulling her up close against the locker door. On the far side, metal shrieked. Something wet brushed against the back of Anna's neck. Naomi's hand, limp and bloody. Anna tried not to move, tried not to breathe loudly. The prayer she offered up was hardly more than a confusion of fear and hope. A locker door slammed open off to her left, then another one, closer, and then another. Anna wondered where Naomi's gun had gotten to. It was in the locker somewhere, but there was no light, and she'd have to unlock the magnets on her boots to look for it. She hoped they hadn't left it outside with the crazy woman. Another locker opened. The door centimeters from Anna's face shifted, but didn't open. The vents and the cracks in the locker door flared the white of a cutting torch, then went dark. A mechanical voice said, Backup power depleted. The curse from the other side was pure frustration. It was followed by a series of grunts and thumps, Melba taking the mech rig off. Anna felt a surge of hope. Open it, Melba said. Her voice was low, rough, and bestial. No, open it. You, I can hear that you're feeling upset, Anna said, horrified by the words even as she spoke them. I think we should talk about this if you... Melba's scream was unlike anything Anna had heard before. Deep and vicious and wild. If the id had a throat, it would have sounded like that if the devil spoke. Something struck the metal door, and Anna flinched back. Then another blow, and another. The metal began to bow in, and droplets of blood clung to the vent slits. Her fists, Anna thought. She's doing this with her hands. The screaming was wild now, obscene where it wasn't wordless, and inhuman as a hurricane. The thick metal of the door bent in, the hinges starting to shudder and bend with each new assault. Anna closed her eyes. The top hinge gave way, shattering. And then, without warning, silence fell. Anna waited, sure she was being lulled into a trap. No sound came except a small, animal gurgle. She could smell the stomach-turning acid stench of fresh vomit. After what felt like hours, she turned off the magnets and pushed the warped and abused door open. Melba floated curled against the wall, her hands pressed to her belly and her body shuddering. Chapter 29 Bull The truth was, distance was always measured in time. It wasn't the sort of thing Bo usually thought about, but his enforced physical stillness was doing strange things with his awareness. Even in the middle of the constant press of events, the calls and coordination, the scolding from his doctor, he felt some part of his mind coming loose. And strange ideas kept floating in, like the way that distance got measured in time. Centuries before... A trip across the Atlantic Ocean could take months. There was a town near New Mexico named Wheelis, 
where the story was some ancient travelers of the dust and caliche had a wagon break down and decided that it was easier to put down roots than go on. Technologies had come, each building on the ones before, and months became weeks and then hours. And outside the gravity well, where machines were freed from the tyranny of air resistance and gravity, the effect was even more profound. When the orbits were right, the journey from Luna to Mars could take as little as twelve days. The trek from Saturn to Ceres, a few months. And because they were out there with their primate brains evolved on the plains of prehistoric Africa, everyone had a sense of how far it was. Saturn to Ceres was a few months. Luna to Mars was a few days. Distance was time. And so they didn't get overwhelmed by it. The slow zone had changed that. Looking at a readout, the ships from Earth and Mars were clustered together like a handful of dried peas thrown in the same bowl. They were drifting now, coming together and spreading apart, taking their places in the captured ring around the eerie station. Compared to the volume of ring-bordered sphere, they seemed huddled close. But the distance between them and the ring was time. And time meant death. From the farthest of the ships to the behemoth was two days' travel in a shuttle, assuming that the maximum speed didn't ratchet down again. The closest he could have jumped to. The human universe had contracted, and was contracting more. With every connection, every stark, frightened voice he heard in the long, frantic hours, Bull grew more convinced that his plan could work. The vastness and strangeness and unreasonable danger of the universe had traumatized everyone it hadn't killed. There was a hunger to go home, to huddle together, back in the village. The instinct was the opposite of war, and as long as he could see it cultivated, as long as the response to the tragedies of the lockdown were to get one another's backs and see that everyone who needed care got it, the grief and fear might not turn to more violence. The feed went to green, then blue, and then Monica Stewart was smiling professionally into the camera. She looked tired, sober but human, a face people knew, one they could recognize and feel comfortable with. Ladies and gentlemen, she said, welcome to the first broadcast of Radio Free Slow Zone. Coming to you from our temporary offices here on board the OPA battleship Behemoth. I am a citizen of Earth and a civilian, but it's my hope that this program can be of some use to all of us in this time of crisis. In addition to bringing whatever unclassified news and information we can, we will also be conducting interviews with the command crews of the ships, civilian leaders on the Thomas Prince, and live musical performances. It's an honor to welcome our first guest, the Reverend Father Hector Cortez. A graphic window opened and the priest appeared. To Bull's eyes, the man looked pretty ragged. The two bright teeth seemed false and the blazing white hair had a greasy look to it. Father Cortez, Monica Stewart said, you have been helping with a relief effort on the Thomas Prince? For a moment, the man seemed not to have heard her. A smile jerked into place. I have, the old man said. I have. And it has been... Monica, I'm humbled. I am humbled. Bull turned off the feed. It was something. It was better than nothing. The Martian frigate Cavalier, now under the command of a second lieutenant named Skupsky, was shutting down its reactors and transferring all its remaining crew and supplies to the behemoth. The Thomas Prince had agreed to move its wounded, its medical team, and all the remaining civilians, poets, priests, and politicians, including the dead-eyed Hector Cortez. It was a beginning, but it wasn't all he could do. If they were to keep coming, if the behemoth was to become the symbol of calm and stability and certainty that he needed it to be, there had to be more. The broadcast channel could give a voice and a face to the growing consolidation. 
he'd need to talk to Monica Stewart about it some more. Maybe there could be some sort of organized mourning of the dead. A council with representatives from all sides that could make an evacuation plan and start getting people back through the ring and home. Except that when the lockdown came, they'd lost all their long-distance ships to it. And the ring itself had retreated, because they had to move so slowly and because distance was measured in time. His hand, Terminal chirped, and he came back to wakefulness with a start. Outside his room, a woman shouted, and a man's tense voice replied. Bull recognized the sound of the crash team rushing to try and revive some poor bastard from collapsing into death. He felt for the team of medics. He was doing the same kind of work, just on a different scale. He shifted his arms, scooped up the terminal, and accepted the connection. Surge appeared on the screen. Beast? he asked. I'm doing great, Bull said dryly. What's up? Mars. They got him. Hauling the cabron back alive. Instinctively, uselessly, Bull tried to sit up. He couldn't sit, and up was a polite abstraction. Holden, he said. Who else, right? He's on a skiff, puttering slow for the MCRN Hammurabi. Should be there in a few hours. No, Bull said. They've got to bring him here. Serge raised his hand in a belter's nod, but his expression was skeptical. I see Dalsisi, but I don't see them doing it. Somewhere far away, down below Bull's chest, the compression sleeves hissed and chuffed and expanded, massaging the blood and lymph around his body now that movement wouldn't keep his fluids from pooling. He couldn't feel it. If they'd caught fire, he wouldn't feel it. Something deep and atavistic shifted in fear and disgust as his hind brain rediscovered his injuries for the thousandth time. Bull ground the heel of his palm against the bridge of his nose. Okay, he said. I'll see what I can do. What does Sam say about the project? She got the rail guns off, and they're working on cutting back the extra torpedo tubes, but the captain found out, and he's throwing a grand mal. Well, that had to happen sometime. Bo said. Guess I'll take care of that, too. Anything else? Unless two Labamisianis, I think you got plenty. Take a breath. We'll take a turn, Sasa. You don't have to do it all yourself. I've got to do something, Bo said as the compression sleeves relaxed with a sigh. I'll be in touch. Tense, low voices drifted in with the burned moth stink of cauterized flesh. Bull let his gaze focus on the blue-white ceiling above the bed he was strapped to. Holden was back. They hadn't killed him. If there was one thing that had the potential to destroy the fragile cooperation he was building, it would be the fight over who got to hold James Holden's nuts to a Bunsen burner. Bull scratched his shoulder, more for the sensation than because it itched, and considered the consequences. Protocol was that they'd question him, hold him in detention, and start negotiating extradition with whoever on the Earth side was investigating the Sung Un. Bull's guess was they'd beat him bloody and drop him outside. The man was in custody, but he was responsible for too many deaths to assume he'd be safe there. It was time to try hailing the Rosinante again. Maybe this time they'd answer. Since the catastrophe, they'd been silent. Their communications array might have been damaged, they might be staying silent as some sort of political tactic, or they might all be dying, or dead. He requested a connection again, and waited with no particular hope of being answered. Later, when they were outside the ring, people could wrestle for jurisdiction as much as they wanted. Right now, Bull needed them to work together. Maybe if he... Against all expectation, the connection to the Rosinante opened. A woman Bull didn't recognize appeared. Pale skin, unrestrained red hair haloing her face. The smudge on her cheek might have been grease or blood. Yes, the woman said. Hello, who is this? Can you help us? My name's Carlos Baca, Bull said. 
swallowing shock and confusion before they could get into his voice. I'm Chief Security Officer on the Behemoth. And yes, I can help you. Oh, thank God, the woman said. So, how about you tell me who you are and what the situation is over there? My name is Anna Volovodov, and I have a woman who tried to kill the crew of the Rosinante in, um, custody? I used all the sedatives in the emergency pack because I can't get into the actual medical bay. I taped her to a chair. Also, I think she may have blown up the Sung Un. Bo folded his hands together. Why don't you tell me about that? he said. Captain Jaconda was an older woman, silver-haired with a take-no-shit military attitude that Bo respected, even though he didn't like it. I still don't have orders to release the prisoner, Captain Jaconda said. I don't see that it's likely that I'll get them. So, for the foreseeable future, no. I have a shuttle already going to collect his crew and the woman he accused of being the real saboteur, Bull said. And last time I looked, I have two dozen of your people slated to come over once we have the drum spun up. Jaconda nodded once, confirming everything he'd said without being moved by any of it. Bull knotted his fingers together and squeezed until the knuckles were white. But he did it out of range of the communication deck's cameras. It's going to be better for all of us if we can get everyone together, Bo said. Pool resources and plan the evacuation. If you don't have shuttles, I can arrange transportation for you and your crew. There's plenty of space here. I agree that it would be better to be under a single command, Jaconda said. If you are offering to turn over the behemoth, I'm willing to accept control and responsibility. Not where I was taking that, no, Bo said. I didn't think so. Mr. Baca, Ashford barked from the doorway. Bull held out a hand in a just-a-minute gesture. This is something we're going to have to revisit, he said. I've got a lot of respect for you and your position, and I'm sure we can find a way to get this done right. Her expression made it clear she didn't see anything wrong. I'll be in touch, Bull said, and dropped the connection. So much for the pleasant part of his day. Ashford pulled himself through the door, coming to rest against the wall nearest the foot of Bull's bed. He looked angry, but it was a different kind of angry. Bull was used to seeing Ashford cautious, even tentative. This man wasn't either. Everything about him spoke of barely restrained rage. Grief makes people crazy, Bull thought. Grief and guilt and embarrassment altogether, maybe did worse. Maybe it broke people. Pa floated in behind him, her eyes cast down. Her face had the odd, waxy look that came from exhaustion. The doctor followed her, and then Serge and Macondo looking any place but at him. The crowd filled the little room past its capacity. Mr. Baca, Ashford said biting at each syllable. I understand you gave the order to disarm the ship. Is that true? Disarm the ship, Bull said, and looked at Dr. Sterling. Her gaze was straight on and unreadable. I had Sam take the rail guns off so we could spin up the drum. And you did this without my permission. Permission for what? Blood darkened Ashford's face, and rage roughened his voice. The railguns are a central component of this ship's defensive capabilities. Not if they don't work, Bo said. I had her take apart the thrust gravity water reclamation system, too. Rebuild it at ninety degrees so it'll use the spin. You want me to run through all the stuff I'm having her repurpose because it doesn't work anymore, or are we just caring about the guns? I also understand that you have authorized non-OPA personnel to have access to the communications channels of the ship, Earthers, Martians, all the people we came out here to keep in line. Is that why we came out here? Bo said. It wasn't a denial, and that seemed to be close enough to a confession for Ashford. Besides which, it wasn't like Bo had been hiding it. And enemy military personnel? You're bringing them aboard my ship as well? 
Pa had agreed to everything Ashford was listing off. But she stood behind the captain, not speaking up, expression unreadable. Bull wasn't sure what was going on between the captain and his XO, but if they were working out some internal power struggle, Bull knew which side he'd want to end up on. So he bit the bullet and didn't mention Pa's involvement. Yes, I'm bringing in everyone I can get. Humanitarian outreach and consolidation of control. It's textbook. A second year would know to do it. Pa winced at that. Mr. Baca, you have exceeded your authority. You have ignored the chain of command. All orders given by you, all permissions granted by you, are hereby revoked. I am relieving you of duty and instructing that you be placed in a medical coma until such time as you can be evacuated. Like fuck you are, Bo said. He hadn't intended to, but the words came out like a reflex. They seemed to float in the air between them, and Bull discovered that he'd meant them. This isn't open for debate, Ashford said coldly. Damn right it's not, Bull said. The reason you're in charge of this mission and not me is that Fred Johnson didn't think the crew would be comfortable with an Earther running a belter ship. You got the job because you kissed all the right political asses. You know what? Good for you. Hope your career takes off like a fucking rocket. Pa's here for the same reason. She's got the right-sized head, though at least hers doesn't seem to be empty. That's a racist insult, Ashford said, trying to interrupt. And I won't have... I'm here because they needed someone who could get the job done. And they knew we were screwed. And you know what? We're still screwed. But I'm going to get us out of here, and I'm going to keep Fred from being embarrassed by what we did here. And you are going to stay out of my way while I do it, you pinche motherfucker. That's enough, Mr. Baca. I will... You know it's true, Bull said, shifting to face Pa. Her expression was closed, empty. If he's in charge of this, he's going to get it wrong. You've seen it. You will stop addressing the XO, Mr. Baca. You'll know what kind of decisions he makes. He'll send them back to their ships, even if it means people die, because you are relieved. You will be... Because he wasn't the one that invited them. It's going to make all of this more dangerous. Quiet. I do not give you permission to speak to my staff. You will be... And if someone else pisses that thing off, we could all... Quiet! Ashford shouted. And he pushed forward, his mouth in a square gape of rage. He hit the medical bed too hard pressing into Bull, grabbing him by the shoulder and shaking him hard enough to snap his teeth shut. I told you to shut up! The restraints opened under Ashford's attack, the Velcro ripping. Pain lanced through Bull's neck like someone was pushing a screwdriver into his back. He tried to push the captain away, but there was nothing to grab hold of. His knuckles cracked against something hard, the table, the wall, something else. He couldn't say what. People around him were shouting. His balance felt profoundly wrong. The dead weight of his body flowing limp and useless in the empty air, but tugged at by the tubes and the catheters. When the world made sense again, he was at a forty-degree angle above the table, his head pointing down. Pa and Macondo were gripping Ashford's arms, the captain's hands bent into claws. Serge was bunched against the wall, ready to launch, but not sure what direction he should go. Dr. Sterling appeared at his side, gathering his legs and drawing him quickly and professionally back toward the bed. Could we please not assault the patient with the crushed spinal cord? She said as she did. Because this makes me very uncomfortable. Another vicious flare of pain, hot, sharp, and evil, ran through Bull's neck and upper back as she strapped him down. One of the tubes was floating free, blood and a bit of flesh adhering to its end. He didn't know what part of his body it had come out of. Pa was looking at him, and he kept his voice calm. We've already screwed up twice. We came through the ring, and we let soldiers go on the station. We won't get a third. We can get everyone together, and we can get them out of here. That's dangerous talk, mister, Ashford spat. I can't be captain, Bo said. Even if I wasn't stuck in this bed, I'm an earther. There has to be a belter in charge. Fred was right about that. Ashford pulled his arms free of Pa and Macondo, 
plucked his sleeves back into trim and steadied himself against the wall. Doctor, place Mr. Baca in a medical coma. That is a direct order. Serge, Bull said. I need you to take Captain Ashford into custody, and I need you to do it now. No one moved. Serge scratched his neck, the sounds of fingernails against stubble louder than anything in the room. Pa's gaze locked in the middle distance, her face sour and angry. Ashford's eyes narrowed, cutting over toward her. When she spoke, her voice was dead and joyless. Serge, you heard what the chief said. Ashford gathered himself to launch for Pa, but Serge already had a restraining hand on the captain's shoulder. This is mutiny, Ashford said. There'll be a reckoning for this. You need to come with us now, Serge said. Macondo took Ashford's other arm and put it in an escort hold, and the three of them left together. Pa stayed against the wall, held steady by a strap, while the doctor, tutting and muttering under her breath, replaced the catheters and checked the monitors and tubes attached to his skin. For the most part, he didn't feel it. When she was done, the doctor left the room. The door slid closed behind her. For almost a minute, neither of them spoke. Guess your opinion on mutiny changed, Bull said. Apparently, Pa said and sighed. He's not thinking straight, and he's drinking too much. He made the decision that brought us all here. He can sign his name to all the corpses on all those ships. I don't think he sees it that way, Pa said, and then, but I think he's putting a lot of effort into not seeing it that way, and he's slipping. I don't think, I don't think he's well. It'd be easier if he had an accident, Bo said. Pa managed to smile. I haven't changed that much, Mr. Baca. Didn't figure, but I had to say it, he said. Let's focus on getting everyone safe and then getting everyone home, she said. It was a nice career while it lasted. I'm sorry it's ending this way. Maybe it is, Bo said. But did you come out here to win medals or to do the right thing? Pa's smile was thin. I'd hoped for both, she said. Nothing wrong with a little optimism, long as it doesn't set policy, he said. I'm going to keep on getting everyone on the behemoth. No weapons but ours, she said. We keep taking all comers, but not if it means having an armed force on the ship. Already done, Bull said. Pa closed her eyes. It was easy to forget how much younger than him she was. This wasn't her first tour, but it could have been her second. Bull tried to imagine what he'd have felt like, still half a kid, throwing his commanding officer into the brig. Scared as hell, probably. You did the right thing, he said. You'd have to say that. I backed your play. Bull nodded. I did the right thing. Thank you for supporting me, Captain. Please know that I'll be returning that favor as long as you sit in the big chair. We aren't friends, she said. Don't have to be. So long as we get the job done. Chapter 30 Holden The Marines weren't gentle, but they were professional. Holden had seen Martian-powered armor used by a recon Marine before. As they moved back through the caverns and tunnels of the station, Holden and thick foam restraints slung across one soldier's back like a piece of equipment, he was aware of how much danger he was in. The men and women in the suits had just watched one of their own be killed and eaten by an alien. They were deep within territory as threatening and unfamiliar as anything he could imagine, and the odds were better than even that they were all blaming him for it. That he wasn't dead already spoke to discipline, training, and a professionalism he would have respected, even if his life hadn't depended on it. Whatever frequencies they were speaking on, he didn't have access to. So the furtive journey from the display chamber, or whatever it had been, back to the surface all happened in eerie silence as far as he was concerned. 
he kept hoping to catch a glimpse of Miller. Instead, they passed by the insectile machines, now still as statues, and over the complex turf. He thought he could see something like a pattern in the waves and ripples that passed along the walls and floor, complicated and beautiful as raindrops falling on the surface of a lake, or music. It didn't comfort him. He tried to get through to the Rosinante, to Naomi, but the Marine he was strapped to had either disabled his suit radio when they were restraining him, or something had jammed the signal. One way or another, he couldn't get anything. Not from the Rossi, not from the Marines, not from anywhere. There was only the gentle loping and an almost unbearable dread. His suit gave him a low air warning. He didn't have any sense of where they were or how far they'd gone. The surface of the station might be through the next tunnel, or they might not have reached the halfway point. Or, for that matter, the station could be changing around them, and the way they'd come in might not exist. The suit said he had another twenty minutes. Hey, he shouted. He tried to swing his legs against the armor of the person carrying him. Hey, I'm going to need air. The Marine didn't respond. No matter how hard Holden tried to thrash, his strength and leverage were a rounding error compared to the abilities of the powered armor. All he could do was hope that he wasn't about to die from an oversight. Worrying about that was actually better than wondering about Naomi and Alex and Amos. The air gauge was down to three minutes, and Holden had shouted himself hoarse when the Marine carrying him crouched slightly, hopped up, and the station fell away beneath them. The luminescent surface irised closed behind them, automatic and unthinking. The skiff hung in the vacuum not more than five hundred meters away, its exterior lights making it the brightest thing in the eerie, starless sky. They found their way into the mass airlock quickly. Holden's suit was blaring its emergency. The carbon dioxide levels crept up toward the critical level, and he had to fight to catch his breath. The Marine flipped him into a wall-mounted holding bar and strapped him in. I'm out of air, Holden screamed. Please! The Marine reached out and cracked the seal on Holden's suit. The rush of air smelled like old plastic and poorly recycled urine. Holden sucked it in like it was roses. The Marine popped off his own helmet. His real head looked perversely small in the bulk of the combat armor. Sergeant Verbinski, a woman's voice snapped. Yes, sir, the Marine who'd been carrying him said. There's something wrong with the prisoner? He ran out of air a few minutes back. The woman grunted. Nothing more was said about it. The acceleration burn when it came was almost subliminal. A tiny sensation of weight settling Holden into his suit, gone as soon as it came. The Marines murmured among themselves and ignored him. It was all the confirmation he needed. What Miller had said was true. The slow zone's top speed had changed again. And from the expressions on their faces, he guessed that the casualties had been terrible. I need to check in with my ship, he said. Can someone contact the Rosinante, please? No one answered him. He pressed his lock. My crew may be hurt. If you could just... Someone shut the prisoner up, the woman who'd spoken before said. He still couldn't see her. The nearest Marine, a thick-jawed man with skin so black it seemed blue, turned toward him. Holden braced himself for a threat or violence. There's nothing you could do, the man said. Please be quiet now. His cell in the brig of the Hammurabi was a little over a meter and a half wide and three meters deep. The crash couch was a dirty blue, and the walls and floor a uniform white that gleamed in the harsh light of the overhead LED. The jumpsuit he'd been issued felt like thick paper and crackled when he moved. When the guards came for him, they didn't bother putting the restraints back on his arms and legs. The captain floated near a desk her close-cropped silver hair making her look like an ancient Roman emperor. Holden was strapped into a crash couch that was canted slightly forward so that he had to look up at her, even without the convenience of an up. 
I am Captain Jakanda, she said. You are a military prisoner. Do you understand what that means? I was in the Navy, Holden said. I understand. Good. That'll cut about a half an hour of legal bullshit. I'll happily tell you everything I know, Holden said. No need for the rough stuff. The captain smiled like winter. If you were anyone else, I'd think that was a figure of speech, she said. What is your relationship to the structure at the center of the slow zone? What were you doing there? He had spent so many months trying not to talk about Miller, trying not to tell anyone anything, except Naomi, and even then he'd felt guilty putting the burden of the mystery on her. On one hand, the chance to unburden himself pulled at him like gravity. On the other, he took a deep breath. This is going to sound a little strange, he said. All right. Shortly after the protomolecule construct lifted off from Venus and headed out to start assembling the ring, I was contacted by Detective Josephus Miller, the one who rode Eros down onto Venus or at least something that looked and talked like him. He's shown up every few weeks since then, and I came to the conclusion that the protomolecule was using him. Well, him and Julie Mao, who was the first one to be infected, to drive me out through the ring. I thought that they, it, wanted me to come here. The captain's expression didn't change. Holden felt a strange lump in his throat, he didn't want to be having this conversation here. He wanted to be talking with Naomi in their bedroom on the Rosinante, or at a bar on Ceres. It didn't matter where, only who. Was she dead? Had the station killed her? Go on, the captain said. Apparently, I was mistaken, Holden said. He began with the journey out with the protomolecule's vision of Miller waiting for him at the station, the attack by her marine and the consequences as Miller explained them, the visions of the vast empire and the darkness that flowed over it, the death of sons. He relaxed as he went along, the words coming easier, faster. He sounded insane, even to himself, visions no one else could see, vast secrets revealed only to him. Except it had all been a mistake. He'd thought he was important, that he was special and chosen, and that what had happened to him and his crew had been dictated by a vast and mysterious power. He'd misunderstood everything. Doors and corners, Miller had said. And because he hadn't puzzled out what the dead man meant by it, they'd all come through the ring and to the station. His relief and his growing self-disgust mingled with every phrase. He'd been a fool dancing at the edge of the cliff, because he'd been sure that he couldn't fall. Not him. And then I was here, talking to you, he said dryly. I don't know what happens next. All right, she said. Her expression gave away nothing. You'll want a full medical workup to see if there's anything organically wrong with my brain, Holden said. Probably, the captain said. My medical staff has its hands full at the moment. You will be kept in administrative detention for the time being. I understand, Holden said. But I need to get in contact with my crew. You can monitor the connection, I don't care. I just need to know they're okay. The angle of the captain's mouth asked why he thought they were. I'll try to get a report to you, she said. Everyone's scrambling right now, and the situation could get worse quickly. Is it bad, then? It is. Time in his cell passed slowly. A guard brought tubes of rations, protein, oil, water, and vegetable paste. Sometimes it had a nearly homeopathic dose of curry. It was food meant to keep you alive. Everything after that was your own problem. Holden ate it because he had to stay alive. He had to find his crew, his ship. He had to get out of there. He had seen a massive alien empire fall. 
it seen suns blown apart. It watched a man overwhelmed and slaughtered by nightmare mechanisms on a space station that human hands hadn't built. All he could think about was Naomi and Amos and Alex, how they were going to keep their ship, how they were going to get home. And home meant any place but here. Not for the first time he wished they were all transporting sketchy boxes of unknown cargo to Titania. He floated in the coffin-sized cell and tried not to go crazy from the toxic combination of inaction and mind-bending fear. Even if the whole crew was well, he was in custody of Mars now. He hadn't harmed the Sung Un, and everyone would know that. He hadn't made the false broadcast. All the things they were accusing him of could fall away, and there would still be the fact that Mars would take away his ship. He tried to focus on that despair, because as bad as it would be, if he kept the ship and lost his crew, that would feel worse. You've got lousy taste in friends, Miller said. Where the hell have you been? Holden snapped. The dead man shrugged. In the cramped quarters, Holden could smell the man's breath. A firefly flicker of blue sped around Miller's head like a low-slung halo and vanished. Time's hard, he said, as if the comment carried its own context. Anyway, we were talking about something. The station, the lockdown. Right, Miller said, nodding. He plucked off his ridiculous hat and scratched his temple. That. So, the thing is, as long as there's a shitload of high energy floating around, the station's not going to get comfortable. You guys have what? Twenty big ships? About that, I guess? They've all got fusion reactions. They've all got massive internal power grids. Not a big deal by themselves, but the station's been spooked a couple times. It's jumpy. You're going to have to give it a little massage. Show that you're not a threat. Do that, and I'm pretty sure I can get you moving again. That, or it'll break you all down to your component atoms. It'll what? Miller's smile was apologetic. Sorry, he said. Joke. Just get the reactors offline and the internal grids off. It'll get you below threshold, and I can take it from there. I mean, if... That's what you decide you want to do. What do you mean, if? Holden shifted. The ceiling brushed against his shoulders. He couldn't stretch in here. There wasn't room for two people. There wasn't room for two people. For a fraction of a second, his brain tried to fit two images, Miller floating beside him and the two small cell, together, and failed. The flesh on his back felt like there were insects crawling all over it. The two things couldn't both be true, and his brain shuddered and recoiled from the fact that they were. Miller coughed. Don't do that, he said. This is hard enough the way it is. What I mean by if is that lockdown's lockdown. I don't get to pick what part of the trap gets unsprung. If I take off the dampening and you all start burning for home or shooting at each other or whatever, that means I also open the gates. All of them. Including the ones with the burned-up stars? No, Miller said. Those gates are gone. Only real star systems on the other side of the ones that are left. Is that a problem? Depends on what comes through, Miller said. That's a lot of doors to kick down all at once. The only sound was the hiss of the air recyclers. Miller nodded as if Holden had said something. The other option is figure out a way to sneak back home with your tails between your legs and try and pretend this all never happened. You think we should do that? I think there was an empire once that touched thousands of stars. The Eros bug? That's one of their tools. It's a wrench and something was big enough to put a bullet in them. Whatever it is could be waiting behind one of those gates, waiting for someone to do something stupid. So maybe you'd rather set up shop here, 
make little doomed babies, live and die in the darkness. But at least whatever is out there stays out there. Holden put his hand on the crash couch to steady himself. His heart was beating a mile a minute and his hands were clammy and pale. He felt like he might throw up and wondered whether he could get the vacuum commode working in time. In his memory, stars died. You think that's what we should do? he asked. Be quiet and get the hell out of here? No. I want to open them. I've learned everything I can get from here, especially in lockdown. I want to figure out what happened, and that means going and taking a look at the scene. You're the machine that finds things. Yes, Miller said. Consider the source, right? You might want to talk about it with someone who's not dead. You people have more to lose than I do. Holden thought for a moment, then smiled, then laughed. I'm not sure it matters. I'm not in much of a position to set policy, he said. That's true. Miller said. Nothing personal, but you've got lousy taste in friends. Chapter 31 Melba She was in her prison cell when they spun up the drum. In its previous life, the cell had been some sort of veterinary ward for large animals. Horses, maybe, or cows. A dozen stalls, six to a side, with brushed steel walls and bars. Real bars, just like all the old videos, except with a little swinging door at the top where they could shovel in hay. Everything else was antiseptic white. Everything was locked. Her clothes were gone, replaced by a simple pale pink jumpsuit. Her hand terminal was gone. She didn't miss it. She floated in the center of the space the walls just out of reach of her fingers and toes. It had taken a dozen attempts, reaching the wall and pushing back more and more gently, to find just the right thrust for the air resistance to stop her out where nothing could touch or be touched, where she could float and be trapped by floating. The man in the other cell bounced off his walls. He laughed and he shouted, but mostly he sulked. She ignored him. He was easy to ignore. The air surrounding her had a slight breeze, the way everything did in a ship. She'd heard a story once on the way out about a ship whose circulation failed in the middle of a night shift. The whole crew had died from the zone of exhausted gas that bubbled around them, drowning in their own recycled air. She didn't think the story was true, because they would have woken up. They would have gasped and thrashed around and gotten up out of their couches, and so they would have lived. People who wanted to live did that. People who wanted to die, on the other hand, just floated. The klaxon sounded through the whole ship, the blatting tone resonating through the decks, taking on a voice like a vast trumpet. First a warning, then another, then another. Then, silently, the bars retreated from her, falling away, and the back wall touched her shoulder like it wanted her attention, but hesitated to ask. Inch by inch, her skin came to rest against the wall. For almost half a minute, the wall touched her, its energy and her inertia pressing them together like praying hands. The drum's acceleration was invisible to her. She only felt the spin sweeping her forward, and then, because forward, down. Her body slid inch by inch, moving down the wall toward the deck. Her body began to take on weight, the joints in her knees and spine shifting, bearing load. She remembered reading somewhere that a woman coming back from a long time at Null G could have grown almost two inches just from the discs in her spine, never having the fluid pushed out of them. Between that and the muscle atrophy, coming back to weight, spin, thrust, or gravity, was the occasion for the most injury. Spinal discs were supposed to be pushed on, supposed to have the fluids go into them and back out. Without that, they turned into water balloons, 
and sometimes they popped. Her knee brushed the floor, then pressed into it. It had to have been an hour or more since the klaxons. Up and down existed again, and she let down take her. She folded against herself, empty as damp paper. There was a drain in the floor, white ceramic unstained by any animal's blood or piss. The lights overhead flickered and grew steady again. The other prisoner was shouting for something. Food, maybe. Water. A guard to escort him to the head. It was natural to think of it as the head now, not the restroom, not the water closet. She didn't call for anyone to help her. She just felt her body grow heavier, being pulled down, and because down, out. It wasn't real gravity, so it wasn't real weight. It was her mass, trying to fly off into the dark and being restrained. Someone came for the other prisoner. She watched the thick plastic boots flicker across her line of sight, then voices. Words like loyal and mutiny. Phrases like when the time's right and restore order. They washed over her and she let them go. Her head hurt a little where her temple pushed against the floor. She wanted to sleep, but she was afraid to dream. More footsteps, the same boots going the other way, passing her. More voices, the boots coming back, the deep metallic clank of the shackle being taken off the stall's door. Her body didn't move, but her attention focused. The guard was different, a woman with broad shoulders and a gun in her hand. She looked at Melba, shrugged, and put a hand terminal into her field of vision. The man on the screen didn't look like a cop. His skin was pale brown like cookie dough. There was something strange about the shape of his face, broad chin, dark eyes, wrinkles in his forehead and the corners of his mouth, that she couldn't place until he spoke and she saw him in motion. Then it was clear he was lying down and looking up at the camera. My name's Carlos Baca, the lying down man said. I'm in charge of security on the behemoth. So this prison you're in? It's mine. All right, Melba thought. You, now. I'm thinking you've got a story to tell. The UN records of your DNA says you're Melba Co. A bunch of people I've got no reason to disbelieve say you're Clarissa Mao. The XO of the Rosinante says you tried to kill her. And this Russian priest lady is backing her story. And then there's this sound engineer who says you hired him to place interruption electronics on the Rosinante. He went quiet for a moment. Any of that ringing a bell? The case on the hand terminal was green ceramic, or maybe enameled metal, not plastic. A hairline scratch on the screen made an extra mark across the man's cheek, like a pirate's dueling scar in a kid's book. All right. How about this? He said. Doctor says you've got a modified endocrine bundle. The kind of things terrorists use when they need to do something showy and hard to detect. And you know, they don't give a shit if it turns their nervous system into soup in a few years. Not the kind of thing a maintenance tech could afford, or have much reason to get. It felt strange, the weight of her head pressing against the floor and looking down from the camera into the man's face, both at the same time. Partly, she supposed that was from being weightless for so long. Her brain was still getting used to the spin gravity after relying on visual clues, and now here was this anomalous visual cue. She knew intellectually what it was, but the special analysis part of her brain still gnawed at it. The man on the screen, he'd said his name, but she didn't remember it, pressed his lips together, then coughed once. It was a wet sound, like he was fighting off pneumonia. I don't think you understand how much trouble you're in, he said. There's people accusing you of blowing up an Earth military vessel, and the case they're building is pretty goddamn good. You can take it from me, the UN has no sense of humor about that kind of thing. They will kill you. You understand that? 
They'll put you in front of a military tribunal, listen to a couple of lawyers for maybe 15, 20 minutes, then they'll blow your brains out. I can help you avoid that, but you have to talk to me. You know what I think? I don't think you're a professional. I think you're an amateur. You made a bunch of amateur mistakes and things got away from you. You tell me if I'm right and we'll go from there. But you keep playing this catatonia shit and you're going to get killed. Do you understand what I'm saying? He had a good voice. It had what her singing coach would have called a thorough range. Deep as gravel, but with reedy overtones. It was the kind of voice she'd expect in a man who'd been well bruised by the world. Her singing voice had always been a little reedy, too, like her father's. Peter, poor thing, had never been able to hold a melody. The others, Michael, Anthea, Julie, Mother, had all had very pure voices, like flutes. The problem with a flute was that it couldn't help being pure. Even sorrow sounded posed and over-lovely when the flute was expressing it. Reeds had that deeper buzz, that dirtiness, and it gave the sound authenticity. She and her father were reeds. Corin, the man on the screen said, Does she understand what I'm saying? The woman with the gun picked up the hand terminal, looked down at Melba, and then into the screen. I don't think so, Chief. The doctor said there wasn't any brain damage. Did, the woman agreed. That don't make her right, though. The sigh carried. Okay, the man's voice said. We're going to have to go from a different angle. I got an idea, but you should come back in first. Sasa, the woman said. She stepped out of the cell. The bars closed again. They were narrow enough to keep a horse's hoof from passing through. She could imagine a horse trying to kick, getting its legs stuck, panicking. That would be bad. Better to avoid the problem. Wiser. Easier to stay out than to get out. Someone had said that to her once, but she didn't know who. Hey! Hey! the other prisoner said. He wasn't shouting, just talking loud enough that his voice carried. Was that true? You have glandular implants? Can you break the door? I'm the captain of this ship. If you can get me out of here, I can help you. Julie had been the best singer, except that she wouldn't do it. Didn't like performing. Father had been the performer. He'd always been the one to lead when there were songs to be sung. He was always the one to direct the poses when the family pictures were taken. He was a man who knew what he wanted and how to get it. Only he was in prison now. Not even a name, only a number. She wondered whether his cell was like hers. It would be nice if it was. Only his would be under a full G, of course. The spin gravity wasn't even up to a half G. Maybe a third. Maybe even less. Like Mars or Ceres. Funny that of all the places humans lived, 